Capital, Volume 1. This independent recording by Andrew S. Reitenberg is public domain, both in content and in audio. Part 1. Commodities and Money. Chapter 1. The Commodity. Section 1. The two factors of the commodity, use value and value, the substance of value and magnitude of value. The wealth of societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails appears as an immense collection of commodities. The individual commodity appears as its elementary form. Our investigation, therefore, begins with the analysis of the commodity. The commodity is, first of all, an external object, a thing which, through its qualities, satisfies human needs of whatever kind. The nature of these needs, whether they arise, for example, from the stomach or the imagination, makes no difference. Nor does it matter here how the thing satisfies man's need, whether directly as a means of subsistence, i.e. an object of consumption, or indirectly as a means of production. Every useful thing, for example iron, paper, etc., may be looked at from the two points of view of quality and quantity. Every useful thing is a whole composed of many properties. It can therefore be useful in various ways. The discovery of these ways, and hence the manifold uses of things, is the work of history. So also is the invention of socially recognized standards of measurement for the quantities of these useful objects. The diversity of the measures for commodities arises in part from the diverse nature of the objects to be measured, and in part from convention. The usefulness of a thing makes it a use value, but this usefulness does not dangle in midair. It is conditioned by the physical properties of the commodity, and has no existence apart from the latter. It is therefore the physical body of the commodity itself, for instance iron, corn, a diamond, which is the use value or useful thing. This property of a commodity is independent of the amount of labor required to appropriate its useful qualities. When examining use values, we always assume we are dealing with definite quantities, such as dozens of watches, yards of linen, or tons of iron. The use values of commodities provide the material for a special branch of knowledge, namely the commercial knowledge of commodities. Use values are only realized in use or in consumption. They constitute the material content of wealth, whatever its social form may be. In the form of society to be considered here, they are also the material bearers of exchange value. Exchange value appears first of all as the quantitative relation, the proportion, in which the use values of one kind exchange for use values of another kind. This relation changes constantly with time and place. Hence, exchange value appears to be something accidental and purely relative, and consequently, an intrinsic value, i.e. an exchange value that is inseparably connected with the commodity, inherent in it, seems a contradiction in terms. Let us consider the matter more closely. A given commodity, a quarter of wheat for example, is exchanged for X boot polish, Y silk or Z gold, etc. In short, it is exchanged for other commodities in the most diverse proportions. Therefore, the wheat has many exchange values instead of one. But X boot polish, Y silk or Z gold, etc., each represent the exchange value of one quarter of wheat. Therefore, X boot polish, Y silk, and Z gold must, as exchange values, be mutually replaceable or of identical magnitude. It follows from this that firstly, the valid exchange values of a particular commodity express something equal, and secondly, exchange value cannot be anything other than the mode of expression, the form of appearance, of a content distinguishable from it. Let us now take two commodities, for example, corn and iron. Whatever their exchange relation may be, it can always be represented by an equation in which a given quantity of corn is equated to some quantity of iron. For instance, one quarter of corn is equal to X centium weights of iron. What does this equation signify? It signifies that a common element of identical magnitude exists in two different things, in one quarter of corn and similarly in X centium weights of iron. Both are therefore equal to a third thing, which in itself is neither one nor the other. Each of them, so far as it is exchange value, must therefore be reducible to this third thing. A simple geometrical example will illustrate this. In order to determine and compare the areas of all rectilinear figures, we split them up into triangles. Then the triangle itself is reduced to an expression totally different from its visible shape, half the product of the base and the altitude. In the same way, the exchange values of commodities must be reduced to a common element, of which they represent a greater or lesser quantity. 
This common element cannot be a geometrical, physical, chemical, or other natural property of commodities. Such properties come into consideration only to the extent that they make the commodities useful, i.e. turn them into use values. But clearly, the exchange relation of commodities is characterized precisely by its abstraction from their use values. Within the exchange relation, one use value is worth just as much as another, provided only that it is present in the appropriate quantity. Or, as old Barbin says, quote, one sort of wares are as good as another, if the value be equal. There is no difference or distinction in things of equal value. One hundred pounds worth of lead or iron is of as great a value as one hundred pounds worth of silver and gold. End quote. As use values, commodities differ above all in quality, while as exchange values they can only differ in quantity, and therefore do not contain an atom of use value. If, then, we disregard the use value of commodities, only one property remains, that of being products of labor. But even the product of labor has already been transformed in our hands. If we make abstraction from its use value, we abstract also from the material constituents and forms which make it a use value. It is no longer a table, a house, a piece of yarn, or any other useful thing. All its sensuous characteristics are extinguished. Nor is it any longer the product of the labor of the joiner, the mason, or the spinner, or of any other particular kind of productive labor. With the disappearance of the useful character of the products of labor, the useful character of the kinds of labor embodied in them also disappears. This, in turn, entails the disappearance of the different concrete forms of labor. They can no longer be distinguished, but are altogether reduced to the same kind of labor, human labor in the abstract. Let us now look at the residue of the products of labor. There is nothing left of them in each case but the same phantom-like objectivity. They are merely congealed quantities of homogeneous human labor, i.e. of human labor power expended without regard to the form of its expenditure. All these things now tell us is that human labor power has been expended to produce them. Human labor is accumulated in them. As crystals of this social substance, which is common to them all, they are values, commodity values. We have seen that when commodities are in the relation of exchange, their exchange value manifests itself as something totally independent of their use value. But if we abstract from their use value, there remains their value, as it has just been defined. The common factor in the exchange relation, or in the exchange value of the commodity, is therefore its value. The progress of the investigation will lead us back to the exchange value as the necessary mode of expression, or form of appearance, of value. For the present, however, we must consider the nature of value independently of its form of appearance. A use value, or useful article, therefore, has value only because abstract human labor is objectified or materialized in it. How, then, is the magnitude of this value to be measured? By means of the quantity of the value-forming substance, the labor, contained in the article. This quantity is measured by its duration, and the labor time is itself measured on the particular scale of hours, days, etc. It might seem that if the value of a commodity is determined by the quantity of labor expended to produce it, it would be the more valuable, the more unskillful and lazy the worker who produced it, because he would need more time to complete the article. However, the labor that forms the substance of value is equal human labor, the expenditure of identical human labor power. The total labor power of society, which is manifested in the values of the world of commodities, counts here as one homogeneous mass of human labor power, although composed of innumerable individual units of labor power. Each of these units is the same as any other to the extent that it has the character of a socially average unit of labor power and acts as such, i.e. it only needs, in order to produce a commodity, the labor time which is necessary on an average, or in other words, is socially necessary. Socially necessary labor time is the labor time required to produce any use value under the conditions of production normal for a given society, and with the average degree of skill and intensity of labor prevalent in that society. The introduction of power looms into England, for example, probably reduced by one half the labor required to convert a given quantity of yarn into woven fabric. In order to do this, the English hand-loom weaver, in fact, needed the same amount of labor time as before, but the product of his individual hour of labor now only represented half an hour of social labor, and consequently fell to one-half its former value. What exclusively determines the magnitude of the value of any article is therefore the amount of labor socially necessary, or the labor time socially necessary for its production. 
The individual commodity counts here only as an average sample of its kind. Commodities which contain equal quantities of labor, or which can be produced in the same time, have therefore the same value. The value of a commodity is related to the value of any other commodity as the labor time necessary for the production of the one is related to the labor time necessary for the production of the other. As exchange values, all commodities are merely definite quantities of congealed labor time. The value of a commodity would therefore remain constant if the labor time required for its production also remained constant, but the latter changes with every variation in the productivity of labor. This is determined by a wide range of circumstances. It is determined, amongst other things, by the worker's average degree of skill, the level of development of science and its technological application, the social organization of the process of production, the extent and effectiveness of the means of production, and the conditions found in the natural environment. For example, the same quantity of labor is present in eight bushels of corn in favorable seasons and in only four bushels in unfavorable seasons. The same quantity of labor provides more metal in rich mines than in poor. Diamonds are a very rare occurrence on the Earth's surface, and hence their discovery costs, on an average, a great deal of labor time. Consequently, much labor is represented in a small volume. Jacob questions whether gold has ever been paid for at its full value. This applies still more to diamonds. According to Eschwege, the total produce of Brazilian diamond mines for the 80 years ending in 1823 still did not amount to the price of one and one-half years average produce of the sugar and coffee plantations of the same country, although the diamonds represented much more labor, therefore more value. With richer mines, the same quantity of labor would be embodied in more diamonds, and their value would fall. If man succeeded, without much labor, in transforming carbon into diamonds, their value might fall below that of bricks. In general, the greater the productivity of labor, the less the labor time required to produce an article, the less the mass of labor crystallized in that article, and the less its value. Inversely, the less the productivity of labor, the greater the labor time necessary to produce an article, and the greater its value. The value of a commodity, therefore, varies directly as the quantity, and inversely as the productivity, of the labor which finds its realization within the commodity. Now we know the substance of value. It is labor. We know the measure of its magnitude, it is labor time. The form which stamps the value as exchange value remains to be analyzed. But before this, we need to develop the characteristics we have already found somewhat more fully. A thing can be a use value without being a value. This is the case whenever its utility to man is not mediated through labor. Air, virgin soil, natural meadows, unplanted forests, etc. fall into this category. A thing can be useful and a product of human labor without being a commodity. He who satisfies his own need with the product of his own labor admittedly creates use values but not commodities. In order to produce the latter, he must not only produce use values but use values for others, social use values, and not merely for others. The medieval peasant produced a corn rent for the feudal lord and a corn tithe for the priest but neither the corn rent nor the corn tithe became commodities simply by being produced for others. In order to become a commodity, the product must be transferred to the other person for whom it serves as a use value through the medium of exchange. Finally, nothing can be a value without being an object of utility. If the thing is useless, so is the labor contained in it. The labor does not count as labor and therefore creates no value. Section 2. The Dual Character of the Labor Embodied in Commodities Initially, the commodity appeared to us as an object with a dual character, possessing both use value and exchange value. Later on, it was seen that labor too has a dual character. Insofar as it finds its expression in value, it no longer possesses the same characteristics as when it is the creator of use values. I was the first to point out and examine critically this twofold nature of the labor contained in commodities. As this point is crucial to an understanding of political economy, it requires further elucidation. Let us take two commodities, such as a coat and ten yards of linen, and let the value of the first be twice the value of the second, so that if ten yards of linen is equal to W, the coat is equal to 2W. The coat is a use value that satisfies a particular need. A specific kind of productive activity is required to bring it into existence. This activity is determined by its aim, mode of operation, object, means, and result. We use the abbreviated expression, useful labor, for labor whose utility is represented by the use value of its product, or by the fact that its product is a use value. In this connection, we consider only its useful effect. 
As the coat and the linen are qualitatively different use values, so also are the forms of labor through which their existence is mediated, tailoring and weaving. If the use values were not qualitatively different, hence not the products of qualitatively different forms of useful labor, they would be absolutely incapable of confronting each other as commodities. Coats cannot be exchanged for coats. One use value cannot be exchanged for another of the same kind. The totality of heterogeneous use values, or physical commodities, reflects a totality of similarly heterogeneous forms of useful labor, which differ in order, genus, species, and variety. In short, a social division of labor. This division of labor is a necessary condition for commodity production, although the converse does not hold. Commodity production is not a necessary condition for the social division of labor. Labor is socially divided in the primitive Indian community, although the products do not thereby become commodities. Or, to take an example nearer home, labor is systematically divided in every factory, but the workers do not bring about this division by exchanging their individual products. Only the products of mutually independent acts of labor, performed in isolation, can confront each other as commodities. To sum up, then, the use value of every commodity contains useful labor, i.e. productive activity of a definite kind carried on with a definite aim. Use values cannot confront each other as commodities unless the useful labor contained in them is qualitatively different in each case. In a society whose products generally assume the form of commodities, i.e. in a society of commodity producers, this qualitative difference between the useful forms of labor which are carried on independently and privately by individual producers develops into a complex system, a social division of labor. It is moreover a matter of indifference whether the coat is worn by the tailor or by his customer. In both cases, it acts as a use value. So, too, the relation between the coat and the labor that produced it is not in itself altered when tailoring becomes a special trade, an independent branch of the social division of labor. Men made clothes for thousands of years, under the compulsion of the need for clothing, without a single man ever becoming a tailor. But the existence of coats, of linen, of every element of material wealth not provided in advance by nature had always to be mediated through a specific productive activity, appropriate to its purpose, a productive activity that assimilated particular natural materials to particular human requirements. Labor, then, as the creator of use values, as useful labor, is a condition of human existence which is independent of all forms of society. It is an eternal natural necessity which mediates the metabolism between man and nature, and therefore human life itself. Use values like coats, linen, etc., in short the physical bodies of commodities, are combinations of two elements, the material provided by nature and labor. If we subtract the total amount of useful labor of different kinds which is contained in the coat, the linen, etc., a material substratum is always left. This substratum is furnished by nature without human intervention. When man engages in production, he can only proceed as nature does herself, i.e. he can only change the form of the materials. Furthermore, even in this work of modification, he is constantly helped by natural forces. Labor is therefore not the only source of material wealth i.e. of the use values it produces. As William Petty says, labor is the father of material wealth, and the earth is its mother. Let us now pass from the commodity as an object of utility to the value of commodities. We have assumed that the coat is worth twice as much as the linen, but this is merely a quantitative difference and does not concern us at the moment. We shall therefore simply bear in mind that if the value of a coat is twice that of ten yards of linen, twenty yards of linen will have the same value as a coat. As values, the coat and the linen have the same substance, they are the objective expressions of homogeneous labor. But tailoring and weaving are qualitatively different forms of labor. There are, however, states of society in which the same man alternately makes clothes and weaves. In this case, these two modes of labor are only modifications of the labor of the same individual, and not yet fixed functions peculiar to different individuals, just as the coat our tailor makes today and the pair of trousers he makes tomorrow require him only to vary his own individual labor. Moreover, we can see at a glance that in our capitalist society, a given portion of labor is supplied alternately in the form of tailoring and in the form of weaving, in accordance with the changes in the direction of the demand for labor. This change in the form of labor may well not take place without friction, but it must take place. If we leave aside the determinate quality of productive activity, and therefore the useful character of the labor, what remains is its quality of being an expenditure of human labor power. Tailoring and weaving, although they are qualitatively different productive activities, are both a productive expenditure of human brains, muscles, nerves, hands, etc., and in this sense, both human labor. They are merely two different forms of the expenditure of human labor power. 
Of course, human labor power must itself have attained a certain level of development before it can be expended in this or that form. But the value of a commodity represents human labor pure and simple, the expenditure of human labor in general. And just as in civil society, a general or a banker plays a great part, but man as such plays a very mean part, so here too the same is true of human labor. It is the expenditure of simple labor power, i.e. of the labor power possessed in his bodily organism by every ordinary man, on the average, without being developed in any special way. Simple, average labor, it is true, varies in character in different countries and at different cultural epochs, but in a particular society it is a given. More complex labor counts only as intensified, or rather multiplied, simple labor, so that a smaller quantity of complex labor is considered equal to a larger quantity of simple labor. Experience shows that this reduction is constantly being made. A commodity may be the outcome of the most complicated labor, but through its value it is posited as equal to the product of simple labor, hence it represents only a specific quantity of simple labor. The various proportions in which different kinds of labor are reduced to simple labor, as their unit of measurement, are established by a social process that goes on behind the backs of the producers. These proportions therefore appear to the producers to have been handed down by tradition. In the interests of simplification, we shall henceforth view every form of labor power directly as simple labor power. By this we shall simply be saving ourselves the trouble of making the reduction. Just as in viewing the coat and the linen as values, we abstract from their different use values, so in the case of labor represented by those values do we disregard the difference between its useful forms, tailoring and weaving. The use values, coat and linen, are combinations of, on the one hand, productive activity with a definite purpose, and on the other, cloth and yarn. The values, coat and linen, however, are merely congealed quantities of homogeneous labor. In the same way, the labor contained in these values does not count by virtue of its productive relation to cloth and yarn, but only as being an expenditure of human labor power. Tailoring and weaving are the formative elements in the use values coat and linen, precisely because these two kinds of labor are of different qualities, but only insofar as abstraction is made from their particular qualities, only insofar as both possess the same quality of being human labor, do tailoring and weaving form the substance of the values of the two articles mentioned. Coats and linen, however, are not merely values in general, but values of definite magnitude, and, following our assumption, the coat is worth twice as much as the ten yards of linen. Why is there this difference in value? Because the linen only contains half as much labor as the coat, so that labor power had to be expended twice as long to produce the second as to produce the first. While, therefore, with reference to use value, the labor contained in a commodity counts only qualitatively, with reference to value, it counts only quantitatively once it has been reduced to human labor, pure and simple. In the former case, it was a matter of the how and the what of labor, in the latter of the how much of the temporal duration of labor. Since the magnitude of the value of a commodity represents nothing but the quantity of labor embodied in it, it follows that all commodities, when taken in certain proportions, must be equal in value. If the productivity of all different sorts of useful labor required, let's say for the production of a coat, remains unchanged, the total value of the coats produced will increase along with their quantity. If one coat represents X days labor, two coats will represent two X days labor, and so on. But now assume that the duration of the labor necessary for the production of a coat is doubled or halved. In the first case, one coat is worth as much as two coats were before. In the second case, two coats are only worth as much as one was before, although in both cases, one coat performs the same service, and the useful labor contained in it remains of the same quality. One change has taken place, however, a change in the quantity of labor expended to produce the article. In itself, an increase in the quantity of use values constitutes an increase in material wealth. Two coats will clothe two men, one coat will only clothe one man, etc. Nevertheless, an increase in the amount of material wealth may correspond to a simultaneous fall in the magnitude of its value. This contradictory movement arises out of the twofold character of labor. By productivity, of course, we always mean the productivity of concrete, useful labor. In reality, this determines only the degree of effectiveness of productive activity directed towards a given purpose within a given period of time. Useful labor becomes, therefore, a more or less abundant source of products in direct proportion as its productivity rises or falls. As against this, however, variations in productivity have no impact whatever on the labor itself represented in value. As productivity is an attribute of labor in its concrete, useful form, it naturally ceases to have any bearing on that labor as soon as we abstract from its concrete, useful form. 
The same labor, therefore, performed for the same length of time, always yields the same amount of value, independently of any variations in productivity. But it provides different quantities of use values during equal periods of time. More if productivity rises, fewer if it falls. For this reason, the same change in productivity which increases the fruitfulness of labor, and therefore the amount of use values produced by it, also brings about a reduction in the value of this increased total amount, if it cuts down the total amount of labor time necessary to produce the use values. The converse also holds. On the one hand, all labor is an expenditure of human labor power, in the physiological sense, and it is in this quality of being equal or abstract human labor that it forms the value of commodities. On the other hand, all labor is an expenditure of human labor power in a particular form with a definite aim, and it is in this quality of being concrete useful labor that it produces use values. Section 3. The Value Form, or Exchange Value Commodities come into the world in the form of use values or material goods, such as iron, linen, corn, etc. This is their plain, homely, natural form. However, they are only commodities because they have a dual nature, because they are at the same time objects of utility and bearers of value. Therefore, they only appear as commodities, or have the form of commodities insofar as they possess a double form, i.e. natural form and value form. The objectivity of commodities as values differs from Dame Quickly in the sense that a man knows not where to have it. Not an atom of matter enters into the objectivity of commodities as values. In this, it is the direct opposite of the coarsely sensuous objectivity of commodities as physical objects. We may twist and turn a single commodity as we wish. It remains impossible to grasp it as a thing possessing value. However, let us remember that commodities possess an objective character as values only insofar as they are all expressions of an identical social substance, human labor, that their objective character as values is therefore purely social. From this, it follows self-evidently that it can only appear in the social relation between commodity and commodity. In fact, we started from exchange value, or the exchange relation of commodities, in order to track down the value that lay hidden within it. We must now return to this form of appearance of value. Everyone knows, if nothing else, that commodities have a common value form which contrasts in the most striking manner with the motley natural forms of their use values. I refer to the money form. Now, however, we have to perform a task never even attempted by bourgeois economics. That is, we have to show the origin of this money form. We have to trace the development of the expression of value contained in the value relation of commodities from its simplest, almost imperceptible outline to the dazzling money form. When this has been done, the mystery of money will immediately disappear. The simplest value relation is evidently that of one commodity to another commodity of a different kind. It does not matter which one. Hence, the relation between the values of two commodities supplies us with the simplest expression of the value of a single commodity. Subsection A. The simple, isolated, or accidental form of value. X commodity A equals Y commodity B or X commodity A is worth Y commodity B. 20 yards of linen equals one coat, or 20 yards of linen are worth one coat. 1. The two poles of the expression of value, the relative form of value and the equivalent form. The whole mystery of the form of value lies hidden in this simple form. Our real difficulty, therefore, is to analyze it. Here, two different kinds of commodities, in our example, the linen and the coat, evidently play two different parts. The linen expresses its value in the coat, and the coat serves as the material in which that value is expressed. The first commodity plays an active role, the second a passive one. The value of the first commodity is represented as relative value. In other words, the commodity is in relative form of value. The second commodity fulfills the function of equivalent. In other words, it is in the equivalent form. The relative form of value and the equivalent form are two inseparable moments which belong to and mutually condition each other. But at the same time, they are mutually exclusive or opposed extremes, i.e. poles of the expression of value. They are always divided up between the different commodities brought into relation with each other by that expression. I cannot, for example, express the value of linen in linen. 20 yards of linen equals 20 yards of linen is not an expression of value. The equation states rather the contrary. 20 yards of linen are nothing but 20 yards of linen, a definite quantity of linen considered as an object of utility. The value of the linen can therefore only be expressed relatively, i.e., in another commodity. 
The relative form of the value of the linen therefore presupposes that some other commodity confronts it in the equivalent form. On the other hand, this other commodity, which figures as the equivalent, cannot simultaneously be in the relative form of value. It is not the latter commodity whose value is being expressed. It only provides the material in which the value of the first commodity is expressed. Of course, the expression 20 yards of linen equals one coat, or 20 yards of linen are worth one coat, also includes its converse, one coat equals 20 yards of linen. But in this case, I must reverse the equation in order to express the value of the coat relatively. And if I do that, the linen becomes the equivalent instead of the coat. The same commodity cannot, therefore, simultaneously appear in both forms in the same state of expression of value. These forms rather exclude each other as polar opposites. Whether a commodity is in the relative form, or in its opposite, the equivalent form, entirely depends on its actual position in the expression of value. That is, it depends on whether it is the commodity whose value is being expressed, or the commodity in which value is being expressed. 2. The Relative Form of Value The Content of the Relative Form of Value In order to find out how the simple expression of the value of a commodity lies hidden in the value relation between two commodities, we must, first of all, consider the value relation quite independently of its quantitative aspect. The usual mode of procedure is the precise opposite of this. Nothing is seen in the value relation but the proportion in which definite quantities of two sorts of commodity count as equal to each other. It is overlooked that the magnitudes of different things only become comparable in quantitative terms when they have been reduced to the same unit. Only as expressions of the same unit do they have a common denominator, and are therefore commensurable magnitudes. Whether 20 yards of linen equals 1 coat, or equals 20 coats, or equals X coats, i.e. whether a given quantity of linen is worth few or many coats, it is always implied, whatever the proportion, that the linen and the coat, as magnitudes of value, are expressions of the same unit things of the same nature. Linen equals coat is the basis of the equation. But these two qualitatively equated commodities do not play the same part. It is only the value of the linen that is expressed. And how? By being related to the coat as its equivalent, or the thing exchangeable with it. In this relation, the coat counts as the form of existence of value, as the material embodiment of value, for only as such is it the same as the linen. On the other hand, the linen's own existence as value comes into view or receives an independent expression, for it is only as value that it can be related to the coat as being equal in value to it, or exchangeable with it. In the same way, butyric acid is a different substance from propyl formate, yet both are made up of the same chemical substances, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Moreover, these substances are combined together in the same proportions in each case, namely C4H8O2. If now butyric acid were to be equated with propyl formate, then in the first place, propyl formate would count in this relation only as a form of existence of C4H8O2, and in the second place, it would thereby be asserted that butyric acid also consists of C4H8O2. Thus, by equating propyl formate with butyric acid, one would be expressing their chemical composition as opposed to their physical formation. If we say that as values, commodities are simply congealed quantities of human labor, our analysis reduces them, it is true, to the level of abstract value, but does not give them a form of value distinct from their natural forms. It is otherwise in the value relation of one commodity to another. The first commodity's value character emerges here through its own relation to the second commodity. By equating, for example, the coat as a thing of value to the linen, we equate the labor embedded in the coat with the labor embedded in the linen. Now it is true that the tailoring which makes the coat is concrete labor of a different sort from the weaving which makes the linen, but the act of equating tailoring with weaving reduces the former, in fact, to what is really equal in the two kinds of labor, to the characteristic they have in common of being human labor. This is a roundabout way of saying that weaving too, insofar as it weaves value, has nothing to distinguish it from tailoring and consequently is abstract human labor. It is only the expression of equivalence between different sorts of commodities which brings to view the specific character of value-creating labor, by actually reducing the different kinds of labor embedded in the different kinds of commodity to their common quality of being human labor in general. However, it is not enough to express the specific character of the labor which goes to make up the value of the linen. Human labor power in its fluid state, or human labor, creates value, but is not itself value. It becomes value in its coagulated state, 
in its objective form. The value of the linen as a congealed mass of human labor can be expressed only as an objectivity, a thing which is materially different from the linen itself and yet common to the linen and all other commodities. The problem is already solved. When it is in the value relation with the linen, the coat counts qualitatively as the equal of the linen. It counts as a thing of the same nature because it is a value. Here, it is therefore a thing in which value is manifested, or which represents value in its tangible natural form. Yet the coat itself, the physical aspect of the coat commodity, is purely a use value. The coat as such no more expresses value than does the first piece of linen we come across. This proves only that within its value relation to the linen, the coat signifies more than it does outside it, just as some men count for more when inside a gold-braided uniform than they do otherwise. In the production of the coat, human labor power, in the shape of tailoring, has in actual fact been expended. Human labor has therefore been accumulated in the coat. From this point of view, the coat is a bearer of value, although this property never shows through even when the coat is at its most threadbare. In its value relation with the linen, the coat counts only under this aspect, counts therefore as embodied value, as the body of value. Despite its buttoned-up appearance, the linen recognizes in it a splendid kindred soul, the soul of value. Nevertheless, the coat cannot represent value towards the linen unless value, for the latter, simultaneously assumes the form of a coat. An individual, A, for instance, cannot be your majesty to another individual B unless majesty in B's eyes assumes the physical shape of A, and moreover changes facial features, hair, and many other things with every new father of his people. Hence, in the value relation in which the coat is the equivalent of the linen, the form of the coat counts as the form of value. The value of the commodity linen is therefore expressed by the physical body of the commodity coat, the value of one by the use value of the other. As a use value, the linen is something palpably different from the coat. As value, it is identical with the coat, and therefore looks like the coat. Thus the linen acquires a value form different from its natural form. Its existence as value is manifested in its equality with the coat, just as the sheep-like nature of the Christian is shown in his resemblance to the Lamb of God. We see, then, that everything in our analysis of the value of commodities previously told us is repeated by the linen itself, as soon as it enters into association with another commodity, the coat. Only it reveals its thoughts in a language with which it alone is familiar, the language of commodities. In order to tell us that the labor creates its own value in its abstract quality of being human labor, it says that the coat, insofar as it counts as its equal, i.e. is value, consists of the same labor as it does itself. In order to inform us that its sublime objectivity as a value differs from its stiff and starchy existence as a body, it says that value has the appearance of a coat, and therefore that insofar as the linen itself is an object of value, it and the coat are as like as two peas. Let us note, incidentally, that the language of commodities also has, apart from Hebrew, plenty of other more or less correct dialects. The German word Wertzein, to be worth, for instance, brings out less strikingly than the Romance verb valere, valer, valoir, that the equating of commodity B with commodity A is the expression of value proper to commodity A. Paris va bien en messe. By means of the value relation, therefore, the natural form of commodity B becomes the value form of commodity A. In other words, the physical body of commodity B becomes a mirror for the value of commodity A. Commodity A, then, in entering into a relation with commodity B as an object of value, as a materialization of human labor, makes the use value B into the material through which its own value is expressed. The value of commodity A, thus expressed in the use value of commodity B, has the form of relative value. The Quantitative Determinacy of the Relative Form of Value Every commodity whose use value is to be expressed is a useful object of a given quantity, for instance 15 bushels of corn or 100 pounds of coffee. A given quantity of any commodity contains a definite quantity of human labor. Therefore, the form of value must not only express value in general, but also quantitatively determined value, i.e. the magnitude of value. In the value relation of commodity A to the commodity B, of the linen to the coat, therefore, not only is the commodity type coat equated with the linen in qualitative terms as an object of value as such, but also a definite quantity of the object of value or equivalent, one coat for example, is equated with a definite quantity of linen, such as 20 yards. 
The equation 20 yards of linen equals one coat, or 20 yards of linen are worth one coat, presupposes the presence in one coat of exactly as much of the substance of value as there is in 20 yards of linen, implies therefore that the quantities in which the two commodities are present have cost the same amount of labor or the same quantity of labor time. But the labor time necessary for the production of 20 yards of linen, or one coat, varies with every change in the productivity of the weaver or the tailor. The influence of such changes on the relative expression of the magnitude of value must now be investigated more closely. Case 1. Let the value of the linen change while the value of the coat remains constant. If the labor time necessary for the production of linen be doubled, as a result of the increasing infertility of flax-growing soil, for instance, its value will also be doubled. Instead of the equation 20 yards of linen equals one coat, we should have 20 yards of linen equals two coats, since one coat would now contain only half as much labor time as 20 yards of linen. If, on the other hand, the necessary labor time be reduced by one half, as a result of improved looms, for instance, the value of the linen will fall by one half. In accordance with this, the equation will now read 20 yards of linen equals one half coat. The relative value of commodity A, i.e. its value expressed in commodity B, rises and falls in direct relation to the value of A, if the value of B remains constant. Case 2. Let the value of the linen remain constant while the value of the coat changes. If under these circumstances the labor time necessary for the production of a coat is doubled, as a result, for instance, of a poor crop of wool, we should have, instead of 20 yards of linen equals one coat, 20 yards of linen equals one half coat. If, on the other hand, the value of the coat sinks by one half, then 20 yards of linen equals two coats. Hence, if the value of commodity A remains constant, its relative value, as expressed in commodity B, rises and falls in inverse relation to the change in the value of B. If we compare the different cases examined under the headings of case 1 and 2, it emerges that the same change in the magnitude of relative value may arise from entirely opposed causes. Thus, the equation 20 yards of linen equals one coat becomes 20 yards of linen equals two coats either because the value of the linen has doubled or because the value of the coat has fallen by one half. And it becomes 20 yards of linen equals one half coat either because the value of the linen has fallen by one half or because the value of the coat has doubled. Case 3. Let the quantities of labor necessary for the production of the linen and the coat vary simultaneously in the same direction and the same proportion. In this case, 20 yards of linen equals one coat, as before, whatever change may have taken place in their respective values. Their change of value is revealed only when they are compared with a third commodity, whose value has remained constant. If the values of all commodities rose or fell simultaneously, and in the same proportion, their relative values would remain unaltered. The change in their real values would be manifested by an increase or decrease in the quantity of commodities produced within the same labor time. Case 4. The labor time necessary for the production respectively of the linen and the coat, and hence their values, may vary simultaneously in the same direction but to an unequal degree, or in opposite directions, and so on. The influence of all possible combinations of this kind on the relative value of a commodity can be worked out simply by applying cases 1, 2, and 3. Thus, real changes in the magnitude of value are neither unequivocally nor exhaustively reflected in their relative expression, or in other words, in the magnitude of the relative value. The relative value of a commodity may vary, although its value remains constant. Its relative value may remain constant, although its value varies. And finally, simultaneous variations in the magnitude of its value and in the relative expression of that magnitude do not by any means have to correspond at all points. The Equivalent Form we have seen that a commodity A, the linen, by expressing its value in the use value of a commodity B, of a different kind, the coat, impresses upon the latter a form of value peculiar to it, namely that of the equivalent. The commodity linen brings to view its own existence as a value through the fact that the coat can be equated with the linen, although it is not assumed a form of value distinct from its own physical form. The coat is directly exchangeable with the linen. In this way, the linen in fact expresses its own existence as a value. The equivalent form of a commodity, accordingly, is the form in which it is directly exchangeable with other commodities. If one kind of commodity, such as a coat, serves as the equivalent of another, such as linen, and coats therefore acquire the characteristic property of being in a form in which they can be directly exchanged with linen, this still by no means provides us with a proportion in which the two are exchangeable. Since the magnitude of the value of the linen is a given quantity, this proportion depends on the magnitude of the coat's value, 
Whether the coat is expressed as the equivalent and the linen as relative, or inversely, the linen is expressed as equivalent and the coat as relative value, the magnitude of the coat's value is determined, as ever, by the labor time necessary for its production, independently of its value form. But as soon as the coat takes up the position of the equivalent in the value of expression, the magnitude of its value ceases to be expressed quantitatively. On the contrary, the coat now figures in the value equation merely as a definite quantity of some article. For instance, 40 yards of linen are worth, what, two coats. Because the commodity coat here plays the part of equivalent, because the use value coat counts as the embodiment of value vis-a-vis -vis the linen, a definite number of coats is sufficient to express a definite quantity of value in the linen. Two coats can therefore express the magnitude of value of 40 yards of linen, but they can never express the magnitude of their own value. Because they had a superficial conception of this fact, i.e. because they considered that in the equation of value the equivalent always has the form of a simple quantity of some article, of a use value, Bailey and many of his predecessors and followers were misled into seeing the expression of value as merely a quantitative relation, whereas in fact the equivalent form of a commodity contains no quantitative determinant of value. The first peculiarity which strikes us when we reflect on the equivalent form is this, that use value becomes the form of appearance of its opposite value. The natural form of the commodity becomes its value form, but note well, this substitution only occurs in the case of a commodity B, coat or maize or iron, etc., when some other commodity A, linen for example, enters into a value relation with it, and then only within the limits of this relation. Since a commodity cannot be related to itself as equivalent, and therefore cannot make its own physical shape into the expression of its own value, it must be related to another commodity as equivalent and therefore must make the physical shape of another commodity into its own value form. Let us make this clear with the example of a measure which is applied to commodities as material objects, i.e. as use values. A sugar loaf, because it is a body, is heavy and therefore possesses weight, but we can neither take a look at this weight nor touch it. We then take various pieces of iron whose weight has been determined beforehand. The bodily form of the iron considered for itself, is no more the form of appearance of weight than is the sugar loaf. Nevertheless, in order to express the sugar loaf as a weight, we put it into a relation of weight with the iron. In this relation, the iron counts as a body representing nothing but weight. Quantities of iron therefore serve to measure the weight of the sugar and represent, in relation to the sugar loaf, weight in its pure form, the form of manifestation of weight. This part is played by the iron only within this relation, i.e. within the relation into which the sugar, or any other body whose weight is to be found, enters with the iron. If both objects lacked weight, they could not enter into this relation, hence the one could not serve to express the weight of the other. When we throw both of them into the scales, we see in reality that considered as weight, they are the same, and therefore that taken in the appropriate proportions they have the same weight. Just as the body of the iron, as a measure of weight, represents weight alone in relation to the sugar loaf, so in our expression of value, the body of the coat represents value alone. Here, however, the analogy ceases. In the expression of the weight of the sugar loaf, the iron represents a natural property common to both bodies, their weight. But in the expression of value of the linen, the coat represents a supernatural property, their value, which is something purely social. The relative value form of a commodity, the linen, for example, expresses its value existence as something wholly different from its substance and properties, as the quality of being comparable with a coat, for example. This expression itself therefore indicates that it conceals a social relation. With the equivalent form, the reverse is true. The equivalent form consists precisely in this, that the material commodity itself, the coat, for instance, expresses value just as it is in its everyday life, and is therefore endowed with a form of value by nature itself. Admittedly, this holds good only within the value relation, in which the commodity linen is related to the commodity coat as its equivalent. However, the properties of a thing do not arise from its relations to other things. They are, on the contrary, merely activated by such relations. The coat, therefore, seems to be endowed with its equivalent form, its property of direct exchangeability, by nature, just as much as its property of being heavy or its ability to keep us warm. Hence the mysteriousness of the equivalent form which only impinges on the crude bourgeois vision of the political economist when it confronts him in its fully developed shape, that of money. He then seeks to explain away the mystical character of gold and silver by substituting for them less dazzling commodities, and with ever-renewed satisfaction, reeling off a catalogue of all the inferior commodities which have played the role of equivalent at one time or another. 
He does not suspect that even the simplest expression of value, such as twenty yards of linen equals one coat, already presents the riddle of the equivalent form for us to solve. The body of the commodity, which serves as the equivalent, always figures as the embodiment of abstract human labor, and is always the product of some specific useful and concrete labor. This concrete labor therefore becomes the expression of abstract human labor. If the coat is merely abstract human labor's realization, the tailoring actually realized in it is merely abstract human labor's form of realization. In the expression of value of the linen, the usefulness of tailoring consists not in making clothes and thus also people, but in making a physical object which we at once recognize as value, as a congealed quantity of labor, therefore, which is absolutely indistinguishable from the labor objectified in the value of the linen. In order to act as such a mirror of value, tailoring itself must reflect nothing apart from its own abstract quality of being human labor. Human labor power is expended in the form of tailoring as well as in the form of weaving. Both, therefore, possess the general property of being human labor, and they therefore have to be considered in certain cases, such as the production of value, solely from this point of view. There is nothing mysterious in this, but in the value expression of the commodity, the question is stood on its head. In order to express the fact that, for instance, weaving creates the value of linen through its general property of being human labor, rather than its concrete form as weaving, we contrast it with the concrete labor which produces the equivalent of the linen, namely tailoring. Tailoring is now seen as the tangible form of realization of abstract human labor. The equivalent form therefore possesses a second peculiarity. In it, concrete labor becomes the form of manifestation of its opposite, abstract human labor. But because this concrete labor, tailoring, counts exclusively as the expression of undifferentiated human labor, it possesses the characteristic of being identical with other kinds of labor, such as the labor embodied in the linen. Consequently, although, like all other commodity-producing labor, it is the labor of private individuals, it is nevertheless labor in its directly social form. It is precisely for this reason that it presents itself to us in the shape of a product which is directly exchangeable with other commodities. Thus the equivalent form has a third peculiarity. Private labor takes the form of its opposite, namely labor in its directly social form. The two peculiarities of the equivalent form we have just developed will become still clearer if we go back to the great investigator who was the first to analyze the value form, like so many other forms of thought, society, and nature. I mean Aristotle. In the first place, he states quite clearly that the money form of the commodity is only a more developed aspect of the simple form of value, i.e. of the expression of the value of a commodity in some other commodity chosen at random. For he says, five beds equals one house is indistinguishable from five beds equals a certain amount of money. He further sees that the value relation which provides the framework for this expression of value itself requires that the house should be qualitatively equated with the bed, and that these things, being distinct to the senses, could not be compared with each other as commensurable magnitudes if they lacked this essential identity. There can be no exchange, he says, without equality, and no equality without commensurability. Here, however, he falters, and abandons the further analysis of the form of value. Quote, it is, however, in reality impossible that such unlike things can be commensurable, end quote, i.e. qualitatively equal. The form of equation can only be something foreign to the true nature of the things. It is therefore only a makeshift for practical purposes. Aristotle therefore himself tells us what prevented any further analysis, the lack of a concept of value. What is the homogeneous element, i.e. the common substance, which the house represents from the point of view of the bed, in the value of expression for the bed? Such a thing, in truth, cannot exist, says Aristotle. But why not? Towards the bed, the house represents something equal, insofar as it represents what is really equal both in the bed and in the house, and that is, human labor. However, Aristotle was himself unable to extract this fact that in the form of commodity values all labor is expressed as equal human labor, and therefore as labor of equal quality, by inspection of the form of value, because Greek society was founded on the labor of slaves, hence had as its natural basis the inequality of men and of their labor powers. The secret of the expression of value, namely the equality and equivalence of all kinds of labor because and insofar as they are human labor in general, could not be deciphered until the concept of human equality had already acquired the permanence of a fixed popular opinion. This, however, becomes possible only in a society where the commodity form is the universal form of the product of labor, hence the dominant social relation is the relation between men as possessors of commodities. 
Aristotle's genius is displayed precisely by his discovery of a relation of equality in the value expression of commodities. Only the historical limitation inherent in the society in which he lived prevented him from finding out what in reality this relation of equality consisted of. The simplest form of value considered as a whole. A commodity's simple form of value is contained in its value relation with another commodity of a different kind, i.e. in its exchange relation with the latter. The value of commodity A is qualitatively expressed by the direct exchangeability of commodity B with commodity A. It is quantitatively expressed by the exchangeability of a specific quantity of commodity B with a given quantity of commodity A. In other words, the value of a commodity is independently expressed through its presentation as exchange value. When at the beginning of this chapter we said in the customary manner that a commodity is both a use value and an exchange value, this was, strictly speaking, wrong. A commodity is a use value or object of utility and a value. It appears as a twofold thing it really is as soon as its value possesses its own particular form of manifestation, which is distinct from its natural form. This form of manifestation is exchange value, and the commodity never has this form when looked at in isolation, but only when it is in a value relation, or an exchange relation, with a second commodity of a different kind. Once we know this, our manner of speaking does no harm. It serves rather as an abbreviation. Our analysis has shown that the form of value that is, the expression of the value of a commodity, arises from the nature of commodity value, as opposed to value and its magnitude arising from their mode of expression as exchange value. This second view is the delusion both of the mercantilists, and people like Ferrier, Ganil, etc., who have made a modern rehash of mercantilism, and their antipodes, the modern bagmen of free trade, such as Bastiat and his associates. The mercantilists place their main emphasis on the qualitative side of the expression of value, hence on the equivalent form of the commodity, which in its finished form is money. The modern peddlers of free trade, on the other hand, who must get rid of their commodities at any price, stress the quantitative side of the relative form of value. For them, accordingly, there exists neither value nor magnitude of value anywhere except in its expression by means of the exchange relation, that is, in the daily list of prices current on the stock exchange. The Scotsman Macleod, whose function it is to trick out the confused idea of Lombard Street and the most learned finery, is a successful cross between the superstitious mercantilists and the enlightened peddlers of free trade. A close scrutiny of the expression of the value of commodity A, contained in the value relation of A to B, has shown that within that relation, the natural form of commodity A figures only as the aspect of use value, while the natural form of B figures only as the form of value, or aspect of value. The internal opposition between use value and value, hidden within the commodity, is therefore represented on the surface by an external opposition, i.e. by a relation between two commodities such that one commodity, whose own value is supposed to be expressed, counts directly only as a use value, whereas the other commodity, in which that value is to be expressed, counts directly only as exchange value. Hence appearance of the opposition between use value and value, which is contained within the commodity. The product of labor is an object of utility in all states of society, but it is only a historically specific epoch of development which presents the labor expended in the production of a useful article as an objective property of that article, i.e. as its value. It is only then that the product of labor becomes transformed into a commodity. It therefore follows that the simple form of value of the commodity is at the same time the simple form of value of the product of labor, and also that the development of the commodity form coincides with the development of the value form we perceive straight away the insufficiency of the simple form of value. It is an embryonic form which must undergo a series of metamorphoses before it can ripen into the price form. The expression of the value of commodity A, in terms of any other commodity B, merely distinguishes the value of A from its use value, and therefore merely places A in an exchange relation with any particular single different kind of commodity, instead of representing A's qualitative equality with all other commodities and its quantitative proportionality to them. To the simple relative form of a value of a commodity, there corresponds the single equivalent form of another commodity. Thus, in the relative expression of the value of the linen, the coat only possesses the form of equivalent, the form of direct exchangeability, in relation to this one individual commodity, the linen. Nevertheless, the simple form of value automatically passes over into a more complete form. Admittedly, this simple form only expresses the value of a commodity A in one commodity of another kind. But what this second commodity is whether it is a coat, iron, corn, etc., is a matter of complete indifference. 
Therefore, different simple expressions of the value of one and the same commodity arise according to whether that commodity enters into a value relation with this second commodity or another kind of commodity. The number of such possible expressions is limited only by the number of the different kinds of commodities distinct from it. The isolated expression of A's value is thus transformed into the indefinitely expandable series of different simple expressions of that value. Subsection B. The total or expanded form of value. Z commodity A equals U commodity B, or equals V commodity C, or equals W commodity D, or equals X commodity E, or etc. 20 yards of linen equals one coat, or 10 pounds of tea, or 40 pounds of coffee, or one quarter of corn, or two ounces of gold, or one half ton of iron, or etc. 1. The expanded relative form of value. The value of a commodity, the linen for example, is now expressed in terms of innumerable other members of the world of commodities. Every other physical commodity now becomes a mirror of the linen's value. It is thus that this value first shows itself as being, in reality, a congealed quantity of undifferentiated human labor. For the labor which creates it is now explicitly presented as labor which counts as the equal of every other sort of human labor, whatever natural form it may possess, hence whether it is objectified in a coat, in corn, in iron, or in gold. The linen, by virtue of the form of value, no longer stands in a social relation with merely one other kind of commodity, but with the whole world of commodities as well. As a commodity, it is a citizen of that world. At the same time, the endless series of expressions of its value implies that, from the point of view of the value of the commodity, the particular form of use value in which it appears is a matter of indifference. In the first form, 20 yards of linen equals one coat, it might well be a purely accidental occurrence that these two commodities are exchangeable in a specific quantitative relation. In the second form, on the contrary, the background to this accidental appearance, essentially different from it and determining it, immediately shines through. The value of the linen remains unaltered in magnitude, whether expressed in coats, coffee, or iron, or in innumerable different commodities, belonging to as many different owners. The accidental relation between two individual commodity owners disappears. It becomes plain that it is not the exchange of commodities which regulates the magnitude of their values, but rather the reverse the magnitude of the value of commodities, which regulates the proportion in which they can exchange. The Particular Equivalent Form Each commodity, such as a coat, tea, iron, etc., figures in the expression of value of the linen as an equivalent, hence as a physical object possessing value. The specific natural form of each of these commodities is now a particular equivalent form alongside many others. In the same way, the many specific, concrete, and useful kinds of labor contained in the physical commodities now count as the same number of particular forms of realization, or manifestation of human labor in general. Defects of the total or expanded form of value Firstly, the relative expression of value of the commodity is incomplete, because the series of its representations never comes to an end. The chain of which each equation of value is a link is liable at any moment to be lengthened by a newly created commodity, which will provide the material for a fresh expression of value. Secondly, it is a motley mosaic of disparate and unconnected expressions of value. And lastly, if, as must be the case, the relative value of each commodity is expressed in this expanded form, it follows that the relative form of value of each commodity is an endless series of expressions of value which are all different from the relative form of value of every other commodity. The defects of the expanded relative form of value are reflected in the corresponding equivalent form. Since the natural form of each particular kind of commodity is one particular equivalent form, amongst innumerable other equivalent forms, the only equivalent forms which exist are limited ones, and each of them excludes all the others. Similarly, the specific, concrete, useful kind of labor contained in each particular commodity equivalent is only a particular kind of labor and therefore not an exhaustive form of appearance of human labor in general. It is true that the completed or total form of appearance of human labor is constituted by the totality of its particular forms of appearance, but in that case it has no single, unified form of appearance. The expanded relative form of value is, however, nothing but the sum of the simple relative expressions or equations of the first form, such as 20 yards of linen equals one coat, 20 yards of linen equals 10 pounds of tea, etc. However, each of these equations implies the identical equation in reverse. One coat equals 20 yards of linen, 10 pounds of tea equals 20 yards of linen, etc. 
In fact, when a person exchanges his linen for many other commodities, and thus expresses its value in a series of other commodities, it necessarily follows that the other owners of commodities exchange them for the linen, and therefore express the values of their various commodities in one and the same third commodity, the linen. If, then, we reverse the series, 20 yards of linen equals one coat, or equals 10 pounds of tea, etc., i.e., if we give the expression to the converse correlation already implied in the series, we get... Subsection C. The General Form of Value. One coat, ten pounds of tea, forty pounds of coffee, one quarter of corn, two ounces of gold, one half ton of iron, X commodity A, etc., all equal twenty yards of linen. The Changed Character of the Form of Value. The commodities now present their values to us. One, in a simple form, because in a single commodity. Two, in a unified form because in the same commodity each time. Their form of value is simple and common to all, hence general. The two previous forms, let's call them A and B, only amounted to the expression of the value of a commodity as something distinct from its own use value, or its physical shape as a commodity. The first form, A, produced equations like this. One coat equals 20 yards of linen. 10 pounds of tea equals one half ton of iron. The value of the coat is expressed as comparable with the linen, that of the tea as comparable with the iron. But to be comparable with linen and with iron, these expressions of the value of the coat and tea is to be as different as linen is from iron. This form, it is plain, appears in practice only in the early stages, when the products of labor are converted into commodities by accidental occasional exchanges. The second form, B, distinguishes the value of a commodity from its own use value more adequately than the first. For the value of the coat now stands in contrast with its natural form in all possible shapes, in the sense that it is equated with linen, iron, tea, in short, with everything but itself. On the other hand, any expression of value common to all commodities is directly excluded, for in the expression of value of each commodity, all other commodities now appear only in the form of equivalence. The expanded form of value comes into actual existence for the first time when a particular product of labor, such as cattle, is no longer exceptionally but habitually exchanged for various other commodities. The new form we have just obtained expresses the values of the world of commodities through one single kind of commodity set apart from the rest, through the linen, for example, and thus represents the values of all commodities by means of their quality with linen. Through its equation with linen, the value of every commodity is now not only differentiated from its own use value, but from all use values, and is, by that very fact, expressed as that which is common to all commodities. By this form, commodities are, for the first time, really brought into relation with each other as values, or permitted to appear to each other as exchange values. The two earlier forms express the value of each commodity either in terms of a single commodity of a different kind or in a series of many commodities which differ from the first one. In both cases, it is the private task, so to speak, of the individual commodity to give itself a form of value, and it accomplishes this task without the aid of the others, which play towards it the merely passive role of equivalent. The general form of value, on the other hand, can only arise as the joint contribution of the whole world of commodities. A commodity only acquires a general expression of its value if, at the same time, all other commodities express their values in the same equivalent and every newly emergent commodity must follow suit. It thus becomes evident that because the objectivity of commodities as values is the purely social existence of these things, it can only be expressed through the whole range of their social relations. Consequently, the form of their value must possess social validity. In this form, when they are all counted as comparable with the linen, all commodities appear not only as qualitatively equal, as values in general, but also as values of quantitatively comparable magnitude. Because the magnitudes of their values are expressed in one and the same material, the linen, these magnitudes are now reflected in each other. For instance, 10 pounds of tea equals 20 yards of linen, and 40 pounds of coffee equals 20 yards of linen. Therefore, 10 pounds of tea equals 40 pounds of coffee. In other words, one pound of coffee contains only a quarter as much of the substance of value, that is, labor, as one pound of tea. The general relative form of value imposes the character of universal equivalent on the linen which is the commodity excluded, as equivalent, from the whole world of commodities. Its own natural form is the form assumed in common by the values of all commodities. It is therefore directly exchangeable with all other commodities. The physical form of the linen counts as the visible incarnation, the social chrysalis state of all human labor. 
Weaving, the private labor which produces linen, acquires as a result a general social form, the form of equality with all other kinds of labor. The innumerable equations of which the general form of value is composed equate the labor realized in the linen with the labor contained in every other commodity in turn, and they thus convert weaving into the general form of appearance of undifferentiated human labor. In this manner, the labor objectified in the values of commodities is not just presented negatively, as labor in which abstraction is made from all the concrete forms and useful properties of actual work. Its own positive nature is explicitly brought out, Namely, the fact that it is the reduction of all kinds of actual labor to their common character of being human labor in general, of being the expenditure of human labor power. The general value form, in which all the products of labor are presented as mere congealed quantities of undifferentiated human labor, shows by its very structure that it is the social expression of the world of commodities. In this way, it is made plain that within this world the general human character of labor forms its specific social character. The development of the relative and equivalent forms of value, their interdependence. The degree of development of the relative form of value and that of the equivalent form correspond. But we must bear in mind that the development of the equivalent form is only the expression and the result of the development of the relative form. The simple or isolated relative form of value of one commodity converts some other commodity into an isolated equivalent. The expanded form of relative value, that expression of the value of one commodity in terms of all other commodities, imprints those other commodities with a form of particular equivalents of different kinds. Finally, a particular kind of commodity acquires the form of universal equivalent, because all other commodities make it the material embodiment of their uniform and universal form of value. But the antagonism between the relative form of value and the equivalent form, the two poles of the value form, also develops concomitantly with the development of the value form itself. The first form, 20 yards of linen equals one coat, already contains this antagonism, without as yet fixing it. According to whether we read the same equation backwards or forwards, each of the two commodity poles, such as the linen and the coat, is to be found in the relative form on one occasion and in the equivalent form on the other occasion. Here it is still difficult to keep hold of the polar antagonism. In form B, only one commodity at a time can completely expand its relative value, and it only possesses this expanded relative form of value because and insofar as all other commodities are, with respect to it, equivalent. Here we can no longer reverse the equation 20 yards of linen equals one coat without altering its whole character and converting it from the expanded form into the general form of value. Finally, the last form, C, gives to the world of commodities a general social relative form of value, because and insofar as all commodities except one are thereby excluded from the equivalent form. A single commodity, the linen, therefore has the form of direct exchangeability with all other commodities. In other words, it has a directly social form because and insofar as no other commodity is in this situation. The commodity that figures as universal equivalent is on the other hand excluded from the uniform and therefore universal relative form of value. If the linen or any other commodity serving as universal equivalent were at the same time to share in the relative form of value, it would have to serve as its own equivalent. We should then have 20 yards of linen equals 20 yards of linen, a tautology in which neither the value nor its magnitude is expressed. In order to express the relative value of the universal equivalent, we must rather reverse the form C. This equivalent has no relative form of value in common with other commodities. Its value is rather expressed relatively in the infinite series of all other physical commodities. Thus the expanded relative form of value, or form B, now appears as the specific relative form of value of the equivalent commodity. The transition from the general form of value to the money form. The universal equivalent form is a form of value in general. It can therefore be assumed by any commodity, on the other hand, a commodity is only to be found in the universal equivalent form, form C, if and insofar as it is excluded from the ranks of all other commodities as being their equivalent. Only when this exclusion becomes finally restricted to a specific kind of commodity does the uniform relative form of value of the world of commodities attain objective fixedness and general social validity. The specific kind of commodity with whose natural form the equivalent form is socially interwoven now becomes the money commodity or serves as money. It becomes its specific social function and consequently gets social monopoly to play the part of universal equivalent within the world of commodities. 
Among the commodities which in form B figure as particular equivalents of the linen, and in form C express in common their relative values in linen, there is one in particular which has historically conquered this advantageous position, gold. If then in form C we replace the linen by gold, we get... Subsection D. The money form. 20 yards of linen, or one coat, or 10 pounds of tea, or 40 pounds of coffee, or one quarter of corn, or one half ton of iron, or X commodity A, each equal two ounces of gold. Fundamental changes have taken place in the course of the transition from form A to form B, and from form B to form C. As against this, form D differs not at all from form C, except that now, instead of linen, gold has assumed the universal equivalent form. Gold is in form D what linen was in form C, the universal equivalent. The advance consists only in that the form of direct and universal exchangeability, in other words, the universal equivalent form, has now, by social custom, finally become entwined with the specific natural form of the commodity gold. Gold confronts the other commodities as money only because it previously confronted them as a commodity. Like all other commodities, it also functioned as an equivalent, either as a single equivalent in isolated exchanges or as a particular equivalent alongside other commodity equivalents. Gradually, it began to serve as a universal equivalent in narrower or wider fields. As soon as it had won a monopoly of this position in the expression of value for the world of commodities, it became the money commodity, and only then, when it had already become the money commodity, did Form D become distinct from Form C, and the general form of value come to be transformed into the money form. The simple expression of the relative value of a single commodity, such as linen, in a commodity which is already functioning as the money commodity, such as gold, is the price form. The price form of the linen is therefore 20 yards of linen equals 2 ounces of gold. Or if 2 ounces of gold when coined are 2 pounds, 20 yards of linen equals 2 pounds. The only difficulty in the concept of the money form is that of grasping the universal equivalent form, and hence the general form of value as such, form C. Form C can be reduced by working backwards to form B, the expanded form of value, and its constitutive element is form A, 20 yards of linen equals one coat, or X commodity A equals Y commodity B. The simple commodity form is therefore the germ of the money form. Section 4. The Fetishism of the Commodity and Its Secret A commodity appears at first sight, an extremely obvious trivial thing but its analysis brings out that it is a very strange thing, abounding in metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties. So far as it is a use value, there is nothing mysterious about it, whether we consider it from the point of view that by its properties it satisfies human needs or that it first takes on these properties as the product of human labor. It is absolutely clear that by this activity, man changes the forms of the materials of nature in such a way as to make them useful to him. The form of wood, for instance, is altered if a table is made out of it. Nevertheless, the table continues to be the wood, an ordinary sensuous thing. But as soon as it emerges as a commodity, it changes into a thing which transcends sensuousness. It not only stands with its feet on the ground, but in relation to all other commodities, it stands on its head and evolves out of its wooden brain grotesque ideas, far more wonderful than if it were to begin dancing of its own free will. The mystical character of the commodity does not therefore arise from its use value. Just as little does it proceed from the nature of the determinants of value. For in the first place, however varied the useful kinds of labor or productive activities, it is a physiological fact that they are functions of the human organism, and that each such function, whatever may be its nature or its form, is essentially the expenditure of human brain, nerves, muscles, and sense organs. Secondly, with regard to the foundation of the quantitative determination of value, namely the duration of that expenditure or the quantity of labor, that is quite palpably different from its quality. In all situations, the labor time it costs to produce the means of subsistence must necessarily concern mankind, although not to the same degree at different stages of development. And finally, as soon as men start to work for each other in any way, their labor also assumes a social form. Whence then arises the enigmatic character of the product of labor, as soon as it assumes the form of a commodity? Clearly it arises from this form itself. The equality of the kinds of human labor takes on a physical form in the equal objectivity of the products of labor as values. The measure of the expenditure of human labor power by its duration takes on the form of a magnitude of the value of the products of labor. And finally, the relationships between the producers, within which the social characteristics of their labors are manifested, take on the form of a social relation between the products of labor. 
The mysterious character of the commodity form consists therefore simply in the fact that the commodity reflects the social characteristics of men's own labor as objective characteristics of the products of labor themselves, as the socio-natural properties of these things. Hence it also reflects the social relation of the producers to the sum total of labor as a social relation between objects, a relation which exists apart from and outside the producers. Through this substitution, the products of labor become commodities, sensuous things which are at the same time supersensible or social. In the same way, the impression made by a thing on the optic nerve is perceived not as a subjective excitation of that nerve, but as the objective form of a thing outside the eye. In the act of seeing, of course, light is really transmitted from one thing, the external object, to another thing, the eye. It is a physical relation between physical things. As against this, the commodity form and the value relation of the products of labor within which it appears have absolutely no connection with the physical nature of the commodity and the material relations arising out of this. It is nothing but the definite social relation between men themselves, which assumes here, for them, the fantastic form of a relation between things. In order, therefore, to find an analogy, we must take flight to the misty realm of religion. There, the products of the human brain appear as autonomous figures endowed with the life of their own, which enter into relations both with each other and with the human race. So it is in the world of commodities with the products of men's hands. I call this the fetishism, which attaches itself to the products of labor as soon as they are produced as commodities, and is therefore inseparable from the production of commodities. As the foregoing analysis has already demonstrated, this fetishism of the world of commodities arises from the peculiar social character of the labor which produces them. Objects of utility become commodities only because they are the products of the labor of private individuals who work independently of each other. The sum total of the labor of all these private individuals forms the aggregate labor of society. Since the producers do not come into social contact until they exchange the products of their labor, the specific social characteristics of their private labors appear only within this exchange. In other words, the labor of the private individual manifests itself as an element of the total labor of society only through the relations which the act of exchange establishes between the products, and through their mediation between the producers. To the producers, therefore, the social relations between their private labors appear as what they are, i.e. they do not appear as direct social relations between persons in their work, but rather as material relations between persons and social relations between things. It is only by being exchanged that the products of labor acquire a socially uniform objectivity as values, which is distinct from their sensuously varied objectivity as articles of utility. This division of the product of labor into a useful thing and a thing possessing value appears in practice only when exchange has already acquired a sufficient extension and importance to allow useful things to be produced for the purpose of being exchanged, so that their character as values has already to be taken into consideration during production. From this moment on, the labor of the individual producer acquires a twofold social character. On the one hand, it must, as a definite useful kind of labor, satisfy a definite social need, and thus maintain its position as an element of the total labor, as a branch of the social division of labor which originally sprang up spontaneously. On the other hand, it can satisfy the manifold needs of the individual producer himself only insofar as every particular kind of useful private labor can be exchanged with, i.e. counts as the equal of, every other kind of useful private labor. Equality in the full sense between different kinds of labor can be arrived at only if we abstract from their real inequality, if we reduce them to the characteristic that they have in common, that of being the expenditure of human labor power, or human labor in the abstract. The private producer's brain reflects this twofold social character of his labor only in the forms which appear in practical intercourse, in the exchange of products. Hence, the socially useful character of his private labor is reflected in the form that the product of labor has to be useful to others. And the social character of the equality of the various kinds of labor is reflected in the form of the common character, as values, possessed by these materially different things, the products of labor. Men do not, therefore, bring the products of their labor into relation with each other as values because they see these objects merely as the material integuments of homogeneous human labor. The reverse is true. By equating their different products to each other in exchange as values, they equate their different kinds of labor as human labor. They do this without being aware of it. Value, therefore, does not have its description branded on its forehead. It rather transforms every product of labor into a social hieroglyphic. 
Later on, men try to decipher the hieroglyphic to get behind the secret of their own social product, for the characteristic which objects of utility have of being values is as much men's social product as is their language. The belated scientific discovery that the products of labor, insofar as they are values, are merely the material expressions of the human labor expended to produce them, marks an epoch in the history of mankind's development, but by no means banishes the semblance of objectivity possessed by the social characteristics of labor. Something which is only valid for this particular form of production, the production of commodities, namely the fact that the specific social character of private labors, carried on independently of each other, consists in their equality as human labor, and in the product assumes the form of the existence of value, appears to those caught up in the relations of commodity production, and this is true both before and after the above-mentioned scientific discovery, to be just as ultimately valid as the fact that the scientific dissection of the air into its component parts left the atmosphere itself unaltered in its physical configuration. What initially concerns producers in practice when they make an exchange is how much of some other product they get for their own. In what proportions can the products be exchanged? As soon as these proportions have attained a certain customary stability, they appear to result from the nature of the products, so that, for instance, one ton of iron and two ounces of gold appear to be equal in value in the same way as a pound of gold and a pound of iron are equal in weight, despite their different physical and chemical properties. The value character of the products of human labor becomes firmly established only when they act as magnitudes of value. These magnitudes vary continually, independently of the will, foreknowledge, and actions of the exchangers. Their own movement within society has, for them, the form of a movement made by things. And these things, far from being under their control, in fact control them. The production of commodities must be fully developed before the scientific conviction emerges, from experience itself, that all the different kinds of private labor, which are carried on independently of each other and yet, as spontaneously developed branches of the social division of labor, are in a situation of all-round dependence on each other, are continually being reduced to the quantitative proportions in which society requires them. The reason for this reduction is that in the midst of the accidental and ever-fluctuating exchange relations between the products, the labor time socially necessary to produce them asserts itself as a regulative law of nature. In the same way, the law of gravity asserts itself when a person's house collapses on top of him. The determination of the magnitude of value by labor time is therefore a secret hidden under the apparent movements in the relative values of commodities. Its discovery destroys the semblance of the merely accidental determination of the magnitude of the value of the product of labor, but by no means abolishes that determination's material form. Reflection on the forms of human life, hence also scientific analysis of those forms, takes a course directly opposite to their real development. Reflections begin post-festum, and therefore with the results of the process of development already to hand. The forms which stamp products as commodities, and which are therefore the preliminary requirements for the circulation of commodities, already possess the fixed quality of natural forms of social life before man seeks to give an account, not of their historical character, for in his eyes they are immutable, but of their content and meaning. Consequently, it was solely the analysis of the prices of commodities which led to the determination of the magnitude of value, and solely the common expression of all commodities in money which led to the establishment of their character as values. It is, however, precisely this finished form of the world of commodities, the money form, which conceals the social character of private labor and the social relations between the individual workers by making those relations appear as relations between material objects instead of revealing them plainly. If I state that coats or boots stand in relation to linen because the latter is a universal incarnation of abstract human labor, the absurdity of this statement is self-evident. Nevertheless, when the producers of coats and boots bring these commodities into a relation with linen, or with gold and silver, and this makes no difference here, as the universal equivalent, the relation between their own private labor and the collective labor of society appears to them in exactly this absurd form. The categories of bourgeois economics consist precisely of forms of this kind. They are forms of thought which are socially valid and therefore objective for the relations of production belonging to this historically determined mode of social production, i.e. commodity production. The whole mystery of commodities, all the magic and necromancy that surrounds the products of labor on the basis of commodity production, vanishes, therefore, as soon as we come to other forms of production. As political economists are fond of Robinson Crusoe stories, let us first look at Robinson on his island. Undemanding though he is by nature, he still has needs to satisfy, and must therefore perform useful labors of various kinds. He must make tools, knock together furniture, tame llamas, fish, hunt, and so on. Of his prayers and the like, we take no account here, since our friend takes pleasure in them, 
and sees them as a recreation. Despite the diversity of his productive functions, he knows that they are only different forms of activity of one and the same Robinson, hence only different modes of human labor. Necessity itself compels him to divide his time with precision between his different functions. Whether one function occupies a greater space in his total activity than another depends on the magnitude of the difficulties to be overcome in attaining the useful effect aimed at. Our friend Robinson Crusoe learns this by experience, and having saved a watch, ledger, ink, and pen from the shipwreck, he soon begins, like a good Englishman, to keep a set of books. His stock book contains a catalog of the useful objects he possesses, of the various operations necessary for their production, and finally of the labor time that specific quantities of these products have on average cost him. All the relations between Robinson and these objects that form his self-created wealth are here so simple and transparent that even Mr. Sedley Taylor could understand them. And yet those relations contain all the essential determinants of value. Let us now transport ourselves from Robinson's Island, bathed in light, to medieval Europe shrouded in darkness. Here, instead of the independent man, we find everyone dependent, serfs and lords, vassals and suzerains, laymen and clerics. Personal dependence characterizes the social relations of material production as much as it does the other spheres of life based on that production. But precisely because relations of personal dependence form the given social foundation, there is no need for labor and its products to assume a fantastic form different from their reality. They take the shape, in the transactions of society, of services in kind and payments in kind. The natural form of labor, its particularity, and not as in a society based on commodity production, its universality, is here its immediate social form. The calve can be measured by time just as well as the labor which produces commodities, but every serf knows that what he expends in the service of his lord is a specific quantity of his own personal labor power. The tithe owed to the priest is more clearly apparent than his blessing. Whatever we may think, then, of the different roles in which men confront each other in such a society, the social relations between individuals in the performance of their labor appear at all events as their own personal relations, and are not disguised as social relations between things, between the products of labor. For an example of labor in common, i.e. directly associated labor, we do not need to go back to the spontaneously developed form which we find at the threshold of the history of all civilized peoples. We have one nearer to hand in the patriarchal rural industry of a peasant family which produces corn, cattle, yarn, linen, and clothing for its own use. These things confront the family as so many products of its collective labor, but they do not confront each other as commodities. The different kinds of labor which create these products, such as tilling the fields, tending the cattle, spinning, weaving, and making clothes, are already in their natural form social functions. For they are functions of the family, which just as much as a society based on commodity production possesses its own spontaneously developed division of labor. The distribution of labor within the family and the labor time expended by the individual members of the family are regulated by differences of sex and age as well as by the seasonal variations in the natural conditions of labor. The fact that the expenditure of the individual labor powers is measured by duration appears here by its very nature as a social characteristic of labor itself, because the individual labor powers, by their very nature, act only as instruments of the joint labor power of the family. Let's finally imagine for a change an association of free men, working with the means of production held in common, and expending their many different forms of labor power in full self-awareness as one single social labor force. All the characteristics of Robinson's labor are repeated here, but with the difference that they are social instead of individual. All Robinson's products were exclusively the result of his own personal labor, and they were therefore directly objects of utility for him personally. The total product of our imagined association is a social product. One part of this product serves as fresh means of production and remains social, but another part is consumed by the members of the association as means of subsistence. This part must therefore be divided amongst them. The way this division is made will vary with the particular kind of social organization of production and the corresponding level of social development attained by the producers. We should assume, but only for the sake of a parallel with the production of commodities, that the share of each individual producer in the means of subsistence is determined by his labor time. Labor time would in that case play a double part. Its apportionment in accordance with a definite social plan maintains the correct proportion between the different functions of labor and the various needs of the associations. On the other hand, labor time also serves as a measure of the part taken by each individual in the common labor and of his share in the part of the total product destined for individual consumption. The social relations of the individual producers, both towards their labor and the products of their labor, are here transparent in their simplicity, 
in production as well as in distribution. For a society of commodity producers, whose general social relation of production consists in the fact that they treat their products as commodities, hence as values, and in this material form bring their individual private labors into relation with each other as homogeneous human labor, Christianity, with its religious cult of man in the abstract, more particularly in its bourgeois development, i.e. in Protestantism, Deism, etc., is the most fitting form of religion. In the ancient Asiatic, classical antique, and other such modes of production, the transformation of the product into a commodity, and therefore men's existence as producers of commodities, plays a subordinate role, which, however, increases in importance as these communities approach nearer and nearer to the stage of their dissolution. Trading nations, properly so called, exist only in the interstices of the ancient world, like the gods of Epicurus in the Intermundia, or Jews in the pores of Polish society. Those ancient social organisms of production are much more simple and transparent than those of bourgeois society, but they are founded either on the immaturity of man as an individual when he has not yet torn himself loose from the umbilical cord of his natural species connection with other men, or on direct relations of dominance and servitude. They are conditioned by a low stage of development of the productive powers of labor and correspondingly limited relations between men within the process of creating and reproducing the material life, hence also limited relations between man and nature. These real limitations are reflected in the ancient worship of nature and in other elements of tribal religions. The religious reflections of the real world can in any case vanish only when the practical relations of everyday life between man and man and man and nature generally present themselves to him and in a transparent and rational form. The veil is not removed from the countenance of the social life process, i.e. the process of material production, until it becomes production by freely associated men, and stands under their conscious and planned control. This, however, requires that society possess a material foundation, or a series of material conditions of existence, which in their turn are the natural and spontaneous product of a long and tormented historical development. Political economy has indeed analyzed value in its magnitude, however incompletely, and has uncovered the content concealed within these forms, but it has never once asked the question why this content has assumed that particular form, that is to say why labor is expressed in value, and why the measurement of labor by its duration is expressed in the magnitude of the value of the product. These formulas, which bear the unmistakable stamp of belonging to a social formation in which the process of production has mastery over man instead of the opposite, appear to the political economist's bourgeois consciousness to be as much a self-evident and nature-imposed necessity as productive labor itself. Hence, the pre-bourgeois forms of the social organization of production are treated by political economy in much the same way as the fathers of the church treated pre-Christian religions. The degree to which some economists are misled by the fetishism attached to the world of commodities or by the objective appearance of the social characteristics of labor is shown, among other things, by the dull and tedious dispute over the part played by nature in the formation of exchange value. Since exchange value is a definite social manner of expressing the labor bestowed on a thing, it can have no more natural content than has, for example, the rate of exchange. As the commodity form is the most general and the most undeveloped form of bourgeois production, it makes its appearance at an early date, though not in the same predominant and therefore characteristic manner as nowadays. Hence, its fetish character is still relatively easy to penetrate. But when we come to more concrete forms, even this appearance of simplicity vanishes. Where did the illusions of the monetary system come from? The adherents of the monetary system did not see gold and silver as representing money as a social relation of production, but in the form of natural objects with peculiar social properties. And what of modern political economy, which looks down so disdainfully on the monetary system? Does not its fetishism become quite palpable when it deals with capital? How long is it since the disappearance of the physiocratic illusion that ground rent grows out of the soil, not out of society? But, to avoid anticipating, we will content ourselves here with one more example relating to the commodity form itself. If commodities could speak, they would say this. Our use value may interest men, but it does not belong to us as objects. What does belong to us as objects, however, is our value. Our own intercourse as commodities proves it. We relate to each other merely as exchange values. Now listen to how those commodities speak through the mouth of the economist. Quote, Value, i.e. exchange value, is a property of things. Riches, i.e. use value of man. Value in this sense necessarily implies exchanges. Riches do not. End quote. Quote, Riches, use value, are the attribute of man. 
Value is the attribute of commodities. A man or a community is rich, a pearl or a diamond is valuable. A pearl or a diamond is valuable as a pearl or a diamond. End quote. So far, no chemist has ever discovered exchange value either in a pearl or a diamond. The economists who have discovered this chemical substance and who lay special claim to critical acumen nevertheless find that the use value of material objects belongs to them independently of their material properties, while their value, on the other hand, forms a part of them as objects. What confirms them in this view is the peculiar circumstance that the use value of a thing is realized without exchange, i.e. in the direct relation between the thing and man, while inversely its value is realized only in exchange, i.e. in a social process. Who would not call to mind at this point the advice given by good Dogberry to the night watchman Seacol? To be a well-favored man is the gift of fortune, but reading and writing comes by nature. Chapter 2. The Process of Exchange Commodities cannot themselves go to market and perform exchanges in their own right. We must, therefore, have recourse to their guardians, who are the possessors of commodities. Commodities are things and therefore lack the power to resist man. If they are unwilling, he can use force. In other words, he can take possession of them. In order that these objects may enter into relation with each other as commodities, their guardians must place themselves in relation to one another as persons whose will resides in those objects and must behave in such a way that each does not appropriate the commodity of the other and alienate his own except through an act to which both parties consent. The guardians must therefore recognize each other as owners of private property. This juridical relation, whose form is the contract, whether as part of a developed legal system or not, is a relation between two wills which mirrors the economic relation. The content of this juridical relation, or the relation of two wills, is itself determined by the economic relation. Here, the persons exist for one another merely as representatives, and hence owners, of commodities. As we proceed to develop our investigation, we shall find, in general, that the characters who appear on the economic stage are merely personifications of economic relations. It is as the bearers of these economic relations that they come into contact with each other. What chiefly distinguishes a commodity from its owner is the fact that every other commodity counts for it only as the form of appearance of its own value. A born leveler and cynic, it is always ready to exchange not only soul, but body, with each and every other commodity be it more repulsive than Marie Tornes herself. The owner makes up for this lack in the commodity of a sense of the concrete physical body of the other commodity by his own five and more senses. For the owner, his commodity possesses no direct use value. Otherwise, he would not bring it to market. It has use value for others, but for himself its only direct use value is as a bearer of exchange value and consequently a means of exchange. He therefore makes up his mind to sell it in return for commodities whose use value is of service to him. All commodities are non-use values for their owners, and use values for their non-owners. Consequently, they must all change hands. But this changing of hands constitutes their exchange, and their exchange puts them in relation with each other as values, and realizes them as values. Hence, commodities must be realized as values before they can be realized as use values. On the other hand, they must stand the test as use values before they can be realized as values, for the labor expended on them only counts insofar as it is expended in a form which is useful for others. However, only the act of exchange can prove whether that labor is useful for others, and its product consequently capable of satisfying the needs of others. The owner of a commodity is prepared to part with it only in return for other commodities whose use value satisfies his own need. So far, exchange is merely an individual process for him. On the other hand, he desires to realize his commodity as a value in any other suitable commodity of the same value. It does not matter to him whether his own commodity has any use value for the owner of the other commodity or not. From this point of view, exchange is for him a general social process. But the same process cannot be simultaneously for all owners of commodities, both exclusively individual and exclusively social in general. Let us look at the matter a little more closely. To the owner of a commodity, every other commodity counts as the particular equivalent of his own commodity. Hence, his own commodity is the universal equivalent for all the others. But since this applies to every owner, there is in fact no commodity acting as universal equivalent, and the commodities possess no general relative form of value under which they can be equated as values and have the magnitude of their values compared. Therefore, they definitely do not confront each other as commodities, but as products or use values only. 
In their difficulties, our commodity owners think like Faust. In the beginning was the deed. They have therefore already acted before thinking. The natural laws of the commodity have manifested themselves in the natural instinct of the owners of commodities. They can only bring their commodities into relation as values and therefore as commodities by bringing them into an opposing relation with some one other commodity, which serves as the universal equivalent. We have already reached that result by our analysis of the commodity, but only the action of society can turn a particular commodity into the universal equivalent. The social action of all other commodities, therefore, sets apart the particular commodity in which they all represent their values. The natural form of this commodity thereby becomes the socially recognized equivalent form. Through the agency of the social process, it becomes the specific social function of the commodity which has been set apart to be the universal equivalent. It thus becomes money. Quote, These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. End quote from Revelation 17.13. Quote, and that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. End quote from Revelation 13.17. Money necessarily crystallizes out of the process of exchange, in which different products of labor are in fact equated with each other, and thus converted into commodities. The historical broadening and deepening of the phenomenon of exchange develops the opposition between use value and value, which is latent in the nature of the commodity. The need to give an external expression to this opposition for the purposes of commercial intercourse produces the drive towards an independent form of value, which finds neither rest nor peace until an independent form has been achieved by the differentiation of commodities into commodities and money. At the same rate, then, as the transformation of the products of labor into commodities is accomplished, one particular commodity is transformed into money. The direct exchange of products has the form of the simple expression of value in one respect, but not as yet in another. That form was X commodity A equals Y commodity B. The form of the direct exchange of products is X use value A equals Y use value B. The articles A and B, in this case, are not as yet commodities, but become so only through the act of exchange. The first way in which an object of utility attains the possibility of becoming an exchange value is to exist as a non-use value, as a quantum of use value superfluous to the immediate needs of its owner. Things are in themselves external to man, and therefore alienable. In order that this alienation may be reciprocal, it is only necessary for men to agree tacitly to treat each other as the private owners of those alienable things, and precisely for that reason as persons who are independent of each other. But this relationship of reciprocal isolation and foreignness does not exist for the members of a primitive community of natural origin, whether it takes the form of a patriarchal family, an ancient Indian commune, or an Inca state. The exchange of commodities begins where communities have their boundaries, at their points of contact with other communities, or with members of the latter. However, as soon as products have become commodities in the external relations of a community, they also, by reaction, become commodities in the internal life of the community. Their quantitative exchange relation is at first determined purely by chance. They become exchangeable through the mutual desire of their owners to alienate them. In the meantime, the need for others' objects of utility gradually establishes itself. The constant repetition of exchange makes it into a normal social process. In the course of time, therefore, at least some part of the products must be produced intentionally for the purpose of exchange. From that moment, the distinction between the usefulness of things for direct consumption and their usefulness in exchange becomes firmly established. Their use value becomes distinguished from their exchange value. On the other hand, the quantitative proportion in which the things are exchangeable becomes dependent on their production itself. Custom fixes their values at definite magnitudes. In the direct exchange of products, each commodity is a direct means of exchange to its owner, and an equivalent to those who do not possess it, although only insofar as it has use value for them. At this stage, therefore, the articles exchanged do not acquire a value form independent of their own use value, or of the individual needs of the exchangers. The need for this form first develops with the increase in the number and variety of the commodities entering into the process of exchange. The problem and the means for its solution arise simultaneously. Commercial intercourse, in which the owners of commodities exchange and compare their own articles with various other articles, never takes place unless different kinds of commodities belonging to different owners are exchanged for and equated as values with one single further kind of commodity. This further commodity, by becoming the equivalent of various other commodities, directly acquires the form of a universal or social equivalent.
if only within narrow limits. The universal equivalent form comes and goes with the momentary social contacts which call it into existence. It is transiently attached to this or that commodity in alternation. But with the development of exchange, it fixes itself firmly and exclusively onto particular kinds of commodity, i.e. it crystallizes out into the money form. The particular kind of commodity to which it sticks is at first a matter of accident. Nevertheless, there are two circumstances which are by and large decisive. The money form comes to be attached either to the most important articles of exchange from outside, which are in fact the primitive and spontaneous forms of manifestation of the exchange values of local products, or to the object of utility, which forms the chief element of indigenous alienable wealth, for example cattle. Nomadic peoples are the first to develop the money form, because all their worldly possessions are in a movable and therefore directly alienable form, and because their mode of life, by continually bringing them into contact with foreign communities, encourages the exchange of products. Men have often made man himself into the primitive material of money, in the shape of the slave, but they have never done this with the land and soil. Such an idea could only arise in a bourgeois society, and one which was already well developed. It dates from the last third of the 17th century, and the first attempt to implement the idea on a national scale was made a century later, during the French bourgeois revolution. In the same proportion, as exchange bursts from its local bonds, and the value of commodities accordingly expands more and more into the material embodiment of human labor as such, in that proportion does the money form become transferred to commodities which are by nature fitted to perform the social function of a universal equivalent. Those commodities are the precious metals. The truth of the statement that, although gold and silver are not by nature money, money is by nature gold and silver, is shown by the appropriateness of their natural properties for the functions of money. So far, however, we are acquainted with only one function of money, namely to serve as the form of appearance of the value of commodities, that is, as the material in which the magnitudes of their values are socially expressed. Only a material, whose every sample possesses the same uniform quality, can be an adequate form of appearance of value, that is, a material embodiment of abstract and therefore equal human labor. On the other hand, since the difference between the magnitudes of value is purely quantitative, the money commodity must be capable of purely quantitative differentiation. It must therefore be divisible at will, and it must also be possible to assemble it again from its component parts. Gold and silver possess these properties by nature. The money commodity acquires a dual use value. Alongside its special use value as a commodity, gold, for instance, serves to fill hollow teeth, it forms the raw material for luxury articles, etc., it acquires a formal use value, arising out of its specific social function. Since all other commodities are merely particular equivalents for money, the latter being their universal equivalent, they relate to money as particular commodities relate to the universal commodity. We have seen that the money form is merely the reflection thrown upon a single commodity by the relations between all other commodities. That money is a commodity is therefore only a discovery for those who proceed from its finished shape in order to analyze it afterwards. The process of exchange gives to the commodity which it has converted into money not its value, but its specific value form. Confusion between these two attributes has misled some writers into maintaining that the value of gold and silver is imaginary. The fact that money can, in certain functions, be replaced by mere symbols of itself gave rise to another mistaken notion, that it itself is a mere symbol. Nevertheless, this error did contain the suspicion that the money form of the thing is external to the thing itself, being simply the form of appearance of human relations hidden behind it. In this sense, every commodity is a symbol, since as value it is only the material shell of the human labor expended on it. But if it is declared that the social characteristics assumed by material objects, or the material characteristics assumed by the social determinations of labor on the basis of a definite mode of production are mere symbols, then it is also declared at the same time that these characteristics are the arbitrary product of human reflection. This was the kind of explanation favored by the 18th century. In this way, the Enlightenment endeavored, at least temporarily, to remove the appearance of strangeness from the mysterious shapes assumed by human relations, whose origins they were unable to decipher. It has already been remarked above that the equivalent form of a commodity does not imply that the magnitude of its value can be determined. Therefore, even if we know that gold is money, and consequently directly exchangeable with all other commodities, that still does not tell us how much ten pounds of gold is worth, for instance. Money, like every other commodity, cannot express the magnitude of its value except relatively in other commodities. This value is determined by the labor time required for its production and is expressed in the quantity of any other commodity in which the same amount of labor time is congealed. 
This establishing of its relative value occurs at the source of its production by means of barter. As soon as it enters into circulation as money, its value is already given. In the last decades of the 17th century, the first step in the analysis of money, the discovery that money is a commodity, had already been taken, but this was merely the first step and nothing more. The difficulty lies not in comprehending that money is a commodity, but in discovering how, why, and by what means a commodity becomes money. We have already seen, from the simplest expression of value, x commodity A equals y commodity B, that the thing in which the magnitude of value of another thing is represented appears to have the equivalent form independently of this relation, as a social property inherent in its nature. We followed the process by which this false semblance became firmly established, a process which was completed when the universal equivalent form became identified with the natural form of a particular commodity, and thus crystallized into the money form. What appears to happen is not that a particular commodity becomes money because all other commodities express their values in it, but on the contrary, that all other commodities universally express their values in a particular commodity because it is money. The movement through which this process has been mediated vanishes in its own result, leaving no trace behind. Without any initiative on their part, the commodities find their own value configuration ready to hand in the form of a physical commodity existing outside but also alongside them. This physical object, gold or silver in its crude state, becomes, immediately on its emergence from the bowels of the earth, the direct incarnation of all human labor. Hence the magic of money. Men are henceforth related to each other in their social process of production in a purely atomistic way. Their own relations of production, therefore, assume a material shape which is independent of their control and their conscious individual action. This situation is manifested first by the fact that the products of men's labor universally take on the form of commodities. The riddle of the money fetish is therefore the riddle of the commodity fetish, now become visible and dazzling to our eyes. Chapter 3. Money, or the Circulation of Commodities Section 1. The Measure of Values Throughout this work, I assume that gold is the money commodity, for the sake of simplicity. The first main function of gold is to supply commodities with the material for the expression of their values, or to represent their values as magnitudes of the same denomination, qualitatively equal and quantitatively comparable. It thus acts as a universal measure of value, and only through performing this function does gold, the specific equivalent commodity, become money. It is not money that renders the commodities commensurable, quite the contrary, because all commodities, as values, are objectified human labor, and therefore in themselves commensurable, their values can be communally measured in one and the same specific commodity, and this commodity can be converted into the common measure of their values, that is, into money. Money, as a measure of value, is the necessary form of appearance of the measure of value which is imminent in commodities, namely labor time. The expression of the value of a commodity in gold x commodity A equals y money commodity, is its money form, or price. A single equation, such as one ton of iron equals two ounces of gold, now suffices to express the value of the iron in a socially valid manner. There is no longer any need for this equation to figure as a link in the chain of equations that express the values of all other commodities, because the equivalent commodity, gold, already possesses the character of money. The general relative form of value of commodities has therefore resumed its original shape of simple or individual relative value. On the other hand, the expanded relative expression of value, the endless series of equations, has now become the specific relative form of value of the money commodity. However, the endless series itself is now a socially given fact in the shape of the prices of commodities. We have only to read the quotations of a price list backwards to find the magnitude of the value of money expressed in all sorts of commodities. As against this, money has no price. In order to form a part of this uniform relative form of value of the other commodities, it would have to be brought into relation with itself as its own equivalent. The price, or money form, of commodities is, like their form of value generally, quite distinct from their palpable and real bodily form. It is therefore a purely ideal or notional form. Although invisible, the value of iron, linen, and corn exists in these very articles. It is signified through their equality with gold, even though this relation with gold exists only in their heads, so to speak. The guardian of the commodities must therefore lend them his tongue, or hang a ticket on them, in order to communicate their prices to the outside world. Since the expression of the value of commodities in gold is a purely ideal act, we may use purely imaginary or ideal gold to perform this operation. 
every owner of commodities knows that he is nowhere near turning them into gold when he has given their value the form of a price or of imaginary gold, and that it does not require the tiniest particle of real gold to give a valuation in gold of millions of pounds worth of commodities. In its function as measure of value, money therefore serves only in an imaginary or ideal capacity. This circumstance has given rise to the wildest theories. But although the money that performs the functions of a measure of value is only imaginary, the price depends entirely on the actual substance that is money. The value, i.e. the quantity of human labor which is contained in a ton of iron, is expressed by an imaginary quantity of the money commodity which contains the same amount of labor as the iron. Therefore, according to whether it is gold, silver, or copper which is serving as the measure of value, the value of the ton of iron will be expressed by very different prices, or will be represented by very different quantities of those metals. If, therefore, two different commodities, such as gold and silver, serve simultaneously as measures of value, all commodities will have two separate price expressions, the price in gold and the price in silver, which will quietly coexist as long as the ratio of the value of silver to that of gold remains unchanged, say at 15 to 1. However, every alteration in this ratio disturbs the ratio between the gold prices and the silver prices of commodities and thus proves, in fact, that a duplication of the measure of value contradicts the function of that measure. Commodities with definite prices all appear in this form. A commodity A equals X gold, B commodity B equals Y gold, C commodity C equals Z gold, etc., where A, B, and C represent definite quantities of the commodities A, B, and C, and X, Y, and Z definite quantities of gold. The values of these commodities are therefore changed into imaginary quantities of gold of different magnitudes. Hence, in spite of the confusing variety of the commodities themselves, their values become magnitudes of the same denomination, gold magnitudes. As such, they are now capable of being compared with each other and measured, and the course of development produces the need to compare them, for technical reasons, with some fixed quantity of gold as their unit of measurement. This unit, by subsequent division into aliquid parts, becomes itself the standard of measurement. Before they become money, gold, silver, and copper already possess such standards in their weights, so that, for example, a pound, which serves as a unit of measurement, can on the one hand be divided into ounces, and on the other hand combined with others to make up hundredweights. It is owing to this that, in all metallic currencies, the names given to the standards of money or of price were originally taken from the pre-existing names of the standards of weight. As measure of value, and as standard of price, money performs two quite different functions. It is the measure of value as the social incarnation of human labor. It is the standard of price as a quantity of metal with a fixed weight. As the measure of value, it serves to convert the values of all the manifold commodities into prices, into imaginary quantities of gold. As the standard of price, it measures those quantities of gold. The measure of values measures commodities considered as values. The standard of price measures, on the contrary, quantities of gold by unit quantity of gold, not the value of one quantity of gold by the weight of another. For the standard of price, a certain weight of gold must be fixed as the unit of measurement. In this case, as in all cases where quantities of the same denomination are to be measured, the stability of the measurement is of decisive importance. Hence, the less the unit of measurement, here a quantity of gold, is subject to variation, the better the standard of price fulfills its office. But gold can serve as a measure of value only because it is itself a product of labor, and therefore potentially variable in value. It is first of all quite clear that a change in the value of gold in no way impairs its function as a standard of price. No matter how the value of gold varies, different quantities of gold always remain in the same value relation to each other. If the value of gold fell by 1,000%, 12 ounces of gold would continue to have 12 times the value of 1 ounce of gold. And when we are dealing with prices, we are only concerned with the relation between different quantities of gold. Since, on the other hand, an ounce of gold undergoes no change in weight when its value rises or falls, no change can take place in the weight of its aliquot parts. Thus, gold always renders the same service as a fixed measure of price, however much its value may vary. Moreover, a change in the value of gold does not prevent it from fulfilling its function as measure of value. The change affects all commodities simultaneously, and therefore, other things being equal, leaves the mutual relations between their values unaltered, although those values are now all expressed in higher or lower gold prices than before. 
Just as in the case of the estimation of the value of a commodity in the use value of any other commodity, so also in this case, where commodities are valued in gold, we assume nothing more than that the production of a given quantity of gold costs, at a given period, a given amount of labor. As regards the fluctuations of commodity prices in general, they're subject to the laws of the simple relative expression of value which we developed in an earlier chapter. A general rise in the prices of commodities can result either from a rise in their values, which happens when the value of money remains constant, or from a fall in the value of money, which happens when the values of commodities remain constant. The process also occurs in reverse. A general fall in prices can result either from a fall in the values of commodities, if the value of money remains constant, or from a rise in the value of money, if the values of the commodities remain constant. It therefore by no means follows that a rise in the value of money necessarily implies a proportional fall in the prices of commodities, or that a fall in the value of money implies a proportional rise in prices. This would hold only for commodities whose value remains constant. But commodities whose value rises simultaneously with, and in proportion to, that of money would retain the same price. And if their value rose either slower or faster than that of money, the fall or rise in their prices would be determined by the difference between the path described by their value and that described by the value of money, and so on. Let us now go back to considering the price form. For various reasons, the money names of the metal weights are gradually separated from their original weight names. The historically decisive reasons being 1. The introduction of foreign money among less developed peoples. This happened at Rome in its early days, where gold and silver coins circulated at first as foreign commodities. The names of these foreign coins were different from those of the indigenous weights. 2. With the development of material wealth, the more precious metal extrudes the less precious from its function as measure of value. Silver drives out copper, gold drives out silver, however much this sequence may contradict the chronology of the poets. The word pound, for instance, was the money name given to an actual pound weight of silver. As soon as gold had driven out silver as a measure of value, the same name became attached to, say, one-fifteenth of a pound of gold, depending on the ratio between the values of gold and silver. Pound as a money name and pound as the ordinary weight name of gold are now two different things. 3. Centuries of continuous debasement of the currency by kings and princes have in fact left nothing behind of the original weights of gold coins but their names. These historical processes have made the separation of the money name from the weight name into a fixed popular custom. Since the standard of money is on the one hand purely conventional, while on the other hand it must possess universal validity, it is in the end regulated by law. A given weight of one of the precious metals, an ounce of gold for instance, becomes officially divided into aliquot parts, baptized by the law as a pound, a thaler, etc. These aliquot parts, which then serve as the actual units of money, are subdivided into other aliquot parts with legal names, such as a shilling, a penny, etc. But despite this, a definite weight of metal remains the standard of metallic money. All that has changed is the subdivision and the denomination of the money. The prices, or quantities of gold, into which the values of commodities are ideally changed are therefore now expressed in the money names, or the legally valid names of the subdivision of the gold standard made for the purpose of reckoning. Hence, instead of saying that a quarter of wheat is worth an ounce of gold, people in England would say that it was worth three pounds, seventeen shillings, ten and a half pence. In this way, commodities express by their money names how much they are worth, and money serves as money of account whenever it is a question of fixing a thing as a value and therefore in its money form. The name of a thing is entirely external to its nature. I know nothing of a man if I merely know his name is Jacob. In the same way, every trace of the money relation disappears in the money names Pound, Thaler, Frank, Ducat, etc. The confusion caused by attributing a hidden meaning to these cabalistic signs is made even greater by the fact that these money names express both the values of commodities and, simultaneously, aliquot parts of a certain weight of metal, namely the weight of the metal which serves as the standard of money. On the other hand, it is in fact necessary that value, as opposed to the multifarious objects of the world of commodities, should develop into this form, a material and non-mental one, but also a simple social form. Price is the money name of the labor objectified in a commodity. Hence the expression of the equivalence of a commodity with the quantity of money whose name is that commodity's price is a tautology, just as the expression of the relative value of a commodity is an expression of the equivalence of two commodities. 
But although price, being the exponent of the magnitude of a commodity's value, is the exponent of its exchange ratio with money, it does not follow that the exponent of this exchange ratio is necessarily the exponent of the magnitude of the commodity's value. Suppose two equal quantities of socially necessary labor are respectively represented by one quarter of wheat and two pounds sterling, approximately half an ounce of gold. Two pounds is the expression in money of the magnitude of the value of the quarter of wheat, or its price. If circumstances now allow this price to be raised to three pounds, or compel it to be reduced to one pound, then although one pound and three pounds may be too small or too large to give proper expression to the magnitude of the wheat's value, they are nevertheless prices of the wheat, for they are, in the first place, the form of its value, i.e. money, and in the second place, the exponents of its exchange ratio with money. If the conditions of production, or the productivity of labor, remain constant, the same amount of social labor time must be expended on the reproduction of a quarter of wheat both before and after the change in price. This situation is not dependent either on the will of the wheat producer or on that of the owners of the other commodities. The magnitude of the value of a commodity therefore expresses a necessary relation to social labor time which is inherent in the process by which its value is created. With the transformation of the magnitude of value into the price, this necessary relation appears as the exchange ratio between a single commodity and the money commodity which exists outside it. This relation, however, may express both the magnitude of value of the commodity and the greater or lesser quantity of money for which it can be sold under the given circumstances. The possibility, therefore, of a quantitative incongruity between price and magnitude of value, i.e. the possibility that the price may diverge from the magnitude of value, is inherent in the price form itself. This is not a defect, but on the contrary, it makes this form the adequate one for a mode of production whose laws can only assert themselves as blindly operating averages between constant irregularities. The price form, however, is not only compatible with the possibility of a quantitative incongruity between the magnitude of value and price, i.e. between the magnitude of value and its own expression in money, but it may also harbor a qualitative contradiction with the result that price ceases altogether to express value, despite the fact that money is nothing but the value form of commodities. Things which in and for themselves are not commodities, things such as conscience, honor, etc., can be offered for sale by their holders, and thus acquire the form of commodities through their price. Hence a thing can, formally speaking, have a price without having a value. The expression of price is in this case imaginary, like certain quantities in mathematics. On the other hand, the imaginary price form may also conceal a real value relation, or one derived from it, as for instance the price of uncultivated land, which is without value because no human labor is objectified in it. Like the relative form of value in general, price expresses the value of a commodity, for instance a ton of iron, by asserting that a given quantity of the equivalent, for instance an ounce of gold, is directly exchangeable with iron. But it by no means asserts the converse, that the iron is directly exchangeable with gold, in order, therefore, that a commodity may in practice operate effectively as exchange value, it must divest itself of its natural physical body and become transformed from merely imaginary into real gold, although this act of transubstantiation may be more troublesome for it than the transition from necessity to freedom for the Hegelian concept, the casting of a shell for a lobster, or the putting off of the old Adam for St. Jerome. Though a commodity may, alongside its real shape, iron, for instance, possess an ideal value shape, or an imagined gold shape in the form of its price, it cannot simultaneously be both real iron and real gold. To establish its price, it is sufficient for it to be equated with gold in the imagination, but to enable it to render its owner the service of a universal equivalent, it must actually be replaced by gold. If the owner of the iron were to go to the owner of some other earthly commodity, and were to refer him to the price of iron as proof that it was already money, his answer would be the terrestrial equivalent of the answer given by St. Peter in heaven to Dante, when the latter recited the creed, quote, Now this coin has been measured, and now we know its alloy and its weight, but tell me if you have it in your purse. End quote. The price form therefore implies both the exchangeability of commodities for money and the necessity of exchanges. On the other hand, gold serves as an ideal measure of value only because it has already established itself as the money commodity in the process of exchange. Hard cash lurks within the ideal measure of value. Section 2. The Means of Circulation Subsection A. The Metamorphosis of Commodities 
We saw in a former chapter that the exchange of commodities implies contradictory and mutually exclusive conditions. The further development of the commodity does not abolish these contradictions, but rather provides the form within which they have room to move. This is, in general, the way in which real contradictions are resolved. For instance, it is a contradiction to depict one body as constantly falling towards another and at the same time constantly flying away from it. The ellipse is a form of motion within which this contradiction is both realized and resolved. Insofar as the process of exchange transfers commodities from hands in which they are non-use values to hands in which they are use values, it is a process of social metabolism. The product of one kind of useful labor replaces that of another. Once a commodity has arrived at a situation in which it can serve as a use value, it falls out of the sphere of exchange into that of consumption. But the former sphere alone interests us here. We therefore have to consider the whole process in its formal aspect, that is to say, the change in form or the metamorphosis of commodities through which the social metabolism is mediated. This change of form has been very imperfectly grasped as yet, owing to the circumstance that, quite apart from the lack of clarity in the concept of value itself, Every change of form in a commodity results from the exchange of two commodities, namely an ordinary commodity and the money commodity. If we keep in mind only this material aspect, that is, the exchange of the commodity for gold, we overlook the very thing we ought to observe, namely, what has happened to the form of the commodity. We do not see that gold, as a mere commodity, is not money, and that the other commodities, through their prices, themselves relate to gold as the medium for expressing their own shape in money. Commodities first enter into the process of exchange ungilded and unsweetened, retaining their original homegrown shape. Exchange, however, produces a differentiation of the commodity into two elements, commodity and money, an external opposition which expresses the opposition between use value and value which is inherent in it. In this opposition, commodities as use values confront money as exchange value. On the other hand, both sides of this opposition are commodities, hence themselves unities of use value and value. But this unity of differences is expressed at two opposite poles, and at each pole in an opposite way. This is the alternating relation between the two poles. The commodity is in reality a use value. Its existence as a value appears only ideally, in its price, through which it is related to the real embodiment of its value, the gold which confronts it as its opposite. Inversely, the material of the gold ranks only as the materialization of value, as money. It is therefore in reality exchange value. Its use value appears only ideally in the series of expressions of relative value within which it confronts all the other commodities as the totality of real embodiments of its unity. These antagonistic forms of the commodities are the real forms of motion of the process of exchange. Let us now accompany the owner of some commodity, say our old friend the linen weaver, to the scene of action, the market. His commodity, 20 yards of linen, has a definite price, 2 pounds. He exchanges it for the 2 pounds, and then, being a man of the old school, he parts with the 2 pounds in return for a family Bible of the same price. The linen, for him a mere commodity, a bearer of value, is alienated in the exchange for gold, which is the shape of the linen's value. Then it is taken out of this shape and alienated again in exchange for another commodity, the Bible, which is destined to enter the weaver's house as an object of utility and there to satisfy his family's need for edification. The process of exchange is therefore accomplished through two metamorphoses of opposite yet mutually complementary character, the conversion of the commodity into money and the reconversion of the money into a commodity. The two moments of this metamorphosis are at once distinct transactions by the weaver, selling, or the exchange of the commodity for money, and buying, or the exchange of the money for a commodity, and the unity of the two acts, selling in order to buy. The end result of the transaction, from the point of view of the weaver, is that instead of being in possession of the linen, he now has the Bible. Instead of his original commodity, he now possesses another of the same value but of different utility. He procures his other means of subsistence and of production in a similar way. For the weaver, the whole process accomplishes nothing more than the exchange of the product of his labor for the product of someone else's, nothing more than an exchange of products. The process of exchange is therefore accomplished through the following changes of form, commodity to money to commodity, or C to M to C. As far as concerns its material content, the movement is C to C, the exchange of one commodity for another, the metabolic interaction of social labor in whose result the process itself becomes extinguished. C to M the first metamorphosis of the commodity, or sale. 
The leap taken by value from the body of the commodity into the body of the gold is the commodity salto mortale, as I have called it elsewhere. If the leap falls short, it is not the commodity which is defrauded, but rather its owner. The social division of labor makes the nature of his labor as one-sided as his needs are many-sided. This is precisely the reason why the product of his labor serves him solely as exchange value but it cannot acquire universal social validity as an equivalent form except by being converted into money. That money, however, is in someone else's pocket. To allow it to be drawn out, the commodity produced by its owner's labor must, above all, be a use value for the owner of the money. The labor expended on it must, therefore, be of a socially useful kind, i.e. it must maintain its position as a branch of the social division of labor. But the division of labor is an organization of production which has grown up naturally, a web which has been, and continues to be, woven behind the backs of the producers of commodities. Perhaps the commodity is the product of a new kind of labor, and claims to satisfy a newly arisen need, or is even trying to bring forth a new need of its own account. Perhaps a particular operation, although yesterday it still formed one out of the many operations conducted by one producer in creating a given commodity, may today tear itself out of this framework, establish itself as an independent branch of labor, and send its part of the product to the market as an independent commodity. The circumstances may or may not be ripe for such a process of separation. Today, the product satisfies a social need. Tomorrow, it may perhaps be expelled partly or completely from its place by a similar product. Moreover, Although our weaver's labor may be a recognized branch of the social division of labor, yet that fact is by no means sufficient to guarantee the utility of his twenty yards of linen. If the society's need for linen, and such a need has a limit, like every other need, has already been satisfied by the products of rival weavers, our friend's product is superfluous, redundant, and consequently useless. Although people do not look a gift horse in the mouth, our friend does not frequent the markets to make presents of his products. Let us assume, however, that the use value of his product does maintain itself, and that the commodity therefore attracts money. Now we have to ask, how much money? No doubt the answer is already anticipated in the price of the commodity, which is the exponent of the magnitude of its value. We leave out of consideration here any possible subjective errors in calculation by the owner of the commodity, which will immediately be corrected objectively in the market. We suppose him to have spent on his product only the average socially necessary quantity of labor time. The price of the commodity, therefore, is merely the money name of the quantity of social labor objectified in it. But now the old established conditions of production and weaving are thrown into the melting pot, without the permission of, and behind the back of, our weaver. What was yesterday undoubtedly labor time socially necessary to the production of a yard of linen ceases to be so today a fact which the owner of money is only too eager to prove from the price quoted by our friend's competitors. Unluckily for the weaver, people of his kind are in plentiful supply. Let us suppose, finally, that every piece of linen on the market contains nothing but socially necessary labor time. In spite of this, all these pieces taken as a whole may contain superfluously expended labor time. If the market cannot stomach the whole quantity at the normal price of two shillings a yard, this proves that too great a portion of the total social labor time has been expended in the form of weaving. The effect is the same as if each individual weaver had expended more labor time on his particular product than was socially necessary. As the German proverb has it, caught together, hung together. All the linen on the market counts as one single article of commerce, and each piece of linen is only an aliquot part of it. And in fact, the value of each single yard is also nothing but the materialization of the same socially determined quantity of homogeneous human labor. We see then that commodities are in love with money, but that the course of true love never did run smooth. The quantitative articulation of society's productive organism, by which its scattered elements are integrated into the system of the division of labor, is as haphazard and spontaneous as its qualitative articulation. The owners of commodities therefore find out that the same division of labor which turns them into independent private producers also makes the social process of production and the relations of the individual producers to each other within that process independent of the producers themselves. They also find out that the independence of the individuals from each other has as its counterpart and supplement a system of all-round material dependence. The division of labor converts the product of labor into a commodity and thereby makes necessary its conversion to money. At the same time, it makes it a matter of chance whether this transubstantiation succeeds or not. Here, however, we have to look at the phenomenon in its pure shape, and must therefore assume it has proceeded normally. In any case, if the process is to take place at all, 
i.e. if the commodity is not impossible to sell, a change of form must always occur, although there may be an abnormal loss or accretion of substance that is of the magnitude of value. The seller has his commodity replaced by gold. The buyer has his gold replaced by a commodity. The striking phenomenon here is that a commodity and gold, 20 yards of linen and 2 pounds, have changed hands and places. In other words, they have been exchanged. But what is the commodity exchanged for? For the universal shape assumed by its own value. And what is the gold exchanged for? For a particular form of its own use value. Why does the gold confront the linen as money? Because the linen's price of two pounds, its money name, already brings it into relation with the gold as money. The commodity is divested of its original form through its sale, i.e. the moment its use value actually attracts the gold, which previously had a merely imaginary existence in its price. The realization of a commodity's price, or of its merely ideal value form, is therefore at the same time and inversely the realization of the merely ideal use value of money. The conversion of a commodity into money is the conversion of money into a commodity. This single process is two-sided. From one pole, that of the commodity owner, it is a sale. From the other pole, that of the money owner, it is a purchase. In other words, a sale is a purchase. C to M is also M to C. Up to this point, we have considered only one economic relation between men, a relation between owners of commodities in which they appropriate the produce of the labor of others by alienating the produce of their own labor. Hence, for one commodity owner to meet with another, in the form of a money owner, it is necessary either that the product of the latter should possess by its nature the form of money, i.e. it should be gold, the material of which money consists, or that his product should already have changed its skin and stripped off its original form of a useful object. In order to function as money, Gold must, of course, enter the market at some point or other. This point is to be found at its source of production, where the gold is exchanged as the immediate product of labor for some other product of equal value. But from that moment onwards, it always represents the realized price of some commodity. Leaving aside its exchange for other commodities at the source of production, gold is, in the hands of every commodity owner, his own commodity, divested of its original shape by being alienated, it is the product of a sale, or of the first metamorphosis, C to M. Gold, as we saw, became ideal money, or a measure of value, because all commodities measure their values in it, and thus made it the imaginary opposite of their natural shape as objects of utility, hence the shape of their value. It became real money because the commodities, through their complete alienation, suffered a divestiture, or transformation, of their real shapes as objects of utility, thus making it the real embodiment of their values. When they thus assume the shape of values, commodities strip off every trace of their natural and original use value, and of the particular kind of useful labor to which they owe their creation, in order to pupate into the homogeneous social materialization of undifferentiated human labor. From the mere look of a piece of money, we cannot tell what breed of commodity has been transformed into it. In their money form, all commodities look alike. Hence money may be dirt, although dirt is not money. We will assume that the two golden coins, in return for which our weaver has parted with his linen, are the metamorphosed shape of a quarter of wheat. The sale of the linen, C to M, is at the same time its purchase, M to C. But this process, considered as the sale of the linen, starts off a movement which ends with its opposite, the purchase of a Bible. Considered as a purchase of the linen, on the other hand, the process completes a movement which began with its opposite, the sale of the wheat, C to M, Linen to money, which is the first phase of CMC, linen to money to Bible, is also M to C, money to linen, the last phase of another movement, C to M to C, being wheat to money to linen. The first metamorphosis of one commodity, its transformation from the commodity form into money, is therefore also invariably the second, and diametrically opposite, metamorphosis of some other commodity, the retransformation of the latter from money into a commodity. M to C, the second or concluding metamorphosis of the commodity, purchase. Money is the absolutely alienable commodity, because it is all other commodities, divested of their shape, the product of their universal alienation. It reads all prices backwards, and thus, as it were, mirrors itself in the bodies of all other commodities, which provide the material through which it can come into being as a commodity. At the same time, the prices, those wooing glances cast at money by commodities, define the limit of its convertibility, namely its own quantity. 
Since every commodity disappears when it becomes money, it is impossible to tell from the money itself how it got into the hands of its possessor, or what article has been changed into it. It has no smell, from whatever source it may come. If it represents on the one hand a commodity which has been sold, it also represents on the other hand a commodity which can be bought. M to C, a purchase, is at the same time C to M, a sale. The concluding metamorphosis of one commodity is the first metamorphosis of another. For our weaver, the life of his commodity ends with the Bible, into which he has reconverted his two pounds. But suppose the seller of the Bible turns the two pounds set free by the weaver into brandy. M to C, the concluding phase of CMC being linen to money to Bible, is also C to M, the first phase of C to M to C being Bible to money to brandy. Since the producer of the commodity offers only a single product, he often sells it in large quantities, whereas the fact that he has many needs compels him to split up the price realized, the sum of the money set free, into numerous purchases. Hence, a sale leads to many purchases of different commodities. The concluding metamorphosis of a commodity thus constitutes an aggregate of the first metamorphoses of other commodities. If we now consider the completed metamorphosis of a commodity as a whole, it appears in the first place that it is made up of two opposite and complementary movements, C to M and M to C. These two antithetical transmutations of the commodity are accomplished through two antithetical social processes in which the commodity owner takes part, and are reflected in the antithetical economic characteristics of the two processes. By taking part in the act of sale, the commodity owner becomes a seller. In the act of purchase, he becomes a buyer. But just as, in every transmutation of a commodity, its two forms, the commodity form and the money form, exist simultaneously but at opposite poles, so every seller is confronted with a buyer, every buyer with a seller. While the same commodity is successively passing through the two inverted transmutations, from a commodity into money and from money into another commodity, the owner of the commodity successively changes his role from seller to buyer. Being a seller and being a buyer are therefore not fixed roles, but constantly attach themselves to different persons in the course of the circulation of commodities. The complete metamorphosis of a commodity, in its simplest form, implies four denouements and three dramatis personae. First, a commodity comes face to face with money. The latter is the form taken by the value of the former, and exists over there in someone else's pocket in all its hard material reality. A commodity owner is thus confronted with a money owner. Now, as soon as the commodity has been changed into money, the money becomes its vanishing equivalent form, whose use value or content exists here on the spot, in the bodies of other commodities. Money, the final stage of the first transformation, is at the same time the starting point for the second. The person who is a seller in the first transaction thus becomes a buyer in the second, in which a third commodity owner comes to meet him as a seller. The two inverted faces of the movement, which makes up the metamorphosis of a commodity, constitute a circuit. Commodity form, stripping off of this form, and return to it. Of course, the commodity itself is here subject to contradictory determinations. At the starting point, it is a non-use value to its owner. At the end, it is a use value. So, too, the money appears in the first phase as a solid crystal of value into which the commodity has been transformed. But afterwards, it dissolves into the mere equivalent form of the commodity. The two metamorphoses which constitute the commodity's circular path are at the same time two inverse partial metamorphoses of two other commodities. One in the same commodity, the linen, opens the series of its own metamorphoses and completes the metamorphosis of another, the wheat. In its first transmutation, the sale, the linen plays these two parts in its own person. But then it goes the way of all flesh, enters the chrysalis state as gold, and thereby simultaneously completes the first metamorphosis of a third commodity. Hence, the circuit made by one commodity in the course of its metamorphoses is inextricably entwined with the circuits of other commodities. This whole process constitutes the circulation of commodities. The circulation of commodities differs from the direct exchange of products not only in form but in its essence. We have only to consider the course of events. The weaver has undoubtedly exchanged his linen for a Bible, his own commodity for someone else's, but this phenomenon is only true for him. The Bible pusher, who prefers a warming drink to cold sheets, had no intention of exchanging linen for his Bible. The weaver did not know that the wheat had been exchanged for his linen. B's commodity replaces that of A, but A and B do not mutually exchange their commodities. It may in fact happen that A and B buy from each other, but a particular relationship of this kind is by no means the necessary result of the general conditions of the circulation of commodities. We see here, on the one hand, 
how the exchange of commodities breaks through all the individual and local limitations of the direct exchange of products and develops the metabolic process of human labor. On the other hand, there develops a whole network of social connections of natural origin entirely beyond the control of the human agents. Only because the farmer has sold his wheat is the weaver able to sell his linen. Only because the weaver has sold his linen is our rash and intemperate friend able to sell his Bible. And only because the latter already has the water of everlasting life is the distiller able to sell his eau de vie. And so it goes on. The process of circulation, therefore, unlike the direct exchange of products, does not disappear from view once the use values have changed places and changed hands. The money does not vanish when it finally drops out of the series of metamorphoses undergone by a commodity. It always leaves behind a precipitate at a point in the arena of circulation vacated by the commodities. In the complete metamorphosis of the linen, for example, linen to money to Bible, the linen first falls out of circulation and money steps into its place. Then the Bible falls out of circulation and again money takes its place. When one commodity replaces another, the money commodity always sticks to the hands of some third person. Circulation sweats money from every pore. Nothing could be more foolish than the dogma that because every sale is a purchase and every purchase a sale, the circulation of commodities necessarily implies an equilibrium between sales and purchases. If this means that the number of actual sales accomplished is equal to the number of purchases, it is a flat tautology. But its real intention is to show that every seller brings his own buyer to market with him. Sale and purchase are one identical act, considered as the alternating relation between two persons who are in polar opposition to each other, the commodity owner and the money owner. They constitute two acts, of polar and opposite character, considered as the transactions of one and the same person. Hence, the identity of sale and purchase implies that the commodity is useless if, when it is thrown into the alchemist's retort of circulation, it has not come out again as money. If, in other words, it cannot be sold by its owner and therefore bought by the owner of the money. This identity further implies that the process, if it reaches fruition, constitutes a point of rest, an interval, long or short, in the life of the commodity. Since the first metamorphosis of a commodity is at once a sale and a purchase, this partial process is at the same time an independent process in itself. The buyer has the commodity, the seller has the money, i.e. a commodity which remains in a form capable of circulating, whether it reappears on the market at an earlier or later date. No one can sell unless someone else purchases, but no one directly needs to purchase because he has just sold. Circulation bursts through all the temporal, spatial, and personal barriers imposed by the direct exchange of products, and it does this by splitting up the direct identity present in this case between the exchange of one's own product and the acquisition of someone else's into two antithetical segments of sale and purchase. To say that these mutually independent and antithetical processes form an internal unity is to say also that their internal unity moves forward through external antitheses. These two processes lack internal independence because they complement each other. Hence, if the assertion of their external independence proceeds to a certain critical point, their unity violently makes itself felt by producing a crisis. There is an antithesis imminent in the commodity between use value and value, between private labor, which must simultaneously manifest itself as directly social labor, and a particular concrete kind of labor, which simultaneously counts as merely abstract universal labor, between the conversion of things into persons and the conversions of persons into things. The antithetical phases of the metamorphosis of the commodity are the developed forms of motion of this imminent contradiction. These forms therefore imply the possibility of crises, though no more than the possibility. For the development of this possibility into a reality, a whole series of conditions is required, which do not yet even exist from the standpoint of simple circulation of commodities. Subsection B. The Circulation of Money the change of form through which the metabolism of the products of labor is accomplished, C to M to C, requires that a given value shall form the starting point of the process, in the shape of a commodity, and that it shall return to the same point in the shape of a commodity. This movement of commodities is therefore a circuit. On the other hand, the form of this movement excludes money from the circuit. The result of the movement is not the return of the money, but its continued removal further and further away from its starting point. 
As long as the seller sticks fast to his money, which is the transformed shape of his commodity, that commodity is still at the stage of the first metamorphosis. In other words, it has compelled only the first half of its circulatory course. Once the process of selling in order to buy is complete, the money again leaves the hands of its original possessor. Of course, if the weaver, having bought the Bible, sells more linen, money comes back into his hands. But this return is not a result of the circulation of the first twenty yards of linen. That circulation rather removed money from the hands of the weaver and placed it in those of the Bible pusher. The return of money to the weaver results only from the renewal or repetition of the same process of circulation with a fresh commodity, and it ends in the same way as the previous process. Hence, the movement directly imparted to money by the circulation of commodities takes the form of a constant removal from its starting point, a path followed from the hands of one commodity owner into those of another. This path is its circulation. The circulation of money is the constant and monotonous repetition of the same process. The commodity is always in the hands of the seller. The money is a means of purchase always in the hands of the buyer. And money serves as a means of purchase by realizing the price of the commodity. By doing this, it transfers the commodity from the seller to the buyer and removes the money from the hands of the buyer into those of the seller, where it again goes through the same process with another commodity. That this one-sided form of motion of the money arises out of the two-sided form of motion of the commodity is a circumstance which is hidden from view. The very nature of the circulation of commodities produces a semblance of the opposite. The first metamorphosis of a commodity is visibly not only the money's movement, but also that of the commodity itself. In the second metamorphosis, on the contrary, the movement appears to us as the movement of the money alone. In the first phase of its circulation, the commodity changes places with the money. Thereupon, the commodity, in its shape as an object of utility, falls out of circulation into consumption. Its value shape, or monetary larva, steps into its shoes. It then passes through the second phase of its circulation, no longer in its own natural shape, but in its monetary shape. With this, the continuity of the movement depends entirely on the money, and the same movement which, for the commodity, includes two opposed processes, is, when considered as the movement of the money, always one in the same process, a constant change of places with commodities which are always different. Hence the result of the circulation of commodities, namely the replacement of one commodity by another, appears not to have been mediated by its own change of form, but rather by the function of money as means of circulation. As means of circulation, money circulates commodities, which in and for themselves lack the power of movement, and transfers them from hands in which they are non-use values into hands in which they are use values, and this process always takes the opposite direction to the path of the commodities themselves. Money constantly removes commodities from the sphere of circulation, by constantly stepping into their place in circulation, and in this way continually moving away from its own starting point. Hence, although the movement of money is merely the expression of the circulation of commodities, the situation appears to be the reverse of this, namely the circulation of commodities seems to be the result of the movement of money. Again, money functions as a means of circulation only because in it the value possessed by the commodities has taken on an independent shape. Hence, its movement, as the medium of circulation, is in fact merely the movement undergone by commodities while changing their form. This fact must therefore make itself plainly visible in the circulation of money. Thus the linen, for instance, first of all changes its commodity form into its money form. The final term of its metamorphosis, C to M, the money form, then becomes the first term of its final metamorphosis, M to C, its transformation back into the shape of the Bible. But each of these two changes of form is accomplished by an exchange between commodity and money, by their reciprocal displacement. The same pieces of coin come into the seller's hand as the alienated form of the commodity and leave it as the commodity in its absolutely alienable form. They are displaced twice. The first metamorphosis of the linen puts these coins into the weaver's pocket. The second draws them out of it. The two opposite changes undergone by the same commodity are reflected in the displacement, twice repeated but in opposite directions, of the same pieces of coin. If, however, only a one-sided metamorphosis takes place, if there are only sales or only purchases, then a given piece of money changes its place only once. Its second change of place always expresses the second metamorphosis of the commodity, its reconversion from money. The frequently repeated displacement of the same coins reflects not only the series of metamorphoses undergone by a single commodity, but also the mutual entanglement of the innumerable metamorphoses in the whole world of commodities. It is in any case evident that all this is valid only for the simple circulation of commodities, the form we are considering here. 
every commodity, when it first steps into circulation and undergoes its first change of form, does so only to fall out of circulation once more and be replaced again and again by fresh commodities. Money, on the contrary, as the medium of circulation, haunts the sphere of circulation and constantly moves around within it. The question therefore arises of how much money this sphere continuously absorbs. In a given country, there takes place every day at the same time, though in different places, numerous one-sided metamorphoses of commodities. In other words, simple sales on one hand, simple purchases on the other. In their prices, the commodities have already been equated with definite but imaginary quantities of money. And since, in the direct form of circulation being considered here, money and commodities always come into physical confrontation with each other, one at the positive pole of purchase, the other at the negative pole of sale, it is clear that the amount of means of circulation required is determined beforehand by the sum of the prices of all these commodities. As a matter of fact, the money is only the representation in real life of the quantity of gold previously expressed in the imagination by the sum of the prices of the commodities. It is therefore self-evident that these two quantities are equal. We know, however, that the values of commodities remaining constant, their prices vary with the value of gold, the material of money, rising in proportion as it falls and falling in proportion as it rises. Given that the sum of the prices of commodities falls or rises in this way, it follows that the quantity of money in circulation must fall or rise to the same extent. This change in the quantity of the circulating medium is certainly caused by the money itself, yet not in virtue of its function as a medium of circulation, but rather in virtue of its function as a measure of value. First, the price of commodities varies inversely as the value of the money, and then the quantity of the medium of circulation varies directly as the price of the commodities. Exactly the same phenomenon would arise if, for instance, instead of the value of gold falling, silver were to replace it as the measure of value, or if instead of the value of silver rising, it were to be driven out of its function as measure of value by gold. In the one case, more silver would be in circulation than there was previously gold, and in the other case, less gold would be in circulation than there was previously silver. In each case, the value of the money material, i.e. the value of the commodity serving as the measure of value, would have undergone a change. And so too, therefore, would the prices of commodities which express their values in money, as well as the quantity of money which would need to be in circulation to realize those prices. We have already seen that the sphere of circulation has a gap in it, through which gold, or silver, or the money material in general, enters as a commodity with a given value. Hence, when money begins to function as a measure of value, when it is used to determine prices, its value is presupposed. If that value falls, the fall first shows itself in a change in the prices of those commodities which are directly exchanged with the precious metals at their source. The greater part of all other commodities, especially at the less developed stages of bourgeois society, will continue for a long time to be estimated in terms of the former value of the measure of value, which has now become antiquated and illusory. Nevertheless, one commodity infects another through their common value relation, so that their prices, expressed in gold or silver, gradually settle down into the proportions determined by their comparative values, until finally the values of all commodities are estimated in terms of the new value of the monetary metal. This process of equalization is accompanied by a continued increase in the quantity of the precious metals, owing to the influx needed to replace the commodities directly exchanged with them. In proportion, therefore, as the adjusted prices of the commodities become universal, in proportion as their values come to be estimated according to the new value of the metal, which has fallen and may up to a certain point continue to fall, in that same proportion does the increased mass of metal which is necessary for the realization of the new prices become available. A one-sided observation of the events which followed the discovery of fresh supplies of gold and silver led some people in the 17th and, more particularly, in the 18th century to the false conclusion that the prices of commodities had risen because there was more gold and silver acting as the means of circulation. Henceforth, we shall assume the value of gold as a given factor, as in fact it is if we take it at the moment when we estimate the price of a commodity. On this assumption, then, the quantity of the medium of circulation is determined by the sum of the prices to be realized. If we now further assume that the price of each commodity is given, the sum of the prices clearly depends on the total amount of commodities found in circulation. We do not need to rack our brains to grasp that if our quarter of wheat costs two pounds, one hundred quarters will cost two hundred pounds, two hundred quarters four hundred pounds, and so on and therefore that the quantity of money which changes place with the wheat, when it is sold, must increase as the quantity of the wheat increases. If the mass of commodities remains constant, the quantity of money in circulation surges up or down according to the fluctuations in the prices of the commodities. It rises and falls because the sum of the prices increases or diminishes as a result of the change of price. 
For this, it is by no means necessary that the prices of all commodities should rise or fall simultaneously. A rise or a fall in the prices of a number of leading articles is sufficient in the one case to increase, and the other to diminish, the sum of the prices of all commodities, and therefore to put more or less money in circulation. Whether the change in the price reflects an actual change in the value of the commodities, or merely fluctuations in their market prices, the effect on the quantity of the medium of circulation remains the same. Let us assume that there occur a number of unconnected and simultaneous sales, or partial metamorphoses in different localities. Sales of, say, one quarter of wheat, twenty yards of linen, one Bible, and four gallons of brandy. If the price of each article is two pounds, and the sum of the prices to be realized is consequently eight pounds, it follows that eight pounds in money must enter into circulation. If, on the other hand, these same articles are links in the following chain of metamorphoses, one quarter of wheat into two pounds, into twenty yards of linen, into two pounds, into one Bible, into two pounds, into four gallons of brandy, into two pounds, a chain which is already well known to us, in that case, the two pounds causes the different commodities to circulate after realizing their prices successively, and therefore realizing the sum of those prices, which is eight pounds, the two pounds finally comes to rest in the hands of the distiller. The two pounds has turned over four times. It has performed four acts of circulation. This repeated change of place of the same pieces of money corresponds to the double change of the form undergone by the commodities. It corresponds to their movement through two diametrically opposed stages of circulation, and the intertwining of the metamorphoses of different commodities. These antithetical and mutually complementary phases, through which the process passes, cannot take place alongside each other. They must follow in temporal succession. It is segments of time, therefore, which form the measure of the duration of the process. In other words, the velocity of the circulation of money is measured by the number of times the same piece of money turns over within a given period. Suppose the process of circulation of the four articles takes a day. The sum of prices to be realized is eight pounds. The number of times the two pounds turns over during the day is four, and the quantity of money in circulation is two pounds. Hence, for a given interval of time during the process of circulation, we have the following equation. The quantity of money functioning as the circulating medium is equal to the sum of the prices of the commodities divided by the number of times coins of the same denomination turn over. This law holds generally. The process of circulation in a given country is made up, on the one hand, of numerous isolated and simultaneous partial metamorphoses, sales and purchases running parallel to each other, in which each coin changes its position only once, or performs only one act of circulation. On the other hand, it is made up of many distinct series of metamorphoses, partly running parallel, partly coalescing with each other, and in each of these series, each coin turns over a number of times. How often each coin turns over varies according to the circumstances. Given the total number of times all the circulating coins of one denomination turn over, we can arrive at the average number of times a single coin turns over, or in other words, the average velocity of the circulation of money. The quantity of money thrown into the process of circulation at the beginning of each day is of course determined by the sum of the prices of all the commodities circulating simultaneously and side by side. But within that process, coins are, so to speak, made responsible for each other. If one increases its velocity of circulation, the other slows down or completely leaves the sphere of circulation. This is because the sphere of circulation can absorb only the amount of gold which, multiplied by the average number of times its basic unit turns over, is equal to the sum of prices to be realized. Hence, if the number of acts of circulation performed by the separate pieces increases, the total number of those pieces in circulation diminishes. If the number of acts of circulation diminishes, the total number of pieces increases. Since the quantity of money which can function as means of circulation is fixed for a given average velocity of circulation, one has only to throw a given quantity of one pound notes into circulation in order to extract the same number of sovereigns from it. This trick is well known to all banks. Just as the circulation of money is in general merely a reflection of the process of circulation of commodities, i.e. their circular path through diametrically opposed metamorphoses, so too the velocity of circulation of money is merely a reflection of the rapidity with which commodities change their forms, the continuous interlocking of the series of metamorphoses, the hurried nature of society's metabolic process, the quick disappearance of commodities from the sphere of circulation, and their equally quick replacement by fresh commodities. In the velocity of circulation, therefore, there appears the fluid unity of the antithetical and complementary phases, i.e. the transformation of the commodities from the form of utility into the form of value, and their retransformation in the reverse direction, or the two processes of sale and purchase. Inversely, when the circulation of money slows down, 
The two processes become separated. They assert their independence and mutual antagonism. Stagnation occurs in the changes of form and hence in the metabolic process. The circulation itself, of course, gives no clue to the origin of this stagnation. It merely presents us with a phenomenon. Popular opinion is naturally inclined to attribute this phenomenon to a quantitative deficiency in the circulating medium, since it sees money appear and disappear less frequently at all points on the periphery of circulation, in proportion as the circulation of money slows down. The total quantity of money functioning during a given period as the circulating medium is determined on the one hand by the sum of the prices of the commodities in circulation, and on the other hand by the rapidity of the alternation of the antithetical processes of circulation. The proportion of the sum of the prices which can on average be realized by each single coin depends on this rapidity of alternation, but the sum of the prices of the commodities depends on the quantity, as well as on the price, of each kind of commodity. These three factors, the movement of prices, the quantity of commodities in circulation, and the velocity of circulation of money, can all vary in various directions under different conditions. Hence, the sum of the prices to be realized, and consequently the quantity of the circulating medium conditioned by that sum, will vary with the very numerous variations of the three factors in combination. Here, we shall outline only the most important variations in the history of commodity prices. While prices remain constant, the quantity of the circulating medium may increase, owing to an increase in the number of commodities in circulation, or a decrease in the velocity of circulation of money, or a combination of the two. On the other hand, the quantity of the circulating medium may decrease with a decreasing number of commodities, or with an increasing rapidity of circulation. With a general rise in the prices of commodities, the quantity of the circulating medium will remain constant, if the number of commodities in circulation decreases proportionally to the increase in their prices, or if the velocity of monetary circulation increases at the same rate as prices rise, the number of commodities in circulation remaining constant. The quantity of the circulating medium may decrease, owing to a more rapid decrease in the number of commodities or to a more rapid increase in the velocity of monetary circulation, in comparison with the fall in the prices of commodities. With the general fall in the prices of commodities, the quantity of the circulating medium will remain constant if the number of commodities increases proportionally to their fall in price, or if the velocity of monetary circulation decreases in the same proportion. The quantity of the circulating medium will increase if the number of commodities increases more quickly or the rapidity of circulation decreases more quickly than the prices fall. The variations of the different factors may be mutually compensatory, so that notwithstanding their continued instability, the sum of the prices to be realized and the quantity of money in circulation remains constant. Consequently, we find, especially if we take long periods into consideration, that the quantity of money in circulation in each country diverges far less from its average level than we should at first sight have expected, with the exception of the violent perturbations which arise periodically, either from crises in production and commerce, or, more rarely, from changes in the value of money itself. The law that the quantity of the circulating medium is determined by the sum of the prices of the commodities in circulation, and the average velocity of the circulation of money, may also be stated as follows. Given the sum of the values of commodities, and the average rapidity of their metamorphoses, the quantity of money, or of the material of money in circulation, depends on its own value. The illusion that it is, on the contrary, prices which are determined by the quantity of the circulating medium, and that the latter, for its part, depends on the amount of monetary material which happens to be present in a country, had its roots in the absurd hypothesis adopted by the original representatives of this view that commodities enter into the process of circulation without a price, and money enters without a value, and that once they have entered circulation, an aliquot part of the medley of commodities is exchanged for an aliquot part of the heap of precious metals. Subsection C. Coin. The symbol of value. Money takes the shape of coin because of its function as the circulating medium. The weight of gold, represented in the imagination by the prices or money names of the commodities, has to confront those commodities, within circulation, as coins or pieces of gold of the same denomination. The business of coining, like the establishing of a standard measure of prices, is an attribute proper to the state. The different national uniforms worn at home by gold and silver as coins, but taken off again when they appear on the world market, demonstrate the separation between the internal or national spheres of commodity circulation and its universal sphere, the world market. The only difference, therefore, between coin and bullion lies in their physical configuration, and gold can at any time pass from one form to the other. For a coin, the road from the mint is also the path to the melting pot. In the course of circulation, 
Coins wear down, some to a greater extent, some to a lesser. The denomination of the gold and its substance, the nominal content and the real content, begin to move apart. Coins of the same denomination become different in value because they are different in weight. The weight of gold fixed upon as the standard of prices diverges from the weight which serves as the circulating medium, and the latter thereby ceases to be a real equivalent of the commodities whose prices it realizes. The history of these difficulties constitutes the history of the coinage throughout the Middle Ages and in modern times down to the 18th century. The natural and spontaneous tendency of the process of circulation to transform the coin from its metallic existence as gold into the semblance of gold, or to transform the coin into a symbol of its official metallic content, is itself recognized by the most recent laws on the degree of metal loss which demonetizes a gold coin, i.e. renders it incapable of being circulated. The fact that the circulation of money itself splits the nominal content of coins away from their real content Dividing their metallic existence from their functional existence, this fact implies the latent possibility of replacing metallic money with tokens made of some other material, i.e. symbols which would perform the function of coins. The technical obstacles to coining, extremely minute quantities of gold and silver, and the circumstance that at first the less precious metal is used as the measure of value instead of the more precious, copper instead of silver, silver instead of gold, and that the less precious circulates as money until dethroned by the more precious, these facts provide a historical explanation for the role played by silver and copper tokens as substitute for gold coins. Silver and copper coins replace gold in those regions of the circulation of commodities where coins pass from hand to hand most rapidly, and are therefore worn out most quickly. This happens where sales and purchases on a very small scale recur unceasingly. In order to prevent these satellites from establishing themselves permanently in the place of gold, the law determines the very minute proportions in which alone they can be accepted as alternative payment. The particular tracks pursued by the different sorts of coin in circulation naturally run into each other. Small change appears alongside gold for the payment of fractional parts of the smallest gold coin. Gold constantly enters into retail circulation, although it is just as constantly being thrown out again by being exchanged with small change. The metallic content of silver and copper tokens is arbitrarily determined by law. In the course of circulation, they wear down even more rapidly than gold coins. Their function as coins is therefore, in practice, entirely independent of their weight, i.e. it is independent of all value. In its form of existence as coin, gold becomes completely divorced from the substance of its value. Relatively valueless objects, therefore, such as paper notes, can serve as coins in place of gold. This purely symbolic character of the currency is still somewhat disguised in the case of metal tokens. In paper money, it stands out plainly. But we can see, everything depends on the first step. Here we are concerned only with inconvertible paper money issued by the state and given forced currency. This money emerges directly out of the circulation of metallic money. Credit money, on the other hand, implies relations which are as yet totally unknown from the standpoint of the simple circulation of commodities. But it may be noted in passing that just as true paper money arises out of the function of money as the circulating medium, so does credit money take root spontaneously in the function of money as the means of payment. Pieces of paper on which money names are printed, such as one pounds, five pounds, etc., are thrown into the circulation process from outside by the state. Insofar as they actually circulate in place of the same amount of gold, their movement is simply a reflection of the laws of monetary circulation itself. A law peculiar to the circulation of paper money can only spring up from the proportion in which that paper money represents gold. In simple terms, the law referred to is as follows. The issue of paper money must be restricted to the quantity of gold, or silver, which would actually be in circulation, and which is represented symbolically by the paper money. Now it is true that the quantity of gold which can be absorbed by the sphere of circulation constantly fluctuates above and below a certain average level, but despite this, the mass of the circulating medium in a given country never sinks below a certain minimum, which can be ascertained by experience. The fact that this minimum mass continually undergoes changes in its constituent parts, or that the pieces of gold of which it consists are constantly being replaced by other pieces, naturally causes no change either in its amount or in the continuity with which it flows around the sphere of circulation. It can therefore be replaced by paper symbols. 
If, however, all the channels of circulation were today filled with paper money to the full extent of their capacity for absorbing money, they might the next day be overfull, owing to the fluctuation in the circulation of commodities. There would no longer be any standard. If the paper money exceeds its proper limit, i.e. the amount in gold coins of the same denomination which could have been in circulation, then quite apart from the danger of becoming universally discredited, it will still represent within the world of commodities only that quantity of gold which is fixed by its imminent laws. No greater quantity is capable of being represented. If the quantity of paper money represents twice the amount of gold available, then in practice one pounds will be the money name not of one quarter of an ounce of gold, but of one eighth of an ounce. The effect is the same as if an alteration had taken place in the function of gold as the standard of prices. The values previously expressed by the price of one pounds would now be expressed by the price of two pounds. Paper money is a symbol of gold, a symbol of money. Its relation to the values of commodities consists only in this. They find imaginary expression in certain quantities of gold, and the same quantities are symbolically and physically represented by the paper. Only insofar as paper money represents gold, which like other commodities has value, is it a symbol of value. Finally, one may ask why gold is capable of being replaced by valueless symbols of itself. As we have already seen, it is capable of being replaced in this way only if its function as coin or circulating medium can be singled out or rendered independent. Now this function of being the circulating medium does not attain an independent position as far as the individual gold coins are concerned, although that independent position does appear in the case of the continued circulation of abraded coins. A piece of money is a mere coin, or means of circulation, only as long as it is actually in circulation. But what is not valid for the individual gold coin is valid for the minimum mass of gold which is capable of being replaced by paper money. That mass constantly haunts the sphere of circulation, continually functions as a circulating medium, and therefore exists exclusively as the bearer of this function. Its movement therefore represents nothing but the continued alternation of the inverse phases of the metamorphosis CMC, phases in which the commodity's shape as a value confronts it only to disappear again immediately. The presentation of the exchange value of a commodity as an independent entity is here only a transient aspect of the process. The commodity is immediately replaced again by another commodity. Hence, in this process, which continually makes money pass from hand to hand, it only needs to lead a symbolic existence. Its functional existence, so to speak, absorbs its material existence. Since it is a transiently objectified reflection of the prices of commodities, it serves only as a symbol of itself, and can therefore be replaced by another symbol. One thing is necessary, however. The symbol of money must have its own objective social validity. The paper acquires this by its forced currency. The state's compulsion can only be of any effect within that internal sphere of circulation which is circumscribed by the boundaries of a given community, but it is also only within that sphere that money is completely absorbed in its function as medium of circulation, and is therefore able to receive, in the form of paper money, a purely functional mode of existence, in which it is externally separated from its metallic substance. Section 3. Money. The commodity which functions as a measure of value, and therefore also as a medium of circulation, either in its own body or through a representative, is money. Gold, or silver, is therefore money. It functions as money on the one hand when it has to appear in person as gold. It is then the money commodity, neither merely ideal, as when it is a measure of value, nor capable of being represented, as when it is the medium of circulation. On the other hand, it also functions as money when its function, whether performed in person or by representative, causes it to be fixed as the sole form of value, or in other words, as the only adequate form of existence of exchange value in the face of all the other commodities, here playing the role of use values, pure and simple. Subsection A. Hoarding. The continuous circular movement of the two antithetical metamorphoses of commodities, or the repeated alternating flow of sale and purchase, is reflected in the unceasing turnover of money, in the function it performs of a perpetuum mobile of circulation. But as soon as the series of metamorphoses is interrupted, as soon as sales are not supplemented by subsequent purchases, money is immobilized. In other words, it is transformed, as Boisguibert says, from mobile into immobile, from coin into money. When the circulation of commodities first develops, there also develops the necessity and the passionate desire to hold fast to the product of the first metamorphosis. This product is the transformed shape of the commodity, or its gold chrysalis. 
Commodities are thus sold not in order to buy commodities, but in order to replace their commodity form by their money form. Instead of being merely a way of mediating the metabolic process, this change of form becomes an end in itself. The form of the commodity in which it is divested of content is prevented from functioning as its absolutely alienable form, or even as its merely transient money form. The money is petrified into a hoard, and the seller of commodities becomes a hoarder of money. In the very beginnings of the circulation of commodities, it is only the excess amounts of use value which are converted into money. Gold and silver thus become of themselves social expressions for superfluity or wealth. This naive form of hoarding is perpetuated among those peoples whose traditional mode of production, aimed at fulfilling their own requirements, corresponds to a fixed and limited range of needs. This is true of the Asiatics, particularly of the Indians. Vanderlint, who imagines that the prices of commodities in a country are determined by the quantity of gold and silver to be found in it, asks himself why Indian commodities are so cheap. Answer, because the Indians bury their money. From 1602 to 1734, he remarks, they buried 150 million pounds worth of silver, which originally came from America to Europe. From 1856 to 1866, in other words in 10 years, England exported to India, and China, but most of the metal exported to China flows back again to India, 120 million pounds in silver, which had been received in exchange for Australian gold. With more developed commodity production, every producer is compelled to secure for himself the nexus rerum, the social pledge. His needs are ceaselessly renewed and necessitate the continual purchase of other people's commodities, whereas the production and sale of his own commodity costs time and is subject to various accidents. In order, then, to be able to buy without selling, he must have sold previously without buying. This operation, conducted on a general scale, seems to involve a self-contradiction. But at the source of their production, the precious metals are directly exchanged for other commodities. And here we have sales, by the owners of commodities, without purchases, by the owners of gold or silver. And later sales again, without subsequent purchases, merely bring about a further distribution of the precious metals among all the owners of commodities. In this way, hordes of gold and silver, of the most various sizes, are piled up at all points of commercial intercourse. With the possibility of keeping hold of the commodity as exchange value, or exchange value as a commodity, the lust for gold awakens. With the extension of commodity circulation, there is an increase in the power of money, that absolutely social form of wealth which is always ready to be used. Quote, Gold is a wonderful thing. Its owner is master of all he desires. Gold can even enable souls to enter paradise. End quote from Columbus in his letter from Jamaica in 1503. Since money does not reveal what has been transformed into it, everything, commodity or not, is convertible into money. Everything becomes saleable and purchasable. Circulation becomes the great social retort into which everything is thrown to come out again as the money crystal. Nothing is immune from this alchemy. The bones of the saints cannot withstand it, let alone more delicate Christian kings. Just as in money every qualitative difference between commodities is extinguished, so too for its own part, as a radical leveler, it extinguishes all distinctions. But money is itself a commodity, an external object capable of becoming the private property of any individual. The social power becomes the private power of private persons. Ancient society therefore denounced it as tending to destroy the economic and moral order. Modern society, which already in its infancy had pulled Pluto by the hair of his head from the bowels of the earth, greets gold as its holy grail, as the glittering incarnation of its innermost principle of life. The commodity, as a use value, satisfies a particular need and forms a particular element of material wealth. But the value of a commodity measures the degree of its attractiveness for all other elements of material wealth, and therefore measures the social wealth of its owner. To the simple owner of commodities among the barbarians, and even to the peasant of Western Europe, value is inseparable from the value form. Hence an increase in his hoard of gold and silver is an increase in value. It is true that the value of money varies, whether as a result of a variation in its own value or a change in the value of commodities. But this, on the one hand, does not prevent 200 ounces of gold from continuing to contain more value than 100 ounces. Nor, on the other hand, does it prevent the metallic natural form of this object from continuing to be the universal equivalent form of all other commodities, and the directly social incarnation of all human labor. The hoarding drive is boundless in its nature. Qualitatively or formally considered, money is independent of all limits. That is, it is the universal representative of material wealth because it is directly convertible into any other commodity. But at the same time, 
Every actual sum of money is limited in amount, and therefore only has a limited efficacy as means of purchase. This contradiction between the quantitative limitation and the qualitative lack of limitation of money keeps driving the hoarder back to his Sisyphean task, accumulation. He is in the same situation as a world conqueror who discovers a new boundary with each country he annexes. In order that gold may be held as money and made to form a hoard, it must be prevented from circulating or from dissolving into the means of purchasing enjoyment. The hoarder therefore sacrifices the lust of his flesh to the fetish of gold. He takes the gospel of abstinence very seriously. On the other hand, he cannot withdraw any more from circulation in the shape of money than he has thrown into it in the shape of commodities. The more he produces, the more he can sell. Work, thrift, and greed are therefore his three cardinal virtues, and to sell much and buy little is the sum of his political economy. Alongside the direct form of the hoard, there runs its aesthetic form, the possession of commodities made out of gold and silver. This grows with the wealth of civil society. Quote, let us be rich, or let us appear rich, end quote from Diderot. In this way, there is formed, on the one hand, a constantly extending market for gold and silver, which is independent of their monetary functions, and on the other hand, a latent source of monetary inflow, which is used particularly in periods of social disturbance. Hoarding serves various purposes in an economy where metallic circulation prevails. Its first function arises out of the conditions of the circulation of gold and silver coins. We have seen how, owing to the continual fluctuations in the extent and rapidity of the circulation of commodities and in their prices, the quantity of money in circulation unceasingly ebbs and flows. This quantity must, therefore, be capable of expansion and contraction. At one time, money must be attracted as coin. At another time, coin must be repelled as money. In order that the mass of money actually in circulation may always correspond to the saturation level of the sphere of circulation, it is necessary for the quantity of gold and silver available in a country to be greater than the quantity required to function as coin. The reserves created by hoarding serve as channels through which money may flow in and out of circulation, so that the circulation itself never overflows its banks. Subsection B. Means of Payment in the direct form of commodity circulation hitherto considered, we found a given value always presented to us in a double shape, as a commodity at one pole and money at the opposite pole. The owners of commodities therefore came into contact as the representatives of equivalents which were already available to each of them. But with the development of circulation, conditions arise under which the alienation of the commodity becomes separated by an interval of time from the realization of its price. It'll be sufficient to indicate the most simple of these conditions. One sort of commodity requires a longer, another shorter time for its production. The production of different commodities depends on different seasons of the year. One commodity may be born in the marketplace, another must travel to a distant market. One commodity owner may therefore step forth as a seller before the other is ready to buy. When the same transactions are continually repeated between the same persons, the conditions of sale are regulated according to the conditions of production. On the other hand, the use of certain kinds of commodity, houses for instance, is sold for a definite period. Only after the lease has expired has the buyer actually received the use value of the commodity. He therefore buys it before he pays for it. The seller sells an existing commodity. The buyer buys as the mere representative of money, or rather as the representative of future money. The seller becomes a creditor. The buyer becomes a debtor. Since the metamorphosis of commodities, or the development of their form of value, has undergone a change here, money receives a new function as well. It becomes the means of payment. The role of creditor, or of debtor, results here from the simple circulation of commodities. The change in its form impresses this new stamp on seller and buyer. At first, therefore, these new roles are just as transient as those of seller and buyer and are played alternately by the same actors. Nevertheless, this opposition looks less pleasant from the very outset and it is capable of a more rigid crystallization. However, the same characteristics can emerge independently of the circulation of commodities. The class struggle in the ancient world, for instance, took the form mainly of a contest between debtors and creditors, and ended in Rome with the ruin of the plebeian debtors, who were replaced by slaves. In the Middle Ages, the contest ended with the ruin of the feudal debtors, who lost their political power together with its economic basis. Here, indeed, the money form and the relation between creditor and debtor does have the form of a money relation, was only the reflection of an antagonism which lay deeper at the level of economic conditions of existence. Let us return to the sphere of circulation. 
The two equivalents, commodities and money, have ceased to appear simultaneously at the two poles of the process of sale. The money functions now, first as a measure of value in the determination of the price of the commodity sold. The price fixed by contract measures the obligation of the buyer, i.e. the sum of money he owes at a particular time. Secondly, it serves as a nominal means of purchase. Although existing only in the promise of the buyer to pay, it causes the commodity to change hands. Not until payment falls due does the means of payment actually step into circulation, i.e. leave the hand of the buyer for that of the seller. The circulating medium was transformed into a hoard because the process stopped short after the first phase, because the converted shape of the commodity was withdrawn from circulation. The means of payment enters circulation but only after the commodity has already left it. The money no longer mediates the process. It brings it to an end by emerging independently as the absolute form of existence of exchange value, in other words, the universal commodity. The seller turned his commodity into money in order to satisfy some need, the hoarder in order to preserve the monetary form of his commodity, and the indebted purchaser in order to be able to pay. If he does not pay, his goods will be sold compulsorily. The value form of the commodity, money, has now become the self-sufficient purpose of the sale, owing to a social necessity springing from the conditions of the process of circulation itself. The buyer converts money back into commodities before he has turned commodities into money. In other words, he achieves the second metamorphosis of commodities before the first. The seller's commodity circulates and realizes its price, but only as a title to money in civil law. It is converted into a use value before it has been converted into money. The completion of its first metamorphosis occurs only subsequently. The obligations falling due within a given period of the circulation process represent the sum of the prices of the commodities whose sale gave rise to those obligations. The quantity of money necessary to realize this sum depends in the first instance on the rapidity of circulation of the means of payment. The quantity is conditioned by two factors. First, the way in which relations between creditors and debtors interlock, as when A receives money from B who is in debt to him and then pays it out to his creditor C, and second, the length of time between the different days in which the obligations fall due. The chain of payments, or retarded first metamorphoses which participate in this process, is essentially different from that intertwining of the series of metamorphoses considered earlier. The flow of the circulating medium does not merely express the connection between buyers and sellers. The connection itself arises within and exists through the circulation of money. The movement of the means of payment, however, expresses a social connection which was already present independently. The fact that sales take place simultaneously and side by side limits the extent to which the rapidity of turnover can make up for the quantity of currency available. On the other hand, this fact gives a new impulse towards the economical use of the means of payment. With the concentration of payments in one place, special institutions and methods of liquidation develop spontaneously. For instance, the clearing houses in medieval Lyon. The debts due to A from B, to B from C, to C from A, and so on, have only to be brought face to face in order to cancel each other out, to a certain extent, as positive and negative amounts. There remains only a single debit balance to be settled. The greater the concentrations of the payments, the less is this balance in relation to the total amount, hence the less is the mass of the means of payment in circulation. There is a contradiction imminent in the function of money as the means of payment. When the payments balance each other, Money functions only nominally, as money of account, as a measure of value. But when actual payments have to be made, money does not come onto the scene as a circulating medium, in its merely transient form of an intermediary in the social metabolism, but as the individual incarnation of social labor, the independent presence of exchange value, the universal commodity. This contradiction bursts forth in that aspect of an industrial and commercial crisis, which is known as a monetary crisis. Such a crisis occurs only where the ongoing chain of payments has been fully developed, along with an artificial system for settling them. Whenever there is a general disturbance of the mechanism, no matter what its cause, money suddenly and immediately changes over from its merely nominal shape, money of account, into hard cash. Profane commodities can no longer replace it. The use value of commodities becomes valueless, and their value vanishes in the face of their own form of value. The bourgeois, drunk with prosperity and arrogantly certain of himself, has just declared that money is a purely imaginary creation. Commodities alone are money, he said. But now the opposite cry resounds over the markets of the world. Only money is a commodity. As the heart pants after fresh water, so pants his soul after money, the only wealth. 
In a crisis, the antithesis between commodities and their value form, money, is raised to the level of an absolute contradiction. Hence, money's form of appearance is here also a matter of indifference. The monetary famine remains, whether payments have to be made in gold or in credit money, such as banknotes. If we now consider the total amount of money in circulation during a given period, we find that for any given turnover rate of the medium of circulation and the means of payment, it is equal to the sum of prices to be realized, plus the sum of the payments falling due, minus the payments which balance each other out, and finally minus the number of circuits in which the same piece of coin serves alternately as medium of circulation and means of payment. The farmer, for example, sells his wheat for two pounds, and this money serves thus as a medium of circulation. On the day when the payment falls due, he uses it to pay for linen which the weaver has delivered. The same two pounds now serves as the means of payment. The weaver now buys a Bible for cash. This serves again as the medium of circulation, and so on. Therefore, even when prices, speed of monetary circulation, and economies in the use of the means of payment are given, the quantity of money in circulation no longer corresponds with the mass of commodities in circulation during a given period, such as a day. Money which represents commodities long since withdrawn from the circulation continues to circulate. Commodities circulate, but their equivalent in money does not appear until some future date. Moreover, the debts contracted each day and the payments falling due on the same day are entirely incommensurable magnitudes. Credit money springs directly out of the function of money as a means of payment, in that certificates of debts owing for already purchased commodities themselves circulate for the purpose of transferring those debts to others. On the other hand, the function of money as a means of payment undergoes expansion in proportion as the system of credit itself expands. As the means of payment, money takes on its own peculiar forms of existence, in which it inhabits the sphere of large-scale commercial transactions. Gold and silver coin, on the other hand, are mostly relegated to the sphere of retail trade. When the production of commodities has attained a certain level and extent, the function of money as means of payment begins to spread out beyond the sphere of circulation of commodities. It becomes the universal material of contracts. Rent, taxes, and so on are transformed from payments in kind to payments in money. The great extent to which this transformation is conditioned by the total shape of the process of production is shown, for example, by the twice-repeated failure of the Roman Empire to levy all contributions in money. The unspeakable misery of the French agricultural population under Louis XIV, a misery so eloquently denounced by Bois-Guibert, Marshal Valbon, and others, was due not only to the weight of the taxes, but also to the conversion of taxes in kind into taxes in money. In Asia, on the other hand, the form of ground rent paid in kind, which is at the same time the main element in state taxation, is based on relations of production which reproduce themselves with the immutability of natural conditions. And this mode of payment, in its turn, acts to maintain the ancient form of production. It forms one of the secrets of the self-preservation of the Ottoman Empire. If the foreign trade imposed on Japan by Europe brings with it the transformation of rents in kind into money rents, then the exemplary agriculture of that country will be done for. Its narrowly based economic conditions of existence will be swept away. In every country, certain days become established as the dates on which general settlements are made. They depend, in part, leaving aside other circular movements described by reproduction, upon the natural conditions of production, which are bound up with the alternation of the seasons. They also regulate the dates for payments which have no direct connection with the circulation of commodities, such as taxes, rents, and so on. The fact that the quantity of money required to make these isolated payments over the whole surface of society falls due on certain days of the year causes periodic, but entirely superficial, perturbations in the economy of the means of payment. From the law of the rapidity of circulation of the means of payment, it follows that the quantity of the means of payment required for all periodic payments, whatever their source, is in direct proportion to the length of the periods. The development of money as a means of payment makes it necessary to accumulate it in preparation for the days when the sums which are owing fall due, while hoarding, considered as an independent form of self-enrichment, vanishes with the advance of bourgeois society, it grows at the same time in the form of the accumulation of a reserve fund of the means of payment. Subsection C. World Money When money leaves the domestic sphere of circulation, it loses the local functions it has acquired there, as the standard of prices, coin, and small change, and as a symbol of value, and falls back into its original form as precious metal in the shape of bullion. In world trade, commodities develop their value universally. Their independent value form thus confronts them here too as world money. 
It is in the world market that money first functions to its full extent as the commodity whose natural form is also the directly social form of realization of human labor in the abstract. Its mode of existence becomes adequate to its concept. Within the sphere of domestic circulation, there can only be one commodity which by serving as a measure of value becomes money. On the world market, a double standard prevails, both gold and silver. World money serves as the universal means of payment, as universal means of purchase, and as the absolute social materialization of wealth as such, universal wealth. Its predominant function is as means of payment in the settling of international balances, hence the slogan of the mercantile system, balance of trade. Gold and silver serve essentially as international means of purchase when the customary equilibrium in the interchange of products between different nations is suddenly disturbed. And lastly, world money serves as the universally recognized social materialization of wealth whenever it is not a matter of buying or paying, but of transferring wealth from one country to another, and whenever its transfer in the form of commodities is ruled out, either by the conjuncture of the market or by the purpose of the transfer itself. Just as every country needs a reserve fund for its internal circulation, so too it requires one for circulation in the world market. The functions of hoards, therefore, arise in part out of the function of money as a medium of payment and circulation internally, and in part out of its function as a world currency. In this latter role, it is always the genuine money commodity, gold and silver in their physical shape, which is required. For that reason, Sir James Stewart expressly characterizes gold and silver as money of the world, in order to distinguish them from their merely local representatives. The stream of gold and silver has a twofold motion. On the one hand, it spreads out from its sources all over the world, and is absorbed to various extents in the different national spheres of circulation, where it enters into the various channels of internal circulation. There, it replaces abraded gold and silver coins, supplies the material for articles of luxury, and petrifies into hordes. The first movement is transmitted through the medium of direct exchange of the labor of individual countries, which has been realized in commodities for the labor realized in precious metals by the gold and silver producing countries. On the other hand, gold and silver continually flow backwards and forwards between the different national spheres of circulation, and this movement follows the unceasing fluctuations of the rate of exchange. Countries with developed bourgeois production limit the hordes concentrated in the strong rooms of the banks to the minimum required for the performance of their specific functions. Whenever these hordes are strikingly above their average level, this is, with some exceptions, an indication of stagnation in the circulation of commodities, i.e. of an interruption in the flow of their metamorphoses. End of Part 1 Part 2 the Transformation of Money into Capital Chapter 4. The General Formula for Capital The circulation of commodities is the starting point of capital. The production of commodities and their circulation in its developed form, namely trade, form the historic presuppositions under which capital arises. World trade and the world market date from the 16th century, and from then on the modern history of capital starts to unfold. If we disregard the material content of the circulation of commodities, i.e. the exchange of the various use values, and consider only the economic forms brought into being by this process, we find that its ultimate product is money. This ultimate product of commodity circulation is the first form of appearance of capital. Historically speaking, capital invariably first confronts landed property in the form of money, in the form of monetary wealth, merchant's capital, and usurer's capital. However, we do not need to look back at the history of capital's origins in order to recognize that money is its first form of appearance. Every day, the same story is played out before us. Even up to the present day, all new capital in the first instance steps onto the stage, i.e. the market, whether it's the commodity market, the labor market, or the money market, in the shape of money. Money which has to be transformed into capital by definite processes. The first distinction between money as money and money as capital is nothing more than a difference in their form of circulation. The direct form of circulation of commodities is CMC, the transformation of commodities into money and the reconversion of money into commodities, selling in order to buy. But alongside this form we find another form, which is quite distinct from the first, MCM, the transformation of money into commodities and the reconversion of commodities into money, buying in order to sell. Money which describes the latter course in its movement is transformed into capital, becomes capital, and from the point of view of its function, already is capital. Let us examine the circular movement MCM a little more closely. 
Just as in the case of simple circulation, it passes through two antithetical phases. In the first phase, M to C being the purchase, the money is changed into a commodity. In the second phase, C to M, the sale, the commodity is changed back again into money. These two phases, taken together in their unity, constitute the total movement which exchanges money for a commodity and the same commodity for money, which buys a commodity in order to sell it, or if one neglects the formal distinction between buying and selling, buys a commodity with money and then buys money with a commodity. The result, in which the whole process vanishes, is the exchange of money for money, M to M. If I purchase 2,000 pounds of cotton for 100 pounds sterling and resell the 2,000 pounds of cotton for 110 pounds, I have in fact exchanged 100 pounds for 110 pounds, money for money. Now it is evident that the circulatory process MCM would be absurd and empty if the intention were, by using this roundabout route, to exchange two equal sums of money, 100 pounds for 100 pounds. The miser's plan would be far simpler and surer. He holds on to his 100 pounds instead of exposing it to the dangers of circulation. And yet, whether the merchant who has paid £100 for his cotton sells it for £110, or lets it go for £100 or even £50, his money has at all events described a characteristic and original path, quite different in kind from the path of simple circulation, as for instance in the case of the peasant who sells corn and with the money thus set free buys clothes. First, then, we have to characterize the formal distinctions between the two circular paths MCM and CMC. This will simultaneously provide us with the difference in content which lies behind these formal distinctions. Let us first see what the two forms have in common. Both paths can be divided into the same two antithetical phases, C to M being a sale and M to C being a purchase. In each phase, the same material elements confront each other, namely a commodity and money, and the same economic dramatis personae, a buyer and a seller. Each circular path is the unity of the same two antithetical phases, and in each case this unity is mediated through the emergence of three participants in a contract, of whom one only sells, another only buys, and the third both buys and sells. What however first and foremost distinguishes the two paths CMC and MCM from each other is the inverted order of succession of the two opposed phases of circulation. The simple circulation of commodities begins with a sale and ends with a purchase, while the circulation of money as capital begins with a purchase and ends with a sale. In the one case, both the starting point and the terminating point of the movement are commodities. In the other, they are money. The whole process is mediated in the first form by money and in the second inversely by a commodity. In the circulation CMC, the money is in the end converted into a commodity which serves as a use value. It has therefore been spent once and for all. In the inverted form, MCM, on the contrary, the buyer lays out money in order that as a seller he may recover money. By the purchase of his commodity, he throws money into circulation in order to withdraw it again by the sale of the same commodity. He releases the money, but only with the cunning intention of getting it back again. The money, therefore, is not spent. It is merely advanced. In the form CMC, the same piece of money is displaced twice. The seller gets it from the buyer and pays it away to another seller. The whole process begins when money is received in return for commodities, and comes to an end when money is given up in return for commodities. In the form MCM, this process is inverted. Here, it is not the piece of money which is displaced twice, but the commodity. The buyer takes it from the hands of the seller and passes it into the hands of another buyer. Whilst in the simple circulation of commodities, the twofold displacement of the same piece of money effects its definitive transfer from one hand into another, here the twofold displacement of the same commodity causes the money to flow back to its initial point of departure. This reflux of money to its starting point does not depend on the commodities being sold for more than was paid for it. That only has a bearing on the amount of money which flows back. The phenomenon of reflux itself takes place as soon as the purchased commodity is resold, i.e. as soon as the cycle MCM has been completed. We have here, therefore, a palpable difference between the circulation of money as capital and its circulation as mere money. The cycle CMC reaches its conclusion when the money brought in by the sale of one commodity is withdrawn again by the purchase of another. If there follows a reflux of money to its starting point, this can happen only through a renewal or repetition of the whole course of the movement. If I sell a quarter of corn for three pounds, and with this three pounds buy clothes, the money, so far as I'm concerned, is irreversibly spent. I have nothing more to do with it. It belongs to the clothes merchant. If I now sell a second quarter of corn, money indeed flows back to me, not, however, as a result of the first transaction, but of its repetition. The money again leaves me as soon as I complete the second transaction by a fresh purchase. In the cycle CMC, therefore, the expenditure of money has nothing to do with its reflux. 
In MCM, on the other hand, the reflux of the money is conditioned by the very manner in which it is expended. Without this reflux, the operation fails, or the process is interrupted and incomplete, owing to the absence of its complementary and final phase, the sale. The path CMC proceeds from the extreme constituted by one commodity and ends with the extreme constituted by another, which falls out of circulation and into consumption. Consumption, the satisfaction of needs, in short, use value, is therefore its final goal. The path MCM, however, proceeds from the extreme of money and finally returns to that same extreme. Its driving and motivating force, its determining purpose, is therefore exchange value. In the simple circulation of commodities, the two extremes have the same economic form. They are both commodities and commodities of equal value, but they are also qualitatively different use values, as for example corn and clothes. The exchange of products, the interchange carried out between the different materials in which social labor is embodied, forms here the content of the movement. It is otherwise in the cycle MCM. At first sight, this appears to lack any content, because it is tautological. Both extremes have the same economic form. They're both money, and therefore not qualitatively different use values, for money is precisely the converted form of commodities in which their particular use values have been extinguished. To exchange a hundred pounds for cotton, and then to exchange the same cotton again for a hundred pounds, is merely a roundabout way of exchanging money for money, the same for the same, and appears to be an operation as purposeless as it is absurd. One sum of money is distinguishable from another only by its amount. The process MCM does not, therefore, owe its content to any qualitative difference between its extremes, for they are both money, but solely to the quantitative changes. More money is finally withdrawn from circulation than was thrown into it at the beginning. The cotton originally bought for £100 is, for example, resold at £100 plus £10. The complete form of this process is therefore M to C to M prime, where M prime is equal to M plus delta M, i.e. the original sum advance plus an increment. This increment, or excess over the original value, I call surplus value. The value originally advanced, therefore, not only remains intact while in circulation, but increases its magnitude, adds to itself a surplus value, or is valorized, and this movement converts it into capital. Of course, it is also possible that in C to M to C, the two extremes C and C, say corn and clothes, may represent quantitatively different magnitudes of value, the peasant may sell his corn above its value, or may buy clothes at less than their value. He may, on the other hand, be cheated by the clothes merchant. Yet for this particular form of circulation, such differences in value are purely accidental. The fact that the corn and the clothes are equivalents does not deprive the process of all sense and meaning, as it does in MCM. The equivalence of their values is rather a necessary condition of its normal course. The repetition or renewal of the act of selling in order to buy finds its measure and its goal, as does the process itself, in a final purpose which lies outside it, namely consumption, the satisfaction of definite needs. But in buying in order to sell, on the contrary, the end and the beginning are the same, money or exchange value, and this very fact makes the movement an endless one. Certainly, M becomes M plus delta M, 100 pounds becomes 110 pounds, but considered qualitatively, a hundred pounds is the same as a hundred and ten pounds, namely money, while from the quantitative point of view, a hundred and ten pounds is, like a hundred pounds, a sum of definite and limited value. If the hundred and ten pounds is now spent as money, it ceases to play its part. It is no longer capital. Withdrawn from circulation, it is petrified into a hoard, and it could remain in that position until the last judgment without a single farthing accruing to it. If, then, we are concerned with the valorization of value, the value of the 110 pounds has the same need for valorization as the value of the 100 pounds, for they are both limited expressions of exchange value, and therefore both have the same vocation, to approach, by quantitative increase, as near as possible to absolute wealth. Momentarily, indeed, the value originally advanced, 100 pounds, is distinguishable from the surplus value of 10 pounds, added to it during circulation, but the distinction vanishes immediately. At the end of the process, we do not receive on one hand the original hundred pounds, and on the other the surplus value of ten pounds. What emerges is rather a value of a hundred and ten, which is in exactly the same form, appropriate for commencing the valorization process, as the original hundred pounds. At the end of the movement, money emerges once again as its starting point. Therefore, the final result of each separate cycle, in which a purchase and consequent sale are completed, forms of itself the starting point for a new cycle. The simple circulation of commodities, selling in order to buy, is a means to a final goal which lies outside circulation, namely the appropriation of use values, the satisfaction of needs. 
As against this, the circulation of money as capital is an end in itself, for the valorization of value takes place only within this constantly renewed movement. The movement of capital is therefore limitless. As the conscious bearer of this movement, the possessor of money becomes a capitalist. His person, or rather his pocket, is the point from which the money starts, and to which it returns. The objective content of the circulation we have been discussing, the valorization of value, is his subjective purpose, and it is only insofar as the appropriation of ever more wealth in the abstract is the sole driving force behind his operations that he functions as a capitalist, i.e. as capital personified and endowed with consciousness and a will. Use values must therefore never be treated as the immediate aim of the capitalist, nor must the profit on any single transaction. His aim is rather the unceasing movement of profit-making. This boundless drive for enrichment, this passionate chase after value, is common to the capitalist and the miser. But while the miser is merely a capitalist gone mad, the capitalist is a rational miser. The ceaseless augmentation of value, which the miser seeks to attain by saving his money from circulation, is achieved by the more acute capitalist by means of throwing his money again and again into circulation. The independent form, i.e. the monetary form, which the value of commodities assumes in simple circulation, does nothing but mediate the exchange of commodities, and it vanishes in the final result of the movement. On the other hand, in the circulation MCM, both the money and the commodity function only as different modes of existence of value itself. The money has its general mode of existence, the commodity has its particular, or so to speak, disguised mode. It is constantly changing from one form into the other, without becoming lost in this movement. It thus becomes transformed into an automatic subject. If we pin down the specific forms of appearance assumed in turn by self-valorizing value in the course of its life, we reach the following elucidation. Capital is money. Capital is commodities. In truth, however, value is here the subject of a process in which, while constantly assuming the form in turn of money and commodities, it changes its own magnitude, throws off surplus value from itself considered as original value, and thus valorizes itself independently. For the movement in the course of which it adds surplus value is its own movement, its valorization is therefore self-valorization. By virtue of being value, it has acquired the occult ability to add value to itself. It brings forth living offspring, or at least lays golden eggs. As the dominant subject of this process, in which it alternately assumes and loses the form of money and the form of commodities, but preserves and expands itself through all these changes, value requires, above all, an independent form by means of which its identity with itself may be asserted. Only in the shape of money does it possess this form. Money, therefore, forms the starting point and the conclusion of every valorization process. It was a hundred pounds, and now it's a hundred and ten pounds, etc., but the money itself is only one of the two forms of value. Unless it takes the form of some commodity, it does not become capital. There is here no antagonism, as in the case of hoarding, between the money and commodities. The capitalist knows that all commodities, however tattered they may look or however badly they may smell, are in faith and in truth money, are by nature circumcised Jews, and what is more, a wonderful means for making still more money out of money. In simple circulation, the value of commodities attained at the most a form independent of their use values, i.e. the form of money. But now, in the circulation MCM, value suddenly presents itself as a self-moving substance which passes through a process of its own, and for which commodities and money are both mere forms. But there is more to come. Instead of simply representing the relations of commodities, it now enters into a private relationship with itself, as it were. It differentiates itself as original value from itself as surplus value, just as God the Father differentiates himself from himself as God the Son, although both are of the same age and form, in fact, one single person. For only by the surplus value of ten pounds does the hundred pounds originally advance become capital, and as soon as this has happened, as soon as the Son has been created and through the Son, the Father, their difference vanishes again, and both become one, a hundred and ten pounds. Value, therefore, now becomes value in process, money in process, and as such, capital. It comes out of circulation, enters into it again, preserves and multiplies itself within circulation, emerges from it with an increased size, and starts the same cycle again and again. M to M, money which begets money. Such is the description of capital given by its first interpreters, the mercantilists. Buying in order to sell, or more accurately, buying in order to sell dearer, MCM, seems admittedly to be a form peculiar to one kind of capital alone, merchant's capital. But industrial capital, too, 
is money which has been changed into commodities and reconverted into more money by the sale of these commodities. Events which take place outside the sphere of circulation, in the interval between buying and selling, do not affect the form of this movement. Lastly, in the case of interest-bearing capital, the circulation MCM prime presents itself in abridged form, in its final result and without any intermediate stage, in a concise style, so to speak, as M to M prime, i.e. money which is worth more money, value which is greater than itself. M to C to M prime is in fact, therefore, the general formula for capital, in the form in which it appears directly in the sphere of circulation. Chapter 5. Contradictions in the General Formula The form of circulation within which money is transformed into capital contradicts all the previously developed laws bearing on the nature of commodities, value, money, and even circulation itself. What distinguishes this form from that of simple circulation of commodities is the inverted order of succession of the two antithetical processes, sale and purchase. How can this purely formal distinction change the nature of these processes, as if by magic? But that's not all. This inversion has no existence for two of the three persons who transact business together. As a capitalist, I buy commodities from A and sell them again to B, but as a simple owner of commodities, I sell them to B and then purchase further commodities from A. For A and B, this distinction does not exist. They step forth only as buyers or sellers of commodities. I myself confront them each time as a mere owner of either money or commodities, as a buyer or a seller, and what's more, in both sets of transactions, I confront A only as a buyer and B only as a seller. I confront the one only as money, the other only as commodities, but neither of them as capital or a capitalist, or a representative of anything more than money or commodities, or of anything which might produce any effect beyond that produced by money or commodities. For me, the purchase from A and the sale to B are part of a series, but the connection between these two acts exists for me alone. A does not trouble himself about my transaction with B, nor does B about my business with A. And if I offered to explain to them the meritorious nature of my action in inverting the order of succession, they would probably point out to me that I was mistaken as to that order, and that the whole transaction, instead of beginning with the purchase and ending with the sale, began, on the contrary, with the sale and was concluded with the purchase. In truth, my first act, the purchase, was from the standpoint of A, a sale and my second act, the sale, was from the standpoint of B, a purchase. Not content with that, A and B would declare that the whole series was superfluous, and nothing but hocus-pocus, that for the future A would buy direct from B, and B sell direct to A. With this, the whole transaction would shrink down to a single, one-sided phase of the ordinary circulation of commodities, a mere sale from A's point of view, and from B's a mere purchase. Thus, the inversion of the order of succession does not take us outside the sphere of the simple circulation of commodities, and we must rather look to see whether this simple circulation, by its nature, might permit the valorization of the values entering into it, and consequently the formation of surplus value. Let us take the process of circulation in a form in which it presents itself to us as the exchange of commodities pure and simple. This is always the case when two owners of commodities buy from each other, and on the date of settlement the amounts they owe to each other balance out equally. Money serves here as money of account, and expresses the values of the commodities in their prices, but does not itself confront the commodities in a material shape. Insofar as use values are concerned, it is clear that both parties may gain. Both of them part with commodities which are of no service to them as use values, and receive others they need to use, and this may not be the only advantage gained. A, who sells wine and buys corn, possibly produces more wine in the same labor time than B, the corn farmer, could produce and B, on the other hand, may produce more corn than A, the wine grower, could produce. A may therefore get more corn for the same exchange value, and B more wine, than each would respectively get without any exchange if they had to produce their own corn and wine. With reference, therefore, to use value, it can indeed be said that exchange is a transaction by which both sides gain. It is otherwise with exchange value. A man who has plenty of wine and no corn treats with a man who has plenty of corn and no wine, an exchange takes place between them of corn to the value of 50 for wine of the same value. This act produces no increase of exchange value either for the one or the other, for each of them already possessed, before the exchange, a value equal to that which he acquired by means of that operation. This situation is not altered by placing money as a medium of circulation between the commodities and making the sale and the purchase into two physically distinct acts. The value of a commodity is expressed in its price before it enters into circulation, and it is therefore a precondition of circulation, not its result. 
If we consider this in the abstract, i.e. disregarding circumstances which do not flow from the imminent laws of simple commodity circulation, all that happens in exchange, if we leave aside the replacing of one use value by another, is a metamorphosis, a mere change in the form of the commodity. The same value, i.e. the same quantity of objectified social labor, remains throughout in the hands of the same commodity owner, first in the shape of his own commodity, and then in the shape of the money into which the commodity has been transformed, and finally, in the shape of the commodity into which this money has been reconverted. This change of form does not imply any change in the magnitude of value. But the change which the value of the commodity undergoes in this process is limited to a change in its money form. This form exists first as the price of the commodity offered for sale, then as an actual sum of money which was, however, already expressed in the price, and lastly, as the price of an equivalent commodity. This change of form no more implies, taken alone, a change in the quantity of value than does changing of a five-pound note into sovereigns, half-sovereigns, and shillings. In so far, therefore, as the circulation of commodities involves a change only in the form of their values, it necessarily involves the exchange of equivalents, provided the phenomenon occurs in its purity. The vulgar economists have practically no inkling of the nature of value, hence, whenever they wish to consider the phenomenon in its purity, after their fashion, they assume that supply and demand are equal, i.e. that they cease to have any effect at all. If then, as regards the use values exchanged, both buyer and seller may possibly gain something, this is not the case as regards exchange values. Here we must rather say, where quality exists, there is no gain. It is true that commodities may be sold at prices which diverge from their values, but this divergence appears as an infringement of the laws governing the exchange of commodities. In its pure form, the exchange of commodities is an exchange of equivalents, and thus it is not a method of increasing value. Hence we see that behind all attempts to represent the circulation of commodities as a source of surplus value, there lurks an inadvertent substitution, a confusion of use value and exchange value. In Kondiak, for instance, quote, It is not true that in an exchange of commodities we give value for value. On the contrary, each of the two contracting parties, in every case, gives a less for a greater value. If we really exchanged equal values, neither party would make a profit, and yet they both gain, or ought to gain. Why? The value of a thing consists solely in its relation to our needs. What is more to the one is less to the other, and vice versa. It is not to be assumed that we offer for sale articles essential for our own consumption. We wish to part with a useless thing in order to get one that we need. We want to give less for more. It was natural to think that, in an exchange, one value was given for another equal to it whenever each of the articles exchanged was of equal value with the same quantity of gold. But there is another point to be considered in our calculation. The question is, whether we both exchange something superfluous for something necessary. End quote. We see in this passage how Condillac not only confuses use value with exchange value, but in a really childish manner assumes that, in a society in which the production of commodities is well developed, each producer produces his own means of subsistence, and throws into circulation only what is superfluous, the excess over his own requirements. Still, Condillac's argument is frequently repeated by modern economists, especially when the point is to show that the exchange of commodities, in its developed form, commerce, is productive of surplus value. For instance, quote, Commerce adds value to products, for the same products in the hands of consumers are worth more than in the hands of producers, and it may strictly be considered as an act of production, end quote. But commodities are not paid for twice over, once on account of their use value and a second time on account of their value. And though the use value of a commodity is more serviceable to the buyer than to the seller, its money form is more so to the seller. Would he sell it otherwise? We might therefore just as well say that the buyer performs what is strictly an act of production by converting stockings, for example, into money. If commodities, or commodities and money, of equal exchange value, and consequently equivalents, are exchanged, it is plain that no one abstracts more value from circulation than he throws into it. The formation of surplus value does not take place. In its pure form, the circulation process necessitates the exchange of equivalents, but in reality processes do not take place in their pure form. Let us therefore assume an exchange of non-equivalents. In any case, the market for commodities is frequented only by owners of commodities, and the power which these persons exercise over each other is no other than the power of their commodities. The material variety of the commodities is the material driving force behind their exchange, and it makes buyers and sellers mutually dependent, because none of them possess the object of his own need, and each holds in his own hand the object of another's need. 
Apart from this material variety in their use values, there is only one other mark of distinction between commodities, the distinction between their natural form and their converted form, between commodities and money. Consequently, the owners of commodities can be differentiated only into sellers, those who own commodities, and buyers, those who own money. Suppose, then, that some inexplicable privilege allows the seller to sell his commodities above their value, to sell what is worth 100 for 110, therefore with a nominal price increase of 10%. In this case, the seller pockets a surplus value of 10. But after he is sold, he becomes a buyer. A third owner of commodities now comes to him as a seller, and he too, for his part, enjoys the privilege of selling his commodities 10% too dear. Our friend gained 10 as a seller, only to lose it again as a buyer. In fact, the net result is that all owners of commodities sell their goods to each other at 10% above their value, which is exactly the same as if they sold them at their true value. A universal and nominal price increase of this kind has the same effect as if the values of commodities had been expressed, for example, in silver instead of in gold. The money names or prices of the commodities would rise, but the relations between their values would remain unchanged. Let us make the opposite assumption that the buyer has the privilege of purchasing commodities below their value. In this case, we do not even need to recall that he, in his turn, will become a seller. He was a seller before he became a buyer. He had already lost 10% as a seller before he gained 10% as a buyer. Everything remains as it was before. The formation of surplus value, and therefore the transformation of money into capital, can consequently be explained neither by assuming that the commodities are sold above their value, nor by assuming that they are bought at less than their value. The problem is in no way simplified if extraneous matters are smuggled in, as with Colonel Torrens, quote, Effectual demand consists in the power and inclination on the part of consumers to give for commodities, either by immediate or circuitous barter, some greater portion of capital than their production costs, end quote. In circulation, producers and consumers confront each other only as buyers and sellers. To assert that the surplus value acquired by the producer has its origin in the fact that consumers pay for commodities more than their value is only to disguise the following simple phrase. The owner of commodities possesses, as a seller, the privilege of selling too dear. The seller has himself produced the commodities, or represents their producer, but the buyer has to no less an extent produced the commodities represented by his money, or represents the producer of those commodities. One producer is therefore confronted with another producer. The distinction between them is that one buys and the other sells. The fact that the owner of the commodities sells them at more than their value, under the designation of producer, and pays too much for them, under the designation of consumer, does not carry us a single step further. The consistent upholders of the mistaken theory that surplus value has its origin in a nominal rise of prices, or in the privilege which the seller has of selling too dear, assumes that there exists a class of buyers who do not sell, i.e. a class of consumers who do not produce, the existence of such a class is inexplicable from the standpoint we have so far reached, that of simple circulation. But let us anticipate. The money with which such a class is constantly making purchases must constantly flow into its coffers without any exchange, gratis, whether by might or by right, from the pockets of commodity owners themselves. To sell commodities at more than their value to such a class is only to get back again, by swindling, a part of the money previously handed over for nothing. Thus the towns of Asia Minor paid a yearly money tribute to ancient Rome. With this money, ancient Rome bought commodities from them and bought them too dear. The provincials cheated the Romans, and in this way swindled back from their conquerors a portion of the tribute in the course of the trade. Yet for all that, the provincials remained the ones who had been cheated. Their goods were still paid for with their own money. That is not the way to get rich, or to create surplus value. Let us therefore keep within the limits of the exchange of commodities, where sellers are buyers and buyers are sellers. Our perplexity may perhaps have arisen from conceiving people merely as personified categories, instead of as individuals. A may be clever enough to get the advantage of B and C, without their being able to take revenge. A sells wine worth 40 pounds to B, and obtains from him, in exchange, corn to the value of 50 pounds. A has converted his 40 pounds into 50 has made more money out of less, and has transformed his commodities into capital. Let us examine this a little more closely. Before the exchange, we had 40 pounds of wine in the hands of A, and 50 pounds worth of corn in those of B, a total value of 90 pounds. After the exchange, we still have the same total value of 90 pounds. The value in circulation has not increased by one iota. All that has changed is its distribution between A and B. What appears on one side as a loss of value appears on the other side as surplus value, 
What appears on one side as a minus appears on the other side as a plus. The same change would have taken place if A, without the disguise provided by the exchange, had directly stolen ten pounds from B. The sum of the values in circulation can clearly not be augmented by any change in their distribution any more than a merchant can increase the quantity of the precious metals in a country by selling a farthing from the time of Queen Anne for a guinea. The capitalist class of a given country, taken as a whole, cannot defraud itself. However much we twist and turn, the final conclusion remains the same. If equivalents are exchanged, no surplus value results, and if non-equivalents are exchanged, we still have no surplus value. Circulation, or the exchange of commodities, creates no value. It can be understood, therefore, why, in our analysis of the primary form of capital, the form in which it determines the economic organization of modern society, we have entirely left out of consideration its well-known and, so to speak, antediluvian form, merchant's capital and usurer's capital. The form M to C to M prime, buying in order to sell dearer, is at its purest and genuine merchant's capital. But the whole of this movement takes place within the sphere of circulation. Since, however, it is impossible by circulation alone to explain the transformation of money into capital and the formation of surplus value, merchant's capital appears to be an impossibility, as long as equivalents are exchanged. It appears, therefore, that it can only be derived from the twofold advantage gained, over both the selling and the buying producers, by the merchant who parasitically inserts himself between them. It is in this sense that Franklin says, quote, War is robbery and commerce is cheating, end quote. If the valorization of merchants' capital is not to be explained merely by frauds practiced on the producers of commodities, a long series of intermediate steps would be necessary, which are as yet entirely absent, since here our only assumption is the circulation of commodities and its simple elements. What we have said with reference to merchants' capital applies still more to usurers' capital. In merchants' capital, the two extremes, the money which is thrown upon the market and the augmented money which is withdrawn from the market, are at least mediated through a purchase and a sale through the movement of circulation. In usurer's capital, the form M to C to M prime is reduced to the unmediated extremes M to M prime, money which is exchanged for more money, a form incompatible with the nature of money and therefore inexplicable from the standpoint of the exchange of commodities. Hence Aristotle says, quote, Since crematistics is a double science, one part belonging to commerce, the other to economics, the latter being necessary and praiseworthy, the former based on circulation and with justice disapproved, for it is not based on nature but on mutual cheating, the usurer is most rightly hated, because money itself is the source of his gain, and it is not used for the purposes for which it was invented. For it originated for the exchange of commodities, but interest makes out of money more money, hence its name. For the offspring resembles the parent, but interest is money, so that of all modes of making a living, this is the most contrary to nature. End quote. In the course of our investigation, we shall find that both merchants' capital and interest-bearing capital are derivative forms, and at the same time it will become clear why, historically, these two forms appear before the modern primary form of capital. We have shown that surplus value cannot arise from circulation, and therefore that, for it to be formed, something must take place in the background which is not visible in the circulation itself. But can surplus value originate anywhere else than in circulation, which is the sum total of all the mutual relations of commodity owners? Outside circulation, the commodity owner only stands in a relation to his own commodity. As far as the value of that commodity is concerned, the relation is limited to this, that the commodity contains a quantity of his own labor, which is measured according to definite social laws. This quantity of labor is expressed by the magnitude of the value of his commodity, and since the value is reckoned in money of account, this quantity is also expressed by the price, ten pounds for instance. But his labor does not receive a double representation. It is not represented both in the value of the commodity and in an excess quantity over and above that value. It is not represented in a price of ten, which is simultaneously a price of eleven, i.e. in a value which is greater than itself. The commodity owner can create value by his labor, but he cannot create values which can valorize themselves. He can increase the value of his commodity by adding fresh labor, and therefore more value to the value in hand, by making leather into boots, for instance. The same material now has more value because it contains a greater quantity of labor. The boots have, therefore, more value than the leather, but the value of the leather remains what it was. It has not valorized itself. It has not annexed surplus value during the making of the boots. It is therefore impossible that, outside the sphere of circulation, a producer of commodities can, without coming into contact with other commodity owners, valorize value, and consequently transform money, or commodities, into capital. 
capital cannot, therefore, arise from circulation, and it is equally impossible for it to arise apart from circulation. It must have its origin both in circulation and not in circulation. We, therefore, have a double result. The transformation of money into capital has to be developed on the basis of the imminent laws of exchange of commodities, in such a way that the starting point is the exchange of equivalents. The money owner, who is as yet only a capitalist in larval form, must buy his commodities at their value, sell them at their value, and yet, at the end of the process, withdraw more value from circulation than he threw into it at the beginning. His emergence as a butterfly must, and yet must not, take place in the sphere of circulation. These are the conditions of the problem. Hicrotus Hic Salta. Chapter 6. The Sale and Purchase of Labor Power The change in value of the money, which has to be transformed into capital, cannot take place in the money itself, since in its function as a means of purchase and payment, it does no more than realize the price of the commodity it buys or pays for, while when it sticks to its own peculiar form, it petrifies into a massive value of constant magnitude. Just as little can this change originate in the second act of circulation, the resale of the commodity, for this act merely converts the commodity from its natural form back into its money form. The change must, therefore, take place in the commodity which is bought in the first act of circulation, M to C, but not in its value, for it is equivalents which are being exchanged, and the commodity is paid for at its full value. The change can, therefore, originate only in the actual use value of the commodity, i.e. in its consumption. In order to extract value out of the consumption of a commodity, our friend the money owner must be lucky enough to find within the sphere of circulation, on the market, a commodity whose use value possesses the peculiar property of being a source of value, whose actual consumption is therefore itself an objectification of labor, hence a creation of value. The possessor of money does find such a special commodity on the market, the capacity for labor, in other words, labor power. We mean by labor power, or labor capacity, the aggregate of those mental and physical capabilities existing in the physical form, the living personality, of a human being, capabilities which he sets in motion whenever he produces a use value of any kind. But in order that the owner of money may find labor power on the market as a commodity, various conditions must first be fulfilled. In and for itself, the exchange of commodities implies no other relations of dependence than those which result from its own nature. On this assumption, labor power can appear on the market as a commodity only if and insofar as its possessor, the individual whose labor power it is, offers it for sale or sells it as a commodity. In order that its possessor may sell it as a commodity, he must have it at his disposal. He must be the free proprietor of his own labor capacity, hence of his person. He and the owner of money meet in the market and enter into relations with each other on a footing of equality as owners of commodities, with the sole difference that one is a buyer the other is a seller. Both are therefore equal in the eyes of the law. For this relation to continue, the proprietor of labor power must always sell it for a limited period only, for if he were to sell it in a lump once and for all, he would be selling himself, converting himself from a free man into a slave, from an owner of a commodity into a commodity. He must constantly treat his labor power as his own property, his own commodity, and he can do this only by placing it at the disposal of the buyer, i.e. handing it over to the buyer for him to consume for a definite period of time temporarily. In this way, he manages both to alienate his labor power and to avoid renouncing his rights of ownership over it. The second essential condition which allows the owner of money to find labor power in the market as a commodity is this, that the possessor of labor power, instead of being able to sell commodities in which his labor has been objectified, must rather be compelled to offer for sale as a commodity that very labor power which exists only in his living body. In order that a man may be able to sell commodities other than his labor power, he must, of course, possess means of production, such as raw materials, instruments of labor, etc. No boots can be made without leather. He requires also the means of subsistence. Nobody, not even a practitioner of Zukunft's music, can live on the products of the future or on use values whose production has not yet been completed, just as on the first day of his appearance on the world stage, man must still consume every day, before and while he produces. If products are produced as commodities, they must be sold after they have been produced, and they can only satisfy the producer's needs after they have been sold. The time necessary for sale must be counted as well as the time of production. 
For the transformation of money into capital, therefore, the owner of money must find the free worker available on the commodity market, and this worker must be free in the double sense that, as a free individual, he can dispose of his labor power as his own commodity, and that, on the other hand, he has no other commodity to sell, i.e. he is rid of them, he is free of all the objects needed for the realization of his labor power. Why this free worker confronts him in the sphere of circulation is a question which does not interest the owner of the money for he finds the labor market in existence as a particular branch of the commodity market, and for the present it interests us just as little. We confine ourselves to the fact theoretically, as he does practically. One thing, however, is clear. Nature does not produce, on the one hand, owners of money or commodities, and on the other hand, men possessing nothing but their own labor power. This relation has no basis in natural history, nor does it have a social basis common to all periods of human history. It is clearly the result of a past historical development, the product of many economic revolutions, of the extinction of a whole series of older formations of social production. The economic categories already discussed similarly bear a historical imprint. Definite historical conditions are involved in the existence of the product as a commodity. In order to become a commodity, the product must cease to be produced as the immediate means of subsistence of the producer himself. Had we gone further and inquired under what circumstances all or even the majority of products take the form of commodities, we should have found that this only happens on the basis of one particular mode of production, the capitalist one. Such an investigation, however, would have been foreign to the analysis of commodities. The production and circulation of commodities can still take place even though the great mass of the objects produced are intended for the immediate requirements of their producers and are not turned into commodities so that the process of social production is as yet by no means dominated in its length and breadth by exchange value. The appearance of products as commodities requires a level of development of the division of labor within society such that the separation of use values from exchange value, a separation which first begins with barter, has already been completed. But such a degree of development is common to many economic formations of society, with the most diverse historical characteristics. If we go on to consider money, its existence implies that a definite stage in the development of commodity exchange has been reached. The various forms of money, money as mere equivalent of commodities, money as means of circulation, money as means of payment, money as hoard, or money as world currency, indicate very different levels of the process of social production, according to the extent and relative preponderance of one function or the other. Yet we know by experience that a relatively feeble development of commodity circulation suffices for the creation of all of these forms. It is otherwise with capital. The historical conditions of its existence are by no means given with the mere circulation of money and commodities. It arises only when the owner of the means of production and subsistence finds the free worker available on the market as the seller of his own labor power. And this one historical precondition comprises a world's history. Capital, therefore, announces from the outset a new epoch in the process of social production. This peculiar commodity, labor power, must now be examined more closely. Like all other commodities, it has a value. How is that value determined? The value of labor power is determined, as in the case of every other commodity, by the labor time necessary for the production, and consequently also the reproduction, of this specific article. Insofar as it has value, it represents no more than a definite quantity of the average social labor objectified in it. Labor power exists only as a capacity of the living individual. Its production consequently presupposes his existence. Given the existence of the individual, the production of labor power consists in his reproduction of himself, or his maintenance. For his maintenance, he requires a certain quantity of the means of subsistence. Therefore, the labor time necessary for the production of his labor power is the same as that necessary for the production of those means of subsistence. In other words, the value of labor power is the value of the means of subsistence necessary for the maintenance of its owner. However, labor power becomes a reality only by being expressed. It is activated only through labor. But in the course of this activity, i.e. labor, a definite quantity of human muscle, nerve, brain, etc. is expended, and these things have to be replaced. Since more is expended, more must be received. If the owner of labor power works today, tomorrow he must again be able to repeat the same process in the same conditions as regards health and strength. His means of subsistence must therefore be sufficient to maintain him in his normal state as a working individual. His natural needs, such as food, 
clothing, fuel, and housing vary according to the climatic and other physical peculiarities of his country. On the other hand, the number and extent of his so-called necessary requirements, as also the manner in which they are satisfied, are themselves products of history, and depend therefore to a great extent on the level of civilization attained by a country. In particular, they depend on the conditions in which, and consequently on the habits and expectations with which, the class of free workers has been formed. In contrast, therefore, with the case of other commodities, the determination of the value of labor power contains a historical and moral element. Nevertheless, in a given country at a given period, the average amount of the means of subsistence necessary for the worker is a known datum. The owner of labor power is mortal. If, then, his appearance in the market is to be continuous, and the continuous transformation of money into capital assumes this, the seller of labor power must perpetuate himself in the way that every living individual perpetuates himself, by procreation. The labor power withdrawn from the market by wear and tear, and by death, must be continually replaced by, at the very least, an equal amount of fresh labor power. Hence the sum of means of subsistence necessary for the production of labor power must include the means necessary for the worker's replacements, i.e. his children, in order that this race of peculiar commodity owners may perpetuate its presence on the market. In order to modify the general nature of the human organism in such a way that it acquires skill and dexterity in a given branch of industry and becomes labor power of a developed and specific kind, a special education or training is needed, and this in turn costs an equivalent in commodities of a greater or lesser amount. The costs of education vary according to the degree of complexity of the labor power required. These expenses, exceedingly small in the case of ordinary labor power, form a part of the total value spent in producing it. The value of labor power can be resolved into the value of a definite quantity of the means of subsistence. It therefore varies with the value of the means of subsistence, i.e. with the quantity of labor time required to produce them. Some of the means of subsistence, such as food and fuel, are consumed every day, and must therefore be replaced every day. Others, such as clothes and furniture, last for longer periods, and need to be replaced only at longer intervals. Articles of one kind must be bought or paid for every day, others every week, others every quarter, and so on. But in whatever way the sum total of these outlays may be spread over the year, they must be covered by the average income, taking one day with another. If the total of the commodities required every day for the production of labor power is equal to A, and of those required every week equal to B, and of those requires every quarter equal to C, and so on, the daily average of these commodities is equal to 365 times A, plus 52 times B, plus 4 times C, and so on, over 365. Suppose that this mass of commodities, required for the average day, contains six hours of social labor. Then, every day half a day of average social labor is objectified in labor power. Or in other words, half a day of labor is required for the daily production of labor power. This quantity of labor forms the value of a day's labor power, or the value of the labor power reproduced every day. If half a day of average social labor is present in three shillings, then three shillings is the price corresponding to the value of a day's labor power. If its owner therefore offers it for sale at three shillings a day, its selling price is equal to its value, and according to our original assumption, the owner of money, who is intent on transforming his three shillings into capital, pays this value. The ultimate or minimum limit of the value of labor power is formed by the value of the commodities which have to be supplied every day to the bearer of labor power the man, so that he can renew his life process. That is to say, the limit is formed by the value of the physically indispensable means of subsistence. If the price of labor power falls to this minimum, it falls below its value, since under such circumstances it can be maintained and developed only in a crippled state, and the value of every commodity is determined by the labor time required to provide it in its normal quality. It is an extraordinarily cheap kind of sentimentality which declares that this method of determining the value of labor power a method prescribed by the very nature of the case, is brutal, and which laments with Rossi in the matter, quote, to conceive capacity for labor in abstraction from the worker's means of subsistence during the production process is to conceive a phantom. When we speak of labor, or capacity for labor, we speak at the same time of the worker and his means of subsistence, of the worker and his wages, end quote. When we speak of capacity for labor, we do not speak of labor any more than we speak of digestion when we speak of capacity for digestion. As is well known, the latter process requires something more than a good stomach. When we speak of capacity for labor, we do not abstract from the necessary means of subsistence. On the contrary, their value is expressed in its value. If his capacity for labor remains unsold, this is of no advantage to the worker. 
He will rather feel it to be a cruel nature-imposed necessity that his capacity for labor has required for its production a definite quantity of the means of subsistence and will continue to require this for its reproduction. Then, like Sismondi, he will discover that, quote, the capacity for labor is nothing unless it is sold, end quote. One consequence of the peculiar nature of labor power as a commodity is this, that it does not in reality pass straight away into the hands of the buyer on the conclusion of the contract between buyer and seller. Its value, like that of every other commodity, is already determined before it enters into circulation, for a definite quantity of social labor has been spent on the production of the labor power. But its use value consists in the subsequent exercise of that power. The alienation of labor power and its real manifestation, i.e. the period of its existence as a use value, do not coincide in time. But in those cases in which the formal alienation by sale of the use value of a commodity is not simultaneous with its actual transfer to the buyer, the money of the buyer serves as means of payment. In every country where the capitalist mode of production prevails, it is the custom not to pay for labor power until it has been exercised for the period fixed by the contract, for example, at the end of each week. In all cases, therefore, the worker advances the use value of his labor power to the capitalist. He lets the buyer consume it before he receives payment of the price. Everywhere the worker allows credit to the capitalist. That this credit is no mere fiction is shown not only by the occasional loss of the wages the worker has already advanced when a capitalist goes bankrupt, but also by a series of more long-lasting consequences. Whether money serves as means of purchase or as a means of payment, this does not alter the nature of the exchange of commodities. The price of the labor power is fixed by the contract, although it is not realized until later, like the rent of a house. The labor power is sold, although it is paid for only at a later period. It will therefore be useful, if we want to conceive the relation in its pure form, to presuppose for the moment that the possessor of labor power, on the occasion of each sale, immediately receives the price stipulated in the contract. We now know the manner of determining the value paid by the owner of money to the owner of this peculiar commodity, labor power. The use value which the former gets in exchange manifests itself only in the actual utilization, in the process of the consumption of the labor power. The money owner buys everything necessary for this process, such as raw material, in the market, and pays the full price for it. The process of the consumption of labor power is at the same time the production process of commodities and of surplus value. The consumption of labor power is completed, as in the case of every other commodity, outside the market or the sphere of circulation. Let us, therefore, in company with the owner of money and the owner of labor power, leave this noisy sphere, where everything takes place on the surface and in full view of everyone, and follow them into the hidden abode of production, on whose threshold there hangs the notice, no admittance except on business. Here we shall see not only how capital produces, but how capital is itself produced. The secret of profit-making must at last be laid bare. The sphere of circulation or commodity exchange, within whose boundaries the sale and purchase of labor power goes on, is in fact a very Eden of the innate rights of man. It is the exclusive realm of freedom, equality, property, and Bentham. Freedom, because both buyer and seller of a commodity, let us say of labor power, are determined only by their own free will. They contract as free persons, who are equal before the law. Their contract is the final result in which their joint will finds a common legal expression. Equality, because each enters into relation with the other, as with the simple owner of commodities, and they exchange equivalent for equivalent. Property, because each disposes only of what is his own. And Bentham, because each looks only to his own advantage. The only force bringing them together and putting them into relation with each other is the selfishness, the gain and the private interest of each. Each pays heed to himself only, and no one worries about the others. And precisely for that reason, either in accordance with the pre-established harmony of things or under the auspices of an omniscient providence, they all work together to their mutual advantage, for the common weal and in the common interest. When we leave this sphere of simple circulation, or the exchange of commodities, which provides the free trader Volgatus with his views, his concepts, and the standard by which he judges the society of capital and wage labor, a certain change takes place, or so it appears, in the physiognomy of our dramatis personae. He who was previously the money owner now strides out in front as a capitalist. The possessor of labor power follows as his worker. The one smirks self-importantly and is intent on business. The other is timid and holds back, 
like someone who has brought his own hide to market and now has nothing else to expect but a tanning. End of Part 2 Part 3 The Production of Absolute Surplus Value Chapter 7 The Labor Process and the Valorization Process Section 1 The Labor Process The use of labor power is labor itself. The purchaser of labor power consumes it by setting the seller of it to work. By working, the latter becomes in actuality what previously he only was potentially, namely labor power in action, a worker. In order to embody his labor in commodities, he must above all embody it in use values, things which serve to satisfy needs of one kind or another. Hence, what the capitalist sets the worker to produce is a particular use value, a specific article. The fact that the production of use values, or goods, is carried on under the control of a capitalist and on his behalf does not alter the general character of that production. We shall therefore, in the first place, have to consider the labor process independently of any specific social formation. Labor is, first of all, a process between man and nature, a process by which man, through his own actions, mediates, regulates, and controls the metabolism between himself and nature. He confronts the materials of nature as a force of nature. He sets in motion the natural forces which belong to his own body, his arms, legs, head and hands, in order to appropriate the materials of nature in a form adapted to his own needs. Through this movement, he acts upon external nature and changes it, and in this way he simultaneously changes his own nature. He develops the potentialities slumbering within nature and subjects the play of its forces to his own sovereign power. We are not dealing here with those first instinctive forms of labor which remain on the animal level. An immense interval of time separates the state of things in which a man brings his labor power to market for sale as a commodity from the situation when human labor had not yet cast off its first instinctive form. We presuppose labor in a form in which it is an exclusively human characteristic. A spider conducts operations which resemble those of the weaver, and a bee would put many a human architect to shame by the construction of its honeycomb cells. But what distinguishes the worst architect from the best of bees is that the architect builds the cell in his mind before he constructs it in wax. At the end of every labor process, a result emerges which had previously been conceived by the worker at the beginning, hence already existed ideally. Man not only effects a change of form in the materials of nature, he also realizes his own purpose in those materials. And this is a purpose he is conscious of. It determines the mode of his activity with the rigidity of a law, and he must subordinate his will to it. This subordination is no mere momentary act. Apart from the exertion of the working organs, a purposeful will is required for the entire duration of the work. This means close attention. The less he is attracted by the nature of the work and the way in which it has to be accomplished, and the less, therefore, he enjoys it as the free play of his own physical and mental powers, the closer his attention is forced to be. The simple elements of the labor process are 1. Purposeful activity, that is, work itself 2. The object on which that work is performed and 3. The instruments of that work The land, and this, economically speaking, includes water, in its original state, in which it supplies man with necessaries or means of subsistence ready to hand, is available without any effort on his part as the universal material for human labor. All those things, which labor merely separates from immediate connection with their environment, are objects of labor spontaneously provided by nature, such as fish, caught and separated from their natural element, namely water, timber felled in virgin forests, and ores extracted from their veins. If, on the other hand, the object of labor has, so to speak, been filtered through previous labor, we call it raw material. For example, ore already extracted and ready for washing. All raw material is an object of labor. But not every object of labor is raw material. The object of labor counts as raw material only when it has already undergone some alteration by means of labor. An instrument of labor is a thing, or a complex of things, which the worker interposes between himself and the object of his labor, and which serves as a conductor, directing his activity onto that object. He makes use of the mechanical, physical, and chemical properties of some substances in order to set them to work on other substances as instruments of his power and in accordance with his purposes. Leaving out of consideration such ready-made means of subsistence as fruits, in gathering which a man's bodily organs alone serve as the instruments of his labor, the object the worker directly takes possession of is not the object of labor, but its instrument. 
Thus nature becomes one of the organs of his activity, which he annexes to his own bodily organs, adding stature to himself, in spite of the Bible. As the earth is his original larder, so too it is his original tool house. It supplies him, for instance, with stones for throwing, grinding, pressing, cutting, etc. The earth itself is an instrument of labor, but its use in this way, in agriculture, presupposes a whole series of other instruments and a comparatively high stage of development of labor power. As soon as the labor process has undergone the slightest development, it requires specially prepared instruments. Thus we find stone implements and weapons in the oldest caves. In the earliest period of human history, domesticated animals, i.e. animals that have undergone modification by means of labor, that have been bred specially, play the chief part as instruments of labor along with stones, wood, bones, and shells, which have also had work done on them. The use and construction of instruments of labor, although present in germ among certain species of animals, is characteristic of the specifically human labor process, and Franklin, therefore, defines man as a tool-making animal. Relics of bygone instruments of labor possess the same importance for the investigation of extinct economic formations of society as do fossil bones for the determination of extinct species of animals. It is not what is made, but how, and by what instruments of labor that distinguishes different economic epochs. Instruments of labor not only supply a standard of the degree of development which human labor has attained, but they also indicate the social relations within which men work. Among the instruments of labor, those of a mechanical kind, which, taken as a whole, we may call the bones and muscles of production, offer much more decisive evidence of the character of a given social epoch of production than those which, like pipes, tubs, baskets, jars, etc., serve only to hold the materials for labor, and may be given the general denotation of the vascular system of production. The latter first begins to play an important part in the chemical industries. In a wider sense, we may include among the instruments of labor, in addition to things through which the impact of labor on its object is mediated and which therefore in one way or another serve as conductors of activity, all the objective conditions necessary for carrying on the labor process. These do not enter directly into the process, but without them it is either impossible for it to take place or possible only to a partial extent. Once again, the earth itself is a universal instrument of this kind, for it provides the worker with the ground beneath his feet and a field of employment for his own particular process. Instruments of this kind which have already been mediated through past labor include workshops, canals, roads, etc. In the labor process, therefore, man's activity, via the instruments of labor, effects an alteration in the object of labor which was intended from the outset. The process is extinguished in the product. The product of the process is a use value, a piece of natural material adapted to human needs by means of a change in its form. Labor has become bound up in its object. Labor has been objectified. The object has been worked on. What on the side of the worker appeared in the form of unrest now appears, on the side of the product, in the form of being, as a fixed, immobile characteristic. The worker has spun, and the product is a spinning. If we look at the whole process from the point of view of its result, the product, it is plain that both the instruments and the object of labor are means of production, and that the labor itself is productive labor. Although a use value emerges from the labor process, in the form of a product, other use values, products of previous labor, enter into it as means of production. The same use value is both the product of a previous process and a means of production in a later process. Products are therefore not only results of labor, but also its essential conditions. With the exception of extractive industries such as mining, hunting, fishing, and agriculture, but only insofar as it starts by breaking up virgin soil, where the material for labor is provided directly by nature, all branches of industry deal with raw material, i.e. an object of labor which has already been filtered through labor, which is itself already a product of labor. An example is seed and agriculture. Animals and plants, which we are accustomed to consider as products of nature, may be, in their present form, not only products of, say, last year's labor, but the result of a gradual transformation continued through many generations under human control and through the agency of human labor. As regards the instruments of labor in particular, they show traces of the labor of past ages even to the most superficial observer in the great majority of cases. Raw material may either form the principal substance of a product, or it may enter into its formation only as an accessory. An accessory may be consumed by the instruments of labor, such as coal by a steam engine, oil by a wheel, hay by draft horses, or it may be added to the raw material in order to produce some physical modification of it 
as chlorine is added to unbleached linen, coal to iron, dye to wool, or again it may help to accomplish the work itself, as in the case of the materials used for heating and lighting workshops. The distinction between principal substance and accessory vanishes in the chemical industries proper, because there none of the raw material reappears in its original composition in the substance of the product. Every object possesses various properties and is thus capable of being applied to different uses. The same product may therefore form the raw material for very different labor processes. Corn, for example, is a raw material for millers, starch manufacturers, distillers, and cattle breeders. It also enters as a raw material into its own production in the shape of seed. Coal both emerges from the mining industry as a product and enters into it as a means of production. Again, a particular product may be used as both instruments of labor and raw material in the same process. Take, for instance, the fattening of cattle, where the animal is the raw material and at the same time an instrument for the production of manure. A product, though ready for immediate consumption, may nevertheless serve as raw material for a further product, as grapes do when they become the raw material for wine. On the other hand, labor may release its product in such a form that it can only be used as raw material. Raw material in this condition, such as cotton, thread, and yarn, is called semi-manufactured, but should rather be described as having been manufactured up to a certain level. Although itself already a product, this raw material may have to go through a whole series of different processes, and in each of these it serves as raw material, changing its shape constantly until it is precipitated from the last process of the series in finished form, either as means of subsistence or as an instrument of labor. Hence, we see that whether a use value is to be regarded as raw material, as instrument of labor, or as product, is determined entirely by its specific function in the labor process, by the position it occupies there. As its position changes, so do its determining characteristics. Therefore, whenever products enter as means of production into new labor processes, they lose their character of being products, and function only as objective factors contributing to living labor. A spinner treats spindles only as a means for spinning, and flax as the material that he spins. Of course, it is impossible to spin without material in spindles, and therefore the availability of these products is presupposed at the beginning of the spinning operation. But in the process itself, the fact that they are the products of past labor is as irrelevant as, in the case of the digestive process, the fact that bread is the product of the previous labor of the farmer, the miller, and the baker. On the contrary, it is by their imperfections that the means of production in any process bring to our attention their character of being the products of past labor. A knife which fails to cut, a piece of thread which keeps on snapping, forcibly remind us of Mr. A, the cutler, or Mr. B, the spinner. In a successful product, the role played by past labor in mediating its useful properties has been extinguished. A machine which is not active in the labor process is useless. In addition, it falls prey to the destructive power of natural processes. Iron rusts, wood rots. Yarn with which we neither weave nor knit is cotton wasted. Living labor must seize on these things, awaken them from the dead, change them from merely possible into real and effective use values. Bathed in the fire of labor, appropriated as part of its organism, and infused with vital energy for the performance of the functions appropriate to their concept and to their vocation in the process, they are indeed consumed, but to some purpose, as elements in the formation of new products, which are capable of entering into individual consumption as means of subsistence, or into a new labor process as means of production. If then, on the other hand, finished products are not only results of the labor process, but also conditions of its existence, their induction into the process, their contact with living labor, is the sole means by which they can be made to retain their character of use values and be realized. Labor uses up its material elements, its objects, and its instruments. It consumes them and is therefore a process of consumption. Such productive consumption is distinguished from individual consumption by this, that the latter uses up products as means of subsistence for the living individual, the former as means of subsistence for labor, i.e. for the activity through which the living individual's labor power manifests itself. Thus, the product of individual consumption is the consumer himself, the result of productive consumption is a product distinct from the consumer. Insofar, then, as its instruments and its objects are themselves products, labor consumes products in order to create products, or in other words, consumes one set of products by turning them into means of production for another set. But just as the labor process originally took place only between man and the earth, which was available independently of any human action, 
So even now, we still employ in the process many means of production which are provided directly by nature and do not represent any combination of natural substances with human labor. The labor process, as we have just presented it in its simple and abstract elements, is purposeful activity aimed at the production of use values. It is an appropriation of what exists in nature for requirements of man. It is the universal condition for the metabolic interaction between man and nature, the everlasting nature-imposed condition of human existence, and it is therefore independent of every form of that existence. Or rather, it is common to all forms of society in which human beings live. We did not, therefore, have to present the worker in his relationship with other workers. It was enough to present man and his labor on one side, nature and its materials on the other. The taste of porridge does not tell us who grew the oats, and the process we have presented does not reveal the conditions under which it takes place, whether it is happening under the slave owner's brutal lash or the anxious eye of the capitalist, whether Cincinnatus undertakes it in tilling his couple of acres or a savage when he lays low a wild beast with a stone. Let us now return to our would-be capitalist. We left him just after he had purchased, in the open market, all the necessary factors of the labor process, its objective factors, the means of production, as well as its personal factor, labor power. With the keen eye of an expert, he has selected the means of production and the kind of labor power best adapted to his particular trade, be it spinning, bootmaking, or any other kind. He then proceeds to consume the commodity, the labor power he has just bought, i.e. he causes the worker, the bearer of that labor power, to consume the means of production by his labor. The general character of the labor process is evidently not changed by the fact that the worker works for the capitalist instead of for himself. Moreover, the particular methods and operations employed in bootmaking or spinning are not immediately altered by the intervention of the capitalist. He must begin by taking the labor power as he finds it in the market, and consequently he must be satisfied with the kind of labor which arose in a period when there were, as yet, no capitalists. The transformation of the mode of production itself, which results from the subordination of labor to capital, can only occur later on, and we shall therefore deal with it in a later chapter. The labor process, when it is the process by which the capitalist consumes labor power, exhibits two characteristic phenomena. First, the worker works under the control of the capitalist to whom his labor belongs. The capitalist takes good care that the work is done in a proper manner, and the means of production are applied directly to this purpose, so that the raw material is not wasted and the instruments of labor are spared, i.e. only worn to the extent necessitated by their use in the work. Secondly, the product is the property of the capitalist, and not that of the worker, its immediate producer. Suppose that a capitalist pays for a day's worth of labor power. Then, the right to use that power for a day belongs to him, just as much as the right to use any other commodity, such as a horse he'd hired for the day. The use of a commodity belongs to its purchaser, and the seller of labor power, by giving his labor, does no more, in reality, than part with the use value he has sold. From the instant he steps into the workshop, the use value of his labor power, and therefore also its use, which is labor, belongs to the capitalist. By the purchase of labor power, the capitalist incorporates labor, as a living agent of fermentation, into the lifeless constituents of the product, which also belong to him. From his point of view, the labor process is nothing more than the consumption of the commodity purchased, i.e. of labor power, but he can consume this labor power only by adding the means of production to it. The labor process is a process between things that the capitalist has purchased, things which belong to him. Thus the product of this process belongs to him just as much as the wine which is the product of the process of fermentation going on in his cellar. Section 2. The Valorization Process The product, the property of the capitalist, is a use value, as yarn, for example, or boots. But although boots are, to some extent, the basis of social progress, and our capitalist is decidedly in favor of progress, he does not manufacture boots for their own sake. Use value is certainly not the thing desired for its own sake in the production of commodities. Use values are produced by capitalists only because and insofar as they form the material substratum of exchange value, are the bearers of exchange value. Our capitalist has two objectives. In the first place, he wants to produce a use value which has exchange value, i.e. an article destined to be sold, a commodity. And secondly, he wants to produce a commodity greater in value than the sum of the values of the commodities used to produce it, namely the means of production and the labor power he purchased with his good money on the open market. 
His aim is to produce not only a use value, but a commodity. Not only use value, but value. And not just value, but also surplus value. It must be borne in mind that we are now dealing with the production of commodities, and that up to this point we have considered only one aspect of this process. Just as the commodity itself is a unity formed of use value and value, so the process of production must be a unity, composed of the labor process and the process of creating value. Let us now examine production as a process of creating value. We know that the value of each commodity is determined by the quantity of labor materialized in its use value, by the labor time socially necessary to produce it. This rule also holds good in the case of the product handed over to the capitalist as a result of the labor process. Assuming this product to be yarn, our first step is to calculate the quantity of labor objectified in it. For spinning the yarn, raw material is required. Suppose in this case 10 pounds of cotton. We have no need at present to investigate the value of this cotton, for our capitalist has, we will assume, bought it at its full value, say 10 shillings. In this price, the labor required for the production of the cotton is already expressed in terms of average social labor. We will further assume that the wear and tear of the spindle, which for our present purpose may represent all other instruments of labor employed, amounts to the value of 2 shillings. If, then, 24 hours of labor, or two working days, are required to produce the quantity of gold represented by 12 shillings, it follows, first of all, that two days of labor are objectified in the yarn. We should not let ourselves be misled by the circumstance that the cotton has changed its form, and the worn-down portion of the spindle has entirely disappeared. According to the general law of value, if the value of 40 pounds of yarn equals the value of 40 pounds of cotton plus the value of a whole spindle, i.e. if the same amount of labor time is required to produce the commodities on either side of this equation, then 10 pounds of yarn are an equivalent for 10 pounds of cotton together with a quarter of a spindle. In the case we are considering, the same amount of labor time is represented in the 10 pounds of yarn on the one hand and in the 10 pounds of cotton and the fraction of a spindle on the other. It is therefore a matter of indifference whether value appears in cotton, in a spindle, or in yarn. Its amount remains the same. The spindle and cotton, instead of resting quietly side by side, join together in the process. Their forms are altered, and they turn into yarn. But their value is no more affected by this than it would be if they had simply exchanged for their equivalent in yarn. The labor time required for the production of the cotton, the raw material of the yarn, is part of the labor necessary to produce the yarn, and is therefore contained in the yarn. The same applies to the labor embodied in the spindle, without whose wear and tear the cotton could not be spun. Hence, in determining the value of the yarn, or the labor time required for its production, all the special processes carried on at various times and in different places which were necessary, first to produce the cotton and the wasted portion of the spindle, and then with the cotton and the spindle to spin the yarn, may together be looked on as different and successive phases of the same labor process. All the labor contained in the yarn is past labor, and it is a matter of no importance that the labor expended to produce its constituent elements lies further back in the past than the labor expended on the final process, the spinning. The former stands, as it were, in the pluperfect, the latter in the perfect tense. But this doesn't matter. If a definite quantity of labor, say 30 days, is needed to build a house, the total amount of labor incorporated in the house is not altered by the fact that the work of the last day was done 29 days later than that of the first. Therefore, the labor contained in the raw material and instruments of labor can be treated just as if it were labor expended in an earlier stage of the spinning process, before the labor finally added in the form of actual spinning. The values of the means of production which are expressed in the price of 12 shillings, the cotton and the spindle, are therefore constituent parts of the value of the yarn, i.e. of the value of the product. Two conditions must nevertheless be fulfilled. First, the cotton and the spindle must genuinely have served to produce a use value, they must, in the present case, become yarn. Value is independent of the particular use value by which it is born, but a use value of some kind has to act as its bearer. Second, the labor time expended must not exceed what is necessary under the given social conditions of production. Therefore, if no more than one pound of cotton is needed to spin one pound of yarn, no more than this weight of cotton may be consumed in the production of one pound of yarn. The same is true of the spindle. If the capitalist has a foible for using golden spindles instead of steel ones, the only labor that counts for anything in the value of the yarn remains that which would be required to produce a steel spindle, because no more is necessary under the given social conditions. We now know what part of the value of the yarn is formed by the means of production, 
namely the cotton and the spindle. It is 12 shillings, i.e. the materialization of two days' labor. The next point to be considered is what part of the value of the yarn is added to the cotton by the labor of the spinner. We have now to consider this labor from a standpoint quite different from that adopted for the labor process. There, we viewed it solely as the activity which has the purpose of changing cotton into yarn. There, the more appropriate the work was to its purpose, the better the yarn, other circumstances remaining the same. In that case, the labor of the spinner was specifically different from other kinds of productive labor, and this difference revealed itself both subjectively in the particular purpose of spinning and objectively in the special character of its operation, the special nature of its means of production, and the special use value of its product. For the operation of spinning, cotton and spindles are a necessity, but for making rifled cannon they would be of no use whatever. Here, on the contrary, where we consider the labor of the spinner only insofar as it creates value, i.e. is a source of value, that labor differs in no respect from the labor of the man who bores cannon, or what concerns us more closely here, from the labor of the cotton spinner and the spindle maker, which is realized in the means of production of the yarn. It is solely by reason of this identity that cotton planting, spindle making, and spinning are capable of forming the component parts of one whole, namely the value of the yarn differing only quantitatively from each other. Here we are no longer concerned with the quality, the character, and the content of the labor, but merely with its quantity, and this simply requires to be calculated. We assume that spinning is simple labor, the average labor of a given society. Later it will be seen that the contrary assumption would make no difference. During the labor process, the worker's labor constantly undergoes a transformation from the form of unrest into that of being, from the form of motion into that of objectivity. At the end of one hour, the spinning motion is represented in a certain quantity of yarn. In other words, a definite quantity of labor, namely that of one hour, has been objectified in the cotton. We say labor, i.e. the expenditure of his vital force by the spinner, and not spinning labor, because the special work of spinning counts here only insofar as it is the expenditure of labor power in general, and not the specific labor of the spinner. In the process we are now considering, it is of extreme importance that no more time be consumed in the work of transforming the cotton into yarn than is necessary under the given social conditions. If, under normal, i.e. average social conditions of production, X pounds of cotton are made into Y pounds of yarn by one hour's labor, then a day's labor does not count as 12 hours' labor unless 12 times X pounds of cotton have been made into 12 times Y pounds of yarn for only socially necessary labor time counts towards the creation of value. Not only the labor, but also the raw materials and the product now appear in quite a new light, very different from that in which we viewed them in the labor process pure and simple. Now, the raw material merely serves to absorb a definite quantity of labor. By being soaked in labor, the raw material is in fact changed into yarn, because labor power is expended in the form of spinning and added to it. But the product, the yarn, is now nothing more than a measure of the labor absorbed by the cotton. If in one hour, one and two-thirds pounds of cotton can be spun into one and two-thirds pounds of yarn, then ten pounds of yarn indicate the absorption of six hours' labor. Definite quantities of product, quantities which are determined by experience, now represent nothing but definite quantities of labor, definite masses of crystallized labor time. They are now simply the material shape taken by a given number of hours or days of social labor. The fact that the labor is precisely the labor of spinning, that its material is cotton, its product yarn, is as irrelevant here as it is that the object of labor is itself already a product, hence already raw material. If the worker, instead of spinning, were to be employed in a coal mine, the object on which he worked would be coal, which is present in nature. Nevertheless, a definite quantity of coal, when extracted from its seam, would represent a definite quantity of absorbed labor. We assumed, on the occasion of its sale, that the value of a day's labor power was three shillings, and that six hours' labor was incorporated in that sum, and consequently that this amount of labor was needed to produce the worker's average daily means of subsistence. If now, our spinner, by working for one hour, can convert one and two-thirds pounds of cotton into one and two-thirds pounds of yarn, it follows that in six hours, he will convert ten pounds of cotton into ten pounds of yarn. Hence, during the spinning process, the cotton absorbs six hours of labor. The same quantity of labor is also embodied in a piece of gold of the value of three shillings. A value of three shillings, therefore, is added to the cotton by the labor of spinning. Let us now consider the total value of the product, the ten pounds of yarn. Two and a half days of labor have been objectified in it. 
Out of this, two days were contained in the cotton and the worn-down portions of the spindle, and half a day was absorbed during the process of spinning. This two and a half days of labor is represented by a piece of gold of the value of 15 shillings. Hence, 15 shillings is an adequate price for the 10 pounds of yarn, and the price of one pound is one shilling sixpence. Our capitalist stares in astonishment. The value of the product is equal to the value of the capital advanced. The value advanced has not been valorized. No surplus value has been created. And consequently, money has not been transformed into capital. The price of the yarn is 15 shillings, and 15 shillings were spent in the open market on the constituent elements of the product, or what amounts to the same thing, on the factors of the labor process. 10 shillings were paid for the cotton, 2 shillings for the wear of the spindle, and 3 shillings for the labor power. The swollen value of the yarn is of no avail, for it is merely the sum of the values formerly existing in the cotton, the spindle, and the labor power. Out of such a simple addition of existing values, no surplus value can possibly arise. These values are now all concentrated in one thing, but so they were in the sum of 15 shillings before it was split up into three parts by the purchaser of the commodities. In itself, this result is not particularly strange. The value of one pound of yarn is one shilling sixpence, and our capitalist would therefore have to pay 15 shillings for 10 pounds of yarn on the open market. It's clear that whether a man buys his house ready built or has it built for him, neither of these operations will increase the amount of money laid out on the house. Our capitalist, who is at home in vulgar economics, may perhaps say that he advanced his money with the intention of making more money out of it. The road to hell is paved with good intentions, and he might just as well have intended to make money without producing at all. He makes threats. He will not be caught napping again. In the future, he will buy the commodities in the market instead of manufacturing them himself. But if all his brother capitalists were to do the same, where would he find his commodities on the market? And he cannot eat his money. He recites the catechism, Consider my abstinence. I might have squandered the fifteen shillings, but instead I consumed it productively and made yarn with it. Very true, and as a reward he is now in possession of good yarn instead of a bad conscience. As for playing the part of a miser, it would never do for him to relapse into such bad ways. We have already seen what such asceticism leads to. Besides, where there is nothing, the king has lost his rights. Whatever the merits of his abstinence, there is no money to recompense him because the value of the product is merely the sum of the values thrown into the process of production. Let him therefore console himself with the reflection that virtue is its own reward. But no, on the contrary, he becomes insistent. The yarn is of no use to him, he says. He produced it in order to sell it. In that case, let him sell it, or easier still, let him in future produce only things he needs himself, a remedy already prescribed by his personal physician McCulloch as being of proven efficacy against an epidemic of overproduction. Now our capitalist grows defiant. Can the worker produce commodities out of nothing merely by using his arms and legs? Did I not provide him with the materials through which and in which alone his labor could be embodied? And as the greater part of society consists of such impecunious creatures, have I not rendered society an incalculable service by providing my instruments of production, my cotton, and my spindle, and the worker too? For have I not provided him with the means of subsistence? Am I to be allowed nothing in return for all this service? But has the worker not performed an equivalent service in return by changing his cotton and his spindle into yarn? In any case, here the question of service does not arise. A service is nothing other than the useful effect of a use value, be it that of a commodity or that of the labor. But here we are dealing with exchange value. The capitalist paid to the worker a value of three shillings, and the worker gave him back an exact equivalent in the value of three shillings he added to the cotton. He gave him value for value. Our friend, who has up till now displayed all the arrogance of capital, suddenly takes on the unassuming demeanor of one of his own workers and exclaims, Have I not myself worked? Have I not performed the labor of superintendence, of overseeing the spinner? And does not this labor too create value? The capitalist's own overseer and manager shrug their shoulders. In the meantime, with a hearty laugh, he recovers his composure. The whole litany he's just recited was simply meant to pull the wool over our eyes. He himself does not care twopence for it. He leaves this and all similar subterfuges and conjuring tricks to the professors of political economy who are paid for it. He himself is a practical man, and although he does not always consider what he says outside his business, within his business, he knows what he's doing. Let us examine the matter more closely. The value of a day's labor power amounts to three shillings, because, on our assumption, half a day's labor is objectified in that quantity of labor power i.e. because the means of subsistence required every day for the production of labor power cost half a day's labor. 
but the past labor embodied in the labor power and the living labor it can perform and the daily cost of maintaining labor power and its daily expenditure in work are two totally different things. The former determines the exchange value of the labor power, the latter its use value. The fact that half a day's labor is necessary to keep the worker alive during 24 hours does not in any way prevent him from working a whole day. Therefore, the value of labor power and the value which that labor power valorizes in the labor process are two entirely different magnitudes, and this difference was what the capitalist had in mind when he was purchasing the labor power. The useful quality of labor power, by virtue of which it makes yarn or boots, was to the capitalist merely the necessary condition for his activity. For in order to create value, labor must be expended in a useful manner. What was really decisive for him was the specific use value which this commodity possesses of being a source not only of value, but of more value than it has itself. This is the specific service the capitalist expects from labor power, and in this transaction he acts in accordance with the eternal laws of commodity exchange. In fact, the seller of labor power, like the seller of any other commodity, realizes its exchange value and alienates its use value. He cannot take the one without giving the other. The use value of labor power, in other words labor, belongs just as little to its seller as the use value of oil, after it has been sold, belongs to the dealer who sold it. The owner of the money has paid the value of a day's labor power. He therefore has use of it for a day. A day's labor belongs to him. On the one hand, the daily sustenance of labor power costs only half a day's labor, while on the other hand, the very same labor power can remain effective, can work, during a whole day, and consequently the value which its use during one day creates is double what the capitalist pays for that use. This circumstance is a piece of good luck for the buyer, but by no means an injustice towards the seller. Our capitalist foresaw this situation, and that was the cause of his laughter. The worker therefore finds in the workshop the means of production necessary for working not just six, but twelve hours. If ten pounds of cotton could absorb six hours' labor and become ten pounds of yarn, now twenty pounds of cotton will absorb twelve hours' labor and be changed into twenty pounds of yarn. Let us examine the product of this extended labor process. Now, five days of labor are objectified in this 20 pounds of yarn. Four days are due to the cotton and the lost steel of the spindle. The remaining day has been absorbed by the cotton during the spinning process. Expressed in gold, the labor of five days is 30 shillings. This is therefore the price of the 20 pounds of yarn, giving as before one shilling sixpence as the price of one pound. But the sum of the values of the commodities thrown into the process amounts to 27 shillings. The value of the yarn is 30 shillings. Therefore, the value of the product is one-ninth greater than the value advanced to produce it. Twenty-seven shillings have been turned into thirty shillings. A surplus value of three shillings has been precipitated. The trick has at last worked. Money has been transformed into capital. Every condition of the problem is satisfied, while the laws governing the exchange of commodities have not been violated in any way. Equivalent has been exchanged for equivalent. For the capitalist as buyer paid the full value for each commodity for the cotton, for the spindle, and for the labor power. He then did what is done by every purchaser of commodities. He consumed their use value. The process of consuming labor power, which was also the process of producing commodities, resulted in 20 pounds of yarn, with a value of 30 shillings. The capitalist, formerly a buyer, now returns to the market as a seller. He sells his yarn at one shilling sixpence a pound, which is its exact value. Yet for all that, he withdraws three shillings more from circulation than he originally threw into it. This whole course of events, the transformation of money into capital, both takes place and does not take place in the sphere of circulation. It takes place through the mediation of circulation because it is conditioned by the purchase of the labor power in the market. It does not take place in circulation because what happens there is only an introduction to the valorization process, which is entirely confined to the sphere of production. And so, everything is for the best, in the best of all possible worlds. By turning his money into commodities, which serve as the building materials for a new product and as factors in the labor process, by incorporating living labor into their lifeless objectivity, the capitalist simultaneously transforms value, i.e. past labor in its objectified and lifeless form, into capital, value which can perform its own valorization process, an animated monster which can begin to work, as if its body were by love possessed. If we now compare the process of creating value with the process of valorization, we see that the latter is nothing but the continuation of the former beyond a definite point. If the process is not carried out beyond the point where the value paid by the capitalist for the labor power is replaced by an exact equivalent, it is simply a process of creating value. But if it is continued beyond that point, it becomes a process of valorization. If we proceed further, 
and compare the process of creating value with the labor process, we find that the latter consists in useful labor which produces use values. Here, the movement of production is viewed qualitatively with regard to the particular kind of article produced and in accordance with the purpose and content of the movement. But if it is viewed as a value-creating process, the same labor process appears only quantitatively. Here, it is a question merely of the time needed to do the work, of the period, that is, during which the labor power is usefully expended. Here, the commodities which enter into the labor process no longer count as functionally determined and material elements on which labor power acts with a given purpose. They count merely as definite quantities of objectified labor. Whether it was already contained in the means of production or has just been added by the action of labor power, that labor counts only according to its duration. It amounts to so many hours, days, etc. Moreover, the time spent in production counts only insofar as it is socially necessary for the production of a use value. This has various consequences. First, the labor power must be functioning under normal conditions. If a self-acting mule is the socially predominant instrument of labor for spinning, it would be impermissible to supply the spinner with a spinning wheel. The cotton, too, must not be such trash as to tear at every other moment, but must be of suitable quality. Otherwise, the spinner would spend more time than socially necessary in producing his pound of yarn, and in this case the excess of time would create neither value nor money. But whether the objective factors of labor are normal or not does not depend on the worker, but rather on the capitalist. A further condition is that the labor power itself must be of normal effectiveness. In the trade in which it is being employed, it must possess the average skill, dexterity, and speed prevalent in that trade and our capitalists took good care to buy labor power of such normal quality. It must be expended with the average amount of exertion and the usual degree of intensity, and the capitalist is as careful to see that this is done as he is to ensure that his workmen are not idle for a single moment. He has bought the use of the labor power for a definite period, and he insists on his rights. He has no intention of being robbed. Lastly, and for this purpose our friend has a penal code of his own, all wasteful consumption of raw material or instruments of labor is strictly forbidden, because what is wasted in this way represents a superfluous expenditure of quantities of objectified labor, labor that does not count in the product or enter into its value. We now see that the difference between labor considered on the one hand as producing utilities and on the other hand as creating value, a difference which we discovered by our analysis of a commodity, resolves itself into a distinction between two aspects of the production process. The production process, considered as the unity of the labor process and the process of creating value, is the process of production of commodities. Considered as the unity of the labor process and the process of valorization, it is the capitalist process of production, or the capitalist form of the production of commodities. We stated on a previous page that in the valorization process, it does not in the least matter whether the labor appropriated by the capitalist is simple labor of average social quality or more complex labor, labor with a higher specific gravity, as it were. All labor of a higher or more complicated character than average labor is expenditure of labor power of a more costly kind. Labor power whose production has cost more time and labor than unskilled or simple labor power, and which therefore has a higher value. This power being of a higher value, it expresses itself in labor of a higher sort, and therefore becomes objectified during an equal amount of time in proportionally higher values. Whatever difference in skill there may be between the labor of a spinner and that of a jeweler, the portion of his labor by which the jeweler merely replaces the value of his own labor power does not in any way differ in quality from the additional portion by which he creates surplus value. In both cases, the surplus value results only from a quantitative excess of labor, from a lengthening of one and the same labor process. In the one case, the production of making jewels, in the other, the process of making yarn. But on the other hand, in every process of creating value, the reduction of the higher type of labor to average social labor, for instance one day of the former to X days of the latter, is unavoidable. We therefore save ourselves a superfluous operation and simplify our analysis by the assumption that the labor of the worker employed by the capitalist is average simple labor. Chapter 8. Constant Capital and Variable Capital the various factors of the labor process play different parts in forming the value of the product. The worker adds fresh value to the material of his labor by expending on it a given amount of additional labor, no matter what the specific content, purpose, and technical character of that labor may be. On the other hand, the values of the means of production used up in the process are preserved and present themselves afresh as constituent parts of the value of the product. The values of the cotton and the spindle, for instance, reappear again in the value of the yarn. 
The value of the means of production is therefore preserved by being transferred to the product. This transfer takes place during the conversion of those means into a product, in other words, during the labor process. It is mediated through labor. But how is this done? The worker does not perform two pieces of work simultaneously, one in order to add value to the cotton, the other in order to preserve the value of the means of production, or what amounts to the same thing, to transfer to the yarn, as product, the value of the cotton on which he works, and part of the value of the spindle with which he works. But by the very act of adding new value, he preserves their former values. Since, however, the addition of new value to the material of his labor and the preservation of its former value are two entirely distinct results, it is plain that this twofold nature of the result can be explained only by the twofold nature of his labor. It must at the same time create value through one of its properties and preserve or transfer value through another. Now, how does every worker add fresh labor and therefore fresh value? Evidently, only by working productively in a particular way. The spinner adds labor time by spinning the weaver by weaving, the smith by forging. But although these operations add labor as such, and therefore new values, it is only through the agency of labor directed to a particular purpose, by the means of spinning, the weaving, and the forging respectively, that the means of production, the cotton and the spindle, the yarn and the loom, and the iron and the anvil, become constituent elements of the product, of a new use value. The old form of the use value disappears, but it is taken up again in a new form of use value. We saw, when we were considering the process of creating value, that if a use value is effectively consumed in the production of a new use value, the quantity of labor expended to produce the article which has been consumed forms a part of the quantity of labor necessary to produce the new use value. This portion is therefore labor transferred from the means of production to the new product. Hence the worker preserves the values of the already consumed means of production or transfers them to the product as portions of its value not by virtue of his additional labor as such, but by virtue of the particular useful character of that labor, by virtue of its specific productive form. Therefore, insofar as labor is productive activity, directed to a particular purpose, insofar as it is spinning, weaving, or forging, etc., it raises the means of production from the dead merely by entering into contact with them, infuses them with life so that they become factors of the labor process, and combines with them to form new products. If the specific productive labor of the worker were not spinning, he could not convert the cotton into yarn, and therefore he could not transfer the values of the cotton and spindle to the yarn. Suppose the same worker were to change his trade to that of a joiner. He would still, by a day's labor, add value to the material he has worked on. We see, therefore, that the addition of new value takes place not by virtue of his labor being spinning in particular, or joinery in particular, but because it is labor in general abstract social labor, and we see also that the value added is of a certain definite amount, not because his labor has a particular useful content, but because it lasts for a definite length of time. On the one hand, it is by virtue of its general character, as expenditure of human labor power in the abstract, that spinning adds new value to the values of the cotton and the spindle. And on the other hand, it is by virtue of its special character, as a concrete useful process, that the same labor of spinning both transfers the values of the means of production to the product and preserves them in the product. Hence, a twofold result emerges within the same period of time. By the simple addition of a certain quantity of labor, new value is added, and by the quality of this added labor, the original value of the means of production are preserved in the product. This twofold effect, resulting from the twofold character of the labor, appears quite plainly in numerous phenomena. Let us assume that some invention enables the spinner to spin as much cotton in six hours as he was able to spin before in 36 hours. His labor is now six times as effective as it was, considered as useful productive activity directed to a given purpose. The product of six hours' labor has increased sixfold, from six pounds to 36 pounds. But now, the 36 pounds of cotton absorb only the same amount of labor as did the six pounds formerly. One-sixth as much new labor is absorbed by each pound of cotton, and consequently the value added by the labor to each pound is only one-sixth of what it formerly was. On the other hand, in the product, the 36 pounds of yarn, the value transferred from the cotton is six times great as it was before. The value of the raw material preserved and transferred to the product by six hours of spinning is six times great as it was before, although the new value added by the labor of the spinner to each pound of the very same raw material is one-sixth of what it was formerly. This shows that the two properties of labor, by virtue of which it is enabled in one case to preserve value and in the other case to create value within the same indivisible process, are different in their very essence. On the one hand, the longer the time necessary to spin a given weight of cotton into yarn, 
the greater amount of fresh value added to the cotton. But on the other hand, the greater the weight of the cotton spun in a given time, the greater is the value preserved by being transferred from it to the product. Let us now assume that the productivity of the spinner's labor, instead of varying, remains constant, that he therefore requires the same time as he formerly did to convert one pound of cotton into yarn, but that the exchange value of the cotton varies, either by rising to six times its former value or by falling to one-sixth of that value. In both of these cases, the spinner puts the same quantity of labor into a pound of cotton, and therefore adds as much value as he did before the change in value. He also produces a given weight of yarn in the same time as he did before. Nevertheless, the value he transfers from the cotton to the yarn is either six times what it was before, or in the second case, one-sixth as much. The same result occurs when the value of the instruments of labor rises or falls, while their usefulness in the labor process remains unaltered. Again, if the technical conditions of the spinning process remain unchanged, and no change of value takes place in the means of production, the spinner continues to consume in equal working times equal quantities of raw material, and equal quantities of machinery of unvarying value. The value preserved in the product is directly proportional to the new value added to the product. In two weeks, the spinner adds twice as much labor, and therefore twice as much value as in one week, and during the same time he consumes twice as much material, and wears out twice as much machinery, or double the value in each case. He therefore preserves, in the product of two weeks, twice as much value as in the product of one week. As long as the conditions of production remain the same, the more value the worker adds by fresh labor, the more value he transfers and preserves. However, this does not happen because he adds new value, but because the addition of new value takes place under unvaried conditions which are independent of his own labor. Of course, it may be said, in a relative sense, that the worker always preserves old value in proportion to the added quantity of new value. Whether the value of cotton rises from one shilling to two shillings, or falls to sixpence, the worker invariably preserves in the product of one hour only half as much value as he preserves in two hours. Similarly, if the productivity of his own labor rises or falls, he will, in the course of one hour, spin either more or less cotton than he did before, and will consequently preserve more or less of the value of the cotton in the product of one hour. But all the same, he will preserve twice as much value by two hours' labor as he will by one. Value exists only in use values, in things, if we leave aside its purely symbolic representation in tokens. Man himself, viewed merely as the physical existence of labor power, is a natural object, a thing, although a living conscious thing, and the labor is the physical manifestation of that power. If, therefore, an article loses its use value, it also loses its value. The reason why means of production do not lose their value at the same time as they lose their use value is because they lose, in the labor process, the original form of their use value only to assume in the product the form of a new use value. But however important it may be to value that it should have some use value to exist in, it is still a matter of complete indifference what particular object serves that purpose. We saw this when dealing with the metamorphosis of commodities. Hence, it follows that in the labor process, the means of production transfer their value to the product only insofar as they lose their exchange value along with their independent use value. They only give up to the product the value they themselves lose as means of production. But in this respect, the objective factors of the labor process do not all behave in the same way. The coal burnt under the boiler vanishes without leaving a trace, so too the oil in which the axles of wheels are greased. Dye stuffs and other auxiliary substances also vanish, but reappear in the properties of the product. The raw material forms the substance of the product, but only after it has undergone a change in its form. Hence, raw material and auxiliary substances lose the independent form with which they entered into the labor process. It is otherwise with the actual instruments of labor. Tools, machines, factory buildings, and containers are only of use in the labor process as long as they keep their original shape, and are ready each morning to enter into it in the same form. And just as during their lifetime, that is to say during the labor process, they retain their shape independently of the product, so too after their death. The mortal remains of machines, tools, workshops, etc. always continue to lead an existence distinct from that of the product they helped to turn out. If we now consider the case of any instrument of labor during the whole period of its service, from the day of its entry into the workshop to the day of its banishment to the lumber room, we find that during this period, its use value has been completely consumed and therefore its exchange value completely transferred to the product. For instance, if a spinning machine lasts for 10 years, it is plain that during that working period, its total value is gradually transferred to the product of the 10 years. The lifetime of an instrument of labor is thus spent in the repetition of a greater or lesser number of similar operations. The instrument suffers the same fate as the man. Every day brings a man 24 hours nearer to his grave, 
although no one can tell accurately merely by looking at a man how many days he has still to travel on that road. This difficulty, however, does not prevent life insurance companies from using the theory of averages to draw very accurate, and what's more, very profitable conclusions about the length of a man's life. So it is with the instruments of labor. It is known by experience how long, on the average, a machine of a particular kind will last. Suppose its use value in the labor process lasts only six days. It then loses, on average, one-sixth of its use value every day, and therefore parts with one-sixth of its value to each day's product. The deterioration of all instruments, their daily loss of use value, and the corresponding quantity of value they part with to the product are accordingly calculated on this basis. It is thus strikingly clear that means of production never transfer more value to the product than they themselves lose during the labor process by the destruction of their own use value. If an instrument of production has no value to lose, i.e. if it is not the product of human labor, it transfers no value to the product. It helps to create use value without contributing to the formation of exchange value. This is true of all those means of production supplied by nature without human assistance, such as land, wind, water, metals in the form of ore, and timber in virgin forests. Here, we are confronted with another interesting phenomenon. Suppose a machine is worth 1,000 pounds and wears out in 1,000 days. Then, every day, one one-thousandth of the value of the machine is transferred to the day's product. At the same time, the machine as a whole continues to take part in the labor process, though with diminishing vitality. Thus it appears that one factor of the labor process, a means of production, continually enters as a whole into that process, while it only enters in parts into the valorization process. The distinction between the labor process and the valorization process is reflected here in their objective factors, in that one and the same means of production, in one and the same process of production, counts in its totality as an element of the labor process, but only piece by piece as an element in the creation of value. On the other hand, a means of production may enter as a whole into the valorization process, although it only enters piece by piece into the labor process. Suppose that in spinning cotton, the waste for every 115 pounds used amounts to 15 pounds, which is converted not into yarn but into devil's dust. Now although this amount of waste is normal and inevitable under average conditions of spinning, the value of the 15 pounds of cotton is just as surely transferred to the value of the yarn as is the value of the 100 pounds that form the substance of the yarn. The use value of 15 pounds of cotton must vanish into dust before 100 pounds of yarn can be made. The destruction of this cotton is therefore a necessary condition for the production of the yarn, and because it is a necessary condition, and for no other reason, the value of that cotton is transferred to the product. The same holds good for every kind of refuse resulting from a labor process, where that refuse cannot be further employed as a means in the production of new and independent use values. Such an employment can be seen in the large machine-building factories at Manchester, where mountains of iron turnings are carted away to the foundry in the evening, only to reappear the next morning in the workshops as solid masses of iron. We have seen that the means of production transfer value to the new product only when, during the labor process, they lose value, in the shape of their old use value. The maximum loss of value the means of production can suffer in the process is plainly limited by the amount of the original value with which they entered into it, or in other words, by the labor time required to produce them. Therefore, the means of production can never add more value to the product than they themselves possess independently of the process in which they assist. However useful a given kind of raw material or a machine or other means of production may be, even if it costs 150 pounds or, say, 500 days of labor, it cannot, under any circumstances, add more than 150 pounds to the value of the product. Its value is determined not by the labor process into which it enters as a means of production, but by that out of which it has issued as a product. In the labor process, it serves only as a use value, a thing with useful properties and cannot therefore transfer any value to the product unless it possessed value before its entry to the process. While productive labor is changing the means of production into constituent elements of a new product, their value undergoes a metempsychosis. It deserts the consumed body to occupy the newly created one. But this transmigration takes place, as it were, behind the back of the actual labor in progress. The worker is unable to add new labor to create new value without, at the same time, preserving old values, because the labor he adds must be of a specific useful kind, and he cannot do work of a useful kind without employing products as the means of production of a new product, and thereby transferring their value to the new product. The property, therefore, which labor power in action, living labor, possesses of preserving value at the same time that it adds it, is a gift of nature, which costs the worker nothing, but is very advantageous to the capitalist since it preserves the existing value of his capital. 
As long as trade is good, the capitalist is too absorbed in making profits to take notice of this gratuitous gift of labor. Violent interruptions of the labor process, crises, make him painfully aware of it. As regards the means of production, what is really consumed is their use value, and the consumption of this value by labor results in the product. There is in fact no consumption of their value, and it would therefore be inaccurate to say that it is reproduced. It is rather preserved, not by reason of any operation it itself undergoes in the labor process, but because the use values, in which it originally existed, vanishes, although when it vanishes it does so into another use value. Hence the value of the means of production reappears in the value of the product, but it is not, strictly speaking, reproduced in that value. What is produced is a new use value in which the old exchange value reappears. It is otherwise with the subjective factor of the labor process, labor power, which sets itself in motion independently. While labor, because it is directed to a specific purpose, preserves and transfers to the product the value of the means of production, at the same time, throughout every instant it is in motion, it is creating an additional value, a new value. Suppose the process of production breaks off, just when the worker has produced an equivalent for the value of his own labor power, when, for example, by six hours of labor he has added the value of three shillings, this value is the excess of the total value of the product over the portion of its value contributed by the means of production. It is the only original value formed during this process, the only portion of the value of the product created by the process itself. Of course, we do not forget that this new value only replaces the money advanced by the capitalist in purchasing labor power, and spent by the worker on means of subsistence. With regard to the three shillings which have been expended, the new value of three shillings appears merely as a reproduction. Nevertheless, it is a real reproduction, and not, as in the case of the value of the means of production, simply an apparent one. The replacement of one value by another is here brought about by the creation of new value. We know, however, from what has gone before, that the labor process may continue beyond the time necessary to reproduce and incorporate in the product a mere equivalent for the value of the labor power. For this, six hours alone would be sufficient, but the process lasts longer, say for twelve hours. The activity of labor power, therefore, not only reproduces its own value, but produces value over and above this. This surplus value is the difference between the value of the product and the value of the elements consumed in the formation of the product, in other words, the means of production and the labor power. In presenting the different parts played by the various factors of the labor process in the formation of the product's value, we have in fact characterized the different functions allotted to the different elements of capital in its own valorization process. The excess of the total value of the product over the sum of the values of its constituent elements is the excess of the capital which has been valorized over the value of the capital originally advanced. The means of production on the one hand, labor power on the other, are merely the different forms of existence which the value of the original capital assumed when it lost its monetary form and was transformed into the various factors of the labor process. That part of capital, therefore, which is turned into means of production, i.e. the raw material, the auxiliary material, and the instruments of labor, does not undergo any quantitative alteration of value in the process of production. For this reason, I call it the constant part of capital, or more briefly, constant capital. On the other hand, that part of capital which is turned into labor power does undergo an alteration of value in the process of production. It both reproduces the equivalent of its own value and produces an excess, a surplus value, which may itself vary and be more or less according to circumstances. This part of capital is continually being transformed from a constant into a variable magnitude. I therefore call it the variable part of capital, or more briefly, variable capital. The same elements of capital which, from the point of view of the labor process, can be distinguished respectively as the objective and subjective factors, as means of production and labor power, can be distinguished, from the point of view of the valorization process, as constant and variable capital. The definition of constant capital given above by no means excludes the possibility of a change of value in its elements. Suppose that the price of cotton in one day is sixpence a pound, and the next day, as a result of the failure of the cotton crop, a shilling a pound. Each pound of the cotton bought at sixpence, and worked up after the rise in value, transfers to the product a value of one shilling, and the cotton already spun before the rise, and perhaps circulating in the market as yarn, similarly transfers to the product twice its original value. It is plain, however, that these changes of value are independent of the valorization of the cotton in the spinning process itself. If the old cotton had never been spun, it could be resold at a shilling a pound after the rise, instead of at sixpence. Further, the fewer the processes the cotton has gone through, the more certain is this result. 
We therefore find that speculators make it a rule, when such sudden changes in value occur, to speculate in the raw material in its least worked-up form. To speculate, therefore, in yarn rather than in cloth, and indeed in cotton itself rather than in yarn. The change of value in the case we have been considering originates not in the process in which the cotton plays the part of a means of production, and in which it therefore functions as constant capital, but in the process in which the cotton itself is produced. The value of a commodity is certainly determined by the quantity of labor contained in it, but this quantity is itself socially determined. If the amount of labor time socially necessary for the production of any commodity alters, and a given weight of cotton represents more labor after a bad harvest than after a good one, this reacts back on all the old commodities of the same type, because they are only individuals of the same species, and their value at any given time is measured by the labor socially necessary to produce them, i.e. by the labor necessary under the social conditions existing at the time. As the value of the raw material may change, so too may that of the instruments of labor, the machinery, etc., employed in the process, and consequently that portion of the value of the product transferred to it from them may also change. If, as a result of new invention, machinery of a particular kind can be produced with a lessened expenditure of labor, the old machinery undergoes a certain amount of depreciation, and therefore transfers proportionately less value to the product. But here, too, the change in value originates outside the process in which the machine is acting as a means of production. Once engaged in this process, the machine cannot transfer more value than it possesses independently of the process. Just as the change in the value of the means of production, even after they have begun to take part in the labor process, does not alter their character as constant capital, so too a change in the proportion of constant to variable capital does not affect the distinction in their functions. The technical conditions of the labor process may be revolutionized to such an extent that, where formerly ten men using ten implements of small value worked a relatively small quantity of raw material, one man may now, with the aid of one expensive machine, work up a hundred times as much raw material. In the latter case, we have an enormous increase in the constant capital, i.e. the total value of the means of production employed, and at the same time a great reduction in the variable part of the capital, which has been laid out on labor power. This change, however, alters only the quantitative relation between the constant and the variable capital, or the proportion in which the total capital is split up into its constant and variable constituents. It has not in the least degree affected the essential difference between the two. Chapter 9 the rate of surplus value. Section 1. The Degree of Exploitation of Labor Power The surplus value generated in the production process by C, the capital advanced, i.e. the valorization of the value of the capital C, presents itself to us first as the amount by which the value of the product exceeds the value of its constituent elements. The capital C is made up of two components. One, the sum of money, small c, laid out on means of production, and the other being the sum of money v, expended on labor power. Small c represents the portion of value which has been turned into constant capital, v, that turned into variable capital. At the beginning, then, c is equal to small c plus v. For example, if 500 pounds is the capital advanced, its components may be such that the 500 pounds is equal to 410 pounds constant plus 90 pounds variable capital. When the process of production is finished, we get a commodity whose value is equal to small c plus v plus s, where s is the surplus value. Or, taking our former figures, the value of this commodity is 410 pounds constant plus 90 pounds variable plus 90 pounds surplus. The original capital has now changed from c to c prime, from 500 pounds to 590 pounds. The difference is s, or a surplus value of 90 pounds. Since the value of the constituent elements of the product is equal to the value of the capital advanced, it is a mere tautology to say that the excess of the value of the product over the value of its constituent elements is equal to the valorization of the value of the capital advanced, or to the surplus value produced. Nevertheless, we must examine this tautology a little more closely. The equation being made is between the value of the product and the value of its constituents consumed in the process of production. Now we have seen how that portion of the constant capital which consists of the instruments of labor transfers to the product only a fraction of its value, while the remainder of that value continues in its old form of existence. Since this remainder plays no part in the formation of value, we may at present leave it on one side. To introduce it into the calculation would make no difference. For instance, taking our former example, small c equals 410 pounds, assume that this sum consists of 312 pounds value of raw material, 44 pounds value of auxiliary material, and 54 pounds value of the machinery worn away in the process, 
and assume that the total value of the machinery employed is 1,054 pounds. Out of this latter sum, then, we reckon as advanced, for the purpose of turning out the product, the sum of 54 pounds alone, which the machinery loses by wear and tear while performing its function, and therefore parts with to the product. Now, if we also reckoned the remaining 1,000 pounds, which continues to exist in its old form in the machinery, as transferred to the product, we would also have to reckon it as part of the value advanced, and thus make it appear on both sides of the calculation. We should, in this way, get 1,500 pounds on one side and 1,590 pounds on the other. The difference between these two sums, or the surplus value, would still be 90 pounds. When we refer, therefore, to constant capital advanced for the production of value, we always mean the value of the means of production actually consumed in the course of production, unless the context demonstrates the reverse. This being so, let us return to the formula C is equal to small c plus v, which we saw was transformed into C prime is equal to small c plus v plus s, C becoming C prime. We know that the value of the constant capital is transferred to the product and merely reappears in it. The new value actually created in the process, the value product, is therefore not the same as the value of the product. It is not, as it would at first sight appear, small c plus v plus s, or 410 pounds constant plus 90 pounds variable plus 90 pounds surplus, but rather v plus s, or 90 pounds variable plus 90 pounds surplus. In other words, not 590 pounds, but 180 pounds. If small c, the constant capital, were equal to zero, in other words, if there were branches of industry in which the capitalist could dispense with all the means of production made by previous labor, whether raw material, auxiliary material, or instruments, employing only labor power and materials supplied by nature, if that were the case, there would be no constant capital to transfer to the product. This component of the value of the product, i.e. the amount of new value created, or the value produced, which contains 90 pounds of surplus value, would remain just as great as if small c represented the highest value imaginable. We should have c is equal to 0 plus v, equaling v, and c prime, the valorized capital, equal to v plus s and therefore c prime minus c is equal to s, as before. On the other hand, if s is equal to zero, in other words, if the labor power whose value is advanced in the form of variable capital were to produce only its equivalent, we should have c is equal to small c plus v, and c prime, being the value of the product, would be equal to small c plus v plus zero. Hence, c would be equal to c prime. In this case, the capital advanced would not have valorized its value. From what has gone before, we know that surplus value is purely the result of an alteration in the value of V, of that part of the capital which was converted into labor power. Consequently, V plus S is equal to V plus delta V, V plus an increment of V. But the fact that it is V alone that varies, and the conditions of that variation, are obscured by the circumstance that in consequence of the increase in the variable component of the capital, there is also an increase in the sum total of the capital advanced. It was originally 500 pounds and becomes 590 pounds. Therefore, in order that our investigation may lead to accurate results, we must make abstraction from that portion of the value of the product in which constant capital alone appears, and thus posit the constant capital as zero, or make small c equal to zero. This is merely an application of a mathematical rule, employed whenever we operate with constant and variable magnitudes, related to each other only by the symbols of addition and subtraction. A further difficulty is caused by the original form of the variable capital. In our example, C prime is equal to 410 pounds constant, plus 90 pounds variable, plus 90 pounds surplus. But 90 pounds is a given, and therefore a constant quantity, and hence it appears absurd to treat it as variable. In fact, however, the 90 pounds variable is here merely a symbol for the process undergone by this value. The portion of the capital invested in the purchase of labor power is a definite quantity of objectified labor a constant value, like the value of the labor power purchased. But in the process of production, the place of the 90 pounds is taken by labor power which sets itself in motion. Dead labor is replaced by living labor, something stagnant by something flowing, a constant by a variable. The result is a reproduction of V plus an increment of V. From the point of view of capitalist production, therefore, the whole process appears as the independent motion of what was originally constant value but has now been transformed into labor power. Both the process and its result are ascribed to this independent motion of value. If, therefore, such expressions as 90 pounds variable capital, or such and such a quantity of self-valorizing value, appear to contain contradictions, this is only because they express a contradiction imminent in capitalist production. At first sight, it appears strange to equate the constant capital to zero, but we do this every day. 
If, for example, we want to calculate the amount of profit gained by England from the cotton industry, we first of all deduct the sums paid for cotton to the United States, India, Egypt, and various other countries, i.e. we posit the value of the capital that merely reappears in the value of the product as a zero magnitude. Of course, the ratio of surplus value not only to that portion of the capital from which it directly arises, and whose change in value it represents, but also to the sum total of the capital advanced, is economically of very great importance. We shall therefore deal exhaustively with this ratio in our third book. In order to enable one portion of capital to realize its value by being converted into labor power, it is necessary that another portion be converted into means of production. In order that variable capital may perform its function, constant capital must be advanced to an adequate proportion, the proportion appropriate to the special technical conditions of each labor process. However, the fact that retorts and other vessels are necessary to a chemical process does not prevent the chemist from ignoring them when he undertakes his analysis of the results. If we look at the creation and the alteration of value for themselves, i.e. in their pure form, then the means of production, this physical shape taken on by constant capital, provides only the material in which fluid, value-creating labor power has to be incorporated. Neither the nature nor the value of this material is of any importance. All that is needed is a sufficient supply of material to absorb the labor expended in the process of production. That supply once given, the material may rise or fall in value, or even be without any value in itself, like the land and the sea, but this will have no influence on the creation of value, or on the variation in the quantity of value. In the first place, therefore, we equate the constant part of capital with zero. The capital advanced is consequently reduced from small c plus v to v, and instead of the value of the product, small c plus v plus s, we now have the value produced being v plus s. Given that the new value produced is equal to 180 pounds, a sum which consequently represents the whole of the labor expended during the process, if we subtract 90 pounds from it, being the value of the variable capital, we have 90 pounds left, the amount of the surplus value. This sum of 90 pounds, or S, expresses the absolute quantity of surplus value produced. The relative quantity produced, or the ratio in which the variable capital has valorized its value, is plainly determined by the ratio of the surplus value to the variable capital, and expressed by S over V. In our example, this ratio is 90 over 90, or 100%. This relative increase in the value of the variable capital, or the relative magnitude of the surplus value, is called here the rate of surplus value. We have seen that the worker, during one part of the labor process, produces only the value of his labor power, i.e. the value of his means of subsistence. Since his work forms a part of a system based on the social division of labor, he does not directly produce his own means of subsistence. Instead of this, he produces a particular commodity, yarn for example, with a value equal to the value of his means of subsistence, or of the money for it. The part of his day's labor devoted to this purpose will be greater or less in proportion to the value of his average daily requirements, or what amounts to the same thing, in proportion to the labor time required on average to produce them. If the value of his daily means of subsistence represents an average of six hours objectified labor, the worker must work an average of six hours to produce that value. If, instead of working for the capitalist, he worked independently, on his own account, he would, other things being equal, still be obliged to work for the same number of hours in order to produce the value of his labor power, and thereby to gain the means of subsistence necessary for his own preservation or continued reproduction. But as we have seen, during that part of his day's labor in which he produces the value of his labor power, say three shillings, he produces only an equivalent for the value of his labor power already advanced by the capitalist, the new value created only replaces the variable capital advanced. It is owing to this fact that the production of the new value of three shillings has the appearance of a mere reproduction. I call the portion of the working day during which this reproduction takes place necessary labor time, and the labor expended during that time necessary labor. Necessary for the worker because independent of the particular social form of his labor, necessary for capital and the capitalist world because the continued existence of the worker is the basis of that world. During the second period of the labor process, that in which his labor is no longer necessary labor, the worker does indeed expend labor power. He does work, but his labor is no longer necessary labor, and he creates no value for himself. He creates surplus value, which, for the capitalist, has all the charms of something created out of nothing. This part of the working day I call surplus labor time, and to the labor expended during that time I give the name of surplus labor. It is just as important for a correct understanding of surplus value to conceive it as merely a congealed quantity of surplus labor time, as nothing but objectified surplus labor, as it is for a proper comprehension of value in general 
to conceive it as merely a congealed quantity of so many hours of labor, as nothing but objectified labor. What distinguishes the various economic formations of society, the distinction between, for example, a society based on slave labor and a society based on wage labor, is the form in which this surplus labor is in each case extorted from the immediate producer, the worker. Since, on the one hand, the variable capital and the labor purchased by that capital are equal in value, and the value of this labor power determines the necessary part of the working day, and since, on the other hand, the surplus value is determined by the surplus part of the working day, it follows that surplus value is in the same ratio to variable capital as surplus labor is to necessary labor. In other words, the rate of surplus value, S over V, is equal to surplus labor over necessary labor. Both ratios, S over V and surplus over necessary, express the same thing in different ways, in the one case in the form of objectified labor, in the other in the form of living fluid labor. The rate of surplus value is therefore an exact expression for the degree of exploitation of labor power by capital, or of the worker by the capitalist. We assumed in our example that the value of the product is equal to 410 pounds constant, plus 90 pounds variable, plus 90 pounds surplus, and that the capital advanced is equal to 500 pounds. Since the surplus value is equal to 90 pounds, and the capital advance is equal to 500, we should, according to the usual way of reckoning, get 18% as the rate of surplus value, because it is generally confused with the rate of profit, a rate so low it might well cause a pleasant surprise to Mr. Carey and other harmonizers. But in fact, the rate of surplus value is not equal to S over C, or S over small c plus V, but to S over V. Thus, it is not 90 over 500, but 90 over 90, being 100%, which is more than five times the apparent degree of exploitation. Although, in the case we have supposed, we do not know the actual length of the working day, or the duration in days and weeks of the labor process, or the number of workers set in motion simultaneously by the variable capital of 90 pounds, the rate of surplus value S over V accurately discloses to us, by means of its equivalent expression, surplus labor over necessary labor, the relation between the two parts of the working day. This relation is here one of equality, being 100%. Hence, the worker, in our example, works one half of the day for himself, the other half for the capitalist. The method of calculating the rate of surplus value is therefore, in brief, as follows. We take the total value of the product and posit the constant capital which merely reappears in it as equal to zero. What remains is the only value that has actually been created in the process of producing the commodity. If the amount of surplus value is given, we have only to deduct it from this remainder to find the variable capital, and vice versa if the latter is given and we need to find the surplus value. If both are given, we have only to perform the concluding operation, namely, calculate S over V, the ratio of the surplus value to the variable capital. Simple as the method is, it may not be amiss, by means of a few examples, to exercise the reader in the application of the novel principles underlying it. First, we will take the case of a spinning mill containing 10,000 mule spindles, spinning number 32 yarn from American cotton, and producing one pound of yarn weekly per spindle. We assume the waste to be 6%. Accordingly, 10,600 pounds of cotton are consumed weekly, of which 600 pounds go to waste. The price of the cotton, in April 1871, was seven and three quarters pence per pound. The raw material, therefore, cost approximately 342 pounds. The 10,000 spindles, including machinery for preparation and motive power, cost, we will assume, one pound per spindle, amounting to a total of 10,000 pounds. Depreciation we put at 10%, or 1,000 pounds a year, being 20 pounds a week. The rent of the building we suppose to be 300 pounds a year, or six pounds a week. The amount of coal consumed, for 100 HP indicated at 4 pounds of coal per horsepower per hour during 60 hours, and including coal consumed in the heating mill, is 11 tons a week at 8 shillings 6 pence a ton, and therefore comes out to about 4.5 pounds a week. Gas, 1 pound a week. Oil, etc., 4.5 pounds a week. Total cost to the above auxiliary materials, 10 pounds a week. Therefore, the constant part of the value of the week's product is 378 pounds. Wages amount to 52 pounds a week. The price of the yarn is 12 and one quarter pence per pound, which gives, for the value of the 10,000 pounds, the sum of 510 pounds sterling. The surplus value is therefore, in this case, 510 pounds minus 430 being 80 pounds. We put the constant part of the value of the product equal to zero, as it plays no part in the creation of value. There remains 132 pounds as the weekly value created, which equals 52 variable plus 80 pounds surplus. The rate of surplus value is therefore 80 over 52, being 153 and 11 thirteenths percent.
In a working day of 10 hours, with average labor, the result is necessary labor equals 3 and 31 over 33 hours, and surplus labor equals 6 and 2 over 33. One more example. Jacob gives the following calculation for the year 1815. Owing to the previous adjustment of several items, it is very imperfect. Nevertheless, it is sufficient for our purpose. In it, he assumes that the price of wheat is 8 shillings a quarter, and that the average yield per acre is 22 bushels. Here, the assumption is always made that the price of the product is the same as its value, and moreover, surplus value is distributed under the various headings of profit, interest, rent, etc. To us, these headings are irrelevant. We simply add them together, and the sum is a surplus value of £3.11. shillings. The sum of £3.19 shillings paid for seed and manure is constant capital, and we put it equal to zero. There is left the sum of £3.10, shillings, which is the variable capital advanced, and we see that a new value of £3.10 shillings plus £3.11 shillings has been produced in its place. Therefore, S over V is equal to £3.11 shillings over £3.10 shillings, i.e. more than 100%. The worker employs more than half his working day in producing the surplus value, which different persons then share amongst themselves on different pretexts. Section 2. The representation of the value of the product by corresponding proportional parts of the product. Let us now return to the example which showed us how the capitalist converts money into capital. The necessary labor of his spinning worker amounted to six hours. Surplus labor was the same. The degree of exploitation of labor was therefore 100%. The product of a working day of 12 hours is 20 pounds of yarn, having a value of 30 shillings. No less than 8 tenths of this value, or 24 shillings, is formed by the mere reappearance in it of the value of the means of production, 20 pounds of cotton, value 20 shillings, and the worn part of the spindle, valued at 4 shillings. In other words, this part consists of constant capital. The remaining 2 tenths, or 6 shillings, is the new value created during the spinning process. One half of this replaces the value of the day's labor power, or the variable capital, the remaining half constitutes a surplus value of three shillings. The total value of the 20 pounds of yarn is thus made up as follows. 30 shillings, being the value of the yarn, is equal to 24 shillings constant, plus three shillings variable, plus three shillings surplus. Since the whole of this value is contained in the 20 pounds of yarn produced, it follows that the various component parts of this value can be represented as being contained respectively in proportional parts of the product. If the value of 30 shillings is contained in 20 pounds of yarn, then 8 tenths of this value, or the 24 shillings that forms its constant part, is contained in 8 tenths of the product, or in 16 pounds of yarn. Of the latter, 13 and 1 third pounds represent the value of the raw material, the 20 shillings worth of cotton spun, and 2 and 2 thirds pounds represent the 4 shillings worth of spindle etc. worn away in the process. Hence, the whole of the cotton used up in spinning the 20 pounds of yarn is represented by 13 and one thirds pounds of yarn. This latter weight of yarn admittedly contains by weight no more than 13 and one third pounds of cotton, which is only worth 13 and one third shillings. But the six and two thirds shillings additional value contained in it is the equivalent for the cotton consumed in spinning the remaining six and two thirds pounds of yarn. The effect is the same as if these six and two-thirds pounds of yarn contained no cotton at all, and the whole twenty pounds of cotton were concentrated in the thirteen and one-third pounds of yarn. The latter weight, on the other hand, does not contain an atom of the value of the auxiliary materials and instruments of labor, or of the value newly created in the process. In the same way, the two and two-thirds pounds of yarn, in which the four shillings, the remainder of the constant capital, is embodied, represent nothing but the value of the auxiliary materials and instruments of labor consumed in producing the twenty pounds of yarn. We have therefore arrived at this result. Although eight-tenths of the product, or sixteen pounds of yarn, seen in its physical existence as a use value, is just as much the fabric of the spinner's labor as the remainder of the same product, yet... When viewed in this connection, it does not contain and has not absorbed any labor expended during the process of spinning. It is just as if the cotton had converted itself into yarn without any help. It is just as if the shape it had assumed was mere trickery and deceit. In fact, when the capitalist has sold it for 24 shillings and with the money replaced his means of production, it becomes evident that the 16 pounds of yarn is nothing more than cotton, spindle waste, and coal in disguise. On the other hand, the remaining two-tenths of the product, or four pounds of yarn, represent nothing but the new value of six shillings created during the 12-hour spinning process. All the value transferred to those four pounds from the raw material and instruments of labor consumed was, so to speak, intercepted in order to be incorporated into the 16 pounds first spun. In this case, it is as if the spinner had spun four pounds of yarn out of air, 
or as if he'd spun it with the aid of cotton and spindles which were available in nature without human intervention, and therefore transferred no value to the product. Of this four pounds of yarn, in which the whole value created in the daily process of spinning is condensed, one half represents the equivalent for the value of the labor consumed, or the three shillings of variable capital. The other half represents three shillings of surplus value. Since twelve hours of labor put in by the spinner are objectified in six shillings, it follows that sixty hours of labor are objectified in yarn of the value of thirty shillings. And this quantity of labor time does in fact exist in the twenty pounds of yarn, for eight-tenths of the yarn, or sixteen pounds, is a materialization of the forty-eight hours labor expended before the beginning of the spinning process, on means of production. The other two-tenths, or four pounds, is a materialization of the twelve hours labor expended during the process itself. On a former page, we saw that the value of the yarn is equal to the new value created during the production of that yarn, plus the value previously existing in means of production. It has now been shown how the different constituents of the value of the product, distinguished according to their function or according to their concept, may be represented by corresponding proportional parts of the product itself. In this way, the product, i.e. the result of the process of production, is split up into different parts, one part representing only the labor previously spent on the means of production or the constant capital, another part only the necessary labor spent during the process of production or the variable capital, and another, and last part, only the surplus labor expended during the process, or the surplus value. The decomposition of the product is as simple a task as it is important. This will be seen later when we apply it to complex and hitherto unsolved problems. So far, we have treated the total product as the final result, ready for use of a working day of 12 hours. We can, however, also follow this total product through all the stages of its production, and in this way we shall arrive at the same result as before if we represent the partial products, precipitated at different stages, as functionally distinct parts of the final, or total product. The spinner produces 20 pounds of yarn in 12 hours. Hence he produces 1 and 2 thirds pound in 1 hour, and 13 and 1 third pound in 8 hours, or a partial product equal in value to all the cotton that is spun in a whole day. Similarly, the partial product of the next period of 1 hour and 36 minutes is 2 and 2 thirds pounds of yarn. This represents the value of the instruments of labor that are consumed in 12 hours. In the following hour and 12 minutes, the spinner produces 2 pounds of yarn worth 3 shillings, a value equal to the whole value he creates in his 6 hours of necessary labor. Finally, in the last hour and 12 minutes, he produces another 2 pounds of yarn, whose value is equal to the surplus value created by a surplus labor in the course of half a day. This method of calculation serves the English manufacturer for everyday use. It shows, he will say, that in the first eight hours, or two-thirds of the working day, he gets back the value of his cotton, and so on for the remaining hours. It is also a perfectly correct method, since it is in fact the first method given above only transferred from the spatial sphere, in which the different parts of the completed product lie side by side, to the temporal sphere, in which those parts are produced in succession but it can also be accompanied by very barbaric notions, especially in the heads of people who are as much interested practically in the valorization process as they are theoretically in misunderstanding it. It may be imagined, for instance, that our spinner produces or replaces, in the first eight hours of the working day, the value of the cotton, in the following hour and 36 minutes, the value of the deterioration and the instruments of labor, in the next hour and 12 minutes, the value of his wages, and finally, that he devotes only the famous last hour to the production of surplus value for the factory owner. In this way, the spinner is made to perform the twofold miracle not only of producing cotton, spindle, steam engine, coal, oil, etc., at the same time as he is using them to spin, but also of turning one working day of a given level of intensity into five similar days. For, in the example we are considering, the production of the raw material and the instruments of labor requires 24 divided by 6 being four working days of 12 hours each, and their conversion into yarn requires another such day. That the love of profit induces an easy belief in such miracles, and that there is no lack of sycophantic doctrinaires to prove their existence, is demonstrated by the following famous historical example. Section 3. Seniors' Last Hour one fine morning, in the year 1836, Nassau W. Senior, who may be called the Heinrich Chlorin of the English economists, a man famed both for his economic science and his beautiful style, was summoned from Oxford to Manchester, to learn in the latter place the political economy he taught in the former. The manufacturers chose him as their prize fighter, not only against the newly passed Factory Act, but against the ten hours' agitation, which aimed to go beyond it. With their usual practical acuteness, they could realize that the learned professor wanted a good deal of finishing. That is why they invited him to Manchester. 
For his part, the professor has embodied the lecture he received from the Manchester manufacturers in a pamphlet entitled Letters on the Factory Act, as it affects the cotton manufacturer, published in London, 1837. Here we find, amongst other things, the following edifying passage. Quote, Under the present law, no mill in which persons under 18 years of age are employed can be worked more than 11 and a half hours a day, that is, 12 hours for five days in the week and nine on Saturday. Now the following analysis will show that in a mill so worked, the whole net profit is derived from the last hour. I will suppose a manufacturer to invest £100,000 minus £80,000 in his mill and machinery, and £20,000 in raw material and wages. The annual return of that mill, supposing the capital to be turned once a year and gross profits to be 15%, ought to be goods worth £115,000. Of this £115,000, each of the 23 half-hours of work produces five one-hundred-and-fifteenths, or one-twenty-third. Of these 23 twenty-thirds, constituting the whole £115,000, 20, that is to say 100,000 out of the 115,000, simply replace the capital. One twenty-third, or 5,000, makes up for the deterioration of the mill and machinery. The remaining two twenty-thirds, that is the last two of the 23 half-hours of every day, produce the net profit of 10%. If, therefore, prices remaining the same, the factory could be kept at work 13 hours instead of 11 and a half, with an addition of about 2,600 pounds to the circulating capital, the net profit would be more than doubled. On the other hand, if the hours of working were reduced by one hour per day, prices remaining the same, the net profit would be destroyed. If they were reduced by one hour and a half, even the gross profit would be destroyed. End quote. And the professor calls this an analysis. If he believed the outcries of the manufacturers to the effect that the workers spent the best part of the day in the production, i.e. the reproduction or replacement, of the value of the buildings, machinery, cotton, coal, etc., then his analysis was superfluous. His answer could simply have been this. Gentlemen, if you work your mills for 10 hours instead of 11 and a half, then other things being equal, the daily consumption of cotton, machinery, etc., will decrease in proportion. You gain just as much as you lose. Your work people will in future spend one hour and a half less time in reproducing or replacing the capital advanced. If, on the other hand, he did not take them at their word, but, being an expert in such matters, considered it necessary to undertake an analysis, then he ought, in a question which turns exclusively on the relation of the net profit to the length of the working day, above all, to have asked the manufacturers to be careful not to lump together machinery, workshops, raw material, and labor, but to be good enough to place the constant capital, invested in buildings, machinery, raw material, etc., on the one side of the account, and the capital advanced in wages on the other side. If it then turned out that according to the calculations of the manufacturers, the worker reproduced or replaced his wages in two half hours, in that case, he should have continued his analysis as follows. According to your figures, the workman produces his wages in the last hour but one, and your surplus value, or net profit, in the last hour. Now, since in equal periods he produces equal values, the product of the last hour but one must have the same value as that of the last hour. Further, it is only while he works that he produces any value at all, and this quantity of work he does is measured by his labor time. This, you say, amounts to eleven and a half hours per day. He employs one portion of these eleven and a half hours in producing or replacing his wages, and the remaining portion in producing your net profit. Beyond this, he does absolutely nothing. But since, on your assumption, his wages and the surplus value he provides are of equal value, it is clear that he produces his wages in five and three quarters hours and your net profit in the other five and three quarters hours. Again, since the value of the yarn produced in two hours is equal to the sum of the value of his wages and of your net profit, the measure of the value of this yarn must be eleven and a half working hours, of which five and three quarters measure the value of the yarn produced in the last hour but one, and the other five and three quarters the value of the yarn produced in the last hour of all. We now come to such a ticklish point, so watch out, the last working hour but one is, like the first, an ordinary working hour, neither more nor less. How then can the spinner produce in one hour, in the shape of the yarn, a value that embodies five and three quarters hours labor? The truth is that he does not perform any such miracle. The use value produced by him in one hour is a definite quantity of yarn. The value of this yarn is measured by five and three quarters working hours, of which four and three quarters were, without any assistance from him, previously embodied in the means of production, in the cotton, the machinery, and so on. The remaining one hour alone is added by him. Therefore, since his wages are produced in five and three quarters hours, and the yarn produced in one hour also contains five and three quarters hours work, there is no witchcraft in the result that the value created by his five and three quarters hours of spinning is equal to the value of the product spun in one hour. 
You are altogether on the wrong track if you think that he loses a single moment of his working day in reproducing or replacing the values of the cotton, the machinery, and so on. On the contrary, it is because his labor converts the cotton and the spindles into yarn, because he spins, that the value of the cotton and spindles go over to the yarn of their own accord. This is a result of the quality of his labor, not its quantity. It is true that he will transfer to the yarn more value, in the shape of cotton, in one hour than he will in half an hour. But that is only because in one hour he spins up more cotton than in half an hour. You see, then, that your assertion that the workman produces, in the last hour but one, the value of his wages, and in the last hour your net profit, amounts to no more than this, that in the yarn produced by him in two working hours, whether they are the first two or the last two hours of the working day, there are incorporated eleven and a half working hours, i.e. precisely as many hours as there are in his working day. And my assertion that in the first five and three quarters hours he produces his wages, and in the last five and three quarters hours your net profit, amounts only to this, that you pay him for the former but not for the latter. In speaking of payment of labor, instead of payment of labor power, I'm only using your own slang expression. Now, gentlemen, if you compare the working time you pay for with the working time you do not pay for, you will find that they are related to each other as half a day is to half a day. This gives a rate of 100%, and a very pretty percentage it is. Further, there is not the least doubt that if you make your hands toil for 13 hours instead of 11 and a half, and as may be expected from you, if you treat the work done in that extra one hour and a half as pure surplus labor, then the latter will be increased from five and three quarters hours labor to seven and one quarters hours labor, and the rate of surplus value will go up from 100% to 126 and two twenty thirds percent so that you are altogether too sanguine in expecting that by such an addition of one and a half hours to the working day the rate will rise from 100% to 200% and more. In other words, that it will be more than doubled. On the other hand, the heart of a man is a wonderful thing, especially when it is carried in his wallet. You take too pessimistic a view when you fear that a reduction of the hours of labor from eleven and a half to ten will sweep away the whole of your net profit. Not at all. All other conditions remaining the same, the surplus labor will fall from five and three quarters hours to four and three quarters hours, a period that still gives a very profitable rate of surplus value, namely 82 and 14 twenty thirds percent. But this fateful last hour, about which you have invented more stories than the millenarians about the day of judgment, is all bosh. If it goes, it will not cost you your pure hands, nor will it cost the boys and girls you employ their pure minds. Whenever your last hour strikes in earnest, think of the Oxford professor. And now, gentlemen, farewell. And may we meet again in a better world, but not before. The battle cry of the last hour, invented by Senior in 1836, was raised once again in the London Economist of the 15th of April, 1848, by James Wilson, an economic mandarin of high standing, in a polemic against the Ten Hours Bill. Section 4 the surplus product. We call the portion of the product that represents surplus value, i.e. one-tenth of the twenty pounds or two pounds of yarn in the example given above, by the name of surplus product. Just as the rate of surplus value is determined by its relation not to the sum total of the capital, but to its variable part, in the same way, the relative amount of surplus product is determined by its ratio not to the remaining part of the total product, but to that part of it in which necessary labor is incorporated. Since the production of surplus value is the determining purpose of capitalist production, the size of a given quantity of wealth must be measured not by the absolute quantity produced, but by the relative magnitude of the surplus product. The sum of the necessary labor and the surplus labor, i.e. the sum of the periods of time during which the worker respectively replaces the value of his labor power and produces the surplus value, constitutes the absolute extent of his labor time, i.e. the working day. Chapter 10. The Working Day Section 1. The Limits of the Working Day We began with the assumption that labor power is bought and sold at its value. Its value, like that of all other commodities, is determined by the labor time necessary to produce it. If it takes six hours to produce the average daily means of subsistence of the worker, he must work an average of six hours a day to produce his daily labor power, or to reproduce the value received as a result of its sale. The necessary part of his working day amounts to six hours, and is therefore, other things being equal, a given quantity. But with this, the extent of the working day itself is not yet given. Let us assume that a line A to B, with six segments, represents the length of the necessary labor time, say six hours. 
If the labor is prolonged beyond AB by one, three, or six hours, we get three other lines. Working day number one, A to B with six segments, and B to C with one segment. Working day number two, A to B with six segments, and B to C with three segments. And working day number three, A to B with six segments, and B to C with another six segments, which represent three different working days of seven, nine, and twelve hours. The extension BC of the line AB represents the length of the surplus labor. As the working day is AB plus BC, or A to C, it varies with the variable magnitude BC. Since AB is constant, the ratio of BC to AB can always be calculated. In working day number one, it is one sixth, in number two, three sixths, and in working day number three, six sixths of AB. Since further, the ratio of surplus labor time to necessary labor time determines the rate of surplus value, the latter is given by the ratio of BC to AB. It amounts, in the three different working days, respectively, to 16 and two-thirds, 50 and 100 percent. On the other hand, the rate of surplus value alone would not give us the extent of the working day. If this rate were 100 percent, the working day might be of 8, 10, 12, or more hours. It would indicate that the two constituent parts of the working day, necessary labor time and surplus labor time, were equal in extent, but not how long each of these two constituent parts was. The working day is thus not a constant, but a variable quantity. One of its parts certainly is determined by the labor time required for the reproduction of the labor power of the worker himself, but its total varies with the duration of the surplus labor. The working day is therefore capable of being determined, but in and for itself indeterminate. Although the working day is not a fixed but a fluid quantity, it can, on the other hand, vary only within certain limits. The minimum limit, however, cannot be determined. Of course, if we make the extension line BC, or the surplus labor, equal to zero, we have a minimum limit, i.e. the part of the day in which the worker must necessarily work for his own maintenance. Under the capitalist mode of production, however, this necessary labor can form only a part of the working day. The working day can never be reduced to this minimum. On the other hand, the working day does have a maximum limit. It cannot be prolonged beyond a certain point. The maximum limit is conditioned by two things. First, by the physical limits to labor power. Within the 24 hours of the natural day, a man can only expend a certain quantity of his vital force. Similarly, a horse can work regularly for only eight hours a day. During part of the day, the vital force must rest, sleep. During another part, the man has to satisfy other physical needs, to feed, wash, and clothe himself. Besides these purely physical limitations, the extension of the working day encounters moral obstacles. The worker needs time in which to satisfy his intellectual and social requirements, and the extent and the number of these requirements is conditioned by the general level of civilization. The length of the working day therefore fluctuates within boundaries both physical and social, but these limiting conditions are of a very elastic nature and allow a tremendous amount of latitude. So we find working days of many different lengths, of 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, and 18 hours. The capitalist has bought the labor power at its daily value. The use value of the labor power belongs to him throughout one working day. He has thus acquired the right to make the worker work for him during one day. But what is a working day? At all events, it is less than a natural day. How much less? The capitalist has his own views of this point of no return, the necessary limit of the working day. As a capitalist, he is only capital personified. His soul is the soul of capital. But capital has one sole driving force, the drive to valorize itself, to create surplus value, to make its constant part, the means of production, absorb the greatest possible amount of surplus labor. Capital is dead labor which, vampire-like, lives only by sucking living labor, and lives the more the more labor it sucks. The time during which the worker works is the time during which the capitalist consumes the labor power he has bought from him. If the worker consumes his disposable time for himself, he robs the capitalist. The capitalist therefore takes his stand on the law of commodity exchange. Like all other buyers, he seeks to extract the maximum possible benefit from the use value of his commodity. Suddenly, however, there arises the voice of the worker, which had previously been stifled in the sound and fury of the production process. The commodity I have sold you differs from the ordinary crowd of commodities in that its use creates value, a greater value than it costs. That's why you bought it. What appears on your side as the valorization of capital is on my side an excess expenditure of labor power. You and I know on the market only one law, that of the exchange of commodities, and the consumption of the commodity belongs not to the seller who parts with it, but to the buyer who acquires it. 
The use of my daily labor power therefore belongs to you. But by means of the price you pay for it every day, I must be able to reproduce it every day, thus allowing myself to sell it again. Apart from the natural deterioration through age, etc., I must be able to work tomorrow with the same normal amount of strength, health, and freshness as today. You are constantly preaching to me the gospel of saving and abstinence. Very well, like a sensible, thrifty owner of property, I will husband my soul wealth, my labor power, and abstain from wasting it foolishly. Every day I will spend, set in motion, transfer into labor only as much of it as is compatible with its normal duration and healthy development. By an unlimited extension of the working day, you may in one day use up a quantity of labor power greater than I can restore in three. What you gain in labor, I lose in the substance of labor. Using my labor and despoiling it are quite different things. If the average length of time an average worker can live, while doing a reasonable amount of work, is 30 years, the value of my labor power, which you pay me from day to day, is 1 over 365 times 30, or 1 over 10,950 of its total value. But if you consume it in 10 years, you pay me daily 1 10,950th instead of 1 3,650th of its total value, i.e. only one-third of its daily value, and you therefore rob me every day of two-thirds of the value of my commodity. You pay me for one day's labor power while you use three days of it. That is against our contract and the law of commodity exchange. I therefore demand a working day of normal length, and I demand it without any appeal to your heart, for in money matters, sentiment is out of place. You may be a model citizen, perhaps a member of the RSPCA, and you may be in the odor of sanctity as well, but the thing you represent when you come face to face with me has no heart in its breast. What seems to throb there is my own heartbeat. I demand a normal working day because, like every other seller, I demand the value of my commodity. We see, then, that, leaving aside certain extremely elastic restrictions, the nature of commodity exchange itself imposes no limit to the working day, no limit to surplus labor. The capitalist maintains his rights as a purchaser when he tries to make the working day as long as possible, and where possible to make two working days out of one. On the other hand, the peculiar nature of the commodity sold implies a limit to its consumption by the purchaser, and the worker maintains his right as a seller when he wishes to reduce the working day to a particular normal length. There is here, therefore, an antimony of right against right, both equally bearing the seal of the law of exchange. Between equal rights, force decides. Hence, in the history of capitalist production, the establishment of a norm for the working day presents itself as a struggle over the limits of that day, a struggle between collective capital, i.e. the class of capitalists, and collective labor, i.e. the working class. Section 2. The Voracious Appetite for Surplus Labor Manufacturer and Boyar Capital did not invent surplus labor. Wherever a part of society possesses the monopoly of the means of production, the worker, free or unfree, must add to the labor time necessary for his own maintenance an extra quantity of labor time in order to produce the means of subsistence for the owner of the means of production. Whether this proprietor be an Athenian Carlos Carathos, an Etruscan theocrat, a Chivis Romanus, a Norman baron, an American slave owner, a Wallachian boyar, a modern landlord, or a capitalist. It is, however, clear that in any economic formation of society where the use value rather than the exchange value of the product predominates, surplus labor will be restricted by a more or less confined set of needs, and that no boundless thirst for surplus labor will arise from the character of production itself. Hence, in antiquity, Overwork becomes frightful only when the aim is to obtain exchange value in its independent monetary shape, i.e. in the production of gold and silver. The recognized form of overwork here is forced labor until death. One only needs to read Diodorus Siculus. Nevertheless, these are exceptions in antiquity. But as soon as peoples whose production still moves within the lower forms of slave labor, the corvée, etc., are drawn into a world market dominated by the capitalist mode of production, whereby the sale of their products for export develops into their principal interest, the civilized horrors of overwork are grafted onto the barbaric horrors of slavery, serfdom, etc. Hence the Negro labor in the southern states of the American Union preserved a moderately patriarchal character as long as production was chiefly directed to the satisfaction of immediate local requirements, but in proportion as the export of cotton became of vital interest to those states, 
the overworking of the Negro, and sometimes the consumption of his life in seven years of labor, became a factor in a calculated and calculating system. It was no longer a question of obtaining from him a certain quantity of useful products, but rather the production of surplus value itself. The same is true of the corvée in the Danubian principalities, for instance. The comparison of the appetite for surplus labor in the Danubian principalities with the same appetite as found in the English factories has a special interest, because the corvée presents surplus labor in an independent and immediately perceptible form. Suppose the working day consists of six hours of necessary labor and six hours of surplus labor. Then the free worker gives the capitalist six times six, or thirty-six hours of surplus labor, every week. It is the same as if he worked three days in the week for himself and three days in the week gratis for the capitalist. But this fact is not directly visible. Surplus labor and necessary labor are mingled together. I can therefore express the same relation by saying that, for instance, in every minute, the worker works 30 seconds for himself and 30 seconds for the capitalist, etc. It is otherwise with the corvée. The necessary labor which the Wallachian peasant performs for his own maintenance is distinctly marked off from his surplus labor on behalf of the boyar. The one he does on his own field, the other on the seigneurial estate. Both parts of the labor time thus exist independently, side by side with each other. In the corvée, the surplus labor is accurately marked off from the necessary labor. However, this clearly alters nothing in the quantitative relation of surplus labor to necessary labor. Three days surplus labor in the week remain three days that yield no equivalent to the worker himself, whether the surplus labor is called corvée or wage labor. But in the capitalist, the appetite for surplus labor appears in the drive for an unlimited extension of the working day, while in the boyard, it appears more simply in a direct hunt for days of corvée. In the Danubian principalities, the calvé was linked with rents in kind and other appurtenances of serfdom, but it formed the most important tribute paid to the ruling class. Where this was the case, the calvé rarely arose from serfdom. Instead, serfdom arose, inversely, from the calvé. This is what took place in the Romanian provinces. Their original mode of production was based on communal property, but not communal property in its Slav or Indian form. Part of the land was cultivated independently as free private property by the members of the commune, another part, the agiar publicus, was cultivated by them in common. The products of this common labor served partly as a reserve fund against bad harvests and other misfortunes, partly as a kind of state treasury to cover the costs of war, religion, and other communal expenses. In the course of time, military and clerical dignitaries usurped the communal land, and along with this the obligations owed to it. The labor of the free peasants on their communal land was transformed into calvé, performed for the thieves who had taken that land. This calvé soon developed into a servile relationship existing in point of fact, though not legally, until Russia, the liberator of the world, raised it to the level of a law on the pretext of abolishing serfdom. The code of the calvé, which the Russian general Kisilov proclaimed in 1831, was of course dictated by the boyars themselves. Thus, at one stroke, Russia both conquered the magnates of the Danubian principalities and earned the applause of cretinous liberals throughout Europe. According to the Reglement Organique, as this code of the corvée is called, every Wallachian peasant owes to the so-called landlord, besides a mass of payments in kind, which are specified in detail, the following. 1. 12 days of labor in general. 2. 1 day of field labor. 3. 1 day of wood carrying. Taken together, this is 14 days in the year. However, with deep insight into political economy, the working day is not taken in its ordinary sense, but as the working day necessary to the production of an average daily product, and that average daily product is determined in such a sly manner that even a cyclops would be unable to finish the job within 24 hours. Therefore, the Reglement itself declares, dryly and with true Russian irony, that by 12 working days one must understand the product of the manual labor of 36 days, by one day of field labor, three days, and by one day of wood carrying, similarly, three times as much. The sum total is now 42 days of corvée. To this had to be added the so-called jobazio, service due to the Lord for emergency requirements. In proportion to the size of its population, every village has to furnish annually a definite contingent to the jobazio. This additional corvée is estimated at 14 days for each Wallachian peasant. Thus, the prescribed calvé amounts to 56 working days every year. But because of the severe climate, the agricultural year in Wallachia numbers only 210 days, of which 40 for Sundays and holidays, and 30 on an average for bad weather, together 70 days, do not count.
140 working days remain. The ratio of the corvée to the necessary labor, 56 over 84, or 66 and two-thirds percent, gives a much smaller rate of surplus value than that which regulates the work of the English agricultural laborer, or factory worker. This is, however, only the legally prescribed corvée, and in a spirit yet more liberal than the English factory acts, the règlement organique was able to facilitate its own evasion. After it is made 56 days out of 12, the nominal day's work of each of the 56 corvée days is again so arranged that a portion of it must fall on the next day. In one day, for instance, an amount of land must be weeded which would require twice as much time for this work, particularly on the maize plantations. The legal day's work for some kinds of agricultural labor can be interpreted in such a way that the day begins in the month of May and ends in the month of October. For Moldavia, the regulations are even stricter. The twelve corvée days of the Reglement Organique, cried a boyard drunk with victory, amount to 365 days in the year. If the Reglement Organique of the Danubian principalities was a positive expression of the appetite for surplus labor which every paragraph legalized, the English Factory Acts are the negative expression of the same appetite. These laws curb capital's drive towards a limitless draining away of labor power by forcibly limiting the working day on the authority of the state but a state ruled by capitalist and landlord. Apart from the daily, more threatening advance of the working-class movement, the limiting of factory labor was dictated by the same necessity as forced the manufacturing of English fields with guano, the same blind desire for profit that in the one case exhausted the soil had in the other case seized hold of the vital force of the nation at its roots. Periodical epidemics speak as clearly on this point as the diminishing military standard of height in France and Germany. The Factory Act of 1850, now in force, as of 1867, allows 10 hours for the average working day, i.e. for the first five days, 12 hours from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., including half an hour for breakfast and an hour for dinner, thus leaving 10 and a half working hours, and 8 hours for Saturday, from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m., of which half an hour is subtracted for breakfast. 60 working hours are left, 10 and one half for each of the first five days, 7 and one half for the last. Certain guardians of these laws are appointed, factory inspectors directly under the Home Secretary, and their reports are published every six months by order of Parliament. They therefore provide regular and official statistics of the voracious appetite of the capitalists for surplus labor. Let us listen for a moment to the factory inspectors. Quote, the fraudulent mill owner begins work a quarter of an hour, sometimes more, sometimes less, before 6 a.m., and leaves off a quarter of an hour, sometimes more, sometimes less, after 6 p.m. He takes five minutes from the beginning and from the end of the half hour nominally allowed for breakfast, and ten minutes at the beginning and end of the hour nominally allowed for dinner. He works for a quarter of an hour, sometimes more, sometimes less, after 2 p.m. on Saturday. Thus, his gain is, before 6 a.m., 15 minutes, after 6 p.m., 15 minutes, at breakfast time, 10 minutes, at dinner time, 20 minutes, and throughout the total day, 60 minutes. The total for the five days being 300 minutes, on Saturday before 6 a.m. being 15, at breakfast time being 10, after 2 p.m. being 15, the total for Saturday being 40 minutes, and so the weekly total being 340 minutes, or 5 hours and 40 minutes weekly, which, multiplied by 50 working weeks in the year, allowing two for holidays and occasional stoppages, is equal to 27 working days. Five minutes a day increased work multiplied by weeks are equal to two and a half days of produce in the year. An additional hour a day gained by the small installments before 6 a.m. and after 6 p.m. and at the beginning and end of the times nominally fixed for meals is nearly equivalent to working 13 months in the year. End quote. Crises during which production is interrupted and the factories work short time, i.e. only for part of the week, naturally do not affect the tendency to extend the working day. The less business there is, the more profit has to be made on the business done. The less time spent in work, the more of that time has to be turned into surplus labor time. This is how the factory inspectors report on the period of crisis from 1857 to 1858. Quote, It may seem inconsistent that there should be any overworking at a time when trade is so bad, but that very badness leads to a transgression by unscrupulous men. They get the extra profit of it in the last half year, says Leonard Horner. 122 mills in my district have been given up, 143 were found standing, yet overwork is continued beyond the legal hours. For a great part of the time, says Mr. Howell, owing to the depression of trade, many factories were altogether closed, and a still greater number were working short time. 
I continue, however, to receive about the usual number of complaints that half, or three-quarters of an hour in the day, are snatched from the workers by encroaching upon the times professedly allowed for rest and refreshment. The same phenomenon was repeated on a smaller scale during the frightful cotton crisis from 1861 to 1865. It is sometimes advanced by way of excuse, when persons are found at work in a factory either at meal hour or at some illegal time, that they will not leave the mill at the appointed hour, and that compulsion is necessary to force them to cease work, cleaning their machinery, etc., especially on Saturday afternoons. But if the hands remain in a factory after the machinery has ceased to revolve, they would not have been so employed if sufficient time had been set apart specially for cleaning, etc., either before 6 a.m. or before 2 p.m. on Saturday afternoons. The profit to be gained by it, overworking in violation of the act, appears to be, to many, a greater temptation than they can resist. They calculate upon the chance of not being found out, and when they see the small amounts of penalty and costs, which those who have been convicted have had to pay, they find that if they should be detected there will still be a considerable balance of gain. In cases where the additional time is gained by a multiplication of small thefts in the course of the day, there are insuperable difficulties to the inspectors making out a case. These small thefts of capital from the workers' meal times and recreation times are also described by the factory inspectors as petty pilferings of minutes, snatching a few minutes, or in the technical language of the workers, nibbling and cribbling at meal times. It is evident that in this atmosphere, the formation of surplus value by surplus labor is no secret. If you allow me, as I was informed by a highly respectable master, to work only ten minutes in the day overtime, you put one thousand a year in my pocket. Moments are the elements of profit. In this connection, nothing is more characteristic than the designation of the workers who work full-time as full-timers and the children under thirteen who are only allowed to work six hours as half-timers. The worker is here nothing more than a personified labor time. All individual distinctions are obliterated in that between full-timers and half-timers. Section 3 branches of English industry, without legal limits to exploitation. So far, we have observed the drive towards the extension of the working day, and the werewolf-like hunger for surplus labor in an area where capital's monstrous outrages, unsurpassed, according to an English bourgeois economist, by the cruelties of the Spaniards to the American redskins, caused it at last to be bound by the chains of legal regulations. Now let us cast a glance at certain branches of production in which the exploitation of labor is either still unfettered even now, or was so yesterday. Quote, Mr. Broughton Charlton, county magistrate, declared, as chairman of a meeting held at the Assembly Rooms, Nottingham, on the 14th of January, 1860, that there was an amount of privation and suffering among that portion of the population connecting with the lace trade, unknown in the other parts of the kingdom, indeed in the civilized world. Children of nine or ten years are dragged from their squalid beds at two, three, or four o'clock in the morning and compelled to work for a bare subsistence until ten, eleven, or twelve at night, their limbs wearing away, their frames dwindling, their faces whitening, and their humanity absolutely sinking into a stone-like torpor, utterly horrible to contemplate. We are not surprised, he went on, that Mr. Mallet or any other manufacturer should stand forward in protest against discussion. The system, as the Reverend Montague Valpy describes it, is one of unmitigated slavery, socially, physically, morally, and spiritually. What can be thought of a town which holds a public meeting to petition that the period of labor for men shall be diminished to 18 hours a day? We declaim against the Virginian and Carolinian cotton planters. Is their black market, their lash, and their barter of human flesh— more detestable than this slow sacrifice of humanity which takes place in order that veils and collars may be fabricated for the benefit of capitalists? End quote. The potteries of Staffordshire have, during the last twenty-two years, formed the subject matter of three parliamentary inquiries. The results were embodied in Mr. Scriven's report of 1841 to the Children's Employment Commissioners, in Dr. Greenhouse's report of 1860, published by order of the Medical Officer of the Privy Council, and lastly in Mr. Long's report of 1862 printed in the Children's Employment Commission first report, dated the 13th of June, 1863. For my purpose, it is enough to take some of the deposition of the exploited children themselves from the reports of 1860 and 1863. From the children, we may deduce the situation of the adults, especially the girls and women, and in the branch of industry indeed, alongside which cotton spinning appears as a very agreeable and healthy occupation. 
William Wood, nine years old, quote, was seven years and ten months old when he began to work, end quote. He ran molds, carried ready-molded articles into the drying room, afterwards bringing back the empty mold from the very beginning. He came to work every day in the week at 6 a.m. and left off at about 9 p.m. Quote, I work till 9 o'clock at night six days in the week. I have done so for the last seven or eight weeks. Fifteen hours of labor for a child of seven. J. Murray, 12 years of age, says, quote, I turn jigger and run molds. I come at six. Sometimes I come at four. I worked all night last night till six o'clock this morning. I have not been in bed since the night before last. There were eight or nine other boys working last night. All but one have come this morning. I get three shillings and sixpence. I don't get any more for working at night. I worked two nights last week. Fernieho, a boy of ten, I've not always an hour for dinner. I have only half an hour sometimes, on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Dr. Greenhouse states that the average life expectancy in the pottery districts of Stoke-on-Trent and Walstanton is extraordinarily low. Although only 36.6% of the male population over the age of 20 are employed in the potteries in the district of Stoke, and 30.4% in Walstanton, more than half the deaths among men of that age in the first district, and nearly two-fifths in the second district, are the result of pulmonary diseases among the potters. Dr. Boothroyd, a medical practitioner at Hanley, says, quote, Each successive generation of potters is more dwarfed and less robust than the preceding one. Similarly, another doctor, Mr. McBean, states, Since I began to practice among the potters 25 years ago, I have observed a marked degeneration, especially shown in diminution of stature and breadth. These statements are taken from Dr. Greenhouse's report of 1860. From the report of the commissioners in 1863, the following, Dr. J.T. Arledge, senior physician of the North Staffordshire Infirmary, says, The potters as a class, both men and women, represent a degenerated population, both physically and morally. They are, as a rule, stunted in growth, ill-shaped and frequently ill-formed in the chest. They become prematurely old and are certainly short-lived. They are phlegmatic and bloodless and exhibit their debility of constitution by obstinate attacks of dyspepsia and disorders of the liver and kidneys and by rheumatism. But of all the diseases, they are especially prone to chest disease, to pneumonia, phthisis, bronchitis, and asthma. One form would appear peculiar to them, and is known as potter's asthma, or potter's consumption. Scrofula attacking the glands or bones or other parts of the body is a disease of two-thirds or more of the potters. That the degenerescence of the population of this district is not even greater than it is, is due to the constant recruiting from the adjacent country and intermarriages with more healthy races. Mr. Charles Parsons, until recently the house surgeon of the same hospital, writes in a letter to Commissioner Long, amongst other things, quote, I can only speak from personal observation and not from statistical data, but I do not hesitate to assert that my indignation has been aroused again and again at the sight of poor children whose health has been sacrificed to gratify the avarice of either parents or employers, end quote. He enumerates the causes of the diseases of the potters and sums them up in the phrase, long hours. In their report, the commissioners expressed the hope that a manufacture which has assumed so prominent a place in the whole world will not long be subject to the remark that its great success is accompanied with the physical deterioration, widespread bodily suffering, and early death of the workpeople, by whose labor and skill such great results have been achieved. And all that holds of the potteries in England is true of those in Scotland. The manufacture of matches dates from 1833, from the discovery of the method of applying phosphorus to the match itself. Since 1845, this branch of industry has developed rapidly in England and has spread out from the thickly populated parts of London to the cities of Manchester, Birmingham, Liverpool, Bristol, Norwich, Newcastle, and Glasgow. It has brought with it tetanus, a disease which a Vienna doctor already discovered in 1845 to be peculiar to the makers of matches. Half the workers are children under 13 and young persons under 18. The manufacture of matches, on account of its unhealthiness and unpleasantness, has such a bad reputation that only the most miserable part of the working class, half-starved widows and so forth, deliver up their children to it, their ragged, half-starved, untaught children, quote from the Children's Employment Commission First Report, published in 1863. Of the witnesses examined by Commissioner White, 270 were under 18, 50 under 10, 10 only 8, and 5 only 6 years old. With the working day ranging from 12 to 14 or 15 hours, night labor, irregular meal times, and meals mostly taken in the workrooms themselves, pestilent with phosphorus, 
Dante would have found the worst horrors in his inferno surpassed in this industry. In the manufacture of wallpaper, the coarser sorts are printed by machine, the finer by hand, block printing. The most active business months are from the beginning of October to the end of April. During this time, the work often lasts, almost interruptedly, from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., or further on into the night. J. Leach's deposition, quote, Last winter, six out of 19 girls were away from ill health at one time from overwork. I have to bawl at them to keep them awake, end quote. W. Duffy, quote, I have seen when the children could none of them keep their eyes open for the work. Indeed, none of us could, end quote. J. Lightborn, quote, I am 13. We worked last winter till nine in the evening, and the winter before till ten. I used to cry with sore feet every night last winter. End quote. G. Abston, quote, That boy of mine, when he was seven years old, I used to carry him on my back through the snow, and he used to have sixteen hours a day. I've often knelt down to feed him as he stood by the machine, for he could not leave it or stop. End quote. Smith, the managing partner of a Manchester factory, quote, We, he means his hands, who work for us, Work on, with no stoppage for meals, so that the day's work of ten and a half hours is finished by 4.30 p.m., and all after that is overtime. Does this Mr. Smith take no meals himself during the ten and a half hours? We, this same Smith, seldom leave off working before 6 p.m. He means leave off from consuming our labor power machines, so that we, the same man again, are really working overtime the whole year round. For all these, children and adults alike, 152 children and young persons and 140 adults, the average work for the last 18 months has been at the very least 7 days 5 hours, or 78 and a half hours a week. For the 6 weeks ending in the 2nd of May this year, 1862, the average was higher, 8 days or 84 hours a week. Despite this, the same Mr. Smith, who is so fond of the plural of majesty, adds, smirking with satisfaction, machine work is not so great. Similarly, the employers in the block printing trade say, hand labor is more healthy than machine work. On the whole, manufacturers are indignantly opposed to the proposal to stop the machines at least during mealtimes. A clause which allowed work between, say, 6 a.m. and 9 p.m., says Mr. Otley, manager of a wallpaper factory in the borough, a district of London, would suit us very well. But the factory hours, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., are not suitable. Our machine is always stopped for dinner. What a generosity. There is no waste of paper and color to speak of, but, he adds sympathetically, I can understand the loss of time not being liked. In the commission's report, the naive opinion is expressed that the fear in some leading firms of losing time, i.e. the time for appropriating the labor of others, and thereby losing profit, is not a sufficient reason for allowing children under 13 and young persons under 18 working 12 to 16 hours per day to lose their dinner, nor for giving it to them as coal and water are supplied to the steam engine, soap to wool, oil to the wheel, namely during the process of production itself as merely auxiliary material for the instruments of labor. No other branch of industry in England has preserved up to the present day a method of production as archaic, as pre-Christian, as we see from the poets of the Roman Empire, as baking has. We shall disregard the practice of making bread by machinery, which has only recently begun to make its way here. But capital, as we said earlier, is at first indifferent towards the technical character of the labor process it seizes control of. At the outset, it takes it as it finds it. The incredible adulteration of bread, especially in London, was first revealed by the Committee of the House of Commons on the Adulteration of Articles of Food, published in 1855 to 1856, and by Dr. Hassall's work, Adulterations Detected. The consequence of these revelations was the act of the 6th of August, 1860, for preventing the adulteration of articles of food and drink, an inoperative law as it naturally shows the tenderest considerations for every free trader who decides to turn an honest penny by buying and selling adulterated commodities. The committee itself more or less naively formulated its conviction that free trade essentially meant trade with adulterated, or as the English ingeniously put it, sophisticated goods. In fact, this kind of sophistry understands better than Protagoras how to make white black and black white, and better than Eleatics how to demonstrate before your very eyes that everything real is merely apparent. At all events, the committee had directed the attention of the public to its daily bread, and therefore to the baking trade. At the same time, the cry of the London journeyman bakers against their overwork rose in public meetings and petitions to Parliament. 
The cry was so urgent that Mr. H. S. Tremon here, also a member of the above-mentioned Commission of 1863, was appointed a Royal Commissioner of Inquiry. His report, together with the evidence given, moved the public not in its heart but in its stomach. Englishmen, with their good command of the Bible, knew well enough that man, unless by elective grace a capitalist or a landlord or the holder of a sinecure, is destined to eat his bread in the sweat of his brow, but they did not know that he had to eat daily in his bread a certain quantity of human perspiration mixed with a discharge of abscesses, cobwebs, dead cockroaches, and putrid German yeast, not to mention alum, sand, and other agreeable mineral ingredients. Without any regard for His Holiness' free trade, the hitherto free baking trade was therefore placed under the supervision of state-appointed inspectors at the close of the parliamentary session of 1863, and by the same act of Parliament, work from nine in the evening to five in the morning was forbidden for journeyman bakers under eighteen. The last clause speaks volumes as to the overwork in this old-fashioned, homely line of business. The following is a quote from the first report. The work of a London journeyman baker begins, as a rule, at about eleven at night. At that hour he makes the dough, a laborious process which lasts half an hour to three-quarters of an hour according to the size of the batch or the labor bestowed upon it. He then lies down upon the kneading board, which is also the covering of the trough in which the dough is made, and with a sack under him and another rolled up as a pillow, he sleeps for about a couple of hours. He is then engaged in a rapid and continuous labor for about five hours, throwing out the dough, scaling it off, molding it, and putting it into the oven preparing and baking rolls and fancy bread, taking the batch bread out of the oven and up into the shop, etc., etc. The temperature of a bakehouse ranges from about 75 to upwards of 90 degrees, and in the smaller bakehouses approximates usually to the higher rather than to the lower degree of the heat. When the business of making the bread, rolls, etc. is over, that of its distribution begins, and a considerable portion of the journeymen in the trade, after working hard in the manner described during the night, are upon their legs for many hours during the day, carrying baskets or wheeling handcarts, and sometimes again in the bakehouse, leaving off work at various hours between 1 and 6 p.m. according to the season of the year or the amount and nature of their master's business, while others are again engaged in the bakehouse in bringing out more batches until late in the afternoon. During what is called the London season, the operatives belonging to the full-priced bakers at the west end of the town generally begin work at 11 p.m. and are engaged in making the bread, with one or two short, sometimes very short, intervals of rest, up to eight o'clock the next morning. They are then engaged all day long, up to four, five, six, and as late as seven o'clock in the evening carrying out bread, or sometimes in the afternoon in the bakehouse again assisting in the biscuit making. They may have, after they have done their work, sometimes five or six, sometimes only four or five hours sleep before they begin again. On Fridays they always begin sooner, some at about ten o'clock, and continue in some cases at work either in making or delivering the bread up to eight p.m. on Saturday night but more generally up to four or five o'clock Sunday morning. On Sundays, the men must attend twice or three times during the day for an hour or two to make preparation for the next day's bread. The men employed by the underselling masters, who sell their bread under the full price and who, as already pointed out, comprise three-fourths of the London bakers, have not only to work on the average longer hours, but their work is almost entirely confined to the bakehouse. The underselling masters generally sell their bread in the shop. If they send it out, which is not common, except as supplying Chandler's shops, they usually employ other hands for that purpose. It is not their practice to deliver bread from house to house. Towards the end of the week, the men begin on Thursday night at 10 o'clock and continue on with only slight intermission until late on Saturday evening. End quote. Even the bourgeois, from his standpoint, grasps the position of the underselling masters. Quote, the unpaid labor of the men was made the source whereby the competition was carried on. End quote from George Reed, The History of Baking. And the full-priced baker denounces his underselling competitors to the commission of inquiry as thieves of other people's labor and adulterators of the product. Quote, they exist now by first defrauding the public and next getting 18 hours of work out of their men for 12 hours wages. End quote from the first report. The adulteration of bread and the formation of a class of bakers who sell bread for less than its full price are developments which have taken place in England since the beginning of the 18th century, i.e. as soon as the corporate character of the trade was lost and the capitalists stepped behind the nominal master baker in the shape of a miller or flour factor. This laid the foundation for capitalist production in this trade, for the unlimited extension of the working day, and for night work, although the last mention has secured a real foothold only since 1824, even in London. After what has just been said, it'll be understood that the Commission's report classes journeyman bakers among the short-lived workers who, 
having by good luck escaped the normal decimation of the children of the working class, rarely reached the age of forty-two. Nevertheless, the baking trade is always overwhelmed with applicants. The sources for the supply of these labor powers to London are Scotland, the agricultural districts of the west of England, and Germany. In the years 1858 to 1860, the journeymen bakers of Ireland organized, at their own expense, huge meetings to agitate against night work and Sunday work. The public, for example at the Dublin meeting of May 1860, supported them with typically Irish warmth. As a result of this movement, a rule of exclusive day labor was successfully established in Wexford, Kilkenny, Clonmel, Waterford, etc. Quote, in Limerick, where the grievances of the journeymen are demonstrated to be excessive, the movement has been defeated by the opposition of the master bakers, the miller bakers being the greatest opponents. The example of Limerick has led to a retrogression in Ennis and Tipperary. In Cork, where the strongest possible demonstration of feeling took place, the masters, by exercising their power of turning the men out of employment, have defeated the movement. In Dublin, the master bakers have offered the most determined opposition to the movement, and by discountenancing as much as possible the journeymen promoting it, have succeeded in leading the men into acquiescence in Sunday work and night work, contrary to the convictions of the men. End quote from the report of the Committee on the Baking Trade in Ireland for 1861. The Committee of the English Government, a government which, in Ireland, is armed to the teeth, merely remonstrates, in funereal tones, it is true, against the implacable master bakers of Dublin, Limerick, Cork, etc. Quote, the committee believe that the hours of labor are limited by natural laws, which cannot be violated with impunity. That for master bakers to induce their workmen, by the fear of losing employment, to violate their religious convictions and their better feelings, to disobey the laws of the land, and to disregard public opinion, this all refers to Sunday labor, is calculated to provoke ill feeling between the workmen and masters, and affords an example dangerous to religion, morality, and social order. The committee believe that any constant work beyond 12 hours a day encroaches on the domestic and private life of the working man and so leads to disastrous moral results, interfering with each man's home and the discharge of his family duties as a son, a brother, a husband, a father. That work beyond 12 hours has a tendency to undermine the health of the working man and so leads to premature old age and death to the great injury of families of working men thus deprived of the care and support of the head of the family when most required. End quote. We have just been in Ireland. On the other side of the channel, in Scotland, the agricultural labourer, the man of the plough, is protesting against his 13 to 14 hours work in a very severe climate, with four hours additional work on Sunday, in that land of Sabbatarians. While simultaneously in London, three railwaymen, a guard, an engine driver, and a signalman, are up before a coroner's jury. A tremendous railway accident has dispatched hundreds of passengers into the next world. The negligence of the railway workers is the cause of the misfortune. They declare with one voice before the jury that ten or twelve years before, their labor lasted only eight hours a day. During the last five or six years, they say, it has been screwed up to fourteen, eighteen, and twenty hours, and when the pressure of holiday travelers is especially severe, when excursion trains are put on, their labor often lasts for forty or fifty hours without a break. They are ordinary men, not cyclops. At a certain point, their labor power ran out. Torpor sees them, their brains stop thinking, their eyes stop seeing. The thoroughly respectable British jurymen replied with a verdict that sent them to the assizes on a charge of manslaughter. In a mild writer to the verdict, the jury expressed the pious hope that the capitalist railway magnates would in future be more extravagant in the purchase of the necessary number of labor powers, and more abstemious, more self-denying, more thrifty in the extortion of paid labor power. From the motley crowd of workers of all callings, ages, and sexes, who throng around us more urgently than did the souls of the slain around Ulysses, on whom we see at a glance the signs of overwork, without referring to the blue books under their arms, let us select two more figures, whose striking contrast proves that all men are alike in the face of capital, a milliner and a blacksmith. In the last week of June 1863, all the London Daily Papers published a paragraph with the sensational heading, Death from Simple Overwork. It dealt with the death of a milliner, Marianne Walkley, twenty years old, employed in a highly respectable dressmaking establishment, exploited by a lady with the pleasant name of Elise. The old, often-told story was now revealed once again. These girls work, on an average, sixteen and a half hours without a break, during the season often thirty hours, and the flow of their failing labor power is maintained by occasional supplies of sherry, port, or coffee. It was the height of the season, 
It was necessary, in the twinkling of an eye, to conjure up magnificent dresses for the noble ladies invited to the ball in honor of the newly imported Princess of Wales. Marianne Walkley had worked uninterruptedly for twenty-six and one-half hours, with sixty other girls, thirty in each room. The rooms provided only one-third of the necessary quantity of air measured in cubic feet. At night, the girls slept in pairs in the stifling holes into which a bedroom was divided by wooden partitions, and this was one of the better millinery establishments in London. Marianne Walkley fell ill on the Friday and died on Sunday, without, to the astonishment of Madame Elise, having finished off the bit of finery she was working on. The doctor, a Mr. Keyes, called too late to the girl's deathbed, made his deposition to the coroner's jury in plain language. Marianne Walkley died from long hours of work in an overcrowded workroom and a too small and badly ventilated bedroom. In order to give the doctor a lesson in good manners, the coroner's jury thereupon brought in the verdict that the deceased had died of apoplexy, but there was reason to fear that her death had been accelerated by overwork in an overcrowded workroom. "'Our white slaves!' exclaimed the Morning Star, the organ of the free-trading gentleman Cobden and Bright. "'Our white slaves, who are toiled into the grave, for the most part, silently pine and die.'" The following is a quote from Dr. Richardson. It is not only in dressmakers' rooms that working to death is the order of the day, but in a thousand other places, and every place I had almost said where a thriving business has to be done. We will take the blacksmith as a type. If the poets are true, there is no man so hearty, so merry as the blacksmith. He rises early and strikes his sparks before the sun. He eats and drinks and sleeps as no other man. Working in moderation, he is in fact in one of the best of human positions, physically speaking but we follow him into the city or town, and we see the stress of work on that strong man, and what then is his position in the death rate of his country. In Mary Lebone, blacksmiths die at the rate of thirty-one per thousand per annum, or eleven above the mean of male adults of the country in its entirety. The occupation, instinctive almost as a portion of human art, unobjectionable as a branch of human industry, is made by mere excess of work the destroyer of the man. He can strike so many blows per day, walk so many steps, breathe so many breaths, produce so much work, and live an average, say, of fifty years. He is made to strike so many more blows, to walk so many more steps, to breathe so many more breaths per day, and to decrease altogether a fourth of his life. He meets the effort. The result is that producing for a limited time a fourth more work, he dies at thirty-seven for fifty. Section 4 Day Work and Night Work The Shift System Constant capital, the means of production, only exist, considered from the standpoint of the process of valorization, in order to absorb labor, and with every drop of labor, a proportional quantity of surplus labor. Insofar as the means of production fail to do this, their mere existence forms a loss for the capitalist, in a negative sense, for while they lie fallow, they represent a useless advance of capital. This loss becomes a positive one as soon as the interruption of employment necessitates an additional outlay when the work begins again. The prolongation of the working day beyond the limits of the natural day into the night only acts as a palliative. It only slightly quenches the vampire thirst for the living blood of labor. Capitalist production therefore drives, by its inherent nature, towards the appropriation of labor throughout the whole of the 24 hours in the day. But since it is physically impossible to exploit the same individual labor power constantly, during the night as well as the day, capital has to overcome this physical obstacle. An alternation becomes necessary between the labor powers used up by day and those used up by night. This can be accomplished in various ways. For instance, it may be arranged that part of the working personnel is employed for one week on day work and for the next week on night work. It is well known that this shift system, this alternation of two sets of the workers, predominated in the full-blooded springtime of the English cotton industry, and that at the present time it still flourishes, among other places, in the cotton-spinning factories of the Moscow Gubernia. This 24-hour process of production exists today as a system in many of the as-yet-free branches of industry in Great Britain, in the blast furnaces, forges, rolling mills, and other metallurgical establishments of England, Wales, and Scotland. Here, the labor process includes a great part of the 24 hours of Sunday, in addition to the 24 hours of the six working days. The workers consist of men and women, adults and children of both sexes. 
the ages of the children and young persons run through all the intermediate grades, from 8, in some cases from 6, to 18. In some branches of industry, the girls and women work through the night together with the male personnel. Leaving aside the generally harmful effects of night labor, the duration of the process of production, unbroken for 24 hours, offers very welcome opportunities for exceeding the limits of the normal working day, for example in the branches of industry already mentioned, which are themselves very strenuous. The official working day usually comes to 12 hours by night or day for all workers, but the amount of overwork done in excess of this limit is in many cases, to use the words of the official English report, truly fearful. It is impossible, says the report, for any mind to realize the amount of work described in the following passages as being performed by boys of from 9 to 12 years of age, without coming irresistibly to the conclusion that such abuses of the power of parents and of employers can no longer be allowed to exist. The practice of boys working at all by day and night turns, either in the usual course of things or at pressing times, seems inevitably to open the door to their not infrequently working unduly long hours. These hours are indeed, in some cases, not only cruelly but even incredibly long for children. Amongst a number of boys it will, of course, not infrequently happen that one or more are from some cause absent. When this happens, their place is made up by one or more boys who work in the other turn. That this is a well-understood system is plain from the answer of the manager of some large rolling mills who, when I asked him how the place of the boys absent from their turn was made up, responded, I dare say, sir, you know that as well as I do, and admitted the fact. At a rolling mill where the proper hours were from 6 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., a boy worked about four nights every week till 8.30 p.m. at least, and this for six months. Another, at nine years old, sometimes made three 12-hour shifts running, and when ten is made two days and two nights running. A third, now ten, worked from 6 a.m. till 12 p.m. three nights and till 9 p.m. the other nights. Another, now 13, worked from 6 p.m. till 12 noon the next day for a week together and sometimes for three shifts together, for example, from Monday morning till Tuesday night. Another, now 12, has worked in an iron foundry at Stavely from 6 a.m. to 12 p.m. for a fortnight on end. Could not do it any more. Quote, George Allensworth, age 9, came here as cellar boy last Friday. Next morning we had to begin at 3, so I stopped here all night. Lived five miles off. Slept on the floor of the furnace, overhead with an apron under me, and a bit of jacket over me. The two other days I've been here at 6 a.m. Aye, it is hot in here. Before I came here I was nearly a year at the same work at some works in the country. Began there too at 3 on Saturday morning. Always did, but was very near home, and could sleep at home. Other days I began at 6 in the morning and given over at 6 or 7 in the evening. End quote. Let us now hear how capital itself regards this 24-hour system. The extreme forms of the system, its abuse and the cruel and incredible extension of the working day, are naturally passed over in silence. Capital only speaks of the system in its normal form. Messrs. Naylor and Vickers, steel manufacturers, who employ between 600 and 700 persons, among whom only 10% are under 18, with only 20 boys under 18 working on the night shift, have the following comments to make. Quote, the boys do not suffer from the heat. The temperature is probably from 86 degrees to 90 degrees. At the forges and in the rolling mills, the hands work night and day, in relays, but all the other parts of the work are day work, i.e. from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. In the forge, the hours are from 12 to 12. Some of the hands always work in the night, without any alternation of day and night work. We do not find any difference in the health of those who work regularly by night and those who work by day, and probably people can sleep better if they have the same period of rest than if it has changed. About 20 of the boys under the age of 18 work in the night sets. We could not well do without lads under 18 working by night. The objection would be the increase in the cost of production. Skilled hands and the heads in every department are difficult to get, but of children we could get any number. But from the small proportion of boys that we employ, the subject, i.e. the subject of restrictions on night work, is of little importance or interest to us. End quote. Mr. J. Ellis, from the firm of Messrs. John Brown and Company, Steel and Iron Works, employing about 3,000 men and boys, part of whose operations, namely iron and heavier steel work, goes on night and day in shifts, states that in the heavier steel work, one or two boys are always employed to a score or two men. Their business employs 500 boys under 18, and of these, about a third, or 170, are under the age of 13. With reference to the proposed alteration of the law, Mr. Ellis says, 
I do not think it would be very objectionable to require that no person under the age of 18 should work more than 12 hours in the 24, but we do not think that any line could be drawn over the age of 12, at which boys could be dispensed with for night work. But we would sooner be prevented from employing boys under the age of 13, or even so high as 14 at all, than not be allowed to employ boys that we do have at night. Those boys who work in the day sets must take their turn in the night sets also. Because the men could not work in the night sets only, it would ruin their health. We think, however, that night work in alternate weeks is no harm. Messrs. Naylor and Vickers, on the other hand, in line with the best interests of their business, took the opposite view, that periodic alternation of night and day labor might well do more harm than continual night labor. We find the men who do it, as well as the others who do other work only by day. Our objections to not allowing boys under 18 to work at night would be on account of the increase of expense, but this is the only reason. What cynical naivete! We think that the increase would be more than the trade, with due regard to its being successfully carried out, could fairly bear. Labor is scarce here, and might fall short if there was such a regulation. In other words, Ellis or Brown and Company might be subjected to the fatal embarrassment of having to pay labor power at its full value. The Cyclops Deal in Ironworks of Messrs. Camel and Company is conducted on the same large scale as the works of the above-mentioned John Brown and Company. The managing director had handed in his evidence to the government commissioner, Mr. White, in writing. Later, he found it convenient to suppress the manuscript when it was returned to him for revision. But Mr. White has a retentive memory. He recalled quite clearly that for these Cyclopean gentlemen, the prohibition of the night labor of children and young persons, quote, would be impossible. It would be tantamount to stopping their works, end quote, and yet their business employs little more than 6% of boys under 18 and less than 1% under 13. On the same question, Mr. E. F. Sanderson, of the firm of Sanderson Brothers and Company, Steel Rolling Mills and Forges, Addercliffe, says, Great difficulty would be caused by preventing boys under 18 from working at night. The chief would be the increase of cost from employing men instead of boys. I cannot say what this would be, but probably it would not be enough to enable the manufacturers to raise the price of steel, and consequently it would fall on them, as of course the men, how wrong-headed these people are, would refuse to pay it. Mr. Sanderson does not know how much he pays the children, but, quote, perhaps the younger boys get from four shillings to five shillings a week. The boys' work is of a kind for which the strength of boys is generally, generally, but of course not always in particular, quite sufficient. And consequently, there would be no gain in the greater strength of the men to counterbalance the loss, or it would only be in the few cases in which the metal is heavy. The men would not like so well not to have boys under them, as men would be less obedient. Besides, boys must begin young to learn the trade. Leaving day work alone open to boys would not answer the purpose. And why not? Why could the boys not learn their craft in the daytime? Your reason? Owing to the men working days and nights in alternate week, the men would be separated half the time from the boys, and would lose half the profit which they make from them. The training which they give to an apprentice is considered as part of the return for the boys' labor, and thus enables the men to get it at a cheaper rate. Each man would want half of this profit. In other words, Messrs. Sanderson would have to pay part of the wages of the adult men out of their own pockets instead of by the night work of the boys. Messrs. Sanderson's profit would then fall to some extent, and this is the good Sandersonian reason why boys cannot learn their craft by day. Apart from this, it would throw night work on the men alone, who are at present relieved by the boys, and they would not be able to stand it. In short, the difficulties would be so great as to lead in all likelihood to the total suppression of night work. As far as the work itself is concerned, says E. F. Sanderson, this would suit us well, but, but Messrs. Sanderson have something else to make besides steel. Steel making is simply a pretext for profit making. The steel furnaces, rolling mills, etc., the buildings, machinery, iron, coal, etc., have something more to do than transform themselves into steel. They are there to absorb surplus labor, and they naturally absorb more in 24 hours than in 12. In fact, both by the sanction of the law and the grace of God, they give to the Sandersons a draft on the labor time of a certain number of hands for all the 24 hours of the day, and as soon as there is an interruption in their function of absorbing labor, they lose their character as capital, and are therefore a pure loss for the Sandersons. But then there would be the loss from so much expensive machinery, lying idle half the time, and to get through the amount of work which we are able to do on the present system, we should have to double our premieres and plant, which would double the outlay. 
But why should these Sandersons pretend to a privilege not enjoyed by the other capitalists, who only work during the day, and whose buildings, machinery, raw material therefore lie idle during the night? E.F. Sanderson answers in the name of all the Sandersons. It is true that there is this loss from machinery lying idle in those factories in which work only goes on by day, but the use of furnaces would involve a further loss in our case. If they were kept up, these would be a waste of fuel, instead of the present waste of the living substance of the workers, and if they were not, there would be a loss of time in laying the fires and getting the heat up, whereas a loss of sleeping time, even that of eight-year-olds, is a gain of working time for the Sanderson clan. And the furnaces themselves would suffer from the changes of temperature, whereas those same furnaces suffer nothing from the alternation of day work and night work. Section 5. The Struggle for a Normal Working Day. Laws for the Compulsory Extension of the Working Day from the middle of the 14th to the end of the 17th century. What is a working day? What is the length of time during which capital may consume the labor power whose daily value it is paid for? How far may the working day be extended beyond the amount of labor time necessary for the reproduction of labor power itself? We have seen that capital's reply to these questions is this. The working day contains the full 24 hours, with the deduction of the few hours of rest without which labor power is absolutely incapable of renewing its services. Hence it is self-evident that the worker is nothing other than labor power for the duration of his whole life, and that therefore all his disposable time is by nature and by right labor time, to be devoted to the self-valorization of capital. Time for education, for intellectual development, for the fulfillment of social functions, for social intercourse, for the free play of the vital forces of his body and his mind, even the rest time of Sunday, and that in a country of Sabbatarians. What foolishness! But in its blind and measureless drive, its insatiable appetite for surplus labor, capital oversteps not only the moral but even the merely physical limits of the working day. It usurps the time for growth, development, and healthy maintenance of the body. It steals the time required for the consumption of fresh air and sunlight. It haggles over the mealtimes, where possible, incorporating them into the production process itself, so that food is added to the worker as a mere means of production as coal is supplied to the boiler and grease and oil to the machinery. It reduces the sound sleep needed for the restoration, renewal, and refreshment of the vital forces to the exact amount of torpor essential to the revival of an absolutely exhausted organism. It is not the normal maintenance of labor power which determines the limits of the working day here, but rather the greatest possible daily expenditure of labor power, no matter how diseased, compulsory, and painful it may be, which determines the limits of the worker's period of rest. Capital asks no questions about the length of life of labor power. What interests it is purely and simply the maximum of labor power that can be set in motion in a working day. It attains this objective by shortening the life of labor power, in the same way as a greedy farmer snatches more produce from the soil by robbing it of its fertility. By extending the working day, therefore, capitalist production, which is essentially the production of surplus value, the absorption of surplus labor, not only produces a deterioration of human labor power, by robbing it of its normal moral and physical conditions of development and activity, but also produces the premature exhaustion and death of this labor power itself. It extends the worker's production time within a given period by shortening his life. But the value of labor power includes the value of the commodities necessary for the reproduction of the worker, for continuing the existence of the working class. If, then, the unnatural extension of the working day, which capital necessarily strives for in its unmeasured drive for self-valorization, shortens the life of the individual worker, and therefore the duration of his labor power, the forces used up have to be replaced more rapidly, and it'll be more expensive to reproduce labor power, just as in the case of a machine where part of its value that has to be reproduced daily grows greater the more rapidly the machine is worn out. It would seem, therefore, that the interest of capital itself points in the direction of a normal working day. The slave owner buys his worker in the same way as he buys his horse. If he loses his slave, he loses his capital, which he must replace by a fresh expenditure on the slave market. But take note of this. Quote, the rice grounds of Georgia, or the swamps of Mississippi, may be fatally injurious to the human constitution, but the waste of human life which the cultivation of these districts necessitates is not so great that it cannot be repaired from the teeming preserves of Virginia and Kentucky. Considerations of economy, moreover, which, under a natural system, afford some security for humane treatment by identifying the master's interests with the slave's preservation, when once trading in slaves is practiced, 
become reasons for racking to the uttermost the toil of the slave, for when his place can at once be supplied from foreign preserves, the duration of his life becomes a matter of less moment than its productiveness while it lasts. It is accordingly a maxim of slave management in slave-importing countries that the most effective economy is that which takes out of the human chattel in the shortest space of time the utmost amount of exertion it is capable of putting forth. It is in tropical culture, where annual profits often equal the whole capital of plantations, that Negro life is most recklessly sacrificed. It is the agriculture of the West Indies, which has been for centuries prolific of fabulous wealth that has engulfed millions of the African race. It is in Cuba at this day, whose revenues are reckoned by millions and whose planters are princes, that we see in the servile class the coarsest fare, the most exhausting and unremitting toil, and even the absolute destruction of a portion of its numbers every year. End quote from Cairns. Mutato nomine de te fabula narrator. The name is changed, but the tale is told of you. For slave trade, read Labor Market. For Kentucky and Virginia, Ireland and the agricultural districts of England, Scotland, and Wales. For Africa, Germany. We have heard how overwork has thinned the ranks of bakers in London. Nevertheless, the London labor market is always overstocked with German and other candidates for death in the bakeries. Pottery, as we saw, is one of the branches of industry with the lowest life expectancy. Does this lead to any shortage of potters? Josiah Wedgwood, the inventor of modern pottery, and himself an ordinary worker by origin, said in 1785 before the House of Commons that the whole trade employed from 15,000 to 20,000 people. In 1861, the population of the urban centers alone of this industry in Great Britain numbered 101,302. The cotton trade has existed for 90 years. It has existed for three generations of the English race, and I believe I may safely say that during that period it has destroyed nine generations of factory operatives. End quote from Ferran's speech in the House of Commons, 27th of April, 1863. Admittedly, the labor market shows significant gaps in certain epochs of feverish expansion. In 1834, for example. But then the manufacturers proposed to the poor law commissioners that they should send the surplus population of the agricultural districts to the north, with the explanation, quote, that the manufacturers would absorb and use it up. Agents were appointed with the consent of the poor law commissioners. An office was set up in Manchester, to which lists were sent of those workpeople in the agricultural districts wanting employment, and their names were registered in books. The manufacturers attended at these offices and selected such persons as they chose. When they had selected such persons as their wants required, they gave instructions to have them forwarded to Manchester, and they were sent, ticketed like bales of goods, by canals or with carriers, others tramping on the road, and many of them were found on the way lost and half-starved. This system had grown up into a regular trade. This house will hardly believe it, but I tell them that this traffic in human flesh was as well kept up. They were, in effect, as regularly sold to these manufacturers as slaves are sold to the cotton grower in the United States. In 1860, the cotton trade was at its zenith. The manufacturers again found they were short of hands. They applied to the flesh agents, as they are called. Those agents sent to the southern downs of England, to the pastures of Dorsetshire, to the glades of Devonshire, to the people tending kine in Wiltshire, but they sought in vain. The surplus population was absorbed. The Berry Guardian lamented that, after the conclusion of the Anglo-French Commercial Treaty, 10,000 additional hands could be absorbed by Lancashire, and that 30,000 or 40,000 will be needed. After the flesh agents and sub-agents had vainly combed through the agricultural districts, a deputation came up to London and waited on the right honorable gentleman Mr. Villiers, president of the Poor Law Board, with the view of obtaining poor children from certain union houses for the mills of Lancashire. What experience generally shows to the capitalist is a constant excess of population i.e. an excess in relation to capital's need for valorization at a given moment, although this throng of people is made up of generations of stunted, short-lived, and rapidly replaced human beings, plucked, so to speak, before they were ripe. And indeed, experience shows to the intelligent observer how rapidly and firmly capitalist production has seized the vital forces of the people at their very roots, although historically speaking, it hardly dates from yesterday. Experience shows, too, how the degeneration of the industrial population is retarded only by the constant absorption of primitive and natural elements from the countryside, and how even the agricultural labors, in spite of the fresh air and principle of natural selection that works so powerfully amongst them and permits the survival of only the strongest individuals, are already beginning to die off. Capital, which has such 
good reasons for denying the sufferings of the legions of workers surrounding it allows its actual movement to be determined as much and as little by the right of the coming degradation and final depopulation of the human race as by the probable fall of the earth into the sun. In every stock-jobbing swindle, everyone knows that some time or other the crash must come, but everyone hopes that it may fall on the head of his neighbor after he himself has caught the shower of gold and placed it in secure hands. Après moi, le déluge is the watchword of every capitalist and of every capitalist nation. Capital therefore takes no account of the health and the length of life of the worker unless society forces it to do so. Its answer to the outcry about the physical and mental degradation, the premature death, the torture of overwork, is this. Should that pain trouble us, since it increases our pleasure, being profit? But looking at these things as a whole, it is evident that this does not depend on the will, either good or bad, of the individual capitalist. Under free competition, the imminent laws of capitalist production confront the individual capitalist as a coercive force, external to him. The establishment of a normal working day is the result of centuries of struggle between the capitalist and the worker. But the history of this struggle displays two opposite tendencies. Compare, for example, the English factory legislation of our time with the English labor statutes from the 14th century to well in the middle of the 18th. While the modern factory acts compulsorily shorten the working day, the earlier statutes tried forcibly to lengthen it. Of course, the pretensions of capital in its embryonic state, in its state of becoming when it cannot as yet use the sheer force of economic relations to secure its right to absorb a sufficient quantity of surplus labor, but must be aided by the power of the state, its pretensions in this situation appear very modest in comparison with the concessions it has to make, complainingly and unwillingly, in its adult condition. Centuries are required before the free worker, owing to the greater development of the capitalist mode of production, makes a voluntary agreement, i.e. is compelled by social conditions, to sell the whole of his active life, his very capacity for labor, in return for the price of his customary means of subsistence, to sell his birthright for a mess of pottage. Hence it is natural that the longer working day which capital tried to impose on adult workers by acts of state power from the middle of the 14th to the end of the 17th century is approximately of the same length as the shorter working day which, in the second half of the 19th century, the state has here and there interposed as a barrier to the transformation of children's blood into capital. What has now been proclaimed, for instance in the state of Massachusetts, until recently the freest state of the North American Republic, as the statutory limit for the labor of children under twelve, was in England, even in the middle of the seventeenth century, the normal working day of able-bodied artisans, robust plowmen, and gigantic blacksmiths. The first statute of laborers found its immediate pretext, not its cause, for legislation of this kind outlives its pretext by centuries, in the great plague that decimated the population, so that, as a Tory writer says, quote, the difficulty of getting men to work on reasonable terms, i.e. at a price that left their employers a reasonable quantity of surplus labor, grew to such a height as to be quite intolerable. Reasonable wages were therefore fixed by law as well as the limits of the working day. The latter point, the only one that interests us here, is repeated in the statute of 1496 under Henry the Seventh. The working day for all craftsmen, Artificers and field laborers from March to September was supposed to last from five in the morning to between seven and eight in the evening, although this was never enforced. The meal times, however, consisted of one hour for breakfast, one and a half hours for dinner, and half an hour for noon meat, i.e. exactly twice as much as under the factory acts now in force. In winter, work was to last from five in the morning until dark, with the same intervals. A statute of Elizabeth of 1562 leaves the length of the working day for all laborers hired for daily or weekly wages untouched, but seeks to limit the interval to two and a half hours in the summer and two in the winter. Dinner is to last only one hour, and the afternoon sleep of half an hour is only allowed between the middle of May and the middle of August. For every hour of absence, one pence is to be subtracted from the wage. In practice, however, the conditions were much more favorable to the laborers than in the statute book. William Petty, the father of political economy, and to some extent the founder of statistics, says in a work he published in the last third of the 17th century, quote, Laboring men, the meaning then was agricultural laborers, work ten hours per diem, and make twenty meals per week, three a day for working days, and two on Sundays, whereby it is plain that if they could fast on Friday nights, and dine in one hour and a half, whereas they take two from eleven to one, thereby thus working one twentieth more, and spending one twentieth less, the above-mentioned tax might be raised. 
Was Dr. Andrew Urey not right when he deplored the 12 hours bill of 1833 as a retrogression to the age of darkness? It is true that the regulations contained in the statutes, and mentioned by Petty, apply also to apprentices. But the situation with respect to child labor, even at the end of the 17th century, is shown by the following complaint. Our youth, here in England, do absolutely nothing before they come to be apprentices, and then they naturally require a long time, seven years, to be formed to complete craftsmen. Germany, on the other hand, is praised because the children there are educated from their cradle at least to something of employment. Still, during the greater part of the 18th century, up to the epoch of large-scale industry, capital in England had not succeeded in gaining control of the worker's whole week by paying the weekly value of his labor power. The agricultural labors, however, formed an exception. The fact that they could live for a whole week on the wage of four days did not appear to the workers to be a sufficient reason for working for the capitalists for the other two days. One party of English economists, in the service of capital, denounced this obstinacy in the most violent manner. Another party defended the workers. Let us listen, for example, to the polemic between Postlethwaite, whose Dictionary of Trade then enjoyed the same reputation as similar works by McCulloch and McGregor do today, and the author of the Essay on Trade and Commerce cited earlier. Postlethwaite says, among other things, quote, We cannot put an end to these few observations without noticing that trite remark in the mouth of too many, that if the industrious poor can obtain enough to maintain themselves in five days, they will not work the whole six. Whence they infer the necessity of even the necessaries of life being made dear by taxes, or by any other means, to compel the working artisan and manufacturer to labor the whole six days in the week without ceasing. I must beg leave to differ in sentiment from those great politicians who contend for the perpetual slavery of the working people of this kingdom. They forget the vulgar adage, all work and no play. Have not the English boasted of the ingenuity and dexterity of her working artists and manufacturers which have heretofore given credit and reputation to British wares in general? What has this been owing to? To nothing more, probably, than the relaxation of the working people in their own way. Were they obliged to toil the year round, the whole six days in the week, in a repetition of the same work, might it not blunt their ingenuity and render them stupid instead of alert and dexterous, and might not our workmen lose their reputation instead of maintaining it by such eternal slavery? And what sort of workmanship could we expect from such hard-driven animals? Many of them will execute as much work in four days as a Frenchman will in five or six, but if Englishmen are to be eternal drudges, it is to be feared that they will degenerate below the Frenchman. As our people are famed for bravery in war, do we not say that it is owing to good English roast beef and pudding in their bellies, as well as their constitutional spirit of liberty? And why may not the superior ingenuity and dexterity of our artists and manufacturers be owing to that freedom and liberty to direct themselves in their own way? And I hope we shall never have them deprived of such privileges and that good living from whence their ingenuity no less than their courage may proceed. To this, the author of the Essay on Trade and Commerce replies, quote, if the making of every seventh day an holiday is supposed to be of divine institution, as it implies the appropriating the other six days to labor, he means capital, as we shall soon see, surely it will not be thought cruel to enforce it. That mankind in general are naturally inclined to ease and indolence, we fatally experience to be true, from the conduct of our manufacturing populace who do not labor, upon an average, above four days in a week, unless provisions happen to be very dear. Put all the necessaries of the poor under one denomination, for instance, call them all wheat, or suppose that the bushel of wheat shall cost five shillings, and that he, the worker, earns a shilling a day by his labor. He then would be obliged to work five days only in a week. If the bushel of wheat should cost but four shillings, he would be obliged to work but four days. But as wages in this kingdom are much higher in proportion to the price of necessaries, the manufacturer, i.e. the manufacturing worker, who labors four days, has a surplus of money to live idle with for the rest of the week. I hope I have said enough to make it appear that the moderate labor of six days in a week is no slavery. Our laboring people, i.e. the agricultural laborers, do this, and to all appearances are the happiest of our laboring poor. But the Dutch do this in manufactures and appear to be a very happy people. The French do so when holidays do not intervene. But our populace have adopted a notion that as Englishmen they enjoy a birthright privilege of being more free and independent than in any country in Europe. Now this idea, as far as it may affect the bravery of our troops, may be of some use. But the less the manufacturing poor have of it, certainly the better for themselves and for the state. The laboring people should never think themselves independent of their superiors. 
It is extremely dangerous to encourage mobs in a commercial state like ours, where perhaps seven parts out of eight of the whole are people with little or no property. The cure will not be perfect till our manufacturing poor are contented to labor six days for the same sum which they now earn in four days. End quote. To this end, and for extirpating idleness, debauchery, and excess, promoting a spirit of industry, lowering the price of labor in our manufactories, and easing the lands of the heavy burden of the poor's rates, our faithful Eckhart of capital proposes the well-tried method of locking up workers who become dependent on public support, in one word, paupers, in an ideal workhouse. Such an ideal workhouse must be made a house of terror, and not an asylum for the poor, quote, where they are to be plentifully fed, warmly and decently clothed, and where they do but little work. In this house of terror, the ideal workhouse, quote, the poor shall work fourteen hours in a day, allowing proper time for meals, in such a manner that there shall remain twelve hours of neat labor. Twelve working hours in a day like the ideal workhouse, the house of terror of 1770. Sixty-three years later, in 1833, when the English Parliament reduced the working day for children of 13 to 18 years to twelve full hours in four branches of industry, the day of judgment seemed to have dawned for English industry. In 1852, when Louis Bonaparte sought to secure his position with the bourgeoisie by tampering with the legal working day, the people of France cried out with one voice, The law that limits the working day to twelve hours is the one good that has remained to us of the legislation of the Republic. At Zurich, the work of children over 10 is limited to 12 hours. In Argonne, 1862, the work of children between 13 and 16 was reduced from 12 and a half to 12 hours. In Austria, in 1860, for children between 14 and 16, the same reduction was made. What progress since 1770, Macaulay might shout with exultation. The house of terror for paupers, only dreamed of by the capitalist mind in 1770, was brought into being a few years later, in the shape of a gigantic workhouse for the industrial worker himself. It was called the factory. And this time, the ideal was a pale shadow compared with the reality. Section 6. The Struggle for a Normal Working Day. Laws for the Compulsory Limitation of Working Hours. The English Factory Legislation of 1833-64 After capital had taken centuries to extend the working day to its normal maximum limit, and then beyond this to the limit of the natural day of twelve hours, there followed, with the birth of large-scale industry in the last third of the 18th century, an avalanche of violent and unmeasured encroachments. Every boundary set by morality and nature, age and sex, day and night, was broken down. Even the ideas of day and night, which in the old statutes were of pleasant simplicity, became so confused that an English judge as late as 1860 needed the penetration of an interpreter of the Talmud to explain judicially what was day and what was night. Capital was celebrating its orgies. As soon as the working class, stunned at first by the noise and turmoil of the new system of production, had recovered its senses to some extent, it began to offer resistance, first of all in England, the native land of large-scale industry. For three decades, however, the concessions wrung from industry by the working class remained purely nominal. Parliament passed five labor laws between 1802 and 1833, but was shrewd enough not to vote a penny for their compulsory implementation, for the necessary official personnel, etc., they remained a dead letter. Quote, the fact is that prior to the Act of 1833, young persons and children were worked all night, all day, or both ad libitum. End quote from the reports of the Inspectors of Factories, published the 30th of April, 1860. A normal working day for modern industry dates only from the Factory Act of 1833, which included cotton, wool, flax, and silk factories. Nothing characterizes the spirit of capital better than the history of the English factory legislation from 1833 to 1864. The Act of 1833 lays down that the ordinary factory working day should begin at 5.30 in the morning and end at 8.30 in the evening. And within these limits, a period of 15 hours, it is lawful to employ young persons, i.e. persons between 13 and 18 years of age, at any time of the day, provided that no one individual young person works more than 12 hours in any one day, except in certain cases especially provided for. The sixth chapter of the Act provided, quote, that there shall be allowed, in the course of every day, not less than one and a half hours for meals to every such person restricted as here and before provided. The employment of children under nine, with exceptions mentioned later, was forbidden. 
The work of children between 9 and 13 was limited to 8 hours a day. Night work, i.e. according to this act, work between 8.30 p.m. and 5.30 a.m., was forbidden for all persons between 9 and 18. The lawmakers were so far from wishing to interfere with the freedom of capital to exploit adult labor power, or as they called it, the freedom of labor, that they created a special system in order to prevent the factory acts from having such a frightful consequence. Quote, The great evil of the factory system, as at present conducted, says the first report at the Central Board of the Commission on the 28th of June, 1833, has appeared to us to be that it entails the necessity of continuing the labor of children to the utmost length of that of the adults. The only remedy for this evil, short of the limitation of the labor of adults, which would, in our opinion, create an evil greater than that which is sought to be remedied, appears to be the plan of working double sets of children. Under the name of the system of relays, relay means in English, as also in French, the changing of the post horses at each different halting place. This plan was therefore carried out, so that, for example, one set of children of between 9 and 13 years were put into harness from 5.30 a.m. until 1.30 p.m., another set from 1.30 p.m. until 8.30 p.m., and so on. In order to reward the manufacturers for having, in the most impudent way, ignored all the acts relating to child labor past dating the previous 22 years, the pill was yet further gilded for them. Parliament decreed that after the 1st of March 1834, no child under 11, after the 1st of March 1835, no child under 12, and after the 1st of March 1836, no child under 13 was to work more than eight hours in a factory. This liberalism, so full of consideration for capital, was the more noteworthy in that Dr. Farr, Sir A. Carlyle, Sir B. Brodie, Sir C. Bell, Mr. Guthrie, etc., in a word, the most distinguished physicians and surgeons in London, had declared in their evidence before the House of Commons that there was danger in delay. Dr. Farr was still blunter, quote, Legislation is necessary for the prevention of death in any form in which it can be prematurely inflicted, and certainly this, the factory method, must be viewed as a most cruel mode of inflicting it. The same reformed parliament, which in its delicate consideration for the manufacturers condemned children under 13 for years to come to the hell of 72 hours of factory labor every week, this same parliament, in the Emancipation Act, which also administered freedom drop by drop, forbade the planters, from the very beginning, to work any Negro slave for more than 45 hours a week. But capital was by no means soothed. It now began a noisy and long-lasting agitation. This turned on the age limit of the category of human beings who, under the name children, were restricted to eight hours of work and were subject to a certain amount of compulsory education. According to the anthropology of the capitalists, the age of childhood ended at ten, or at the outside, eleven. The nearer the deadline approached for the full implementation of the Factory Act, the fatal year 1836, the wilder became the rage of the mob of manufacturers. They managed, in fact, to intimidate the government to such an extent that in 1835 it proposed to lower the limit of the age of childhood from 13 to 12. But now the pressure from without became more threatening. The House of Commons lost its nerve. It refused to throw children of 13 under the juggernaut wheels of capital for more than eight hours a day, and the Act of 1833 came into full operation. It remained unaltered until June of 1844. During the decade in which it regulated factory work, at first in part and then entirely, the official reports of the factory inspectors teem with complaints about the impossibility of enforcing it. The point of time within the 15 hours from 5.30 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. at which each young person and each child was to begin, break off, resume, or end his 12 or 8 hours labor was left by the Act of 1833 to the free decision of the Lords of Capital. Similarly, the Act also permitted them to assign different meal times to different persons. Thanks to this provision, the capitalists soon discovered a new system of relays, by which the workhorses were not changed at fixed stations, but were always re-harnessed at different stations. We shall not pause here to reflect on the beauty of this system, as we shall have to return to it later. But this much is clear at first glance. It annulled the whole Factory Act, not only in the spirit, but in the letter. How could the factory inspectors, with this complex bookkeeping in respect of each individual child or young person, enforce the legally determined hours of work and compel the employers to grant the legal mealtimes? In many of the factories, the old and scandalous brutality soon blossomed again unpunished. In an interview with the Home Secretary, 1844, the factory inspectors demonstrated the impossibility of any control under the newly invented relay system. In the meantime, however, circumstances had greatly changed. 
The factory workers, especially since 1838, had made the Ten Hours Bill their economic, as they had made the Charter their political, election cry. Some of the manufacturers even, who had run their factories in conformity with the Act of 1833, overwhelmed Parliament with representations on the immoral competition of their false brethren, who were able to break the law because of their greater impudence or their more fortunate local circumstances. Moreover, however much the individual manufacturer might like to give free rein to his old lust for gain, the spokesmen and political leaders of the manufacturing class ordered a change in attitude and in language towards the workers. They had started their campaign to repeal the corn laws, and they needed the workers to help them to victory. They promised, therefore, not only that the loaf of bread would be twice its size, but also that the Ten Hours Bill would be enacted in the free trade millennium. Thus, they were even less inclined, and less able, to oppose a measure intended only to make the law of 1833 a reality. And finally, the Tories, threatened in their most sacred interest, the rent of land, thundered with philanthropic indignation against the nefarious practices of their foes. This was the origin of the Additional Factory Act of the 7th of June, 1844, which came into effect on the 10th of September, 1844. It placed under protection a new category of workers, namely women over 18. They were placed in every respect on the same footing as young persons, their working hours limited to 12, and night work forbidden to them. For the first time, it was found necessary for the labor of adults to be controlled directly and officially by legislation. The Factory Report of 1844-45 to states ironically, No instances have come to my knowledge of adult women having expressed any regret at their rights being thus far interfered with. The working hours of children under 13 were reduced to six and a half, and in certain circumstances to seven. To get rid of the abuses of the spurious system of relays, the law established, among other things, the following important regulations. Quote, the hours of work of children and young persons shall be reckoned from the time when any child or young person shall begin to work in the morning, so that if A, for example, begins work at 8 in the morning and B at 10, B's working day must nevertheless end at the same hour as A's. The time shall be regulated by a public clock, for example, the nearest railway clock, by which the factory clock is to be set. The manufacturer has to hang up a legible, printed notice stating the hours for the beginning and ending of the work and the pauses allowed for meals. Children beginning work before 12 noon may not be again employed after 1 p.m. The afternoon shift must therefore consist of other children than those employed in the morning. Of the hour and a half for meal times, quote, one hour thereof, at the least, shall be given before three of the clock in the afternoon, and at the same period of the day. No child or young person shall be employed more than five hours before 1 p.m. without an interval for mealtime of at least 30 minutes. No child or young person, or female, shall be employed or allowed to remain in any room in which any manufacturing process is then, i.e. at mealtimes, carried on. It has been seen that these highly detailed specifications, which regulate with military uniformity the times, the limits, and the pauses of work by the stroke of the clock, were by no means a product of the fantasy of members of Parliament. They developed gradually, out of the circumstances as natural laws of the modern mode of production. Their formulation, official recognition, and proclamation by the state were the result of a long class struggle. One of their first consequences was that in practice, the working day of adult males in factories became subject to the same limitations, since in most processes of production the cooperation of children, young persons, and women is indispensable. On the whole, therefore, during the period from 1844 to 47, the 12 hours working day became universal and uniform in all branches of industry under the Factory Act. The manufacturers, however, did not allow this progress without a compensating retrogression. At their instigation, the House of Commons reduced the minimum age for exploitable children from nine to eight in order to ensure that, quote, additional supply of factory children, end quote, which is owed to the capitalists, according to divine and human law. The years 1846 to 47 are epoch-making in the economic history of England. The Corn Laws were repealed, the duties on cotton and other raw materials were removed, free trade was proclaimed as the guiding star of legislation, in short, the millennium had arrived. On the other hand, in the same years the Chartist movement and the Ten Hours Agitation reached their highest point. They found allies in the Tories, who were panting for revenge. Despite the fanatical opposition of the army of perjured free traders, headed by Bright and Cobden, the Ten Hours Bill, so long struggled for, made its way through Parliament. The new Factory Act of the 8th of June 1847 enacted that on the 1st of July 1847 there should be a preliminary reduction of the working day for young persons, from 13 to 18, and all females to 11 hours, 
but that on the 1st of May 1848 there should be a definite limitation of the working day to ten hours. For the rest, the Act was only an amendatory supplement to the Acts of 1833 and 1844. Capital now undertook a preliminary campaign to prevent the Act from coming into full force on the 1st of May 1848, and the workers themselves, under the pretense that they had been taught by experience, were to help in the destruction of their own work. The moment was cleverly chosen. Quote, it must be remembered, too, that there has been more than two years of great suffering, in consequence of the terrible crisis of 1846-7, among the factory operatives, from many mills having worked short time, and many being altogether closed. A considerable number of the operatives must therefore be in very narrow circumstances, many, it is to be feared, in debt, so that it might fairly have been presumed that at the present time they would prefer working the longer time, in order to make up for past losses, perhaps to pay off debts, or get their furniture out of pawn, or replace that sold, or to get a new supply of clothes for themselves and their families. End quote from Reports of the Inspectors of Factories, published on the 31st of October, 1848. The manufacturers tried to aggravate the natural impact of these circumstances by a general 10% reduction in wages. This was done in order, as it were, to celebrate the inauguration of the new free trade era. Then followed a further reduction of 8 and one third percent as soon as the working day was shortened to 11 hours, and a reduction of twice that amount as soon as it was finally shortened to 10. Therefore, whenever circumstances permitted, a reduction in wages of at least 25% took place. Under these favorably prepared conditions, the agitation among the factory workers for the repeal of the Act of 1847 was begun. No method of deceit, seduction, or intimidation was left unused, but all in vain. In relation to the half-dozen petitions in which the workers were made to complain of their oppression by the Act, the petitioners themselves declared under oral examination that their signatures had been extorted. They felt themselves oppressed, but by something different than the Factory Act. But if the manufacturers did not succeed in getting the workers to speak as they wished, they themselves shrieked all the louder in the press and in Parliament in the name of the workers. They denounced the factory inspector as a species of revolutionary commissioner reminiscent of the convention, who would ruthlessly sacrifice the unfortunate factory workers to his mania for improving the world. This maneuver also failed. Leonard Horner, himself a factory inspector, conducted many examinations of witnesses in the factories of Lancashire, both personally and through sub-inspectors. About 70% of the workers examined declared in favor of 10 hours, a much smaller percentage in favor of 11, and an altogether insignificant minority for the old 12 hours. Another friendly dodge was to make the adult males work 12 to 15 hours, and then to declare that this fact was a fine demonstration of what the proletariat really wanted. But the ruthless factory inspector Leonard Horner was again on the spot. The majority of the overtimers declared, quote, They would much prefer working 10 hours for less wages, but they had no choice. So many were out of employment so many spinners getting very low wages by having to work as piecers being unable to do better, that if they refused to work the longer time, others would immediately get their places, so that it was a question with them of agreeing to work the longer time or of being thrown out of employment altogether. The preliminary campaign of capital thus came to grief, and the Ten Hours Act came into force on the 1st of May, 1848. Meanwhile, however, the fiasco of the Chartist Party, whose leaders had been imprisoned and whose organization dismembered, had shattered the self-confidence of the English working class. Soon after this, the June insurrection in Paris and its bloody suppression united, in England as on the continent, all fractions of the ruling classes, landowners and capitalists, stock exchange sharks and small-time shopkeepers, protectionists and free traders, government and opposition, priests and free thinkers, young whores and old nuns, under the common slogan of the salvation of property, religion, the family, and society. Everywhere the working class was outlawed. The manufacturers no longer needed to restrain themselves. They broke out in open revolt not only against the Ten Hours Act, but against all the legislation since 1833 that aimed at restricting, to some extent, the free exploitation of labor power. It was a pro-slavery rebellion in miniature, carried on for over two years with a cynical recklessness and a terroristic energy, which were so much the easier to achieve in that the rebel capitalist risked nothing but the skin of his workers. To understand what follows, we must remember that all three factory acts, those of 1833, 1844, and 1847, were in force insofar as the one did not amend the others, that not one of these limited the working day of the male worker over 18, and that since 1833, the 15 hours from 5.30 a.m. until 8.30 p.m. had remained the legal 
day, within the limits of which the twelve hours and later the ten hours of labor by young persons and women had to be performed under the prescribed conditions. The manufacturers began by here and there dismissing a number of the young persons and women they employed, in many cases half of them, and then, for the adult males, restoring night work, which had almost disappeared. The Ten Hours Act, they cried, leaves us no other alternative. The second step they took related to the legal pauses for meals. Let us listen to the factory inspectors. Since the restriction of the hours of work to ten, the factory occupiers maintain, although they have not yet practically gone the whole length, that supposing the hours of work to be from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m., they fulfill the provision of the statutes by allowing an hour before 9 a.m. and half an hour after 7 p.m. In some cases, they now allow an hour, or half an hour for dinner, insisting at the same time that they are not bound to allow any part of the hour and a half in the course of the factory working day. Thus the manufacturers maintain that these scrupulously strict provisions of the Act of 1844 with regard to meal times only gave the workers permission to eat and drink before coming into the factory and after leaving it, i.e. at home. And why indeed should the workers not eat their dinner before nine o'clock in the morning? The Crown lawyers, however, decided that the prescribed meal times, quote, must be in the interval during the working hours, and that it will not be lawful to work for ten hours continuously from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. without any interval. After these pleasant demonstrations, Capital commenced its real revolt by taking a step which agreed with the letter of the law in 1844, and was therefore legal. The Act of 1844 certainly prohibited the employment after 1 p.m. of children aged from 8 to 13 who had been employed before noon, but it did not regulate in any way the six and a half hours work of the children whose working day began at 12 midday or later. Children of eight might, if they began work at noon, be employed from 12 till 1, from 2 till 4, and from 5 till 8.30 in the evening. Taken together, this made up a legal six and a half hours. But they could do even better. In order to make the children's work coincide with that of the adult male laborers up to 8.30 p.m., the manufacturers only had to give them no work till two in the afternoon. They could then keep them in the factory until 8.30 in the evening without intermission. Quote, and it is now expressly admitted that the practice exists in England from the desire of mill owners to have their machinery at work for more than ten hours a day to keep the children at work with male adults after all the young persons and women have left and until 8.30 p.m., if the factory owners choose. Workers and factory inspectors protested on hygienic and moral grounds, but Capital answered, My deeds upon my head, I crave the law, the penalty and forfeit of my bond. In fact, according to statistics laid before the House of Commons on the 26th of July, 1850, 3,742 children were still being subjected to this practice in 257 factories on the 15th of July, 1850, despite all the protests. But this was not enough. Lynx-eyed Capital discovered that although the Act of 1844 did not allow five hours' work before midday without a pause of at least 30 minutes for refreshment, it prescribed nothing like this for afternoon work. Hence Capital demanded and maintained the satisfaction not only of making children of eight drudge without any interval from 2 to 8.30 p.m., but also of letting them go hungry. I his breast, so says the bond. This Shylock-like clinging to the letter of the law in 1844, insofar as it regulated child labor, was, however, only a way of introducing an open revolt against the same law, insofar as it regulated the labor of young persons and women. It'll be remembered that the abolition of the false relay system was the main aim of that law, and formed its main content. The manufacturers began their revolt simply by declaring that the sections of the Act of 1844 which prohibited the unrestricted use of young persons and women, in such short fractions of the day of fifteen hours as the employer chose, had been comparatively harmless as long as the working hours were limited to twelve hours, but that under the Ten Hours Act they were a grievous hardship. They informed the inspectors very coolly that they would set themselves above the letter of the law and reintroduce the old system on their own account. This would, they said, be in the interest of the ill-advised operatives themselves, as it would allow them to pay higher wages. This was the only possible plan by which to maintain, under the Ten Hours Act, the industrial supremacy of Great Britain. Perhaps it may be a little difficult to detect irregularities under the relay system, but what of that? Is the great manufacturing interest of this country to be treated as a secondary matter in order to save some little trouble to inspectors and sub-inspectors of factories? All these dodges were, of course, to no avail. The factory inspectors appealed to the courts. 
but the Home Secretary, Sir George Grey, was soon so overwhelmed by the clouds of dust arising from the manufacturer's petitions that in a circular of the 5th of August, 1848, he recommended the inspectors not to lay informations against the mill owners for a breach of the letter of the Act or for the employment of young persons by relays in cases in which there is no reason to believe that such young persons have been actually employed for a longer period than that sanctioned by law. At this, Factory Inspector J. Stewart allowed the so-called relay system for the 15-hour period of the factory day to be restored throughout Scotland, where it soon flourished again as of old. The English factory inspectors, on the other hand, declared that the Home Secretary had no dictatorial powers enabling him to suspend the laws and continued their legal proceedings against the pro-slavery rebellion. But what was the point of summoning the manufacturers to appear before the courts when the courts, in this case the county magistrates, acquitted them? In these tribunals, the manufacturers sat in judgment on themselves. An example. A certain Eskridge, a cotton spinner of the firm of Kershaw, Lease & Company, had laid before the factory inspector of his district the details of a relay system intended for his mill. Receiving a refusal, he at first kept quiet. A few months later, an individual named Robinson, also a cotton spinner, and if not Eskridge's man Friday, at least his relative, appeared before the borough magistrates of Stockport on a charge of introducing the very plan of relays Eskridge had devised. The bench consisted of four justices, three of them cotton spinners, and was headed by this same inevitable Eskridge. Eskridge acquitted Robinson, and now decided that what was right for Robinson was fair for Eskridge. Supported by his own legal decision, he at once introduced the new relay system into his own factory. Of course, the composition of this tribunal was in itself a blatant violation of the law. These judicial farces, exclaims Inspector Howell, urgently call for a remedy either that the law should be so altered as to be made to conform to these decisions, or that it should be administered by a less fallible tribunal, whose decisions would conform to the law when these cases are brought forward. I long for a stipendiary magistrate. The Crown lawyers declared that the manufacturer's interpretation of the Act of 1848 was absurd, but the saviors of society would not allow themselves to be turned from their purpose. Leonard Horner reports, Having endeavored to enforce the act by ten prosecutions in seven magisterial divisions, and having been supported by the magistrates in one case only, I considered it useless to prosecute more for this evasion of the law. That part of the Act of 1848, which was framed for securing uniformity in the hours of work, is thus no longer in force in my district of Lancashire. Neither have the sub-inspectors nor myself any means of satisfying ourselves when we inspect a mill working by shifts that the young persons and women are not working more than ten hours a day. In a return of the 30th of April of mill owners working by shifts, the number amounts to 114, and has been for some time rapidly increasing. In general, the time of working the mill is extended to 13 and a half hours, from 6 a.m. to 7 and a half p.m. In some instances, it amounts to 15 hours, from 5.5 a.m. to 8.5 p.m. Leonard Horner already possessed by December 1848 a list of 65 manufacturers and 29 factory overseers who unanimously declared that no system of supervision could, under this relay system, prevent the most extensive amount of overwork. Sometimes the same children and young persons were shifted from the spinning room to the weaving room. Sometimes, in the course of 15 hours, they were shifted from one factory to another. How is it possible to control a system which, under the guise of relays, is some one of the many plans for shuffling the hands about in endless variety and shifting the hours of work and of rest for different individuals throughout the day so that you may never have one complete set of hands working together in the same room at the same time? But even if we entirely leave aside actual overwork, this so-called relay system was an offspring of Capital's imagination never surpassed even by Fourier in his humorous sketches of these short sessions, except that the attraction of labor is here transformed into the attraction of Capital. Look, for example, at those schemes praised by the respectable press as models of what a reasonable degree of care and method can accomplish. The working personnel was sometimes divided into from 12 to 15 categories, and these categories themselves constantly underwent changes in their composition. During the 15 hours of the factory day, Capital dragged in the worker now for 30 minutes, now for an hour, and then pushed him out again to drag him into the factory and thrust him out afresh, hounding him hither and thither in scattered shreds of time without ever letting go until the full 10 hours of work was done. 
As on the stage, the same persons had to appear in turn in the different scenes of the different acts. And just as an actor is committed to the stage throughout the whole course of the play, so the workers were committed to the factory for the whole fifteen hours, without reckoning the time taken in coming and going. Thus the hours of rest were turned into hours of enforced idleness, which drove the young men to the taverns and the young girls to the brothels. Every new trick the capitalist hit upon from day to day for keeping his machinery going for twelve or fifteen hours without increasing the number of the personnel meant that the worker had to gulp down his meals in different fragments of time. During the ten hours' agitation, the manufacturers cried out that the mob of workers were petitioning in the hope of obtaining twelve hours' wages for ten hours' work. Now they reversed the medal. They paid ten hours' wages for twelve or fifteen hours' disposition over the workers' labor power. This was the heart of the matter. This was the manufacturer's edition of the Ten Hours Law. These were the same unctuous free traders dripping with the milk of human kindness who for ten whole years during the agitation against the corn laws had demonstrated to the workers by making precise calculations in pounds, shillings, and pence that with corn freely imported, ten hours of labor would be quite sufficient given the existing means of English industry to enrich the capitalists. This revolt of capital was after two years finally crowned with victory by a decision handed down by one of the four highest courts in England, the Court of Exchequer, which, in a case brought before it on the 8th of February, 1850, decided that the manufacturers were certainly acting against the sense of the Act of 1844, but that this Act itself contained certain words that rendered it meaningless. This verdict was tantamount to an abrogation of the Ten Hours Bill. A great number of manufacturers, who until then had been afraid to use the shift system for young persons and women, now seized on it enthusiastically. But this apparently decisive victory of capital was immediately followed by a counterstroke. So far, the workers had offered a resistance which was passive, though inflexible and unceasing. They now protested in Lancashire and Yorkshire in threatening meetings. The so-called Ten Hours Act, they said, was thus mere humbug, a parliamentary fraud. It had never existed. The factory inspectors urgently warned the government that class antagonisms had reached an unheard-of degree of tension. Some of the manufacturers themselves grumbled, On account of the contradictory decisions of the magistrates, a condition of things altogether abnormal and anarchical obtains. One law holds in Yorkshire, another in Lancashire, one law in one parish of Lancashire, another in its immediate neighborhood. The manufacturer in large towns could evade the law, but the manufacturer in country districts could not find the people necessary for the relay system, still less for the shifting of hands from one factory to another, etc. And the most fundamental right, under the law of capital, is the equal exploitation of labor power by all capitalists. Under these circumstances, it came to a compromise between manufacturers and men, given the seal of parliamentary approval in the Supplementary Factory Act of the 5th of August, 1850. The working day for young persons and women was lengthened from ten to ten and a half hours for the first five days of the week and shortened to seven and a half hours on Saturdays. The work had to take place between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., with pauses of not less than one and a half hours for mealtimes, these mealtimes to be allowed at exactly the same time for all and in accordance with the regulations laid down in 1844. By this, the relay system was ended once and for all. For child labor, the Act of 1844 remained in force. One set of manufacturers secured to themselves special seigneurial rights over the children of the proletariat, just as they had done before. These were the silk manufacturers. In 1833, they had howled threateningly that if the liberty of working children of any age for ten hours a day were taken away, it would stop their works. It would be impossible for them to buy a sufficient number of children over thirteen. They extorted the privilege they desired. Subsequent investigations show that the pretext was a deliberate lie. This did not, however, prevent them, throughout the following decade, from spinning silk for ten hours a day out of the blood of little children who had to be put on stools to perform their work. The Act of 1844 certainly robbed the silk manufacturers of the liberty of employing children under eleven for longer than six and a half hours each day. But as against this, it secured them the privilege of working children between 11 and 13 for 10 hours a day, and annulling, in their case, the education which had been made compulsory for all other factory children. This time the pretext was the delicate texture of the fabric in which they were employed, requiring a lightness of touch only to be acquired by their early introduction to these factories. 
The children were quite simply slaughtered for the sake of their delicate fingers, just as horned cattle are slaughtered in southern Russia for their hides and their fat. Finally, in 1850, the privilege granted in 1844 was limited to the departments of silk twisting and silk winding. But here, in order to compensate capital for the loss of its liberty, the hours of labor for children aged from 11 to 13 were increased from 10 to 10 and a half. The pretext? Labor in silk mills was lighter than in mills for other fabrics, and less likely in other respects also to be prejudicial to health. Official medical inquiries proved afterwards that, on the contrary, the average death rate is exceedingly high in the silk districts, and amongst the female part of the population is higher even than it is in the cotton districts of Lancashire. Despite the protests of the factory inspectors, repeated every six months, this evil has lasted to the present day. The Act of 1850 replaced the 15-hour period from 6 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. by a 12-hour period from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., but only for young persons and women. It did not, therefore, affect children, who could always be employed for half an hour before this period and two and a half hours after it, provided the total duration of their labor did not exceed six and a half hours. While the bill was under discussion, the factory inspectors laid before Parliament statistics relating to the infamous abuses which had arisen from this anomaly. But in vain. In the background lurked the intention of using children to force the working day of adult males up to fifteen hours, in years of prosperity. The experience of the three years which followed demonstrated that such an attempt was bound to fail in face of the resistance of the adult male workers. The Act of 1850 was therefore finally completed in 1853 by the prohibition of the employment of children in the morning before and in the evening after young persons and women. Henceforth, with few exceptions, the Factory Act of 1850 regulated the working day of all workers in the branches of industry subject to it. By then, half a century had elapsed since the passing of the first Factory Act. Factory legislation went beyond its original sphere of application for the first time in the Print Works Act of 1845. The unwillingness with which capital accepted this new extravagance speaks through every line of the Act. It limits the working day for children from 8 to 13, and for women, to 16 hours between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. without any legal pause for mealtimes. It allows males over 13 to be worked at will day and night. It is a parliamentary abortion. Nevertheless, the principle had triumphed with its victory in those great branches of industry which form the most characteristic creation of the modern mode of production. Their wonderful development from 1853 to 1860, hand in hand with the physical and moral regeneration of the factory workers, was visible to the weakest eye. The very manufacturers from whom the legal limitation and regulation of the working day had been wrung step by step in the course of a civil war lasting half a century now pointed boastfully to the contrast with the areas of exploitation which were still free. The Pharisees of political economy now proclaimed that their newly won insight into the necessity for a legally regulated working day was a characteristic achievement of their science. It'll be easily understood that after the factory magnates had resigned themselves and submitted to the inevitable, capital's power of resistance gradually weakened, while at the same time the working class's power of attack grew with the number of its allies and those social layers not directly interested in the question hence the comparatively rapid progress since 1860. Dye works and bleach works were brought under the Factory Act of 1850 and 1860, lace and stocking factories in 1861. As a result of the first report of the Commission on the Employment of Children, 1863, the same fate was shared by the manufacturers of all earthenware products, not just the potteries. Matches, percussion caps, cartridges, carpets, and fustian cuttings and the employers of people engaged in the many processes included under the name of finishing. In the year 1863, bleaching in the open air and baking were placed under special acts by which, in the former case, the labor of young persons and women at night was forbidden, from eight in the evening to six in the morning, and in the latter, the employment of journeyman bakers under eighteen between nine in the evening and five in the morning. We shall return to the later proposals of the same commission, which threatened to deprive all the important branches of English industry of their freedom with the exception of agriculture, mining, and transport. Section 7. The Struggle for a Normal Working Day. Impact of the English Factory Legislation on Other Countries. 
The reader will recall that the production of surplus value, or the extraction of surplus value, forms the specific content and purpose of capitalist production, quite apart from any reconstruction of the mode of production itself which may arise from the subordination of labor to capital. He will remember that, from the standpoint so far developed here, it is only the independent worker, a man who is thus legally qualified to act for himself, who enters into a contract with the capitalist as a seller of a commodity. So, if our historical sketch has shown the prominent part played by modern industry on the one hand, and the labor of those who are physically and legally minors on the other, the former is still for us only a particular department of the exploitation of labor, and the latter only a particularly striking example of it. Without anticipating subsequent developments, the following points can be derived merely by connecting together the historical facts. First, Capital's drive towards a boundless and ruthless extension of the working day is satisfied first in those industries which were first to be revolutionized by water power, steam, and machinery in those earliest creations of the modern mode of production, the spinning and weaving of cotton, wool, flax, and silk. The changed material mode of production and the correspondingly changed social relations of the producers first gave rise to outrages without measure, and then called forth, in opposition to this, social control, which legally limits, regulates, and makes uniform the working day and its pauses. During the first half of the 19th century, this control therefore appears simply as legislation for exceptions. As soon as the factory acts had conquered the original domain of the new mode of production, it was found that in the meantime, many other branches of production had made their entry into the factory system properly so-called, that manufacturers with more or less obsolete methods, such as potteries, glassmaking, etc., that old-fashioned handicrafts like baking, and finally even the scattered so-called domestic industries such as nail-making, had long since fallen as completely under capitalist exploitation as the factories themselves. Factory legislation was therefore compelled gradually to strip itself of its exceptional character or to declare that any house in which work was done was a factory, as in England where the law proceeds in the manner of the Roman casuists. Second, the history of the regulation of the working day in certain branches of production, and the struggle still going on in others over this regulation, prove conclusively that the isolated worker, the worker as free seller of his labor power, succumbs without resistance once capitalist production has reached a certain stage of maturity. The establishment of a normal working day is therefore the product of a protracted and more or less concealed civil war between the capitalist class and the working class. Since the contest takes place in the arena of modern industry, it is fought out first of all in the homeland of that industry, England. The English factory workers were the champions not only of the English working class, but of the modern working class in general, just as their theorists were the first to throw down the gauntlet to the theory of the capitalists. Hence, the philosopher of the factory, Yuri, considers it a mark of inextinguishable disgrace on the part of the English working class that they wrote the slavery of the factory acts on their banners, as opposed to capital which was striving manfully for the perfect freedom of labor. France limped slowly behind England. The French Twelve Hours Law needed the February Revolution to bring it into the world, and it is far more loopholes than its English model. Nevertheless, the French revolutionary method has its own peculiar advantages. At one stroke, it dictates the same limits to the working day in all shops and factories without distinction, whereas the English legislation yields reluctantly to the pressure of circumstances, now on this point, now on that, and is well on the way to creating an inextricable tangle of contradictory enactments. Moreover, the French law proclaims as a principle what in England was only one in the name of children, minors, and women, and has only recently been claimed for the first time as a universal right. In the United States of America, every independent workers' movement was paralyzed as long as slavery disfigured a part of the republic. Labor in a white skin cannot emancipate itself where it is branded in a black skin. However, a new life immediately arose from the death of slavery. The first fruit of the American Civil War was the Eight Hours Agitation, which ran from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from New England to California, with the seven-league boots of the locomotive. The General Congress of Labor, held at Baltimore in August 1866, declared, The first and great necessity of the present, to free the labor of this country from capitalistic slavery, is the passing of a law by which eight hours shall be the normal working day in all states of the American Union. We are resolved to put forth all our strength until this glorious result is attained. At the same time, the beginning of September 1866, the Congress of the International Working Men's Association, held at Geneva, passed the following resolution, proposed by the London General Council. We declare that the limitation of the working day is a preliminary condition without which all further attempts at improvement and emancipation must prove abortive. 
The Congress proposes eight hours as the legal limit of the working day. Thus the working class movements on both sides of the Atlantic, which had grown instinctively out of the relations of production themselves, set its seal on the words of the English factory inspector R.J. Saunders. Further steps towards a reformation of society can never be carried out with any hope of success unless the hours of labor be limited and the prescribed limit strictly enforced. It must be acknowledged that our worker emerges from the process of production looking different from when he entered it. In the market, as an owner of a commodity, labor power, he stood face to face with other owners of commodities, one owner against another owner. The contract by which he sold his labor power to the capitalist proved in black and white, so to speak, that he was free to dispose of himself. But when the transaction was concluded, it was discovered that he was no free agent, that the period of time for which he is free to sell his labor power is the period of time for which he is forced to sell it, that in fact the vampire will not let go while there remains a single muscle, sinew, or drop of blood to be exploited. For protection against the serpent of their agonies, the workers have put their heads together and, as a class, compel the passing of a law, an all-powerful social barrier by which they can be prevented from selling themselves and their families into slavery and death by voluntary contract with capital. In the place of the pompous catalogue of the inalienable rights of man, there steps the modest Magna Carta of the legally limited working day, which at last makes clear when the time which the worker sells is ended and when his own begins. What a great change from that time! Chapter 11. The Rate and Mass of Surplus Value In this chapter, as hitherto, the value of labor power, and therefore the part of the working day necessary for the reproduction or maintenance of that labor power, is assumed to be a given constant magnitude. With this presupposition, the rate of surplus value directly gives us the mass of surplus value furnished to the capitalist by the worker within a definite period of time. If, for example, the necessary labor amounts to six hours a day, expressed in a quantity of gold equal to three shillings, then three shillings is the daily value of one labor power. If, further, the rate of surplus value is 100%, this variable capital of three shillings produces a mass of surplus value of three shillings. In other words, the worker supplies every day a mass of surplus labor of six hours. But the variable capital is the monetary expression for the total value of all the labor powers the capitalist employs simultaneously. Its value is therefore equal to the average value of one labor power multiplied by the number of labor powers employed. With the given value of labor power, therefore, the magnitude of the variable capital varies directly with the number of workers employed simultaneously. If the daily value of one labor power is three shillings, then a capital of 300 shillings must be advanced in order to exploit 100 labor powers every day, and a capital of n times three shillings must be advanced in order to exploit n labor powers every day. In the same way, if a variable capital of three shillings, being the daily value of one labor power, produces a daily surplus value of three shillings, a variable capital of three hundred shillings will produce a daily surplus value of three hundred shillings, and one of n times three shillings will produce a daily surplus value of n times three shillings. The mass of surplus value produced is therefore equal to the surplus value provided by the working day of one worker multiplied by the number of workers employed. But as the mass of surplus value which a single worker produces, the value of labor power being given, is determined by the rate of surplus value, this first law follows. The mass of surplus value produced is equal to the amount of the variable capital advanced multiplied by the rate of surplus value. In other words, the mass of surplus value is determined by the product of the number of labor powers simultaneously exploited by the same capitalist and the degree of exploitation of each individual labor power. Let the mass of the surplus value be S the surplus value supplied by the individual worker in the average day small s, the variable capital advanced daily in the purchase of one individual labor power small v, the sum total of the variable capital v. The value of an average labor power p, its degree of exploitation a prime over a, being surplus labor over necessary labor, and the number of workers employed n. We have then s is equal to small s over small v times v, and is equal to p times a prime over a times n. We assume throughout not only that the value of an average labor power is constant, but that the workers employed by a capitalist are reduced to average workers. There do exist exceptional cases in which the surplus value produced does not increase in proportion to the number of workers being exploited, but then the value of the labor power does not remain constant. In the production of a definite mass of surplus value, therefore, a decrease in one factor may be compensated for by an increase in the other. 
If the variable capital diminishes, and at the same time the rate of surplus value increases in the same ratio, the mass of surplus value remains unaltered. If, on our earlier assumption, the capitalist has to advance 300 shillings in order to exploit 100 workers each day, and if the rate of surplus value amounts to 50%, this variable capital of 300 shillings yields a surplus value of 150 shillings, or 100 times 3 working hours. If the rate of surplus value doubles, or the working day, instead of being extended from 6 to 9, is extended from 6 to 12 hours, and at the same time variable capital is reduced by half, i.e. to 150 shillings, it too yields a surplus value of 150 shillings, or 50 times 6 working hours. A decrease in the variable capital may therefore be compensated for by a proportionate rise in the degree of exploitation of labor power, or a decrease in the number of workers employed by a proportionate extension of the working day. Within certain limits, therefore, the supply of labor exploitable by capital is independent of the supply of workers. And inversely, a fall in the rate of surplus value leaves the mass of surplus value which has been produced unaltered if the amount of the variable capital, i.e. the number of workers employed, increases in the same proportion. Nevertheless, there are limits which cannot be overcome to the compensation for a decrease in the number of workers employed, i.e. a decrease in the amount of variable capital advanced provided by a rise in the rate of surplus value i.e. the lengthening of the working day. Whatever the value of labor power may be, whether the labor time necessary for the maintenance of the worker is two hours or ten, the total value a worker can produce, day in, day out, is always less than the value in which 24 hours of labor are objectified. For instance, it is less than 12 shillings, if 12 shillings is the monetary expression for 24 hours of objectified labor. On our former assumption, according to which six hours of labor every day are necessary in order to reproduce the labor power itself, or to replace the value of the capital advanced to purchase it, a variable capital of 1,500 shillings, employing 500 workers at a rate of surplus value of 100% with a 12-hour working day, produces every day a surplus value of 1,500 shillings, or six times 500 working hours. A capital of 300 shillings, employing 100 workers a day, with a rate of surplus value of 200%, or with a working day of 18 hours, only produces a mass of surplus value of 600 shillings, or 12 times 100 working hours, and its total value product, the equivalent of the variable capital advance plus the surplus value, can, day in, day out, never reach the sum of 1,200 shillings, or 24 times 100 working hours. The absolute limit of the average working day this being by nature always less than 24 hours, sets an absolute limit to the compensation for a reduction of variable capital by a higher rate of surplus value, or for the decrease of the number of workers exploited by a higher degree of exploitation of labor power. This self-evident second law is of importance for the explanation of many phenomena, arising from the tendency of capital to reduce as much as possible the number of workers employed, i.e. the amount of its variable component, the part of which is changed into labor power, we shall develop this tendency later on, which stands in contradiction with its other tendency to produce the greatest possible mass of surplus value. On the other hand, if the mass of labor power employed, or the amount of variable capital increases, but not in proportion to the fall in the rate of surplus value, a diminution occurs in the mass of surplus value produced. A third law results from the determination by the following two factors of the mass of surplus value produced rate of surplus value, and the amount of variable capital advanced. The rate of surplus value, i.e. the degree of exploitation of labor power, and the value of labor power, i.e. the amount of the necessary labor time being given, it is self-evident that the greater the variable capital, the greater would be the mass of the value produced and of the surplus value. If the limit of the working day is given, and also the limit of its necessary part, the mass of value and surplus value produced by the individual capitalist is clearly exclusively dependent on the mass of labor that he sets in motion. But this, on the assumptions we have made above, depends on the mass of labor power, or the number of workers he exploits, and this number, in its turn, is determined by the amount of the variable capital advanced. With a given rate of surplus value, and a given value of labor power, therefore, the masses of surplus value produced vary directly as the amounts of the variable capitals advanced. Now we know that the capitalist divides his capital into two parts. He lays out one part on means of production. This is the constant part of his capital. He lays out the other part on living labor power. This part forms his variable capital. On the basis of the same mode of production, the division of capital into constant and variable differs in different branches of production. And within the same branch of production, too, this relation changes with changes in the technical foundation and in the ways of linking together the process of production in society. But whatever the proportion between the constant and the variable part of a given capital, whether it is 1 to 2 or 1 to 10 or 1 to x, the law just laid down is not affected by this. 
for according to our previous analysis, the value of the constant capital reappears in the value of the product, but does not enter into the newly produced value, the newly created value product. To employ 1,000 spinners, more raw material, spindles, etc., are of course required than to employ 100. The value of these additional means of production, however, may rise, fall, remain unaltered, be large or small. It has no influence on the valorization process performed by the labor powers which set the means of production in motion. The law demonstrated above, therefore, takes this form. The masses of value and of surplus value produced by different capitals, the value of labor power being given and its degree of exploitation being equal, vary directly as the amounts of the variable components of these capitals, i.e. the parts which have been turned into living labor power. This law clearly contradicts all experience based on immediate appearances. Everyone knows that a cotton spinner who, if we consider the percentage over the whole of his applied capital, employs much constant capital and little variable capital, does not, on account of this, pocket less profit or surplus value than a baker, who sets in motion relatively much variable capital and little constant capital. For the solution of this apparent contradiction, many intermediate terms are still needed. Just as, from the standpoint of elementary algebra, many intermediate terms are needed before we can understand that zero over zero may represent an actual magnitude. Classical economics holds instinctively to this law, although it has never actually formulated it, because it is a necessary consequence of the law of value. It tries to rescue the law from the contradictions of immediate experience by making a violent abstraction. We shall see later how the school of Ricardo came to grief on this stumbling block. Vulgar economics, which like the Bourbons has really learned nothing, relies here, as elsewhere, on the mere semblance as opposed to the law which regulates and determines the phenomena. In antithesis to Spinoza, it believes that ignorance is a sufficient reason. The labor which is set in motion by the total capital of a society, day in, day out, may be regarded as a single working day. If, for example, the number of workers is a million, and the average working day is ten hours, the social working day will consist of ten million hours. With a given length of this working day, whether its limits are fixed physically or socially, the mass of surplus value can be increased only by increasing the number of workers, i.e. the size of the working population. The growth of population here forms the mathematical limit to the production of surplus value by the total social capital. And inversely, with a given population, this limit is formed by the possible lengthening of the working day. It will, however, be seen in the next chapter that this law holds only for the form of surplus value dealt with up to the present. From the foregoing treatment to the production of surplus value, it follows that not every sum of money, or value, can be transformed into capital at will. In fact, it is a presupposition of this transformation that a certain minimum of money, or of exchange value, is in the hands of the individual possessor of money or commodities. The minimum of variable capital is the cost price of a single labor power employed the whole year through, day in, day out, for the production of surplus value. If this worker were in possession of his own means of production and were satisfied to live as a worker, he could make do with the amount of labor time necessary to reproduce his means of subsistence, say, eight hours a day. In addition to this, he would only need means of production sufficient for eight working hours. The capitalist, on the other hand, who makes him do besides these eight hours, say, four hours of surplus labor, requires an additional sum of money for furnishing the additional means of production. On our assumption, however, he would have to employ not one, but two workers in order to live on the surplus value appropriated daily as well as, and no better than, a worker, i.e. in order to be able to satisfy his needs. In this case, the mere maintenance of his life would be the purpose of his production, not the increase of wealth. But capitalist production presupposes the increase of wealth. To live only twice as well as an ordinary worker, and as well as that, turn half of the surplus value produced into capital, he would have to multiply the number of workers and the minimum of capital advanced by eight. Of course he can, like the man who is working for him, participate directly in the process of production, but then he's only a hybrid, a man between capitalist and worker, a small master. A certain stage of capitalist production necessitates that the capitalist be able to devote the whole of the time during which he functions as a capitalist i.e. as capital personified, to the appropriation and therefore the control of the labor of others, and to the sale of the products of that labor. The guild system of the Middle Ages therefore tried forcibly to prevent the transformation of the master of a craft into a capitalist, by limiting the number of workers a single master could employ to a very low maximum. Hence, the possessor of money or commodities actually turns into a capitalist only where the minimum sum advance for production greatly exceeds the known medieval maximum, 
Here, as in natural science, is shown the correctness of the law discovered by Hegel in his logic that at a certain point merely quantitative differences pass over by a dialectical inversion into qualitative distinctions. The minimum sum of value the individual possessor of money or commodities must command in order to metamorphose himself into a capitalist changes with the different stages of development of capitalist production, and is at given stages different in different spheres of production, according to their special technical conditions. Certain spheres, even at the beginnings of capitalist production, require a minimum of capital which is not yet to be found in the hands of single individuals. This situation gives rise partly to state subsidies to private persons, as in France in the time of Colbert, and in some German states right into our own epoch, and partly to the formation of companies with a legally secured monopoly over the conduct of certain branches of industry and commerce, the forerunners of the modern joint stock companies. We shall not examine in detail the changes which take place in the relation between the capitalist and the wage laborer in the course of the process of production, nor shall we deal any further with the characteristics of capital itself. Here, we shall only emphasize certain main points. Capital developed within the production process until it acquired command over labor, i.e. over self-activating labor power, in other words, the worker himself. The capitalist, who is capital personified, now takes care that the worker does his work regularly and with the proper degree of intensity. Capital also developed into a coercive relation, and this compels the working class to do more work than would be required by the narrow circle of its own needs. As an agent in producing the activity of others, as an extractor of surplus labor and an exploiter of labor power, it surpasses all earlier systems of production, which were based on directly compulsory labor, in its energy and its quality of unbounded and ruthless activity. At first, capital subordinates labor on the basis of the technical conditions within which labor has been carried on up to that point in history. It does not, therefore, directly change the mode of production. The production of surplus value, in the form we have so far considered by means of simple extension of the working day, appeared, therefore, independently of any change in the mode of production itself. It was no less effective in the old-fashioned bakeries than in the modern cotton factories. If we consider the process of production from the point of view of the simple labor process, the worker is related to the means of production not in their quality as capital, but as being the mere means and material for his own purposeful productive activity. In tanning, for example, he deals with the skins as his simple object of labor. It is not the capitalist whose skin he tans. But it is different as soon as we view the production process as a process of valorization. The means of production are at once changed into means for the absorption of the labor of others. It is no longer the worker who employs the means of production, but the means of production which employ the worker. Instead of being consumed by him as material elements of his productive activity, they consume him as the ferment necessary to their own life process, and the life process of capital consists solely in its own motion as self-valorizing value. Furnaces and workshops that stand idle by night and absorb no living labor are a mere loss to the capitalist. Hence, furnaces and workshops constitute lawful claims upon the night labor of the labor powers. As soon as a certain sum of money is transformed into means of production, i.e. into the objective factors of the production process, the means of production themselves are transformed into a title, both by right and by might, to the labor and surplus labor of others. An example will show, in conclusion, how this inversion, indeed this distortion, which is peculiar to and characteristic of capitalist production, of the relation between dead labor and living labor, between value and the force that creates value, is mirrored in the consciousness of the capitalist. During the English Manufacturers' Revolt of 1848-50, the head of one of the oldest and most respectable houses in the west of Scotland, Messrs. Carlyle, Sons & Company, of the linen and cotton thread factory at Paisley, a company which has now existed for about a century, which was in operation in 1752 and four generations of the same family have conducted it, this very intelligent gentleman wrote a letter printed in the Glasgow Daily Mail of the 25th of April, 1849, under the heading, The Relay System where the following grotesquely naive passage, among others, crept in. Quote, Let us now see what evils will attend the limiting to ten hours the working of the factory. They come out to the most serious damage to the mill owner's prospects and property. If he, i.e. his hands, worked twelve hours before and is limited to ten, then every twelve machines or spindles in his establishment shrink to ten, and should the works be disposed of, they will be valued only as ten so that a sixth part would thus be deducted from the value of every factory in the country. End quote. In this West of Scotland bourgeois brain, which has inherited the capitalist qualities of 
four generations, the value of the means of production, spindles, etc., is so inextricably confused with the quality they possess as capital of valorizing themselves, or swallowing up every day a definite quantity of the unpaid labor of others, that the head of the firm of Carlyle & Company actually imagines that if he sells his factory, not only will the value of the spindles be paid to him, but in addition, their power of self-valorization. Not only the labor contained in them, which is necessary to the production of spindles of this kind, but also the surplus labor, which they help to pump out daily from the brave Scots of Paisley. This is why he thinks that, with the shortening of the working day by two hours, the selling price of twelve spinning machines dwindles to that of ten. End of Part 3 Part 4 the production of relative surplus value. Chapter 12. The Concept of Relative Surplus Value That portion of the working day which merely produces an equivalent for the value paid by the capitalist for his labor power has up to this point been treated by us as a constant magnitude. And so it is, under given conditions of production and at a given stage in the economic development of society. As we saw, the worker could continue to work for two, three, four, six, etc. hours beyond this, his necessary labor time. The rate of surplus value and the length of the working day depended on how far this extra time was prolonged. Although the necessary labor time was constant, we saw, on the other hand, that the total working day was variable. Now suppose we have a working day whose length and whose division between necessary labor and surplus labor are given. Let the whole line A to C, that being A to B with 10 segments and B to C with 2 segments, represent, for example, a working day of 12 hours. The section AB represents 10 hours of necessary labor, and the section BC represents 2 hours of surplus labor. How can the production of surplus value be increased, i.e. how can surplus labor be prolonged without any prolongation, or independently of any prolongation, of the line AC? Although the boundaries of the working day, A and C, are given, it would seem possible to lengthen the line BC, other than an extension beyond its endpoint C, which is also the end of the working day, AC, by pushing back its starting point B in the direction of A. Assume that B' prime to B, in the line A to B' prime with 9 segments, B' prime to B with 1 segment, and B to C with 2 segments, is equal to half of BC, or to 1 hour's labor time. If now in AC, the working day of 12 hours, we move point B to B prime, then BC becomes B prime C. The surplus labor increases by one half, from two hours to three hours, although the working day remains 12 hours as before. This extension of surplus labor time from BC to B prime C, from two hours to three hours, is however evidently impossible without a simultaneous contraction of the necessary labor time from AB to AB prime, from 10 hours to nine hours. The prolongation of surplus labor would correspond to a shortening of necessary labor, i.e. a portion of the labor time previously consumed in reality for the worker's own benefit would be converted into labor time expended for the capitalist. There would be an alteration not in the length of the working day, but in its division into necessary labor time and surplus labor time. On the other hand, it is evident that the duration of surplus labor is given when the length of the working day and the value of labor power are given. The value of labor power, i.e. the labor time necessary to produce labor power, determines the labor time necessary for the reproduction of the value of the labor power. If one hour of work is embodied in sixpence and the value of a day's labor power is five shillings, the worker must work for ten hours a day in order to replace the value paid by capital for his labor power, or to produce an equivalent for the value of the means of subsistence he needs to consume every day. Given the value of these means of subsistence, the value of his labor power can be calculated, and given the value of his labor power, the duration of his necessary labor time. The duration of the surplus labor, however, is arrived at by subtracting the necessary labor time from the total working day. Ten from twelve leaves two, and it is not easy to see how, under the given conditions, the surplus labor can possibly be prolonged beyond two hours. No doubt the capitalist could, instead of five shillings, pay the worker four shillings sixpence, or even less. Nine hours' labor time would be sufficient to reproduce this value of four shillings sixpence, and consequently three hours of surplus labor, instead of two, would accrue to the capitalist, and the surplus value would rise from one shilling to one shilling sixpence. This result, however, could be attained only by pushing the wage of the worker down below the value of his labor power. With the four shilling sixpence which he produces in nine hours, he commands one-tenth less of the means of subsistence than before, 
and consequently the reproduction of his labor power can take place only in a stunted form. The surplus labor would in this case be prolonged only by transgressing its normal limits. Its domain would be extended only by a usurpation of part of the domain of necessary labor time. Despite the important part which this method plays in practice, we are excluded from considering it here by our assumption that all commodities, including labor power, are bought and sold at their full value. If we once assume this, it follows that the labor time necessary for the production of labor power, or for the reproduction of its value, cannot be lessened by a fall in the worker's wages below the value of his labor power, but only by a fall in this value itself. Given the length of the working day, the prolongation of the surplus labor must of necessity originate in the curtailment of the necessary labor time. The latter cannot arise from the former. In the example we chose, the value of labor power had to fall in fact by one-tenth in order for the necessary labor time to be diminished by one-tenth, i.e. from ten hours to nine, and for the surplus labor to consequently be prolonged from two hours to three. A fall in this kind in the value of labor power implies, however, that the same means of subsistence formerly produced in 10 hours can now be produced in 9 hours. But this is impossible without an increase in the productivity of labor. For example, suppose a cobbler with a given set of tools makes one pair of boots in one working day of 12 hours. If he is to make two pairs in the same time, the productivity of his labor must be doubled, and this cannot be done except by an alteration in his tools or in his mode of working or both. Hence, the conditions of production of his labor, i.e. his mode of production, and the labor process itself, must be revolutionized. By an increase in the productivity of labor, we mean an alteration in the labor process of such a kind as to shorten the labor time socially necessary for the production of a commodity, and to endow a given quantity of labor with the power of producing a greater quantity of use value. Hitherto, in dealing with the production of surplus value in the above form, we have assumed that the mode of production is given and invariable. But when surplus value has to be produced by the conversion of necessary labor into surplus labor, it by no means suffices for capital to take over the labor process in its given or historically transmitted shape, and then simply to prolong its duration. The technical and social conditions of the process, and consequently the mode of production itself, must be revolutionized before the productivity of labor can be increased. Then, with the increase in the productivity of labor, the value of labor power will fall and the portion of the working day necessary for the reproduction of that value will be shortened. I call that surplus value which is produced by the lengthening of the working day absolute surplus value. In contrast to this, I call that surplus value which arises from the curtailment of the necessary labor time and from the corresponding alteration in the respective lengths of the two components of the working day relative surplus value. In order to make the value of labor power go down, the rise in productivity of labor must seize upon those branches of industry whose products determine the value of labor power, and consequently either belong to the category of normal means of subsistence or are capable of replacing them. But the value of a commodity is determined not only by the quantity of labor which gives it its final form, but also by the quantity of labor contained in the instruments by which it has been produced. For instance, the value of a pair of boots depends not only on the labor of the cobbler, but also on the value of the leather, wax, thread, etc. Hence, a fall in the value of labor power is also brought about by an increase in the productivity of labor, and by a corresponding cheapening of commodities in those industries which supply the instruments of labor and the material for labor, i.e. the physical elements of constant capital which are required for producing the means of subsistence. But an increase in the productivity of labor in those branches of industry which supply neither the necessary means of subsistence nor the means by which they are produced leaves the value of labor power undisturbed. The cheapening of the commodity, of course, causes only a relative fall in the value of labor power, a fall proportional to the extent to which that commodity enters into the reproduction of labor power. Shirts, for instance, are a necessary means of subsistence, but are only one out of many. The total sum of the necessary means of subsistence, however, consists of various commodities, each the product of a distinct industry, and the value of each of those commodities enters as a component part into the value of labor power. The latter value decreases with the decrease of the labor time necessary for its reproduction. The total decrease of necessary labor time is equal to the sum of all the different reductions in labor time which have occurred in those various distinct branches of production. Here we treat this general result as if it were the direct result and the direct purpose in each individual case. When an individual capitalist cheapens shirts, for instance, by increasing the productivity of labor, he by no means necessarily aims to reduce the value of labor power and shorten necessary labor time in proportion to this. 
but he contributes towards increasing the general rate of surplus value only insofar as he ultimately contributes to this result. The general and necessary tendencies of capital must be distinguished from their forms of appearance. While it is not our intention here to consider the way in which the imminent laws of capitalist production manifest themselves in the external movement of the individual capitals, assert themselves as the coercive laws of competition, and therefore enter into the consciousness of the individual capitalist as the motives which drive him forward, this much is clear. A scientific analysis of competition is possible only if we can grasp the inner nature of capital, just as the apparent motions of the heavenly bodies are intelligible only to somebody who is acquainted with their real motions, which are not perceptible to the senses. Nevertheless, for the understanding of the production of relative surplus value, and merely on the basis of the results already achieved, we may add the following remarks. If one hour's labor is embodied in sixpence, a value of six shillings will be produced in a working day of twelve hours. Suppose that with labor of the currently prevailing productivity, twelve articles are produced in these twelve hours. Let the value of the means of production used up in each article be sixpence. Under these circumstances, each article costs one shilling. Sixpence for the value of the means of production, and sixpence for the value newly added in working with those means. Now let some one capitalist contrive to double the productivity of labor, and to produce twenty-four instead of twelve articles in the course of a working day of twelve hours. The value of the means of production remaining the same, the value of each article will fall to nine pence, made up of sixpence for the value of the means of production and three pence for the value newly added by the labor. Even though the productivity of labor has been doubled, the day's labor creates, as before, a new value of six shillings, and no more, which is now, however, spread over twice as many articles. Each article now has embodied in it one twenty-fourth of this value instead of one twelfth, three pence instead of sixpence or what amounts to the same thing, only half an hour of labor time instead of a whole hour, is now added to the means of production while they are being transformed into each article. The individual value of these articles is now below their social value. In other words, they have cost less labor time than the great bulk of the same articles produced under the average social conditions. Each article costs, on an average, one shilling and represents two hours of social labor, but under the altered mode of production it only costs nine pence or contains only one and a half hours of labor. The real value of a commodity, however, is not its individual, but its social value. That is to say, its value is not measured by the labor time that the article costs the producer in each individual case, but by the labor time socially required for its production. If, therefore, the capitalist who applies the new method sells his commodity at its social value of one shilling, he sells it for three pence above its individual value, and thus he realizes an extra surplus value of three pence. On the other hand, the working day of 12 hours is now represented, for him, by 24 articles instead of 12. Hence, in order to get rid of the product of one working day, the demand must be double what it was, i.e. the market must become twice as extensive. Other things being equal, the capitalist commodities can only command a more extensive market if their prices are reduced. He will therefore sell them above their individual but below their social value, say at 10 pence each. By this means, he still squeezes an extra surplus value of one penny out of each. This augmentation of surplus value is pocketed by the capitalist himself, whether or not his commodities belong to the class of necessary means of subsistence and therefore participate in determining the general value of labor power. Hence, quite independently of this, there is a motive for each individual capitalist to cheapen his commodities by increasing the productivity of labor. Nevertheless, even in this case, the increased production of surplus value arises from the curtailment of the necessary labor time and the corresponding prolongation of the surplus labor. Let the necessary labor time amount to 10 hours, the value of a day's labor power to 5 shillings, the surplus labor time to 2 hours, and the daily surplus value to be 1 shilling. But the capitalist now produces 24 articles, which he sells at 10 pence each, making 20 shillings in all. Since the value of the means of production is 12 shillings, 14 and 2 fifths of these articles merely replace the constant capital advanced. The labor of the 12 hour working day is represented by the remaining 9 and 3 fifths articles. Since the price of the labor power is five shillings, six articles represent the necessary labor time, and three and three-fifths articles the surplus labor. The ratio of necessary labor to surplus labor, which under average social conditions was five to one, is now only five to three. We may arrive at the same result in the following way. The value of the product of the working day of twelve hours is twenty shillings. Of this sum, twelve shillings represent the value of the means of production, a value that merely reappears in the finished product. There remains eight shillings, which are the expression in money of the value newly created during the working day. This sum is greater than the sum in which average social labor of the same kind is expressed. 
12 hours of the latter labor are expressed by only 6 shillings. The exceptionally productive labor acts as intensified labor. It creates, in equal periods of time, greater values than average social labor of the same kind. But our capitalist still continues to pay, as before, only 5 shillings as the daily value of labor power. Hence, instead of 10 hours, the worker now needs to work only for 7 and 1 fifth hours in order to reproduce this value. His surplus labor is therefore increased by 2 and 4 fifths hours, and the surplus value he produces grows from 1 into 3 shillings. Hence, the capitalist who implies the improved method of production appropriates and devotes to surplus labor a greater portion of the working day than the other capitalist in the same business. He does, as an individual, what capital itself, taken as a whole, does when engaged in producing relative surplus value. On the other hand, however, this extra surplus value vanishes as soon as the new method of production is generalized, for then the difference between the individual value of the cheapened commodity and its social value vanishes. The law of the determination of value by labor time makes itself felt to the individual capitalist who applies the new method of production by compelling him to sell his goods under their social value. This same law, acting as a coercive law of competition, forces his competitors to adopt the new method. The general rate of surplus value is therefore ultimately affected by the whole process only when the increase in the productivity of labor has seized upon those branches of production and cheapened those commodities that contribute towards the necessary means of subsistence and are therefore elements of the value of labor power. The value of commodities stands in inverse ratio to the productivity of labor. So too does the value of labor power, since it depends on the values of commodities. Relative surplus value, however, is directly proportional to the productivity of labor. It rises and falls together with productivity. The value of money being assumed to be constant, an average social working day of 12 hours always produces the same new value, 6 shillings, no matter how this sum may be apportioned between surplus value and wages. But if, as a result of an increase in productivity, there is a fall in the value of the means of subsistence and the daily value of labor power is thereby reduced from 5 shillings to 3, the surplus value will increase from 1 shilling to 3. 10 hours were necessary for the reproduction of the value of the labor power, now only 6 are required. 4 hours have been set free and can be annexed to the domain of surplus labor. Capital, therefore, has an imminent drive and a constant tendency towards increasing the productivity of labor in order to cheapen commodities and, by cheapening commodities, to cheapen the worker himself. The absolute value of a commodity is, in itself, of no interest to the capitalist who produces it. All that interests him is the surplus value present in it, which can be realized by sale. Realization of the surplus value necessarily carries with it the replacement of the value advanced. Now, since relative surplus value increases in direct proportion to the development of the productivity of labor, while the value of commodities stands in precisely the opposite relation to the growth of productivity, since the same process both cheapens commodities and augments the surplus value contained in them, we have here the solution of the following riddle. Why does the capitalist, whose sole concern is to produce exchange value, continually strive to bring down the exchange value of commodities? One of the founders of political economy, Kesne, used to torment his opponents with this question, and they could find no answer to it. You acknowledge, he says, that the more one can reduce the expenses and costs of labor in the manufacture of industrial products without injury to production, the more advantageous is that reduction, because it diminishes the price of the finished article. And yet, you believe that the production of wealth, which arises from the labor of the craftsman, consists in the augmentation of the exchange value of the products. The shortening of the working day, therefore, is by no means what is aimed at in capitalist production, when labor is economized by increasing its productivity. It is only the shortening of the labor time necessary for the production of a definite quantity of commodities that is aimed at. The fact that the worker, when the productivity of his labor has been increased, produces, say, ten times as many commodities as before, and thus spends one-tenth as much labor on each, by no means prevents him from continuing to work twelve hours as before, nor from producing in those 12 hours 1,200 articles instead of 120. Indeed, his working day may simultaneously be prolonged, so as to make him produce, say, 1,400 articles in 14 hours. Therefore, in the treaties of economists of the stamp of McCulloch, Urey, Sr., and the like, we may read on one page that the worker owes a debt of gratitude to capital for developing his productivity because the necessary labor time is thereby shortened, and on the next page that he must prove his gratitude by working in future for 15 hours instead of 10. The objective of the development of the productivity of labor within the context of capitalist production is the shortening of that part of the working day in which the worker must work for himself, and the lengthening thereby of the other part of the day in which he is free to work for nothing for the capitalist. 
How far this result can also be attained without cheapening commodities will appear from the following chapters, where we examine the particular methods of producing relative surplus value. Chapter 13. Cooperation. Capitalist production only really begins, as we have already seen, when each individual capital simultaneously employs a comparatively large number of workers, and when, as a result, the labor process is carried on on an extensive scale and yields relatively large quantities of products. A large number of workers working together at the same time in one place, or if you like, in the same field of labor, in order to produce the same sort of commodity under the command of the same capitalist constitutes the starting point of capitalist production. This is true both historically and conceptually. With regard to the mode of production itself, manufacture can hardly be distinguished, in its earliest stages, from the handicraft trades of the guilds, except by the greater number of workers simultaneously employed by the same individual capital. It is merely an enlargement of the workshop of the master craftsmen of the guilds. At first, then, the difference is purely quantitative. We have shown that the surplus value produced by a given capital is equal to the surplus value produced by each worker multiplied by the number of workers simultaneously employed. The number of workers does not in itself affect either the rate of surplus value or the degree of exploitation of labor power, and with regard to the production of commodity values in general, every qualitative alteration in the labor process appears to be irrelevant. If a working day of 12 hours is objectified in 6 shillings, 1,200 working days of 12 hours will be objectified in 1,200 times 6 shillings. In one case, 12 times 1,200 working hours are incorporated in the products, and in the other case, 12 working hours. In the production of value, a number of workers merely rank as so many individual workers and it therefore makes no difference in the value produced whether the 1,200 men work separately or united under the command of one capitalist. Nevertheless, within certain limits, a modification does take place. The labor objectified in value is labor of an average social quality. It is an expression of average labor power. Any average magnitude, however, is merely the average of a number of separate magnitudes all of one kind, but differing in quantity. In every industry, each individual worker differs from the average worker. These individual differences, or errors as they are called in mathematics, compensate each other and vanish whenever a certain minimum number of workers are employed together. Edmund Burke, that famous sophist and sycophant, goes so far as to make the following assertion, based on his practical observations as a farmer, that in so small a plantation as that of five farm laborers, all individual differences in the labor vanish, and that consequently any given five adult farm laborers taken together will do as much work in the same time as any other five. But however that may be, it is clear that the collective working day of a large number of workers employed simultaneously divided by the number of these workers, gives one day of average social labor. For example, let the working day of each individual be 12 hours. Then the collective working day of 12 men simultaneously employed consists of 144 hours. And although the labor of each of the dozen men may diverge more or less from the average social labor, each of them requiring a different amount of time for the same operation, the working day of everyone possesses the qualities of an average social working day, because it forms one-twelfth of the collective working day of 144 hours. From the point of view of the capitalist who employs these twelve men, the working day is that of the whole dozen. Each individual man's day is an adequate part of the collective working day, no matter whether the twelve men help each other in their work, or whether the connection between their operations consists merely in the fact that the men are all working for the same capitalists. But if the twelve men are employed in six pairs, by six different small masters, it'll be entirely a matter of chance whether each of these masters produces the same value, and consequently whether he secures the general rate of surplus value. Divergences would occur in individual cases. If one worker required considerably more time for the production of a commodity than was socially necessary, the duration of necessary labor time would, in his case, diverge significantly from the labor time socially necessary, the average labor time. His labor would therefore not count as average labor, and his labor power would not count as average labor power. It would either be unsaleable or saleable only at less than the average value of labor power. A fixed minimum of efficiency in all labor is therefore assumed, and we shall see later on that capitalist production provides the means of fixing this minimum. Nevertheless, this minimum diverges from the average, although on the other hand the capitalist has to pay the average value of labor power. Of the small six masters, then, one would squeeze out more than the average rate of surplus value, another less. The inequalities would cancel out for the society as a whole, but not for the individual masters. The law of valorization, therefore, comes fully into its own for the individual producer only when he produces as a capitalist and employs a number of workers simultaneously, 
i.e. when from the outset he sets in motion labor of a socially average character. Even without an alteration in the method of work, the simultaneous employment of a large number of workers produces a revolution in the objective conditions of the labor process. The buildings where the workers actually work, the storehouses for the raw material, the implements and utensils they use simultaneously or in turns, in short, a portion of the means of production, are now consumed jointly in the labor process. On the one hand, the exchange value of these means of production is not increased, for the exchange value of a commodity is not raised by any increase in the exploitation of its use value. On the other hand, they are used in common, and therefore on a larger scale than before. A room where twenty weavers work at twenty looms must be larger than the room of a single weaver with two assistants. But it costs less labor to build one workshop for twenty persons than to build ten to accommodate two weavers each. Thus the value of means of production concentrated for use in common, on a large scale, does not increase in direct proportion to their extent and useful effect. When consumed in common, they give up a smaller part of their value to each single product, partly because the total value they part with is spread over a greater number of products, and partly because their value, although it is greater in absolute terms, is relatively less, looked at from the point of view of their sphere of action, than the value of the separate means of production. Owing to this, the value of a part of the constant capital falls, and in proportion to the size of the fall, the total value of the commodity also falls. The effect is the same as if the means of production had cost less. This economy, in the application of the means of production, arises entirely out of their joint consumption in the labor process by many workers. Moreover, this character of being necessary conditions of social labor, a character that distinguishes them from the dispersed and relatively more costly means of production of isolated independent workers or small masters, is maintained even when the numerous workers assembled together do not assist each other but merely work side by side. A portion of the instruments of labor acquires this social character before the labor process itself does so. Economy in the use of means of production has to be considered from two points of view. Firstly, insofar as it cheapens commodities and thereby brings about a fall in the value of labor power. Secondly, insofar as it alters the ratio of surplus value to the total capital advanced, i.e. to the sum of the values of its constant and variable components. The latter aspect will not be considered until the first section of Volume 3 of this work. In order that we may treat them in their proper context, many other points relevant here have also been relegated to the third volume. The particular course taken by our analysis forces this tearing apart of the object under investigation, this corresponds also to the spirit of capitalist production. Here, the worker finds the instruments of labor existing independently of him as another man's property. Hence, economy in their use appears, from his standpoint, to be a separate operation, one that does not concern him and therefore has no connection with the methods by which his own personal productivity is increased. When numerous workers work together side by side in accordance with a plan, whether in the same process or in different but connected processes, this form of labor is called cooperation. Just as the offensive power of a squadron or cavalry, or the defensive power of an infantry regiment, is essentially different from the sum of the offensive or defensive powers of the individual soldiers taken separately, so the sum total of the mechanical forces exerted by isolated workers differs from the social force that is developed when many hands cooperate in the same undivided operation, such as raising a heavy weight, turning a winch, or getting an obstacle out of the way. In such cases, the effect of the combined labor could either not be produced at all by isolated individual labor, or it could be produced only by a great expenditure of time, or on a very dwarf-like scale. Not only do we have here an increase in the productive power of the individual by means of cooperation, but the creation of a new productive power which is intrinsically a collective one. Apart from the new power that arises from the fusion of many forces into a single force, Mere social contact begets in most industries a rivalry and stimulation of the animal spirits, which heightens the efficiency of each individual worker. This is why a dozen people working together will produce far more in their collective day of 144 hours than 12 isolated men, each working for 12 hours, and far more than one man who works 12 days in succession. This originates from the fact that man, if not, as Aristotle thought, a political animal, is at all events a social animal. Although a number of men may be simultaneously occupied together on the same work, or the same kind of work, the labor of each, as a part of the labor of all, may correspond to a distinct phase of the labor process, and as a result of the system of cooperation, the object of labor passes through the phases of the process more quickly than before. For instance, if a dozen masons place themselves in a row, so as to pass stones from the foot of the ladder to its summit, each of them does the same thing, and yet their separate acts form connected parts of one total operation. These acts are particular phases which each stone must go through, 
and the stones are thus carried up more quickly by the twenty-four hands of the row of men than they could be if each man went separately up and down the ladder with his load. The object of labor is carried over the same distance in a shorter time. Again, a combination of labor occurs whenever a building, for instance, is taken in hand on different sides simultaneously, although here, too, the cooperating masons are doing the same work or the same kind of work. The twelve masons, in their collective working day of 144 hours, make much more progress with the building than one mason could make working for twelve days or 144 hours. The reason for this is that a body of men working together have hands and eyes both in front and behind, and can be said to be, to a certain extent, omnipresent. The various parts of the product come to fruition simultaneously. In the above instances, we stress the point that men do the same work, or the same kind of work, because this, the most simple form of common labor, plays a great part in cooperation, even at its most fully developed stage. If the labor process is complicated, then the sheer number of the cooperators permits the apportionment of various operations to different hands, and consequently their simultaneous performance. The time necessary for the completion of the whole work is thereby shortened. In many industries there are critical moments, that is to say periods of time determined by the nature of the labor process itself, during which certain definite results must be obtained. For instance, if a flock of sheep has to be shorn or a field of wheat has to be cut and harvested, the quantity and quality of the product depends on the initiation and completion of the work at certain definite points in time. In these cases, the time the labor process may take is laid down in advance, just as it is in fishing for herrings. A single person cannot carve a working day of more than, say, 12 hours out of the natural day, but 100 men cooperating can extend the working day to 1,200 hours. The shortness of the time allowed for the work is compensated for by the large mass of labor thrown into the field of production at the decisive moment. The completion of the task within the proper time depends on the simultaneous application of numerous combined working days. The amount of useful effect depends on the number of workers. This number, however, is always smaller than the number of isolated workers that would be required to do the same amount of work in the same period. It is owing to the absence of this kind of cooperation that a great quantity of corn is wasted every year in the western part of the United States, and the same thing happens to cotton in those eastern parts of India where English rule has destroyed the old communities. On the one hand, cooperation allows work to be carried on over a large area. For certain labor processes, therefore, it is required simply by the physical constitution of the object of labor. Examples of this are the draining of marshes, the construction of dikes, irrigation, and the building of canals, roads, and railways. On the other hand, while extending the scale of production, it renders possible a relative contraction of its arena. This simultaneous restriction of space and extension of effectiveness, which allows a large number of incidental expenses, faux frais, to be spared, results from the massing together of workers and of various labor processes, and from the concentration of the means of production. The combined working day produces a greater quantity of use values than an equal sum of isolated working days, and consequently diminishes the labor time necessary for the production of a given useful effect. Whether the combined working day, in a given case, acquires this increased productivity because it heightens the mechanical force of labor, or extends its sphere of action over a greater space, or contracts the field of production relatively to the scale of production, or at the critical moment sets large masses of labor to work, or excites rivalry between individuals and raises their animal spirits, or impresses on the similar operations carried on by a number of men the stamp of continuity and many-sidedness, or performs different operations simultaneously, or economizes the means of production by use in common, or lends to the individual labor the character of average social labor, Whichever of these cases is the cause of the increase, the special productive power of the combined working day is, under all circumstances, the social productive power of labor, or the productive power of social labor. This power arises from cooperation itself. When the worker cooperates in a planned way with others, he strips off the fetters of his individuality and develops the capabilities of his species. As a general rule, workers cannot cooperate without being brought together. Their assembly in one place is a necessary condition for their cooperation. Hence, wage laborers cannot cooperate unless they are employed simultaneously by the same capital, the same capitalist, and therefore unless their labor powers are bought simultaneously by him. The total value of these labor powers, or the amount of the wages of these workers for a day or a week, as the case may be, must be ready in the pocket of the capitalist before the workers themselves are ready to start the process of production. The payment of 300 workers at once, even though only for one day, requires a greater outlay of capital than the payment of a smaller number of men week by week during a whole year. 
Hence, the number of the workers that cooperate, or the scale of cooperation, depends in the first instance on the amount of capital that the individual capitalist can spare for the purchase of labor power. In other words, on the extent to which a single capitalist has command over the means of subsistence of a number of workers. And as with variable capital, so also with constant capital. For example, the outlay on raw materials is 30 times as great for the capitalist who employs 300 men as it is for each of the 30 capitalists who employ 10 men. The value and quantity of the instruments of labor used in common does not, it is true, increase at the same rate as the number of workers, but it does increase very considerably. Hence, concentration of large masses of the means of production in the hands of individual capitalists is a material condition for the cooperation of wage laborers, and the extent of cooperation, or the scale of production, depends on the extent of this concentration. We saw in a former chapter that a certain minimum amount of capital was necessary in order that the number of workers simultaneously employed, and consequently the amount of surplus value produced, might suffice to liberate the employer himself from manual labor, to convert him from a small master into a capitalist, and thus formally to establish the capital relation. We now see that a certain minimum amount is a material condition for the conversion of numerous isolated and independent processes into one combined social process. We also saw that, at first, the subjection of labor to capital was only a formal result of the fact that the worker, instead of working for himself, works for and consequently under the capitalist. Through the cooperation of numerous wage laborers, the command of capital develops into a requirement for carrying on the labor process itself, into a real condition of production. That a capitalist should command in the field of production is now as indispensable as that a general should command on the field of battle. All directly social or communal labor on a large scale requires, to a greater or lesser degree, a directing authority in order to secure the harmonious cooperation of the activities of individuals and to perform the general functions that have their origin in the motion of the total productive organism as distinguished from the motion of its separate organs. A single violin player is his own conductor. An orchestra requires a separate one. The work of directing, superintending, and adjusting becomes one of the functions of capital from the moment that the labor under capital's control becomes cooperative. As a specific function of capital, the directing function acquires its own special characteristics. The driving motive and determining purpose of capitalist production is the self-valorization of capital to the greatest possible extent, i.e. the greatest possible production of surplus value, hence the greatest possible exploitation of labor power by the capitalist. As the number of the cooperating workers increases, so too does their resistance to the domination of capital, and necessarily the pressure put on by capital to overcome this resistance. The control exercised by the capitalist is not only a special function arising from the nature of the social labor process and peculiar to that process, but it is, at the same time, a function of the exploitation of a social labor process, and is consequently conditioned by the unavoidable antagonism between the exploiter and the raw material of his exploitation. Similarly, as the means of production extend, the necessity increases for some effective control over the proper application of them, because they confront the wage labor as the property of another. Moreover, the cooperation of wage laborers is entirely brought about by the capital that employs them. Their unification into one single productive body and the establishment of a connection between their individual functions lies outside their competence. These things are not their own act, but the act of the capital that brings them together and maintains them in that situation. Hence, the interconnection between their various labors confronts them, in the realm of ideas, as a plan drawn up by the capitalist, and in practice, as his authority as the powerful will of a being outside them who subjects their activity to his purpose. If capitalist direction is thus twofold in content, owing to the twofold nature of the process of production which has to be directed, on the one hand a social labor process for the creation of a product, and on the other hand capital's process of valorization, in form it is purely despotic. As cooperation extends its scale, this despotism develops the forms that are peculiar to it, just as at first the capitalist is relieved from actual labor as soon as his capital has reached that minimum amount with which capitalist production, properly speaking, first begins, so now he hands over the work of direct and constant supervision of the individual workers and groups of workers to a special kind of wage laborer. An industrial army of workers under the command of a capitalist requires, like a real army, officers, being managers, and NCOs, being foremen and overseers, who command it during the labor process in the name of capital. The work of supervision becomes their established and exclusive function. When comparing the mode of production of isolated peasants or independent artisans with the plantation economy which rests on slavery, political economists count this labor of superintendence as part of the faux frais of production.
But when considering the capitalist mode of production, they, on the contrary, identify the function of direction which arises out of the nature of the communal labor process with the function of direction which is made necessary by the capitalist and therefore antagonistic character of that process. It is not because he is a leader of industry that a man is a capitalist. On the contrary, he is a leader of industry because he is a capitalist. The leadership of industry is an attribute of capital, just as in feudal times the functions of general and judge were attributes of landed property. The worker is the owner of his labor power until he has finished bargaining for its sale with the capitalist, and he can sell no more than what he has, i.e. his individual, isolated labor power. This relation between capital and labor is in no way altered by the fact that the capitalist, instead of buying the labor power of one man, buys that of one hundred, and enters into separate contracts with one hundred unconnected men instead of with one. He can set the one hundred men to work without letting them cooperate. He pays them the value of one hundred independent labor powers, but he does not pay for the combined labor power of the one hundred. Being independent of each other, the workers are isolated. They enter into relations with the capitalists, but not with each other. Their cooperation only begins with the labor process, but by then they have ceased to belong to themselves. On entering the labor process, they are incorporated into capital. As cooperators, as members of a working organism, they merely form a particular mode of existence of capital. Hence, the productive power developed by the workers socially is the productive power of capital. The socially productive power of labor develops as a free gift to capital whenever the workers are placed under certain conditions, and it is capital which places them under these conditions. Because this power costs capital nothing, while on the other hand it is not developed by the worker until his labor itself belongs to capital, it appears as a power which capital possesses by its nature, a productive power inherent in capital. The colossal effects of simple cooperation are to be seen in the gigantic structures erected by the ancient Asiatics, Egyptians, Etruscans, etc. It has happened in times past that these oriental states, after supplying the expenses of their civil and military establishments, have found themselves in possession of a surplus which they could apply to the works of magnificence or utility, and in the construction of these, their command over the hands and arms of almost the entire non-agricultural population has produced stupendous monuments which still indicate their power. The teeming valley of the Nile produced food for a swarming non-agricultural population, and this food, belonging to the monarch and the priesthood, afforded the means of erecting the mighty monuments which filled the land. In moving the colossal statues and vast masses of which the transport creates wonder, human labor, almost alone, was prodigally used. The number of the laborers and the concentration of their efforts sufficed. We see mighty coral reefs rising from the depths of the ocean into islands and firm land, yet each individual depositor is puny, weak, and contemptible. The non-agricultural laborers of an Asiatic monarchy have little but their individual bodily exertions to bring to the task, but their number is their strength and the power of directing these masses gave rise to palaces and temples, the pyramids, and the armies of gigantic statues of which the remains astonish and perplex us. It is that confinement of the revenues which feed them, to one or a few hands, which makes such undertakings possible. This power of Asiatic and Egyptian kings, of Etruscan theocrats, etc., has in modern society been transferred to the capitalist, whether he appears as an isolated individual or, in the case of joint stock companies, in combination with others. Cooperation in the labor process, such as we find it at the beginning of human civilization among hunting peoples, or say is a predominant feature of the agriculture of Indian communities, is based on the one hand on the common ownership of the conditions of production, and on the other hand on the fact that in those cases the individual has as little torn himself free from the umbilical cord of his tribe or community as a bee has from his hive. Both of these characteristics distinguish this form of cooperation from capitalist cooperation. The sporadic application of cooperation on a large scale in ancient times, in the Middle Ages, and in modern colonies, rests on direct relations of domination and servitude, in most cases on slavery. As against this, the capitalist form presupposes from the outset the free wage laborer who sells his labor power to capital. Historically, however, this form is developed in opposition to peasant agriculture and independent handicrafts, whether in guilds or not. From the standpoint of the peasant and the artisan, capitalist cooperation does not appear as a particular historical form of cooperation. Instead, cooperation itself appears as a historical form peculiar to, and specifically distinguishing, the capitalist process of production. Just as the social productive power of labor that is developed by cooperation appears to be the productive power of capital, so cooperation itself, contrasted with the process of production carried on by isolated independent workers, or even by small masters, appears to be a specific form of the capitalist process of production. It is the first change experienced by the actual labor process when subjected to capital. It takes place spontaneously and naturally. 
The simultaneous employment of a large number of wage laborers in the same labor process, which is a necessary condition for this change, also forms the starting point of capitalist production. This starting point coincides with the birth of capital itself. If then, on the one hand, the capitalist mode of production is a historically necessary condition for the transformation of the labor process into a social process, so on the other hand, this social form of the labor process is a method employed by capital for the more profitable exploitation of labor by increasing its productive power. In its simple shape, as investigated so far, cooperation is a necessary concomitant of all production on a large scale, but it does not, in itself, represent a fixed form characteristic of a particular epoch in the development of the capitalist mode of production. At the most, it appears to do so, and then only approximately, in the handicraft-like beginnings of manufacture, and in that kind of large-scale agriculture which corresponds to the period of manufacture and is distinguished from peasant agriculture, mainly by the number of workers simultaneously employed and the massive means of production concentrated for their use. Simple cooperation has always been, and continues to be, the predominant form in those branches of production in which capital operates on a large scale, but the division of labor and machinery plays only an insignificant part. Cooperation remains the fundamental form of the capitalist mode of production, although in its simple shape it continues to appear as one particular form alongside the more developed ones. Chapter 14. The Division of Labor and Manufacture Section 1. The Dual Origin of Manufacture That form of cooperation, which is based on division of labor, assumes its classical shape in manufacture. As a characteristic form of the capitalist process of production, it prevails throughout the manufacturing period properly so called, which extends, roughly speaking, from the middle of the 16th century to the last third of the 18th century. Manufacture originates in two ways. One, by the assembling together in one workshop, under the control of a single capitalist, of workers belonging to various independent handicrafts, through whose hands a given article must pass on its way to completion. A carriage, for example, was formerly the product of a great number of independent craftsmen, such as wheelwrights, harness makers, tailors, locksmiths, upholsterers, turners, fringe makers, glaziers, painters, polishers, gilders, etc. In the manufacture of carriages, however, all these different craftsmen are assembled in one building where the unfinished product passes from hand to hand. It is true that a carriage cannot be gilded before it has been made, but if a number of carriages are being made simultaneously, some may be in the hands of the gilders while others are still going through an earlier process. So far, we are still on the footing of simple cooperation, which finds its materials ready to hand in the shape of men and things. But very soon, an important change takes place. The tailor, the locksmith, and the other craftsmen are now exclusively occupied in the making of carriages. They therefore gradually lose the habit, and therefore the ability, of carrying on their old trade in all of its ramifications. But on the other hand, their activity, which is now entirely one-sided, assumes the form most appropriate to its narrowed sphere of effectiveness. At first, the manufacture of carriages appeared as a combination of various independent handicrafts, but it gradually began to signify the splitting up of carriage production into its various detailed operations, and each single operation crystallized into the exclusive function of a particular worker, the manufacture as a whole being performed by these partial workers in conjunction. In the same way, cloth manufacture, as also a whole series of other manufacturers, arose from combining together different handicrafts under the command of a single capitalist. 2. Manufacture can also arise in exactly the opposite way, one capitalist simultaneously employs in one workshop a number of craftsmen who all do the same work, or the same kind of work, such as making paper, type, or needles. This is cooperation in its simplest form. Each of these craftsmen, with the help perhaps of one or two apprentices, makes the entire commodity, and he consequently performs in succession all the operations necessary to produce it. He still works in his old handicraft-like way. But very soon, external circumstances cause a different use to be made of the concentration of the workers on one spot and the simultaneousness of their work. An increased quantity of the article has perhaps to be delivered within a given time. The work is therefore divided up. Instead of each man being allowed to perform all the various operations in succession, these operations are changed into disconnected, isolated ones, carried on side by side. Each is assigned to a different craftsman, and the whole of them together are performed simultaneously by the cooperators. This accidental division is repeated, develops advantages of its own, and gradually ossifies into a systematic division of labor. The commodity, from being the individual product of an independent craftsman, becomes the social product of a union of craftsmen, each of whom performs one, and only one, of the constituent partial operations. 
The same operations which, in the case of a papermaker belonging to a guild in Germany, merged into each other as the successive acts of one craftsman, became in Dutch paper manufacture a number of partial operations performed side by side by numerous workers acting in cooperation. The needlemaker of Nuremberg, organized in his guild, laid the foundation for English needle manufacture. But while in Nuremberg that single craftsman performed a series of perhaps twenty operations one after the other, in England, it was not long before there were twenty needlemakers, side by side, each performing only one operation of the twenty. Finally, as a result of further experience, each of those twenty operations was again split up, isolated and made entirely independent, so that it became the exclusive function of a separate worker. The mode in which manufacture arises, its growth out of handicrafts, is therefore twofold. On the one hand, it arises from the combination of various independent trades, which lose that independence and become specialized to such an extent that they are reduced to merely supplementary and partial operations in the production of one particular commodity. On the other hand, it arises from the cooperation of craftsmen in one particular handicraft. It splits up that handicraft into its various detailed operations, isolating these operations and developing their mutual independence to the point where each becomes the exclusive function of a particular worker. On the one hand, therefore, manufacture either introduces division of labor into a process of production or further develops that division. On the other hand, it combines together handicrafts that were formerly separate. But whatever may have been its particular starting point, its final form is always the same, a productive mechanism whose organs are human beings. For a proper understanding of the division of labor in manufacture, it is essential to keep the following points firmly in mind. Firstly, the analysis of a process of production into its particular phases here coincides completely with the decomposition of a handicraft into its different partial operations. Whether complex or simple, each operation has to be done by hand, retains the character of a handicraft, and is therefore dependent on the strength, skill, quickness, and sureness with which the individual worker manipulates his tools. Handicraft remains the basis, a technically narrow basis which excludes a really scientific division of the production process into its component parts, since every partial process undergone by the product must be capable of being done by hand and of forming a separate handicraft. It is precisely because the skill of the craftsman thus continues to be the foundation of the production process that every worker becomes exclusively assigned to a partial function, and that his labor power becomes transformed into the lifelong organ of this partial function. Secondly, the division of labor is a particular sort of cooperation, and many of its advantages spring from the nature of cooperation in general, not from this particular form of it. Section 2. The Specialized Worker and His Tools if we now go into more detail, it is firstly clear that a worker who performs the same simple operations for the whole of his life converts his body into the automatic one-sided implement of that operation. Consequently, he takes less time in doing it than the craftsman who performs a whole series of operations in succession. The collective worker, who constitutes the living mechanism of manufacture, is made up solely of such one-sidedly specialized workers. Hence, in comparison with the independent handicraft, more is produced in less time, or in other words, the productivity of labor is increased. Moreover, once this partial labor is established as the exclusive function of one person, the methods it employs become perfected. The worker's continued repetition of the same narrowly defined act and the concentration of his strength on it teach him by experience how to attain the desired effect with the minimum of exertion. But since there are always several generations of workers living at one time and working together at the manufacture of a given article, the technical skill, the tricks of the trade thus acquired, become established and are accumulated and handed down. Manufacture, in fact, produces the skill of the specialized worker by reproducing and systematically driving to an extreme within the workshop the naturally developed differentiation which it found ready to hand in society. On the other hand, the conversion of a partial task into the lifelong destiny of a man corresponds to the tendency shown by earlier societies towards making trades hereditary. The trades either become petrified into castes, or in cases where definite historical conditions produced a variability in the individual which was incompatible with the caste system, they hardened into guilds. Castes and guilds arise from the action of the same natural law that regulates the differentiation of plants and animals into species and varieties, except that, when a certain degree of development has been reached, the heredity of castes and the exclusiveness of guilds are ordained as a law of society. Quote, the muslins of Dhaka and fineness, the calicos and other piece goods of Coromandel in brilliant and durable colors, have never been surpassed. 
Yet they are produced without capital, machinery, division of labor, or any of those means which give such facilities to the manufacturing interest of Europe. The weaver is merely a detached individual, working a web when ordered of a customer, and with a loom of the rudest construction consisting sometimes of a few branches or bars of wood put roughly together. There is even no expedient for rolling up the warp. The loom must therefore be kept stretched to its full length, and become so inconveniently large that it cannot be contained within the hut of the manufacturer, who is therefore compelled to ply his trade in the open air, where it is interrupted by every vicissitude of the weather. End quote from H. Murray and J. Wilson. It is only the special skill, accumulated from generation to generation and transmitted from father to son, that gives to the Hindu, as it gives to the spider, this virtuosity. And yet the work of such a Hindu weaver is very complicated in comparison with that of the majority of workers under the system of manufacture. A craftsman who performs the various partial operations in the production of a finished article, one after the other, must at one time change his place, at another time his tools. The transition from one operation to another interrupts the flow of his labor and creates gaps in his working day, so to speak. These close up when he is tied to the same operation the whole day long. They vanish in the same proportion as the changes in his work diminish. The resulting increase of productivity is due either to an increased expenditure of labor power in a given time, i.e. increased intensity of labor, or to a decrease in the amount of labor power unproductively consumed. The extra expenditure of power required by every transition from rest to motion is compensated for by prolonging the duration of the normal speed of work when once acquired. As against this, however, constant labor of one uniform kind disturbs the intensity and flow of a man's vital forces, which find recreation and delight in the change of activity itself. The productivity of labor depends not only on the proficiency of the worker, but also on the quality of his tools. Tools of the same kind, such as knives, drills, gimlets, hammers, etc., may be employed in different processes, and the same tool may serve various purposes in a single process, but as soon as the different operations of a labor process are disconnected from each other, and each partial operation acquires in the hands of the worker a suitable form peculiar to it, alterations become necessary in the tools which previously served more than one purpose. The direction taken by this change of form is determined by the peculiar difficulties put in the worker's way by the unchanged form of this tool. Manufacture is characterized by the differentiation of the instruments of labor, a differentiation whereby tools of a given sort acquire fixed shapes, adapted to each particular application, and by the specialization of these instruments which allows full play to each special tool only in the hands of a specific kind of worker. In Birmingham alone, 500 varieties of hammer are produced, and not only is each one adapted to a particular process, but several varieties often serve exclusively for different operations in the same process. The manufacturing period simplifies, improves, and multiplies the implements of labor by adapting them to the exclusive and special functions of each kind of worker. It thus creates at the same time one of the material conditions for the existence of machinery, which consists of a combination of simple instruments. The specialized worker and his instruments are the simplest elements of manufacture. Let us now turn to look at manufacture as a whole. Section 3 the two fundamental forms of manufacture, heterogeneous and organic. Manufacture has two fundamental forms of articulation which, although occasionally intertwined, are essentially different in kind, and moreover play very different roles in the later transformation of manufacture into large-scale industry carried on by machinery. This double character arises from the nature of the articles produced, which either results from the merely mechanical assembling of partial products made independently, or owes its completed shape to a series of connected processes and manipulations. A locomotive, for instance, consists of more than 5,000 independent parts. It cannot, however, serve as an example of the first kind of genuine manufacture, for it is a creation of large-scale industry. But a watch can, and William Petty used it to illustrate the division of labor in manufacture. Formerly the individual creation of a craftsman from Nuremberg, the watch has been transformed into the social product of an immense number of specialized workers, such as mainspring makers, dial makers, spiral spring makers, jeweled hole makers, ruby lever makers, hand makers, case makers, screw makers, and gilders. Then there are numerous subdivisions, such as wheel makers, with a further division between brass and steel, pin makers, movement makers, acheveurs de pignon, who fix the wheels on the axles and polish the facets, pivot makers, and many more. Only a few parts of the watch pass through several hands, and all these membra disjecta come together for the first time in the hand that binds them into one mechanical whole. 
This external relation between the finished product and its various and diverse elements makes it a matter of chance, in this case, as in the case of all similar finished articles, whether the specialized workers are brought together in one workshop or not. The subdivided operations themselves may be carried on like so many independent handicrafts, as they are in the cantons of Vaud and Neuchâtel. While in Geneva there exist large watch factories, i.e. establishments where the specialized workers directly cooperate under the control of a single capitalist. Even in the latter case, the dial, springs, and case are seldom made in the factory itself. To carry on the trade as a manufacturer with concentration of workers is profitable only under exceptional conditions, because competition is at its greatest between these workers who desire to work at home, because the splitting up of the work into a number of heterogeneous processes scarcely permits the use of instruments of labor common to all, and because the capitalist, by scattering the work around, saves any outlay on workshops, etc. Nevertheless, the position of this specialized worker, who although he works at home does so for a capitalist, or that is, a manufacturer, is very different from that of an independent craftsman, who works for his own customers. The second kind of manufacture, its perfected form, produces articles that go through connected phases of development, go step by step through a series of processes, like the wire in the manufacture of needles, which passes through the hands of 72, and sometimes even 92, different specialized workers. Insofar as such a manufacture, when first started, combines scattered handicrafts, it lessens the space by which the various phases of production are separated from each other. The time taken in passing from one stage to another is shortened, and so is the labor by means of which these transitions are made. In comparison with the handicraft, productive power is gained, and this gain arises from the general cooperative character of manufacture. On the other hand, division of labor, which is the principle peculiar to manufacture, requires the isolation of the various stages of production and their independence of each other. The establishment and maintenance of a connection between the isolated functions requires that the article be transported incessantly from one hand to another and from one process to another. From the standpoint of large-scale industry, this requirement emerges as a characteristic and costly limitation and one that is inherent in the principle of manufacture. If we confine our attention to some determinate quantity of raw material, to a heap of rags, for instance, in paper manufacture, or length of wire in needle manufacture, we perceive that it passes successively through a series of stages in the hands of the various specialized workers, until it takes on its final shape. On the other hand, if we look at the workshop as a complete mechanism, we see the raw material in all stages of its production at the same time. The collective worker, formed from the combination of the so many specialized workers, draws the wire with one set of tooled-up hands, straightens the wire with another set, armed with different tools, cuts it with another set, points it with another set, and so on. The different stages of the process, previously successive in time, have become simultaneous and contiguous in space. Hence, a greater quantity of finished commodities is produced within the same period. This simultaneity, it is true, arises from the general cooperative form of the process as a whole, but manufacture not only finds the conditions for cooperation ready to hand, it also, to some extent, creates them by subdividing handicraft labor. On the other hand, it only accomplishes the social organization of the labor process by riveting each worker to a single fraction of the work. Since the product of each specialized worker is, at the same time, only a particular stage in the development of a finished article, which is the same in each case, each worker, or group of workers, prepares the raw material for another worker, or group of workers. The result of the labor of the one is the starting point for the labor of the other. One worker therefore directly sets the other to work. The labor time necessary to attain the desired effect in each partial process is learned by experience, and the mechanism of manufacture taken as a whole is based on the assumption that a given result will be obtained in a given time. It is only on this assumption that the various supplementary labor processes can proceed uninterruptedly and simultaneously, side by side. It is clear that the direct mutual interdependence of the different pieces of the work, and therefore of the workers, compels each of them to spend on his work no more than the necessary time. This creates a continuity, a uniformity, a regularity, an order, and even an intensity of labor quite different from that found in an independent handicraft or even in simple cooperation. The rule that the labor time expended on a commodity should not exceed the amount socially necessary to produce it is one that appears, in the production of commodities in general, to be enforced from outside by the action of competition. To put it superficially, each single producer is obliged to sell his commodity at its market price. In manufacture, on the contrary, the provision of a given quantity of the product in a given period of labor is a technical law of the process of production itself. 
Different operations, however, require unequal lengths of time, and therefore an equal length of time yield unequal quantities of the specialized products. Thus, if the same worker has to perform the same operation day after day, there must be a different number of workers for each operation. For instance, in type manufacture, there are four founders and two breakers to one rubber. The founder casts 2,000 type an hour, the breaker breaks up 4,000, and the rubber polishes 8,000. Here we have again the principle of cooperation in its simplest form, the simultaneous employment of many people doing the same thing. Only now this principle is the expression of an organic relation. The division of labor under the system of manufacture not only simplifies and multiplies the qualitatively different parts of society's collective worker, but also creates a fixed mathematical relation or ratio which regulates the quantitative extent of those parts, i.e. the relative number of workers or the relative size of the group of workers for each special function. Thus, alongside the qualitative articulation, the division of labor develops a quantitative rule and a proportionality for the social labor process. Once the most fitting proportion has been established by experience for the number of specialized workers in the various groups producing on a given scale, that scale can be extended only by employing a multiple of each particular group. Moreover, the same individual can do certain kinds of work just as well on a large as on a small scale. For instance, the labor of superintendents, the transportation of the parts of the product from one stage to the next, etc. The isolation of such functions, their allotment to a particular worker, becomes advantageous only with an increase in the number of workers employed, but this increase must affect every group proportionally. The isolated group of workers to whom any particular specialized function is assigned is made up of homogeneous elements and is one of the constituent organs of the total mechanism. In many manufacturers, however, the group itself is an organized body of labor, the total mechanism being a repetition or multiplication of these elementary organisms of production. Let us take, for example, the manufacture of glass bottles. It may be resolved into three essentially different stages. First, the preliminary stage, which consists of preparing the components of the glass, mixing the sand and lime, etc., and melting them into a fluid mass of glass. Various specialized workers are employed in this first stage, as also in the final one of removing the bottle from the drying furnace, sorting and packing them, etc. In the middle, between these two stages, comes the glass melting proper, the manipulation of the fluid mass. At each mouth of the furnace, there works a group called the hole, consisting of one bottle maker or finisher, one blower, one gatherer, one putter up or wetter off, and one taker in. These five specialized workers are special organs of a single working organism that only acts as a whole, and therefore can only operate by the direct cooperation of all five. The whole body is paralyzed if only one of its members is missing. But a glass furnace has several openings, in England from four to six, each of which contains an earthenware melting pot full of molten glass and employs a similar five-man group of workers. The organization of each group is based on the division of labor, but the bond between the different groups is simple cooperation, which, by using in common one of the means of production, namely the furnace, causes it to be consumed more economically. A furnace of this kind, with its four to six groups, constitutes a glass house, and a glass factory comprises a number of such glass houses, together with the apparatus and the workers required for the preparatory and final phases of production. Finally, just as manufacture arises in part from the combination of various handicrafts, so too it develops into a combination of various manufacturers. The larger English glass manufacturers, for instance, make their own earthenware melting pots because the success or failure of the process depends to a great extent on their quality. The manufacture of one of the means of production is here united with that of the product. On the other hand, the manufacture of the product may be united with other manufacturers, in which the very same product serves in turn as raw material, or with whose products the original product is itself subsequently mixed. Thus we find the manufacture of flint glass combined with glass cutting and brass founding, brass being needed for the metal settings of various articles of glass. The various manufacturers which have been combined together in this way form more or less separate departments of a complete manufacture, but they are at the same time independent processes, each with its own division of labor. In spite of the many advantages offered by this combination of manufacturers, it never retains a complete technical unity on its own foundation. This unity only arises when it has been transformed into an industry carried on by machinery. Early in the period of manufacture, the principle of lessening the labor time necessary for the production of commodities was consciously formulated and expressed, and the use of machines also appeared sporadically, especially for certain simple primary processes that have to be conducted on a very large scale and with the application of great force. 
Thus, at an early period in paper manufacture, the tearing up of the rags was done by paper mills, and in metalworks the pounding of the ores was done by stamping mills. The Roman Empire handed down the elementary form of all machinery in the shape of the water wheel. The handicraft period bequeathed to us the great invention of the compass, gunpowder, type printing, and the automatic clock. But on the whole, machinery played that subordinate part, which Adam Smith assigns to it in comparison with division of labor. In the 17th century, the sporadic use of machinery was of the greatest importance, because it supplied the great mathematicians of that time with a practical basis and an incentive towards the creation of modern mechanics. The collective worker, formed out of the combination of a number of individual specialized workers, is the item of machinery specifically characteristic of the manufacturing period. The various operations performed in turn by the producer of a commodity, which coalesce during the labor process, make demands of various kinds upon him. In one operation he must exert more strength, in another more skill, in another more attention, and the same individual does not possess all these qualities in an equal degree. After the various operations have been separated, made independent and isolated, the workers are divided, classified, and grouped according to their predominant qualities. If their natural endowments are the foundation on which the division of labor is built up, manufacture, once introduced, develops in them new powers that are by nature fitted only for limited and special functions. The collective worker now possesses all the qualities necessary for production in an equal degree of excellence and expends them in the most economical way by exclusively employing all his organs, individualized in particular workers or groups of workers, in performing their special functions. The one-sidedness and even the deficiencies of the specialized individual worker become perfections when he is part of the collective worker. The habit of doing only one thing converts him into an organ which operates with the certainty of a force of nature, while his connection with the whole mechanism compels him to work with the regularity of a machine. Since the various functions performed by the collective worker can be simple or complex, high or low, the individual labor power, his organs, require different degrees of training and must therefore possess very different values. Manufacture, therefore, develops a hierarchy of labor powers, to which there corresponds a scale of wages. The individual workers are appropriated and annexed for life by a limited function, while the various operations of the hierarchy of labor powers are parceled out among the workers according to both their natural and their acquired capacities. Every process of production, however, requires certain simple manipulations, which every man is capable of doing. These actions, too, are now separated from their constant interplay with those aspects of activity which are richer in content and ossified into the exclusive functions of particular individuals. Hence, in every craft it seizes, manufacture creates a class of so-called unskilled laborers, a class strictly excluded by the nature of handicraft industry. If it develops a one-sided speciality to perfection at the expense of the whole of a man's working capacity, it also begins to make a speciality of the absence of all development. Alongside the gradations of the hierarchy, there appears to be the simple separation of the workers into skilled and unskilled. For the latter, the cost of apprenticeship vanishes. For the former, it diminishes compared with that required of the craftsman, owing to the simplification of the functions. In both cases, the value of labor power falls. An exception to this law occurs whenever the decomposition of the labor process gives rise to new and comprehensive functions, which either did not appear at all in handicrafts or not to the same extent. The relative devaluation of labor power, caused by the disappearance or reduction of the expenses of apprenticeship, directly implies a higher degree of valorization of capital, for everything that shortens the necessary labor time required for the reproduction of labor power extends the domain of surplus labor. Section 4. The Division of Labor in Manufacture and the Division of Labor in Society We first consider the origin of manufacture, then its simple elements, the specialized worker and his tools, and finally the total mechanism. We shall now lightly touch on the relation between the division of labor in manufacture and the social division of labor which forms the foundation of all commodity production. If we keep labor alone in view, we may designate the division of social production into its main genera, such as agriculture, industry, etc., as division of labor in general, and the splitting up of these broad divisions into species and subspecies as division of labor in particular. Finally, we may designate the division of labor within the workshop as division of labor in detail. The division of labor within society develops from one starting point. The corresponding restriction of individuals to particular vocations or callings develops from another starting point, which is diametrically opposed to the first. This second starting point is also that of the division of labor within manufacture. 
Within a family, and after further development within a tribe, there springs up naturally a division of labor caused by differences of sex and age, and therefore based on a purely physiological foundation. More material for this division of labor is then provided by the expansion of the community, the increase of its population, and in particular, conflicts between the different tribes and the subjugation of one tribe by another. On the other hand, as I have already remarked, the exchange of products springs up at the points where different families, tribes, or communities come into contact, for at the dawn of civilization it is not private individuals but families, tribes, etc. that meet on an independent footing. Different communities find different means of production and different means of subsistence in their natural environment. Hence, their modes of production and living, as well as their products, are different. It is this spontaneously developed difference which, when different communities come into contact, calls forth the mutual exchange of products and the consequent gradual conversion of those products into commodities. Exchange does not create the differences between spheres of production, but it does bring the different spheres into a relation, thus converting them into more or less interdependent branches of the collective production of a whole society. In this case, the social division of labor arises from the exchange between spheres of production which are originally distinct from and independent of one another. In the other case, where the physiological division of labor is the starting point, the particular organs of a compact whole become separated from each other and break off. This process of disintegration receives its main impetus from the exchange of commodities with foreign communities, Afterwards, these organs attain such a degree of independence that the sole bond still connecting the various kinds of work is the exchange of the products as commodities. In the one case, what was previously independent has been made dependent. In the other case, what was previously dependent has been made independent. The foundation of every division of labor, which has attained a certain degree of development and has been brought about by the exchange of commodities, is the separation of town from country. One might well say that the whole economic history of society is summed up in the movement of this antithesis. However, for the moment, we shall not go into this. Just as a certain number of simultaneously employed workers is the material precondition for the division of labor within manufacture, so the number and density of the population, which here corresponds to the collection of workers together in one workshop, is a precondition for the division of labor within society. Nevertheless, this density is more or less relative. A relatively thinly populated country with well-developed means of communication has a denser population than a more numerously populated country with a badly developed means of communication. In this sense, the northern states of the USA, for instance, are more thickly populated than India. Since the production and the circulation of commodities are the general prerequisites of the capitalist mode of production, division of labor in manufacture requires that a division of labor within society should have already attained a certain degree of development. Inversely, the division of labor in manufacture reacts back upon that in society, developing and multiplying it further. With the differentiation of the instruments of labor, the trades which produce these instruments themselves become more and more differentiated. If the system of manufacture seizes upon a trade which was previously carried on in connection with others, either as a chief or subordinate trade, and by one producer, these trades immediately break their connection and assert their independence of each other. If it ceases upon a particular stage in the production of a commodity, the other stages of its production become converted into as many independent trades. It has already been stated that where the finished article consists merely of a number of parts fitted together, the specialized operations may re-establish themselves as genuine and separate handicrafts. In order to accomplish the division of labor and manufacture more completely, a single branch of production is split up into numerous and to some extent entirely new manufactures, according to the varieties of its raw material or the various forms that the same piece of raw material may assume. Thus in France alone, in the first half of the 18th century, over 100 different kinds of silk stuffs were woven, and in Avignon, for instance, it was legally required that every apprentice should devote himself to only one sort of fabrication and should not learn the preparation of several kinds of stuff at once. The territorial division of labor, which confines special branches of production to special districts of a country, acquires fresh stimulus from the system of manufacture, which exploits all natural peculiarities. The colonial system and the extension of the world market, both of which form part of the general conditions for the existence of the manufacturing period, furnish us with rich materials for displaying the division of labor in society. This is not the place, however, for us to show how division of labor seizes upon not only the economic, but every other sphere of society, and everywhere lays the foundation for that specialization, that development in a man of one single faculty at the expense of all others, which already caused Adam Ferguson, the master of Adam Smith, to exclaim, We make a nation of helots and have no free citizens.
but in spite of the numerous analogies and links connecting them, the division of labor in the interior of a society and that in the interior of a workshop differ not only in degree but also in kind. The analogy appears most indisputable where there is an invisible bond uniting the various branches of trade. For instance, the cattle breeder produces hides, the tanner makes the hides into leather, and the shoemaker makes the leather into boots. Here, the product of each man is merely a step towards the final form, which is the combined product of their specialized labors. There are, besides, all the various trades which supply the cattle breeder, the tanner, and the shoemaker with their means of production. Now it is quite possible to imagine, with Adam Smith, that the difference between the above social division of labor and the division in manufacture is merely subjective, exists merely for the observer, who in the case of manufacture can see at a glance all the numerous operations performed on the spot, while in the instance given above, the spreading out of the work over great areas and the great number of people employed in each branch of labor obscure the connection. But what is it that forms the bond between the independent labors of the cattle breeder, the tanner, and the shoemaker? It is the fact that their respective products are commodities. What, on the other hand, characterizes the division of labor and manufacture? The fact that the specialized worker produces no commodities. It is only the common product of all the specialized workers that becomes a commodity. The division of labor within society is mediated through the purchase and sale of the products of different branches of industry, while the connection between the various partial operations in a workshop is mediated through the sale of the labor power of several workers to one capitalist, who applies it as a combined labor power. The division of labor within manufacture presupposes a concentration of the means of production in the hands of one capitalist. The division of labor within society presupposes a dispersal of those means among many independent producers of commodities. While within the workshop, the iron law of proportionality subjects definite numbers of workers to definite functions, in the society outside the workshop, the plague of chance and caprice results in the motley pattern of distribution of the producers and their means of production among the various branches of social labor. It is true that the different spheres of production constantly tend towards equilibrium for the following reason. On the one hand, every producer of a commodity is obliged to produce a use value, i.e. he must satisfy a particular social need, though the extent of these needs differs quantitatively, and there exists an inner bond which attaches the different levels of need to a system which has grown up spontaneously. On the other hand, the law of the value of commodities ultimately determines how much of its disposable labor time society can expend on each kind of commodity. But this constant tendency on the part of the various spheres of production towards equilibrium comes into play only as a reaction against the constant upsetting of this equilibrium, the planned and regulated a priori system on which the division of labor is implemented within the workshop becomes, in the division of labor within society, an a posteriori necessity imposed by nature, controlling the unregulated caprice of the producers and perceptible in the fluctuations of the barometer of market prices. Division of labor within the workshop implies the undisputed authority of the capitalist over men, who are merely the members of a total mechanism which belongs to him. The division of labor within society brings into contact independent producers of commodities who acknowledge no authority other than that of competition, of the coercion exerted by the pressure of their reciprocal interests, just as in the animal kingdom the war of all against all more or less preserves the conditions of existence of every species. The same bourgeois consciousness which celebrates the division of labor in the workshop, the lifelong annexation of the worker to a partial operation and his complete subjection to capital, as an organization of labor that increases its productive power, denounces with equal vigor every conscious attempt to control and regulate the process of production socially, as an inroad upon such sacred things as the rights of property, freedom, and the self-determining genius of the individual capitalist. It is very characteristic that the enthusiastic apologists of the factory system have nothing more damning to urge against a general organization of labor in society than that it would turn the whole of society into a factory. If in the society where the capitalist mode of production prevails, anarchy and the social division of labor and despotism and the manufacturing division of labor mutually condition each other, we find, on the contrary, in those earlier forms of society in which the separation of trades has been spontaneously developed, then crystallized and finally made permanent by law, on the one hand, a specimen of the organization of labor of society in accordance with an approved and authoritative plan, and on the other, the entire exclusion of division of labor in the workshop, or at least its development on a minute scale, sporadically and accidentally. Those small and extremely ancient Indian communities, for example, some of which continue to exist to this day, are based on the possession of the land in common, on the blending of agriculture and handicrafts, 
and on an unalterable division of labor, which serves as a fixed plan and basis for action whenever a new community is started. The communities occupy areas of from 100 up to several thousand acres, and each forms a compact whole producing all it requires. Most of the products are destined for direct use by the community itself, and are not commodities. Hence, production here is independent of that division of labor brought about in Indian society as a whole by the exchange of commodities. It is the surplus labor alone that becomes a commodity, and a part of that surplus cannot become a commodity until it has reached the hands of the state, because from time immemorial a certain quantity of the community's production has found its way to the state as rent in kind. The form of the community varies in different parts of India. In the simplest communities, the land is tilled in common, and the produce is divided among the members. At the same time, spinning and weaving are carried on in each family as subsidiary industries. Alongside the mass of people thus occupied in the same way, we find the chief inhabitant, who is a judge, police authority, and tax gatherer in one, the bookkeeper, who keeps account of the tillage and registers everything relating to this, another official who prosecutes criminals, protects strangers traveling through and escorts them to the next village, the boundary man who guards the boundaries against neighboring communities, the water overseer who distributes the water from the common tanks for irrigation, the Brahmin who conducts the religious services, the schoolmaster who on the sand teaches the children reading and writing, the calendar Brahmin or astrologer who makes known the lucky or unlucky days for seed time and harvest, and for every other kind of agricultural work, a smith and a carpenter who make and repair all the agricultural implements, the potter who makes all the pottery of the village, the barber, the washerman who washes clothes, the silversmith, here and there the poet, who in some communities replaces the silversmith, in others the schoolmaster. This dozen or so of individuals is maintained at the expense of the whole community. If the population increases, a new community is founded on the pattern of the old one, on unoccupied land. The whole mechanism reveals a systematic division of labor, but a division like that in manufacture is impossible, since the smith, the carpenter, etc., find themselves faced with an unchanging market, and at the most there occur, according to the sizes of the villages, two or three smiths or carpenters instead of one. The law that regulates the division of labor in the community acts with the irresistible authority of a law of nature, while each individual craftsman, the smith, the carpenter, and so on, conducts in his workshop all the operations of his handicraft in the traditional way, but independently and without recognizing any authority. The simplicity of the productive organism in these self-sufficing communities which constantly reproduce themselves in the same form and, when accidentally destroyed, spring up again on the same spot and with the same name, this simplicity supplies the key to the riddle of the unchangeability of Asiatic societies, which is in such striking contrast with the constant dissolution and refounding of Asiatic states, and their never-ceasing changes of dynasty. The structure of the fundamental economic elements of society remains untouched by the storms which blow up in the cloudy regions of politics. The rules of the guilds, as I have said before, deliberately hindered the transformation of the single master into a capitalist by placing very strict limits on the number of apprentices and journeymen he could employ. Moreover, he could employ his journeymen only in the handicraft in which he was himself a master. The guild zealously repelled every encroachment by merchant's capital, the only free form of capital which confronted them. A merchant could buy every kind of commodity, but he could not buy labor as a commodity. He existed only on sufferance, as a dealer in the products of the handicrafts. If circumstances called for a further division of labor, the existing guilds split themselves up into subordinate sections, or founded new guilds by the side of the old ones. But they did this without concentrating different handicrafts in one workshop. Hence the guild organization, however much it may have contributed to creating the material conditions for the existence of manufacture by separating, isolating, and perfecting the handicrafts, excluded the kind of division of labor characteristic of manufacture. On the whole, the worker and his means of production remained closely united, like the snail with its shell, and therefore the principal basis of manufacture was absent, namely the autonomy of the means of production as capital vis-à-vis -vis the worker. While the division of labor in society at large, whether mediated through the exchange of commodities or not, can exist in the most diverse economic formations of society, the division of labor in the workshop, as practiced by manufacture, is an entirely specific creation of the capitalist mode of production. Section 5. The Capitalist Character of Manufacture an increased number of workers under the control of one capitalist is the natural starting point both of cooperation in general and of manufacture in particular. But the division of labor in manufacture makes this increase in the number of workers a technical necessity. 
The minimum number that any given capitalist is bound to employ is here prescribed by the previously established division of labor. On the other hand, the advantage of further division can be obtained only by adding to the number of workers, and this means adding not single individuals but multiples. However, an increase in the variable component of the capital employed necessitates an increase in its constant component too, i.e. both in the available extent of the conditions of production such as workshops, implements, etc., and in particular in raw material, the demand for which grows much more quickly than the number of workers. The quantity of it consumed in a given time by a given amount of labor increases in the same ratio as does the productive power of that labor through its division. Hence it is a law, springing from the technical character of manufacture, that the minimum amount of capital which the capitalist must possess has to go on increasing. In other words, the transformation of these social means of production and subsistence into capital must keep extending. In manufacture as well as in simple cooperation, the collective working organism is a form of existence of capital. The social mechanism of production, which is made up of numerous individual specialized workers, belongs to the capitalist. Hence, the productive power which results from the combination of various kinds of labor appears as the productive power of capital. Manufacture proper not only subjects the previously independent worker to the discipline and command of capital, but creates in addition a hierarchical structure amongst the workers themselves. While simple cooperation leaves the mode of the individual's labor for the most part unchanged, manufacture thoroughly revolutionizes it and seizes labor power by its roots. It converts the worker into a crippled monstrosity by furthering his particular skill as in a forcing house through the suppression of a whole world of productive drives and inclinations, just as in the states of La Plata, they butcher a whole beast for the sake of his hide or his tallow. Not only is the specialized work distributed among the different individuals, but the individual himself is divided up and transformed into the automatic motor of a detail operation, thus realizing the absurd fable of Menenius Agrippa, which presents man as a mere fragment of his own body. If, in the first place, the worker sold his labor power to capital because he lacked the material means of producing a commodity, now his own individual labor power withholds its services unless it has been sold to capital. It will continue to function only in an environment which first comes into existence after its sale, namely the capitalist workshop. Unfitted by nature to make anything independently, the manufacturing worker develops his productive activity only as an appendage of that workshop. As the chosen people bore in their features the sign that they were the property of Jehovah, so the division of labor brands the manufacturing worker as the property of capital. The knowledge, judgment, and will, which, even though to a small extent are exercised by the independent peasant or handicraftsman in the same way as the savage makes the whole art of war consist in the exercise of his personal cunning, are faculties now required only for the workshop as a whole. The possibility of an intelligent direction of production expands in one direction because it vanishes in many others. What is lost by these specialized workers is concentrated in the capital which confronts them. It is the result of the division of labor and manufacture that the worker is brought face to face with the intellectual potentialities of the material process of production as the property of another and as a power which rules over him. This process of separation starts in simple cooperation where the capitalist represents to the individual workers the unity and the will of the whole body of social labor. It is developed in manufacture, which mutilates the worker, turning him into a fragment of himself. It is completed in large-scale industry, which makes science a potentiality for production, which is distinct from labor, and presses it into the service of capital. In manufacture, the social productive power of the collective worker, hence of capital, is enriched through the impoverishment of the workers in individual productive power. Quote, Ignorance is the mother of industry as well as of superstition. Reflection and fancy are subject to error, but a habit of moving the hand or the foot is independent of either. Manufacturers, accordingly, prosper most where the mind is least consulted and where the workshop may be considered as an engine, the parts of which are men. End quote from A. Ferguson. As a matter of fact, in the middle of the 18th century, some manufacturers preferred to employ semi-idiots for certain operations which, though simple, were trade secrets. The understandings of the greater part of men, says Adam Smith, are necessarily formed by their ordinary employments. The man whose whole life is spent in performing a few simple operations has no occasion to exert his understanding. He generally becomes as stupid and ignorant as it is possible for a human creature to become. After describing the stupidity of the specialized worker, he goes on, The uniformity of his stationary life naturally corrupts the courage of his mind. It corrupts even the activity of his body and renders him incapable of exerting his strength with vigor and perseverance in any other employments than that to which he has been bred. His dexterity, at his own particular trade, 
seems in this manner to be acquired at the expense of his intellectual, social, and martial virtues. But in every improved and civilized society, this is the state into which the laboring poor, that is the great body of the people, must necessarily fall. For preventing the complete deterioration of the great mass of the people which arises from the division of labor, Adam Smith recommends education of the people by the state, but in prudently homeopathic doses. Garnier, his French translator and commentator, who quite naturally developed into a senator under the First French Empire, is entirely consistent in opposing Smith on this point. Education of the people, he urges, violates the first law of the division of labor, and with it, quote, our whole social system would be proscribed. Like all other divisions of labor, he says, that between hand labor and head labor is more pronounced and decided in proportion as society, he rightly uses this word to describe capital, landed property, and the state that belongs to them, becomes richer. The division of labor, like every other, is an effect of the past and a cause of future progress. Ought the government then to work in opposition to this division of labor and to hinder its natural course? Ought it to expend a part of the public money in the attempt to confound and blend together two classes of labor which are striving after division and separation? Some crippling of body and mind is inseparable even from the division of labor in society as a whole. However, since manufacture carries this social separation of branches of labor much further, and also by its peculiar division attacks the individual at the very roots of his life, it is the first system to provide the material and the impetus for industrial pathology. Quote, to subdivide a man is to execute him if he deserves the sentence, to assassinate him if he does not. The subdivision of labor is the assassination of a people. End quote from D. Urquhart. Cooperation based on the division of labor, in other words, manufacture, begins as a spontaneous formation. As soon as it attains a degree of consistency and extension, it becomes the conscious, methodical, and systematic form of capitalist production. The history of manufacture proper shows how the division of labor which is peculiar to it acquires the most appropriate form at first by experience, as it were, behind the backs of the actors, and then, like the guild handicrafts, strives to hold fast to that form when once it has been found, and here and there succeeds in keeping it for centuries. Any alteration in this form, except in trivial matters, never results from anything but a revolution in the instruments of labor. Modern manufacture, I am not referring here to large-scale industry, which is based on machinery, either finds the disjecta member ready to hand, and only waiting to be collected together, as is the case in the manufacture of clothes in large towns, or it can easily apply the principles of division simply by exclusively assigning the various operations of a handicraft, such as bookbinding, to particular men. In such cases, a week's experience is enough to determine the proportion between the numbers of the hands necessary for the various functions. By dissection of handicraft activity into its separate components, by specialization of the instruments of labor, by the formation of specialized workers, and by grouping and combining the latter into a single mechanism, the division of labor in manufacture provides the social process of production with a qualitative articulation and a quantitative proportionality. It thereby creates a definite organization of social labor and at the same time develops new and social productive powers of labor. As a specifically capitalist form of the process of social production, and on the foundation available to it it could not develop in any other form than a capitalist one, the division of labor in manufacture is merely a particular method of creating relative surplus value, or of augmenting the self-valorization of capital, usually described as social wealth, wealth of nations, etc., at the expense of the worker. Not only does it increase the socially productive power of labor for the benefit of the capitalist instead of the worker, it also does this by crippling the individual worker. It produces new conditions for the domination of capital over labor. If, therefore, on the one hand it appears historically as an advance and a necessary aspect of the economic process of the formation of society, on the other hand it appears as a more refined and civilized means of exploitation. Political economy, which first emerged as an independent science during the period of manufacture, is only able to view the social division of labor in terms of the division found in manufacture, i.e. as a means of producing more commodities with a given quantity of labor, and consequently of cheapening commodities and accelerating the accumulation of capital. In most striking contrast with this accentuation of quantity and exchange value is the attitude of the writers of classical antiquity, who were exclusively concerned with quality and use value. As a result of the separation of the social branches of production, commodities are better made, men's various inclinations and talents select suitable fields of action, and without some restriction, no important results can be obtained anywhere. Hence, both product and producer are improved by the division of labor. 
If the growth of the quantity produced is occasionally mentioned, this is only done with the word alluding to exchange value or to the cheapening of commodities. This standpoint, the standpoint of use value, is adopted by Plato, who treats the division of labor as the foundation on which the division of society into estates is based, and also by Xenophon, who with his characteristic bourgeois instinct already comes closer to the division of labor within the workshop. Plato's Republic, insofar as the division of labor is treated in it as the formative principle of the state, is merely an Athenian idealization of the Egyptian caste system, Egypt having served as the model of an industrial country to others of his contemporaries, for example, Isocrates. It retained this importance for the Greeks, even at the time of the Roman Empire. During the manufacturing period proper, i.e. the period in which manufacture is the predominant form taken by capitalist production, the full development of its own peculiar tendencies comes up against obstacles from many directions. Although, as we have already seen, manufacture creates a simple division of the workers into skilled and unskilled, at the same time it inserts them into a hierarchical structure. The number of unskilled workers remains very limited, owing to the preponderant influence of the skills. Although it adapts the particular operations to the various degrees of maturity, strength, and development of the living instruments of labor, and thus tends toward the exploitation of women and children in production, this tendency is largely defeated by the habits and resistance of the male workers. Although the splitting up of handicrafts lowers the cost of forming the worker, and thereby lowers his value, a long period of apprenticeship is still necessary for certain more difficult kinds of work. Moreover, even where it would be superfluous, the workers jealously retain it. In England, for instance, we find the laws of apprenticeship, with their seven years probation, in full force down to the end of the manufacturing period. They are not entirely thrown aside until the advent of large-scale industry. Since handicraft skill is the foundation of manufacture, and since the mechanism of manufacture as a whole possesses no objective framework which would be independent of the workers themselves, capital is constantly compelled to wrestle with the insubordination of the workers. By the infirmity of human nature, says our friend Yuri, it happens that the more skillful the workman, the more self-willed and intractable he is apt to become, and of course the less fit a component of a mechanical system in which he may do great damage to the whole. Hence the complaint that the workers lack discipline runs through the whole of the period of manufacture. Even if we did not have the testimony of contemporary writers on this, we have two simple facts which speak volumes. Firstly, during the period between the 16th century and the epoch of large-scale industry, capital failed in its attempt to seize control of the whole disposable labor time of the manufacturing workers. And secondly, the manufacturers are short-lived, changing their locality from one country to another with the emigration or immigration of the workers. Order must in one way or another be established, exclaims in 1770 the often cited author of The Essay on Trade and Commerce. Order, echoes Dr. Andrew Urey 66 years later, was lacking in the system of manufacture, based as it was on the scholastic dogma of the division of labor, and Arkwright created order. At the same time, manufacture was unable either to seize upon the production of society to its full extent, or to revolutionize that production to its very core. It towered up as an artificial economic construction, on the broad foundation of the town handicrafts and the domestic industries of the countryside. At a certain stage of its development, the narrow technical basis on which manufacture rested came into contradictions with the requirements of production which it itself had created. One of its most finished products was the workshop for the production of the instruments of labor themselves, and particularly the complicated pieces of mechanical apparatus already being employed. A machine factory, says Yuri, displayed the division of labor in manifold gradations, the file, the drill, the lathe, having each its different workmen in order of skill. This workshop, the product of the division of labor and manufacture, produced in turn machines. It is machines that abolish the role of the handicraftsman as the regulating principle of social production. Thus, on the one hand, the technical reason for the lifelong attachment of the worker to a partial function is swept away. On the other hand, the barriers placed in the way of the domination of capital by this same regulating principle now also fall. Chapter 15. Machinery and Large-Scale Industry Section 1. The Development of Machinery John Stuart Mill says in his Principles of Political Economy, it is questionable if all the mechanical inventions yet made have lightened the day's toil of any human being. That is, however, by no means the aim of the application of machinery under capitalism. Like every other instrument for increasing the productivity of labor, machinery is intended to cheapen commodities, and by shortening the part of the working day in which the worker works for himself, to lengthen the other part, 
the part he gives to the capitalist for nothing. The machine is a means for producing surplus value. In manufacture, the transformation of the mode of production takes labor power as its starting point. In large-scale industry, on the other hand, the instruments of labor are the starting point. We have first to investigate, then, how the instruments of labor are converted from tools into machines, or what the difference is between a machine and an implement used in a handicraft. We are concerned here only with broad and general characteristics, for epochs in the history of society are no more separated from each other by strict and abstract lines of demarcation than are geological epochs. Mathematicians and experts on mechanics, and they are occasionally followed in this by English economists, call a tool a simple machine and a machine a complex tool. They see no essential difference between them, and even give the name of machine to simple mechanical aids such as the lever, the inclined plane, the screw, the wedge, etc. As a matter of fact, every machine is a combination of these simple tools or powers no matter how they may be disguised. From the economic standpoint, however, this explanation is worth nothing because the historical element is missing from it. Again, some people may try to explain the difference between a tool and a machine by saying that, in the case of the tool, man is the motive power, whereas the power behind the machine is a natural force independent of man, as, for instance, an animal, water, wind, and so on. According to this, a plow drawn by oxen, which is common to the most diverse epochs of production, would be a machine, while Clausen's circular loom, which weaves 96,000 picks a minute, though it is set in motion by the hand of one single worker, would be a mere tool. Indeed, this same loom, though a tool when worked by hand, would be a machine if worked by steam. And since the application of animal power is one of man's earliest inventions, production by machinery would have preceded production by handicrafts. When in 1735 John Wyatt announced his spinning machine and thereby started the Industrial Revolution of the 18th century, he nowhere mentioned that a donkey would provide the motive power instead of a man. Yet this is what actually happened. In his program, it was called a machine to spin without fingers. All fully developed machinery consists of three essentially different parts, the motor mechanism, the transmitting mechanism, and finally the tool or working machine. The motor mechanism acts as the driving force of the mechanism as a whole. It either generates its own motive power, like the steam engine, the caloric engine, the electromagnetic machine, etc., or it receives its impulse from some already existing natural force, like the water wheel from the descent of water down an incline, the windmill from the wind, and so on. The transmitting mechanism, composed of flywheels, shafting, toothed wheels, pulleys, straps, ropes, bands, pinions, and gearing of the most varied kinds, regulates the motion, changes its form where necessary, as for instance from linear to circular, and divides and distributes it among the working machines. These two parts of the whole mechanism are there solely to impart motion to the working machine. Using this motion, the working machine then seizes on the object of labor and modifies it as desired. It is this last part of the machinery, the tool or working machine, with which the Industrial Revolution of the 18th century began. And to this day, it constantly serves as the starting point whenever a handicraft or manufacture is turned into an industry carried on by machinery. On a closer examination of the working machine proper, we rediscover in it, as a general rule, though often in highly modified forms, the very apparatus and tools used by the handicraftsman or the manufacturing worker, but there is a difference that, instead of being the tools of a man, they are the implements of a mechanism, mechanical implements. Either the entire machine is only a more or less altered mechanical edition of the old handicraft tool, as for instance the power loom, or the working parts fitted in the frame of the machine are old acquaintances, as spindles are in a mule, needles in a stocking loom, saw blades in a sawing machine, and knives in a chopping machine. The distinction between these tools and the actual framework of the working machine exists from their moment of entry into the world because they continue, for the most part, to be produced by handicraft or by manufacture and are afterwards fitted into the framework of the machine, which is produced by machinery. The machine, therefore, is a mechanism that, after being set in motion, performs with its tools the same operation as the worker did formerly with similar tools. Whether the motive power is derived from a man, or in turn from a machine, makes no difference here. From the moment that the tool proper is taken from man and fitted into a mechanism, a machine takes the place of a mere implement. The difference strikes one at once, even in those cases where man himself continues to be the prime mover. The number of implements that he himself can use simultaneously is limited by the number of his own natural instruments of production, i.e. his own bodily organs. In Germany, they tried at first to make one spinner work two spinning wheels, that is, to work simultaneously with both hands and both feet. That proved to be too exhausting. Later, a treadle spinning wheel with two spindles was invented, 
but adepts in spinning who could spin two threads at once were almost as scarce as two-headed men. The jenny, on the other hand, even at the very beginning, spun with twelve to eighteen spindles, and the stocking loom knits with many thousand needles at once. The number of tools that a machine can bring into play simultaneously is from the outset independent of the organic limitations that confine the tools of the handicraftsman. In many manual implements, the distinction between man as mere motive power or man as worker or operator properly so called is very striking indeed. For instance, the foot is merely the prime mover of the spinning wheel, while the hand, working with the spindle and drawing and twisting, performs the real operation of spinning. It is the second part of the handicraftsman's implement, in this case the spindle, which is first seized on by the Industrial Revolution, leaving to the worker, in addition to his new labor of watching the machine with his eyes and correcting its mistakes with his hands, the merely mechanical role of acting as the motive power. On the other hand, in cases where man has always acted as a simple motive power, as for instance by turning the crank of a mill, by pumping, by moving the arm of a bellows up and down, by pounding with a mortar, etc., there is soon a call for the application of animals, water, and wind as motive powers. Here and there, long before the period of manufacture, and also to some extent during that period, these implements attained the stature of machines, but without creating any revolution in the mode of production. It becomes evident in the period of large-scale industry that these implements, even in the form of manual tools, are already machines. For instance, the pumps with which the Dutch emptied the Lake of Harlem in 1836-7 were constructed on the principle of ordinary pumps, the only difference being that their pistons were driven by cyclopean steam engines, instead of by men. In England, the common and very imperfect bellows of the blacksmith is occasionally converted into a blowing engine by connecting its arm with a steam engine. The steam engine itself, such as it was at its invention during the manufacturing period at the close of the 17th century, and such as it continued to be down to 1780, did not give rise to any industrial revolution. It was, on the contrary, the invention of machines that made a revolution in the form of steam engines necessary. As soon as man, instead of working on the object of labor with a tool, becomes merely the motive power of a machine, it is purely accidental that the motive power happens to be clothed in the form of human muscles. Wind, water, or steam could just as well take man's place. Of course, this does not prevent such a change of form from producing great technical alterations in a mechanism which was originally constructed to be driven by man alone. Nowadays, all machines that have to break new ground, such as sewing machines, bread-making machines, etc., are constructed to be driven by humans as well as by purely mechanical motive power, unless they have special characteristics which exclude their use on a small scale. The machine, which is the starting point of the Industrial Revolution, replaces the worker, who handles a single tool, by a mechanism operating with a number of similar tools and set in motion by a single motive power, whatever the form of that power. Here we have the machine, but in its first role as a simple element in production by machinery. An increase in the size of the machines and the number of its working tools calls for a more massive mechanism to drive it, and this mechanism, in order to overcome its own inertia, requires a mightier moving power than that of man, quite apart from the fact that man is a very imperfect instrument for producing uniform and continuous motion. Now, assuming that he is acting simply as a motor, that a machine has replaced the tool he was using, it is evident that he can also be replaced as a motor by natural forces. Of all the great motive forces handed down from the period of manufacture, horsepower is the worst, partly because a horse has a head of his own, and partly because he's costly and the extent to which he can be used in factories is very limited. Nevertheless, the horse was used extensively during the infancy of large-scale industry. This is proved both by the complaints of the agronomists of that epoch and by the way of expressing mechanical force in terms of horsepower, which survives to this day. The wind was too inconsistent and uncontrollable, and apart from this, in England, the birthplace of large-scale industry, the use of water power preponderated even during the period of manufacture. In the 17th century, attempts had already been made to turn two pairs of millstones with a single water wheel, but the increased size of the transmitting mechanism came into conflict with the water power, which was now insufficient, and this was one of the factors which gave the impulse for a more accurate investigation of the laws of friction. In the same way, the irregularity caused by the motive power in mills that were set in motion by pushing and pulling a lever led to the theory and the application of the flywheel, which later played such an important part in large-scale industry. In this way, the first scientific and technical elements of large-scale industry were developed during the period of manufacturing. Arkwright's throstle spinning mill was from the very first turned by water, Despite this, the use of water power as the main motive force brought with it various added difficulties. The flow of water could not be increased at will. It failed at certain seasons of the year, and above all, it was essentially local. Not till the invention of Watt's second and so-called double-acting steam engine was a prime mover found which drew its own motive power from the consumption of coal and water, 
was entirely under man's control, was mobile and a means of locomotion, was urban and not, like the water wheel, rural, permitted production to be concentrated in towns instead of, like the water wheels, being scattered over the countryside, and finally was of universal technical application and little affected in its choice of residence by local circumstances. The greatness of Watt's genius showed itself in that specification of the patent that he took out in April 1784. In that specification, his steam engine is described not as an invention for a specific purpose, but as an agent universally applicable in industry. Many of the applications he points out in it, for instance the steam hammer, were not introduced until half a century later. Yet the steam engines of colossal size for ocean steamers were sent to the Great Exhibition of 1851 by his successors, the firm of Bolton and Watt. As soon as tools had been converted from being manual implements of man into parts of a mechanical apparatus, of a machine, the motive mechanism also acquired an independent form, entirely emancipated from the restraints of human strength. Thereupon, the individual machine, which we have considered so far, sinks to a mere element in production by machinery. One motive mechanism was now able to drive many machines at once. The motive mechanism grows with the number of the machines that are turned out simultaneously, and the transmitting mechanism becomes an extensive apparatus. We have now to distinguish the cooperation of a number of machines of one kind from a complex system of machinery. In the one case, the product is entirely made by a single machine, which performs all the various operations previously done by one handicraftsman with his tool, by a weaver with his loom, for instance, or by several handicraftsmen successively, either separately or as members of a system of manufacture. In the modern manufacture of envelopes, for example, one man folded the paper with the folder, another laid on the gum, a third turned over the flap on which the emblem is impressed, a fourth embossed the emblem, and so on. And on each occasion, the envelope had to change hands. One single envelope machine now performs all these operations at once and makes more than 3,000 envelopes in an hour. In the London Exhibition of 1862, there was an American machine for making paper cornets. It cut the paper, pasted and folded and finished 300 in a minute. Here, the whole process, which under the manufacturing system was split up into a series of operations and carried out in that order, is completed by a single machine, operating a combination of different tools. Now, whether such a machine is merely a reproduction of a complicated manual implement, or a combination of various simple implements specialized by a manufacturer, in both cases we meet again with simple cooperation in the factory, i.e. in the workshop in which machinery alone is used and, leaving the worker out of consideration for the moment, this cooperation appears in the first instance as the assembling in one place of similar and simultaneously acting machines. Thus, a weaving factory consists of a number of power looms working side by side, and a sewing factory consists of a number of sewing machines all in the same building. But there is here a technical unity, in that all the machines receive their impulse simultaneously, and in an equal degree from the pulsations of the common prime mover, which are imparted to them by the transmitting mechanism. And this mechanism, to a certain extent, is also common to them all, since only particular ramifications of it branch off to each machine. Just as a number of tools, then, form the organs of a machine, so a number of machines of one kind constitute the organs of the motive mechanism. A real machine system, however, does not take the place of these independent machines until the object of labor goes through a connected series of graduated processes carried out by a chain of mutually complementary machines of various kinds. Here we have again the cooperation by division of labor, which is peculiar to manufacture, but now it appears as a combination of machines with specific functions. The tools peculiar to the various specialized workers, such as those of the beaters, combers, shearers, spinners, etc., in the manufacture of wool, are now transformed into the tools of specialized machines, each machine forming a special organ with a special function in the combined mechanism. In those branches in which the machine system is first introduced, manufacture itself provides, in general, a natural basis for the division, and consequently the organization, of the process of production. Nevertheless, an essential difference at once appears. In manufacture, it is the workers who, either singly or in groups, must carry on each particular process with their manual implements. The worker has been appropriated by the process, but the process had previously to be adapted to the worker. This subjective principle of the division of labor no longer exists in production by machinery. Here, the total process is examined objectively, viewed in and for itself, and analyzed into its constitutive phases. The problem of how to execute each particular process and to bind the different partial processes together into a whole is solved by the aid of machines, chemistry, etc. But of course, in this case too, the theoretical conception must be perfected by accumulated experience on a large scale. 
Each particular machine supplies raw material to the machine next in line, and since they are all working at the same time, the product is always going through the various stages of its formation, and is also constantly in a state of transition from one phase of production to another. Just as in manufacture, the direct cooperation of the specialized workers establishes a numerical proportion between the different groups, so in an organized system of machinery where one machine is constantly kept employed by another, a fixed relation is established between their number, their size, and their speed. The collective working machine, which is now an articulated system composed of various kinds of single machine and of groups of single machines, becomes all the more perfect the more the process as a whole becomes a continuous one, i.e. the less the raw material is interrupted in its passage from the first phase to the last. In other words, the more its passage from one phase to another is effected not by the hands of man but by the machinery itself. In manufacture, the isolation of each special process is a condition imposed by the division of labor itself, whereas in the fully developed factory the continuity of the special processes is the regulating principle. A system of machinery, whether it is based simply on the cooperation of similar machines as in weaving, or on a combination of different machines as in spinning, constitutes in itself a vast automaton as soon as it is driven by a self-acting prime mover. But although the whole system may, for example, be driven by a steam engine, some of the individual machines may require the aid of the worker for some of their movements. Such aid was necessary for the insertion of the mule carriage before the invention of the self-acting mule, and is still necessary in the fine spinning mills. Equally, certain parts of the machine may have to be handled by the worker like a manual tool, if the machine is to do its work. This was the case in machine makers' workshops before the conversion of the slide rest into a self-actor. As soon as a machine executes without man's help, all the movements required to elaborate the raw material and needs only supplementary assistance from the worker, we have an automatic system of machinery, capable of constant improvement in its details. Such improvements as the apparatus that stops a drawing frame whenever a sliver breaks and the self-acting stop which stops the power loom as soon as the shuttle bob and is empty of weft are quite modern inventions. As an example both of continuity of production and of the implementation of the automatic principle, we may take a modern paper mill. In the paper industry generally, we may advantageously study in detail not only the distinctions between modes of production based on different means of production, but also the connection between the social relations of production and those modes of production. The old German papermaking trade provides an example of handicraft production. Holland in the 17th century and France in the 18th century provide examples of manufacture proper, and modern England provides the example of automatic fabrication. Besides these, there still exist in India and China two distinct ancient Asiatic forms of the same industry. An organized system of machines to which motion is communicated by the transmitting mechanism from an automatic center is the most developed form of production by machinery. Here we have, in place of the isolated machine, a mechanical monster whose body fills whole factories, and whose demonic power, at first hidden by the slow and measured motions of its gigantic members, finally bursts forth in the fast and feverish whirl of its countless working organs. There were mules and steam engines before there were any workers exclusively occupied in making mules and steam engines, in the same way as men wore clothes before there were any tailors. However, the inventions of Volkansen, Arkwright, Watt, and others could only be put into practice because each inventor found a considerable number of skilled mechanical workers available, placed at their disposal by the period of manufacture. Some of these workers were independent handicraftsmen of various trades, others were grouped together in manufactures in which, as we have mentioned before, a division of labor of particular strictness prevailed. As inventions increased in number, and the demand for the newly discovered machines grew larger, the machine-making industry increasingly split up into numerous independent branches, and the division of labor within these manufacturers developed accordingly. Here, therefore, in manufacture, we see the immediate technical foundation of large-scale industry. Manufacture produced the machinery with which large-scale industry abolished the handicraft and manufacturing systems in the spheres of production it first sees hold of. The system of machine production therefore grew spontaneously on a material basis which was inadequate to it. When the system had attained a certain degree of development, it had to overthrow this ready-made foundation, which had meanwhile undergone further development in its old form, and create for itself a new basis appropriate to its own mode of production. Just as the individual machine retains a dwarf-like character as long as it is worked by the power of man alone, and just as no system of machinery could be properly developed before the steam engine took place of the earlier motive powers, animals, wind, and even water, so too, large-scale industry was crippled in its whole development as long as its characteristic instrument of production, the machine, 
owed its existence to the personal strength and personal skill and depended on the muscular development, the keenness of sight, and the manual dexterity with which the specialized workers in manufacture and the handicraftsmen outside manufacture wielded their dwarf-like implements. Thus, apart from the high cost of machines made in this way, a circumstance which forms the dominant motive for the capitalist actions, the expansion of industries carried on by means of machinery and the invasion of fresh branches of production by machinery were dependent on the growth of a class of workers who, owing to the semi-artistic nature of their employment, could increase their numbers only gradually, and not by leaps and bounds. But besides this, at a certain stage of its development, large-scale industry also came into conflict with the technical basis provided for it by handicrafts and manufacture. A number of technical problems arose naturally and spontaneously from the very course of development. The size of the prime movers, of the transmitting mechanism, and of the machines properly so-called increased. The components of its machines became more complicated and diverse in form. They had to operate with stricter regularity, and they accordingly diverged more and more from the model which originally determined their construction under the handicraft system, and acquired an independent form restricted only by their mechanical task. At the same time, the automatic system was perfected, and it became more and more unavoidable to use materials which were difficult to work with, as, for instance, when iron replaced wood. In every case, the solution of these problems met with a stumbling block and the personal restrictions which even the collective worker of manufacture could not break through except to a limited extent. Such machines as the modern hydraulic press, the modern power loom, and the modern carding engine could never have been furnished by the manufacturing period. The transformation of the mode of production in one sphere of industry necessitates a similar transformation in other spheres. This happens at first in branches of industry which are connected together by being separate phases of a process, and yet isolated by the social division of labor, in such a way that each of them produces an independent commodity. Thus machine spinning made machine weaving necessary, and both together made a mechanical and chemical revolution compulsory in bleaching, printing, and dyeing. So too, on the other hand, the revolution in cotton spinning called forth the invention of the gin, for separating the seeds from the cotton fiber. It was only by means of this invention that the production of cotton became possible on the enormous scale at present required. But as well as this, the revolution in the modes of production of industry and agriculture made necessary a revolution in the general conditions of the social process of production, i.e. in the means of communication and transport. In a society whose pivot, to use Fourier's expression, was small-scale agriculture, with its subsidiary domestic industries and urban handicrafts, the means of communication and transport were so utterly inadequate to the needs of production in the period of manufacture, with its extended division of social labor, its concentration of the instruments of labor and workers and its colonial markets, that they in fact became revolutionized. In the same way, the means of communication and transport handed down from the period of manufacture soon became unbearable fetters on large-scale industry given the feverish velocity with which it produces, its enormous extent, its constant flinging of capital and labor from one sphere of production into another, and its newly created connections with the world market. Hence, quite apart from the immense transformation which took place in shipbuilding, the means of communication and transport gradually adapted themselves to the mode of production of large-scale industry by means of a system of river steamers, railways, ocean steamers, and telegraphs. But the huge masses of iron that had now to be forged, welded, cut, bored, and shaped required for their part machines of cyclopean dimensions, which the machine-building trades of the period of manufacture were incapable of constructing. Large-scale industry therefore had to take over the machine itself, its own characteristic instrument of production, and to produce machines by means of machines. It was not until it did this that it could create for itself an adequate technical foundation and stand on its own feet. At the same time as machine production was becoming more general, in the first decades of the 19th century, it gradually took over the construction of the machines themselves. But it is only during the last few decades that the construction of railways and ocean steamers on a vast scale has called into existence the cyclopean machines now employed in the construction of prime movers. The most essential condition for the production of machines by machines was a prime mover capable of exerting any amount of force while retaining perfect control. The steam engine already fulfilled this condition. But at the same time, it was necessary to produce the geometrically accurate straight lines, planes, circles, cylinders, cones, and spheres for the individual parts of the machines. Henry Maudsley solved this problem in the first decade of the 19th century by the invention of the slide rest, a tool that was soon made automatic and was applied in a modified form to other machines for constructing machinery besides the lath, for which it was originally intended. This mechanical appliance replaces not some particular tool, but the hand itself, which produces a given form by holding and guiding the cutting tool along the iron or other material of labor. 
Thus, it became possible to produce the geometrical shapes of the individual parts of machinery with the degree of ease, accuracy, and speed that no accumulated experience of the hand of the most skilled workman could give. If we now look at the part of the machinery which is employed in the construction of machines and forms the actual operating tool, we find that the manual implements reappear but on a cyclopean scale. The operating part of the boring machine is an immense drill driven by a steam engine. Without this machine, on the other hand, the cylinders of large steam engines and of hydraulic processes could not be made. The mechanical lathe is only a cyclopean reproduction of the ordinary foot lathe. The planing machine is an iron carpenter that works on iron with the same tools as the human carpenter employs on wood. The instrument that cuts the veneers on the London wharves is a gigantic razor. The tool of the shearing machine, which shears iron as easily as a tailor's scissors cut cloth, is a monster pair of scissors, and the steam hammer works with an ordinary hammerhead, but of such a weight that even Thor himself couldn't wield it. These steam hammers are an invention of Nasmith, and there is one that weighs over six tons, and strikes with a vertical fall of seven feet on an anvil weighing thirty-six tons. It is mere child's play for it to crush a block of granite into powder, yet it is no less capable of driving a nail into a piece of soft wood with a succession of light taps. As machinery, the instrument of labor assumes a material mode of existence which necessitates the replacement of human force by natural forces, and the replacement of the rule of thumb by the conscious application of natural science. In manufacture, the organization of the social labor process is purely subjective. It is a combination of specialized workers. Large-scale industry, on the other hand, possesses in the machine system an entirely objective organization of production, which confronts the worker as a pre-existing material condition of production. In simple cooperation, and even in the more specialized form based on the division of labor, the extrusion of the isolated worker by the associated worker still appears to be more or less accidental. Machinery, with a few exceptions to be mentioned later, operates only by means of associated labor, or labor in common. Hence, the cooperative character of the labor process is in this case a technical necessity, dictated by the very nature of the instrument of labor. Section 2. The Value Transferred by the Machinery to the Product We saw that the productive forces resulting from cooperation and the division of labor cost capital nothing. They are natural forces of social labor. Other natural forces appropriated to productive processes, such as steam, water, etc., also cost nothing. But just as a man requires lungs to breathe with, so he requires something that is the work of human hands in order to consume the forces of nature productively. A water wheel is necessary to exploit the force of water, and a steam engine to exploit the elasticity of steam. Once discovered, the law of the deflection of a magnetic needle in the field of an electric current, or the law of the magnetization of iron by electricity, cost absolutely nothing. But the exploitation of these laws for the purposes of telegraphy, etc., necessitates costly and extensive apparatus. As we have seen, the machine does not drive out the tool. Rather does the tool expand and multiply, changing from a dwarf implement of the human organism to the implement of a mechanism created by man. Capital now sets the worker to work not with the manual tool, but with the machine which itself handles the tools. Therefore, although it is clear at the first glance that large-scale industry raises the productivity of labor to an extraordinary degree by incorporating into the production process both the immense forces of nature and the results arrived at by natural science, it is by no means equally clear that this increase in productive force is not, on the other hand, purchased with an increase in the amount of labor expended. Machinery, like every other component of constant capital, creates no new value, but yields up its own value to the product it serves to beget. Insofar as the machine has value and, as a result, transfers value to the product, it forms an element in the value of the latter. Instead of being cheapened, the product is made dearer in proportion to the value of the machine. And it is crystal clear that machines and systems of machinery, large-scale industries' characteristic instruments of labor, are incomparably more loaded with value than the implements used in handicrafts and manufacture. In the first place, it must be observed that machinery, while always entering as a whole into the labor process, enters only piece by piece into the process of valorization. It never adds more value than it loses, on an average, by depreciation. Hence, there is a great difference between the value of a machine and the value transferred in a given time by the machine to the product. Equally, there is a great difference between the machine as a factor in the formation of value and as a factor in the formation of the product. The longer the period during which the machine serves in the same labor process, the greater are those differences. It is no doubt true, as we have seen, that every instrument of labor enters as a whole into the labor process, while only piecemeal, in proportion to its average daily depreciation, into the process of valorization. 
but this difference between the mere utilization of the instrument and its depreciation is much greater in the case of machinery than it is with a tool, because the machine, being made from more durable material, has a longer life, because it can be employed more economically from the point of view both of the deterioration of its own components and of its consumption of materials, as its use is regulated by strict scientific laws, and finally, because its field of production is incomparably larger than that of a tool. Both in the case of the machine and of the tool, we find that after allowing for their average daily cost, that is, for the value they transmit to the product by their average daily wear and tear, and for their consumption of auxiliary substances such as oil, coal, and so on, they do their work for nothing, like the natural forces which are already available without the intervention of human labor. The greater the productive effectiveness of machinery compared with that of the tool, the greater is the extent of its gratuitous service. Only in large-scale industry has man succeeded in making the product of his past labor labor which has already been objectified, perform gratuitous service on a large scale like a force of nature. When we considered cooperation in manufacture, we found that certain general conditions of production, such as buildings, could be consumed more economically than the scattered conditions of production of isolated craftsmen, because they could be consumed in common, and that therefore they made the product cheaper. In a system of machinery, not only is the framework of the machine consumed in common by its numerous working parts, but the prime mover, together with a part of the transmitting mechanism, is consumed in common by a large number of operating machines. Given the difference between the value of the machinery and the value transferred by it in a day to the product, the extent to which this latter value makes the product dearer depends in the first instance upon the size of the product, on its area, so to speak. Mr. Baines of Blackburn, in a lecture of 1857, estimates that each real mechanical horsepower will drive 450 self-acting mule spindles with preparation or 220 throstle spindles or 15 looms for 40-inch cloth with the appliances for warping, sizing, etc. In the first case, it is the daily product of 450 mule spindles, in the second of 200 throstle spindles and in the third of 15 power looms over which is spread the daily cost of one horsepower and the deterioration of the machinery set in motion by that power. Hence, this deterioration transfers only a minute amount of value to a pound of yarn or a yard of cloth, similarly with the steam hammer mentioned earlier. Since its daily deterioration, its consumption of coal, etc., are spread over the immense masses of iron hammered by it in a day, only a small value was added to a hundredweight of iron, but that value would be very great if the cyclopean instrument were used to drive in small nails. Given a machine's capacity for work, that is, the number of its operating tools, or where it is a question of force, their size, the amount of its product will depend on the velocity of its working parts, on the speed, for instance, of the spindles, or on the number of blows given by the hammer in a minute. Many of these colossal hammers strike 70 times in a minute, and Ryder's patent machine for forging spindles with small hammers gives as many as 700 strokes per minute. Given the rate at which machinery transfers its value to the product, the amount of value so transferred depends on the total value of the machinery. The less labor it contains, the less value it contributes to the product. The less value it gives up, the more productive it is, and the more its services approach those rendered by natural forces. But the production of machinery lessens its value in relation to its extension and efficacy. A comparative analysis of the prices of commodities produced by handicrafts or manufacture and of the prices of the same commodities produced by machinery shows in general that in the product of machinery, the value arising out of the instrument of labor increases relatively, but decreases absolutely. In other words, its absolute amount decreases, but its amount in relation to the total value of the product, of pound of yarn, for instance, increases. It is evident that whenever it costs as much labor to produce a machine as is saved by the employment of that machine, all that has taken place is a displacement of labor. Consequently, the total labor required to produce a commodity has not been lessened. In other words, the productivity of labor has not been increased. However, the difference between the labor a machine costs and the labor it saves, in other words, the degree of productivity the machine possesses, does not depend on the difference between its own value and the value of the tool it replaces. As long as the labor spent on a machine is such that the portion of its value added to the product remains smaller than the value added by the worker to the product with his tool, there is always a difference of labor saved in favor of the machine. The productivity of the machine is therefore measured by the human labor power it replaces. According to Mr. Baines, two and a half workers are required for the 450 mule spindles, including preparation machinery that are driven by one horsepower. Each self-acting mule spindle, working 10 hours, produces 13 ounces of yarn of average thickness. Consequently, two and a half workers spin 365 and 5 eighths pounds of yarn per week. Hence, if we disregard waste to make the calculation simpler, 366 pounds of cotton, 
absorb only 150 hours of labor during their conversion into yarn, in other words, 15 working days of 10 hours each. But with the spinning wheel, assuming that the hand spinner produces 13 ounces of yarn in 60 hours, the same weight of cotton would absorb 2,700 working days of 10 hours each, or 27,000 hours of labor. Where block printing, the old method of printing calico by hand, has been driven out by machine printing, a single machine with the aid of one man or boy prints as much calico of four colors in one hour as it formerly took 200 men to do. Before Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin in 1793, the separation of the seed from a pound of cotton cost an average day's labor. By means of his invention, it became possible for one woman to clean a hundred pounds a day, and since then the effectiveness of the gin has been increased considerably. A pound of raw cotton, which previously cost 50 cents to produce, could subsequently be sold for 10 cents at a greater profit, i.e. with more unpaid labor. In India, they use an instrument called a churka, which is half machine and half tool for separating the seeds from the cotton wool. With this, one man and one woman can clean 28 pounds a day. With the churka invented some years ago by Dr. Forbes, one man and a boy produce 250 pounds a day. If oxen, steam, or water are used for driving it, only a few boys and girls are required, as feeders, providers of raw material for the machines. Sixteen of these machines driven by oxen do as much work in a day as 750 people did before on average. As already stated, a steam plow does as much work in one hour at a cost of three pence as 66 men at a cost of 15 shillings. I come back to this example in order to clear up an erroneous notion. The 15 shillings are by no means the expression in money of all the labor expended in one hour by the 66 men. If the ratio of surplus labor to necessary labor were 100%, these 66 men would produce in one hour a value of 30 shillings, although their wages, 15 shillings, represented only their labor for half an hour. Let us suppose, then, that a machine costs as much as the wages for a year of the 150 men it displaces, say 3,000 pounds. This 3,000 pounds is by no means the expression in money of the labor provided by these men and added to the object of labor before the introduction of the machine, but only the expression of that portion of their year's labor which was expended for themselves and is represented by their wages. On the other hand, the 3,000 pounds, the monetary value of the machine, expresses all the labor expended to produce it, whatever the proportion between the workers' wages and the capitalist surplus value. Therefore, even if the machine costs as much as the labor power displaced by it, the labor objectified in it is still much smaller in quantity than the living labor it replaces. The use of machinery for the exclusive purpose of cheapening the product is limited by the requirement that less labor must be expended in producing the machinery than is displaced by the employment of that machinery. For the capitalist, however, there is a further limit on its use. Instead of paying for the labor, he pays only the value of the labor power employed. The limit to his using a machine is therefore fixed by the difference between the value of the machine and the value of the labor power replaced by it. Since the division of the day's work into necessary labor and surplus labor differs in different countries, and even in the same country at different periods or in different branches of industry, and further, since the actual wage of the worker sometimes sinks below the value of his labor power and sometimes rises above it, it is possible for the difference between the price of the machinery and the price of the labor power replaced by that machinery to undergo great variations, while the difference between the quantity of labor needed to produce the machine and the total quantity of labor replaced by it remains constant. But it is only the former difference that determines the cost to the capitalist of producing a commodity and influences his actions through the pressure of competition. Hence the invention nowadays in England of machines that are employed only in North America, just as in the 16th and 17th centuries, machines were invented in Germany for use exclusively in Holland, and just as many French inventions of the 18th century were exploited only in England. In the older countries, machinery itself, when employed in some branches of industry, creates such a superfluity of labor, redundancy of labor is how Ricardo puts it, in other branches, that the fall of wages below the value of labor power impedes the use of machinery in those other branches and, from the standpoint of the capitalist, makes the use of machinery superfluous and often impossible because his profit comes from a reduction in the labor paid for, not in the labor employed. In some branches of the wool industry in England, the employment of children has been considerably lessened during recent years and in some cases entirely abolished. Why? Because the factory acts made two sets of children necessary, one set working six hours, the other four, or both sets working five hours. But the parents refused to sell the half-timers cheaper than the full-timers, hence the substitution of machinery for the half-timers. 
Before the labor of women and children under 10 years old was forbidden in mines, the capitalists considered the employment of naked women and girls, often in company with men so far sanctioned by their moral code and especially by their ledgers, that it was only after the passing of the act that they had recourse to machinery. The Yankees have invented a stone-breaking machine. The English do not make use of it because the wretch who does this work gets paid for such a small portion of his labor that machinery would increase the cost of production to the capitalist. In England, women are still occasionally used instead of horses for hauling barges, because the labor required to produce horses and machines is an accurately known quantity, while that required to maintain the women of the surplus population is beneath all calculation. Hence, we nowhere find a more shameless squandering of human labor power for despicable purposes than in England, the land of machinery. Section 3. The Most Immediate Effects of Machine Production on the Worker as we have shown, the starting point of large-scale industry is the revolution in the instruments of labor, and this attains its most highly developed form in the organized system of machinery in the factory. Before we inquire how human material is incorporated with this objective organism, let us consider some general effects of the revolution on the worker himself. Subsection A. Appropriation of Supplementary Labor Power by Capital. The Employment of Women and Children. Insofar as machinery dispenses with muscular power, it becomes a means for employing workers of slight muscular strength, or whose bodily development is incomplete, but whose limbs are all the more supple. The labor of women and children was therefore the first result of the capitalist application of machinery. That mighty substitute for labor and for workers, the machine, was immediately transformed into a means for increasing the number of wage laborers by enrolling, under the direct sway of capital, every member of the worker's family, without distinction of age or sex. Compulsory work for the capitalist usurped the place not only of the children's play, but also of the independent labor at home, within customary limits, for the family itself. The value of labor power was determined not only by the labor time necessary to maintain the individual adult worker, but also by that necessary to maintain his family. Machinery, by throwing every member of that family onto the labor market, spreads the value of the man's labor power over his whole family. It thus depreciates it. To purchase the labor power of a family of four workers may perhaps cost more than it formerly did to purchase the labor power of the head of the family. But, in return, four days' labor takes the place of one day's, and the price falls in proportion to the excess of the surplus labor of the four over the surplus labor of one. In order that the family may live, four people must now provide not only labor for the capitalist, but also surplus labor. Thus we see that machinery, while augmenting the human material that forms capital's most characteristic field of exploitation, at the same time raises the degree of that exploitation. Machinery also revolutionizes, and quite fundamentally, the agency through which the capital relation is formally mediated, i.e. the contract between the worker and the capitalist. Taking the exchange of commodities as our basis, our first assumption was that the capitalist and the worker confronted each other as free persons, as independent owners of commodities, the one possessing money and the means of production, the other labor power. But now the capitalist buys children and young persons. Previously, the worker sold his own labor power, which he disposed of as a free agent, formally speaking. Now he sells his wife and child. He has become a slave dealer. Notices of demand for children's labor often resemble in form the inquiries for Negro slaves that were formerly to be read among the advertisements in American journals. My attention, says an English factory inspector, was drawn to an advertisement in the local paper of one of the most important manufacturing towns of my district, of which the following is a copy. Wanted, 12 to 20 young persons, not younger than what can pass for 13 years. Wages, 4 shillings a week. Apply, etc. The phrase, what can pass for 13 years, refers to the fact that, according to the Factory Act, children under 13 years old may only work 6 hours a day. An officially appointed doctor, the certifying surgeon, must certify their age. The manufacturer, therefore, asks for children who look as if they are already 13 years old. The decrease, often by leaps and bounds, in the number of children under 13 years employed in factories, a decrease that is shown in an astonishing manner by the English statistics of the last 20 years, was for the most part, according to the evidence of the factory inspectors themselves, the work of these certifying surgeons, who adjusted the children's ages in a manner appropriate to the capitalist greed for exploitation and the parents' need to engage in this traffic. In the notorious London district of Bethnal Green, a public market is held every Monday and Tuesday morning, at which children of both sexes, from nine years of age upwards, hire themselves out to the silk manufacturers. Quote, 
The usual terms are one shilling eight pence a week, this belongs to the parents, and two pence for myself and tea. The contract is binding only for the week. The scene and language while this market is going on are quite disgraceful. End quote from the fifth report of the Children's Employment Commission. It still happens in England that women take children from the workhouse and let anyone have them out for two shillings sixpence a week. In spite of legislation, the number of boys sold in Great Britain by their parents to act as live chimney-sweeping machines, although machines exist to replace them, is at least 2,000. The revolution affected by machinery and the legal relationship between buyer and seller of labor power, causing the transaction as a whole to lose the appearance of a contract between free persons, later offered the English Parliament an excuse, founded on juristic principles, for state intervention into factory affairs. Whenever the law limits the labor of children to six hours in industries not previously touched, the complaints of the manufacturers resound yet again. They allege that numbers of parents withdraw their children from the industries brought under the Act in order to sell them where freedom of labor still prevails, i.e. where children under 13 years are compelled to work like adults, and for that reason can be sold at a higher price. But since capital is by its nature a leveler, since it insists upon equality in the condition of exploitation of labor in every sphere of production as its own innate right, the limitation by law of children's labor in one branch of industry results in its limitation in others. We have already alluded to the physical deterioration of the children and young persons, as well as the women, whom machinery subjects to the exploitation of capital first directly in the factories that sprout forth on the basis of machinery, and then indirectly in all the remaining branches of industry. Here we shall dwell on one point only, the enormous mortality of the children of the workers during the first few years of their life. In 16 of the registration districts into which England is divided, there are, for every 100,000 children alive under the age of one year, only 9,085 deaths in a year, on average, in one district only 7,047. In 24 districts, the deaths are over 10,000 but under 11,000. In 39 districts, over 11,000 but under 12,000. In 48 districts, over 12,000 but under 13,000. In 22 districts, over 20,000. In 25 districts, over 21,000. In 17, over 22,000. In 11, over 23,000. In who? Wolverhampton. Ashton under Lyne and Preston, over 24,000. In Nottingham, Stockport, and Bradford, over 25,000. In Wisbeach, 26,000. And in Manchester, 26,125. As was shown by an official medical inquiry in the year 1861, the high death rates are, apart from local causes, principally due to the employment of the mothers away from their homes, and to the neglect and maltreatment arising from their absence, which consists in such things as insufficient nourishment, unsuitable food, and dosing with opiates. Besides this, there arises an unnatural estrangement between mother and child, and as a consequence, intentional starving and poisoning of the children. In those agricultural districts where a minimum in the employment of women exists, the death rate is on the other hand very low. However, the 1861 Commission of Inquiry arrived at the unexpected conclusion that in some purely agricultural districts bordering on the North Sea, the death rate of children under one year old almost equaled that of the worst factory districts. Dr. Julian Hunter was therefore commissioned to investigate this phenomenon on the spot. His report is incorporated into the sixth report on public health. Up to that time, it was supposed that the children were decimated by malaria and other diseases peculiar to low-lying and marshy districts. But the inquiry showed the very opposite, namely that the same cause which drove away malaria, the conversion of the land from a morass in the winter and a scanty pasture in summer into fruitful cornland, created the exceptional death rate of the infants. The 70 medical men whom Dr. Hunter examined in those districts were wonderfully in accord on this point. In fact, the revolution in cultivation had led to the introduction of the industrial system. Quote, Married women, who work in gangs along with boys and girls, are, for a stipulated sum of money, placed at the disposal of the farmer by a man called the undertaker, who contracts for the whole gang. These gangs will sometimes travel many miles from their own village. They are to be met morning and evening on the roads, dressed in short petticoats with suitable coats and boots and sometimes trousers, looking wonderfully strong and healthy, but tainted with a customary immorality, and heedless of the fatal results which their love of this busy and independent life is bringing on their unfortunate offspring who are pining at home. End quote from the Sixth Report on Public Health. All the phenomena of the factory districts are reproduced here, including a yet higher degree of disguised infanticide and the stupefaction of children with opiates. My knowledge of such evils, says Dr. Simon, the medical officer of the Privy Council and editor-in-chief of the reports on public health, may excuse the profound misgiving with which I regard any large industrial employment of adult women.
Happy indeed, exclaims Mr. Baker, the factory inspector, in his official report. Happy indeed will it be for the manufacturing districts of England when every married woman having a family is prohibited from working in any textile works at all. The moral degradation which arises out of the exploitation by capitalism of the labor of women and children has been exhaustively represented by Friedrich Engels in his Condition of the Working Class in England, and by other writers too, that a mere mention will suffice here. But the intellectual degeneration artificially produced by transforming immature human beings into mere machines for the production of surplus value, and there is a very clear distinction between this and the state of natural ignorance in which the mind lies fallow without losing its capacity for development, its natural fertility, finally compelled even the English Parliament to make elementary education a legal requirement before children under 14 years could be consumed productively by being employed in those industries which are subject to the factory acts. The spirit of capitalist production emerges clearly from the ludicrous way the so-called education clauses of the factory acts have been drawn up, from the absence of any administrative machinery whereby this compulsory education is once again made for the most part illusory from the opposition of the manufacturers themselves to these education clauses and from the tricks and dodges they use to evade them. Quote, For this, the legislature is alone to blame by having passed a delusive law, which, while it would seem to provide that the children employed in factories shall be educated, contains no enactment by which the children shall on certain days of the week, and for a certain number of hours, three in each day, be enclosed within the four walls of a place called school, and that the employer of the child shall receive a weekly certificate to that effect, signed by a person designated by the subscriber as a schoolmaster or schoolmistress. End quote from Leonard Horner. Before passing the amended Factory Act of 1844, it happened not infrequently that these certificates of attendance at school were signed by the schoolmaster or schoolmistress with a cross, as they themselves were unable to write. Quote, on one occasion, on visiting a place called a school from which certificates of school attendance had issued, I was so struck with the ignorance of the master that I said to him, Pray, sir, can you read? His reply was, I, summit. And as a justification of his right to grant certificates, he added, At any rate, I am before my scholars. The inspectors, when the bill of 1844 was in preparation, did not fail to denounce this disgraceful state of the places called schools, certificates from which they were obliged to admit as a compliance with the laws. But they were successful only in obtaining this, that since the passing of the Act in 1844, quote, the figures in the school certificate must be filled up in the handwriting of the schoolmaster, who must also sign his Christian name and surname in full, end quote from Leonard Horner's report to the inspectors of factories. Sir John Kincaid, factory inspector for Scotland, relates similar official experiences. Quote, the first school we visited was kept by a Mrs. Ann Killen. Upon asking her to spell her name, she straightaway made a mistake. By beginning with the letter C, but correcting herself immediately, she said her name began with a K. On looking at her signature, however, in the school certificate books, I noticed that she spelt it in various ways, while her handwriting left no doubt as to her unfitness to teach. She herself also acknowledged that she could not keep the register. In a second school, I found the schoolroom 15 feet long and 10 feet wide, and counted in this space 75 children, who were gabbling something unintelligible. But it is not only in the miserable places above referred to that the children obtain certificates of school attendance without having received any instruction of any value, for in many schools where there is a competent teacher, his efforts are of little avail, from the distracting crowd of children of all ages, from infants of three years old and upwards, his livelihood, miserable at best, depending on the pence received from the greatest number of children whom it is possible to cram into the space. To this is to be added scanty school furniture, deficiency of books and other materials for teaching, and the depressing effect upon the poor children themselves of a close, noisome atmosphere. I have been in many such schools where I have seen rows of children doing absolutely nothing, and this is certified as school attendance. And in statistical return, such children are set down as being educated. In Scotland, the manufacturers do their best to exclude from employment the children who are obliged to attend school. Quote, it requires no further argument to prove that the educational clauses of the Factory Act, being held in such disfavor among mill owners, tend in a great measure to exclude that class of children alike from the employment and the benefit of education contemplated by this Act. This situation appears at its most grotesque and repulsive in calico print works, which are regulated by a special Act. This Act lays it down that, quote, 
Every child, before being employed in a print works, must have attended school for at least 30 days, and not less than 150 hours during the six months immediately preceding such first day of employment, and during the continuance of its employment in the print works, it must attend for a like period of 30 days and 150 hours during every successive period of six months. The attendance at school must be between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. No attendance of less than two and a half hours nor more than five hours on any one day shall be reckoned as part of the 150 hours. Under ordinary circumstances, the children attend school morning and afternoon for 30 days for at least five hours each day, and upon the expiration of the 30 days, the statutory total of 150 hours having been attained, having, in their language, made up their book, they return to the print works, where they continue until the six months have expired, when another installment of school attendance becomes due, and they again seek the school until the book is again made up. Many boys, having attended school for the required number of hours, when they return to school after the expiration of their six months' work in the print works, are in the same condition as when they first attended school as print work boys, and I have been assured that they have lost all they gained by their previous school attendance. In other print works, the children's attendance at school is made to depend altogether upon the exigencies of the work in the establishment. The requisite number of hours is made up each six months by installments consisting of from three to five hours at a time, spreading over perhaps the whole six months. For instance, the attendance on one day might be from 8 to 11 a.m., on another day from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m., and the child might not appear at school again for several days, when it would attend from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Then it might attend for three or four days consecutively, or for a week, then it would not appear in school for three weeks or a month, after that upon some odd days at some odd hours when the operative who employed it chose to spare it, and thus the child was, as it were, buffeted from school to work, from work to school, until the tale of 150 hours was told." End quote from Redgrave in the reports of the inspectors of factories. Machinery, by this excessive addition of women and children to the working personnel, at last breaks the resistance which the male workers had continued to oppose to the despotism of capital throughout the period of manufacture. Subsection B. The Prolongation of the Working Day. If machinery is the most powerful means of raising the productivity of labor, i.e. of shortening the working time needed to produce a commodity, it is also, as a repository of capital, the most powerful means of lengthening the working day beyond all natural limits in those industries first directly seized on by it. It creates, on the one hand, new conditions which permit capital to give free rein to this tendency, and on the other hand, new incentives which whet its insatiable appetite for the labor of others. In the first place, in machinery, the motion and the activity of the instrument of labor asserts its independence vis-à-vis -vis the worker. The instrument of labor now becomes an industrial form of perpetual motion. It would go on producing forever if it did not come up against certain natural limits in the shape of the weak bodies and strong wills of its human assistance. Because it is capital, the automatic mechanism is endowed, in the person of the capitalist, with consciousness and a will. As capital, therefore, it is animated by the drive to reduce to a minimum the resistance offered by man, that obstinate yet elastic natural barrier. This resistance is, moreover, lessened by the apparently undemanding nature of work at a machine, and the more pliant and docile character of the women and children employed by preference. The productivity of machinery is, as we saw, inversely proportional to the value transferred by it to the product. The longer the period during which it functions, the greater is the mass of the products over which the value transmitted by the machine is spread, and the smaller is the portion of that value added to each single commodity. The active lifetime of a machine, however, is clearly dependent on the length of the working day, or the duration of the daily labor process, multiplied by the number of days for which the process is carried on. The amount of deterioration suffered by a machine does not by any means exactly correspond to the length of time it has been in use, and even if it were so, a machine working 16 hours a day for seven and a half years covers as long a working period as the same machine working only eight hours a day for 15 years and transmits to the total product no more value. Notwithstanding this, the value of the machine would be reproduced twice as quickly in the first case as in the second, and the capitalist, using the same machine, would absorb in seven and one half years as much surplus value as he would in 15 in the second case. The physical deterioration of the machine is of two kinds. The one arises from use, as coins wear away by circulating, the other from lack of use, as a sword rusts when left in its scabbard. This second kind is its consumption by the elements. Deterioration of the first kind is more or less directly proportional, and that of the second kind to a certain extent inversely proportional to the use of the machine. But in addition to the material wear and tear, a machine also undergoes what we might call a moral depreciation. 
it loses exchange value either because machines of the same sort are being produced more cheaply than it was or because better machines are entering into competition with it. In both cases, however young and full of life the machine may be, its value is no longer determined by the necessary labor time actually objectified in it, but by the labor time necessary to reproduce either it or the better machine. It has therefore been devalued to a greater or lesser extent. The shorter the period taken to reproduce its total value, the less is the danger of moral depreciation, and the longer the working day, the shorter that period in fact is. When machinery is first introduced into a particular branch of production, new methods of reproducing it more cheaply follow blow upon blow, and so do improvements which relate not only to individual parts and details of the machine, but also to its whole construction. It is therefore in the early days of a machine's life that this special incentive to the prolongation of the working day makes itself felt most acutely. Given the length of the working day, and in otherwise identical circumstances, the exploitation of double the number of workers requires not only a doubling of that part of the constant capital which is invested in machinery and buildings, but also a doubling of the part laid out in raw material and auxiliary substances. The lengthening of the working day, on the other hand, permits an expansion of the scale of production without any change in the amount of capital invested in machinery and buildings. Not only does surplus value increase, therefore, but the outlay necessary to obtain it diminishes. It is true that this takes place more or less with every lengthening of the working day, but here the change is of far greater importance because the part of the capital that has been converted into the instruments of labor now falls more decisively into the balance. The development of machine production ties a constantly increasing portion of the capital to a form in which, on the one hand, it is constantly capable of valorization, and in which, on the other hand, it loses both use value and exchange value whenever it is deprived of contact with living labor. Mr. Ashworth, an English cotton magnate, imparted the following lesson to Professor Nassau W. Sr. Quote, when a laborer lays down his spade, he renders useless, for that period, a capital worth 18 pence. When one of our people leaves the mill, he renders useless a capital that has cost 100,000 pounds. Just imagine that, making useless, if just for a single moment, a capital that has cost 100,000 pounds. It is in truth monstrous that a single one of our people should ever leave the factory. The increased use of machinery, as Senior now realizes having been instructed by Mr. Ashworth, makes a constantly increased prolongation of the working day desirable. Machinery produces relative surplus value, not only by directly reducing the value of labor power and indirectly cheapening it by cheapening the commodities that enter into its production, but also when it is first introduced sporadically into an industry by converting the labor employed by the owner of that machinery into labor of a higher degree, by raising the social value of the article produced above its individual value, and thus enabling the capitalist to replace the value of a day's labor power by a smaller portion of the value of a day's product. During this transitional period, while the use of machinery remains a sort of monopoly, profits are exceptional, and the capitalist endeavors to exploit thoroughly the sunny time of this his first love by prolonging the working day as far as possible. The magnitude of the profit gives him an insatiable hunger for yet more profit. As machinery comes into general use in a particular branch of production, the social value of the machine's product sinks down to its individual value, and the following law asserts itself. Surplus value does not arise from the labor power that has been replaced by the machinery, but from the labor power actually employed in working with the machinery. Surplus value arises only from the variable part of capital, and we saw that the amount of surplus value depends on two factors, namely the rate of surplus value and the number of workers simultaneously employed. Given the length of the working day, the rate of surplus value is determined by the relative duration of the necessary labor and the surplus labor performed in the course of a working day. The number of workers simultaneously employed depends, for its part, on the ratio of the variable to the constant capital. Now, however much the use of machinery may increase surplus labor at the expense of necessary labor, by raising the productive power of labor, it is clear that it attains this result only by diminishing the number of workers employed by a given amount of capital. It converts a portion of capital which was previously variable, i.e. had been turned into living labor, into machinery, i.e. into constant capital which does not produce surplus value. It is impossible, for instance, to squeeze as much surplus value out of two as out of 24 workers. If each of these 24 men gives only one hour of surplus labor in 12, the 24 men give another 24 hours of surplus labor, while 24 hours is the total labor of the two men. Hence, there is an imminent contradiction in the application of machinery to the production of surplus value. 
Since of the two factors of the surplus value created by given amounts of capital, one, the rate of surplus value, cannot be increased except by diminishing the other, the number of workers. This contradiction comes to light as soon as machinery has come into general use in a given industry, for then the value of the machine-produced commodity regulates the social value of all commodities of the same kind, and it is this contradiction which in turn drives the capitalist, without his being aware of the fact, to the most ruthless and excessive prolongation of the working day, in order that he may secure compensation for the decrease in the relative number of workers exploited by increasing not only the relative but also absolute surplus labor. The capitalist application of machinery, on the one hand, supplies new and powerful incentives for an unbounded prolongation of the working day, and produces such a revolution in the mode of labor as well as the character of the social working organism that it is able to break all resistance to this tendency. But on the other hand, partly by placing at the capitalist disposal new strata of the working class previously inaccessible to him, partly by setting free the workers it supplants, machinery produces a surplus working population, which is compelled to submit to the dictates of capital. Hence that remarkable phenomenon in the history of modern industry that machinery sweeps away every moral and natural restriction on the length of the working day. Hence, too, the economic paradox that the most powerful instrument for reducing labor time suffers a dialectical inversion and becomes the most unfailing means for turning the whole lifetime of the worker and his family into labor time at capital's disposal for its own valorization. If, dreamed Aristotle, the greatest thinker of antiquity, if every tool when summoned, or even by intelligent anticipation, could do the work that befits it, just as the creations of Daedalus moved of themselves, or the tripods of Hephaestes went of their own accord to their sacred work, if the weaver's shuttles were to weave of themselves, then there would be no need of either apprentices for the master craftsmen, or of slaves for the lords. And Antipater, a Greek poet of the time of Cicero, hailed the water wheel for grinding corn the most basic form of all productive machinery, as the liberator of female slaves and the restorer of the golden age. Oh, those heathens! They understood nothing of political economy and Christianity, as the learned Bastiat discovered, and before him the still wiser McCulloch. They did not, for example, comprehend that machinery is the surest means of lengthening the working day. They may perhaps have excused the slavery of one person as a means to the full human development of another, but they lacked the specifically Christian qualities which would have enabled them to preach the slavery of the masses in order that a few crude and half-educated parvenus might become eminent spinners, extensive sausage-makers, and influential shoe-black dealers.